Nicole Vanderheiden was a mother of three who had a lot of potential and a lot of life ahead of her. With a six-month-old infant at home, Nikki and her boyfriend Doug scheduled a much-needed night out. Any way you cut it, parenting an infant is difficult. But when the drinks started flowing, the uglier side of the couple's relationship clearly revealed itself. Rather than having a relaxing night out, the couple's evening spiraled into a heated argument with one of the two storming off into the night, never to be seen again. Who's my man? Who's my little man? Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. Too busy sucking on this goat and listening to my new Raycon Everyday Earbuds. Back to school shopping is an exciting time for a ton of people. Now, I finished up my schooling many years ago, and while I never really enjoyed school myself, one of my favorite things was back to school shopping because you get to buy all sorts of new stuff to take with you to school. Things you're gonna be using every single day. These days, a must have for me is my Raycon Everyday Earbuds. And Raycon is having a back to school sale right now where you can get 20 to 40% off. Raycon Everyday Earbuds have an active ergonomic design with multi-point connectivity. And that means you can connect them to two devices at once and they even offer active noise cancellation. They're also available in tons of vibrant colors. And my personal favorite is probably this green color, which I think complements their yellow case quite nicely. These earbuds are super comfortable. Honestly, they even fit me a little bit better than my other earbuds that cost three times the price. These earbuds are excellent for using at the gym or when you're just out and about because you don't have to constantly keep trying to push them back in your ear when they fall out. They just fit. My wife and I both have used Raycon Everyday Earbuds when working around the farm, listening to podcasts, or just hanging out around the house. They genuinely work great in just about every application. Click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com slash tie knot to get 20 to 40% off your Raycon purchase. Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. Now I'm gonna get back to my goat. <laughs> oh, no, dude. Nicole Vanderheiden, or Nikki as her friends called her, was a mother of three. She had two children from a previous marriage that had unfortunately ended in divorce. She and her ex-husband shared custody of the children, and by all accounts, they had a pretty good co-parenting situation. Nikki and her kids lived alongside her boyfriend, Doug Detree. The two had met, started dating, and moved in together within a matter of months. It all happened shockingly fast. It wasn't long afterward that Nikki became pregnant with their first child, Dylan. Of course, the pregnancy was sudden, but they were excited about it and were ready to take the next step in their relationship together. Shared parenthood. Nikki worked as a substitute teacher for the Green Bay Area Public School District. In particular, she loved teaching science. She had a passion for teaching kids about nature and exploring the great outdoors with them, helping future generations learn what it feels like to touch grass instead of glass. From the outside, it seemed like Nikki was an upstanding, all-American woman with no secrets to hide and the perfect relationship. To everyone around her, it probably appeared like she was living the dream. But looks aren't always what they seem. See, Doug and Nikki had been experiencing some turbulence in their relationship. If you think about it, Nikki and Doug hadn't been together long before she got pregnant, and she brought two children from her previous marriage, whom she shared custody with. That means that not only were there three kids involved, but her ex was around too. A lot. None of that's a bad thing on Nikki's part, but Doug just wasn't sure he was ready for it all. In fact, he wasn't even sure that the family life was even for him, though he probably should have thought about that before the whole pregnancy thing. Nikki was also guilty of frequently accusing Doug of wanting to get with other women, but it seems like her accusations had a bit of truth to them. Doug did truly miss the single life, and because of his soul-searching and trying to figure out what he wanted, Nicole had started to feel like she'd been left on the back burner. When you combine all of these complicating factors into the lives of these two, you can't help but feel like it's a recipe for disaster. And in due time, that would turn out to be true. On the night of May 20th, 2016, Nikki and Doug went to a Steel Panther concert at a local bar called The Watering Hole. The two had been urged to go out by Doug's friend, Greg, probably because he noticed how worn down the two had been acting lately, but with their newfound lifestyle, surrounded by deeply opinionated kids. 
The two had arranged for Nikki's mother to come stay with Dylan for part of the night, while Nikki's friend Dallas Kennedy stayed with him for the rest of the evening until Doug returned home. Nikki's other two children were with their father for the weekend. Nikki, Doug, and their group of friends had fun at the concert. The watering hole is quite large, and hundreds of people were packed into the establishment, so it was a pretty lively concert. What's interesting is that everybody in attendance that night says that Nikki was really pounding the drinks back and quickly. Nikki had also been breastfeeding for months, so she didn't really have a tolerance built up to handle the massive volume of alcohol that she was ingesting. And because of that, things quickly got out of hand. After the concert, Doug bumped into some old friends from high school, and they asked if he'd like to have a drink with them. Nikki and the original friend group had planned to head to a second bar called the Sardine Can. Doug told them to go ahead and go to the next bar, and he would meet up with them later, saying that he wanted to catch up with his old friends for a while. Nicole was pretty upset about this. After all, they were out that night with his friends, not hers. She was already annoyed when he essentially blew her off for his old high school friends, but then she started feeling as though he may have been chatting up other women who were there that night as well. And that's when Nikki got very upset. When the two were separated, she began drunkenly texting him, accusing him of all sorts of things, calling him a cheater, an abuser, and everything in between. Doug, on the other hand, wasn't taking her accusations seriously, which probably just made things worse. From his texts, it's hard to tell if he was trying to de-escalate things or if he was just flat out blowing her off and dismissing her concerns, but whatever the case was, Nikki was fuming. Somewhere around 12.30 a.m., Nikki called Doug, but he didn't answer her call. She then had a friend call him, and he answered that call. That upset Nikki even more. Surveillance footage from the sardine can showed Nikki and her friends were there from about 11.15 p.m. until about 11.45 p.m. Police say that it was clear to see that Nikki was on her phone and very upset. After a while, she stood up and stormed off with her friend Aaron Glinsky in tow. According to Aaron, Nikki was having fun and letting loose, but then Doug quit replying to her texts, and that made her upset, and he said she walked out of the bar angrily. He said he was trying to either get her to come back to the bar or call her a taxi to get her home, but that caused an argument between the two. She started getting physical with him, so he walked off and just let her do her thing. Surveillance footage from the bar proved that Aaron was telling the truth. Shortly after Nikki stormed off, Aaron and the rest of the group got an Uber and went home. Doug and his group of friends wouldn't arrive at the sardine can until about 12.18 a.m., about 30 minutes after Nikki and the other group had already left. But according to surveillance footage, it doesn't look like Doug was even there for Nikki. It kind of looks like he couldn't have cared less where she'd gotten off to. He and his new group of friends stayed at the bar until about 2.15 a.m. before calling it a night. After Nikki had left, she continued drunk texting Doug, and eventually her phone died. But he did get one last text from her, explaining that she'd met a friend, but she never explained who this friend was or where she'd met this person. Doug assumed that he'd meet up with Nikki when he got home a short while later, but when he showed up at 3 a.m., Nikki was nowhere to be found. Nikki's friend, the one who'd been babysitting their infant, was a bit worried when Nikki never came back home, but they both just assumed she'd lost track of time and would show up later on, but she never did. The next morning, when Doug woke up at around 11 a.m., Nikki still hadn't returned home. Doug texted Greg, Dallas, and Nikki's sister, Heather, in an attempt to see if any of them had seen her, but they hadn't. Doug texted Nikki all throughout that morning and early evening, but all of these texts remained unread, and it was around that time that everyone realized something had gone horribly wrong. On May 21st, 2016, a 911 call came in from a farmer. He was frantic and said that he just stumbled across a crime scene. Uh, we just found a human body laying in the okay. weeds. Okay. Oh, God. Is the person beyond help, or do I need to give yeah. instructions for CPR? No, it's okay. beyond help. The scene he'd found was in a wooded area in a field just far enough that it wasn't immediately visible from the road. It was located in Bellevue, which is in the Green Bay area. A blonde woman was lying face down in the dirt. Investigators found that she was only wearing her socks and two pink wristbands from the bars she'd attended the night before, and there was what appeared to be a shoe print on her back. It takes quite a bit of force to stomp someone in the back so hard that a shoe print remains on bare skin, 
but that was only a small taste of the violence that this woman had suffered. Sergeant Richard Lopnow with the Brown County Sheriff's Department said, quote, the extent of the injuries that she suffered were pretty horrific. There was trauma to her neck, in addition to lacerations and bruising throughout her body. Her fingernails were damaged, indicative of defensive wounds. This tells us she was fighting for her life. Nicole's body wasn't immediately identifiable because of all the excessive bruising. She was instead identified through dental records, and they confirmed this was Nicole. She sustained more than 240 individual injuries. According to the medical examiner, Nikki had 20 abrasions, 8 lacerations, 8 contusions, a fractured skull, a hemorrhaged tongue, and bleeding around the brain. Most of the injuries occurred before Nicole's passing, although some occurred after. There were so many injuries that it was difficult to tell when some of them had even taken place. There was also some indication that she'd been assaulted, but this wasn't immediately confirmed. Not long after Nikki's body was identified, some bloody clothing was discovered on the side of the road around a mile from the crime scene. It was quickly determined to be Nikki's. A thorough search of the area revealed her purse with her ID and cell phone inside, as well as her shoes. The police turned the evidence over to the crime lab for analysis, but unfortunately, due to a ton of other submissions, the lab was only accepting 10 submissions at a time, meaning they'd have to wait quite a bit of time before all of Nikki's evidence could be processed. Police were baffled. Not only did they not know what happened to Nicole, but now they had to deal with backlogs slowing down important breaks in the case. When Nikki's case made the headlines, the Green Bay community was understandably shaken. Residents never thought such a horrific crime could happen in their sleepy little town. No one could imagine who could have done this to Nikki, a loving mother and a great friend. But even though investigators didn't have a definitive suspect, they definitely had a hunch. During the initial stages of the investigation, police were suspicious of Nicole's boyfriend, Doug. While police were still at the scene of Nicole's body, they received another 911 call around 4.30 p.m., and they quickly determined this call had come from Doug. He called in to report that he hadn't seen Nicole since the night before. Police were quick to follow up with him and headed to the couple's home, and one officer noted that Doug appeared to be hungover. Doug told the officer about what had unfolded the night before, and how Nikki never came home. He hoped she'd showed up the following morning, but when she didn't, he decided to call in a missing person report. One of the officers reported that there were inconsistencies with Doug's level of concern for Nikki, but I'm not 100% sure what he meant by this. I'm assuming he means that it seemed as though he was faking his worry for Nikki, but that may not be completely accurate. The police definitely had questions for Doug when he placed his missing person report. For instance, why did it take him so long? Their infant son needed his mom, especially since he was still breastfeeding. Though admittedly, Nikki certainly shouldn't have been breastfeeding the morning after a night like they had. The same night that Doug filed the missing person report, a warrant to search the home was executed. At the same time, Doug was brought in for a three-hour interrogation by detectives Brian Slinger and Lee Kingston. When asked why he waited so long to make the report, Doug said that he wasn't feeling good and thought that Nikki ran off with some other guy. He basically said that he just didn't want to deal with all of that, so he just let it slide. Around two hours into the interrogation, detectives finally broke the news to Doug about the body that had been found in the field. They carefully monitored his reaction to the news, then asked him if he had anything to do with her disappearance. He insisted that he didn't, and even began to sob, saying, I want her back. She needs to come back. Just a short while later, a big break in the case came when two joggers made a report. They'd noticed a pool of blood on a nearby street curb, then a neighbor found a cord when they accidentally hit it with a lawnmower. It turned out to be an Android cell phone charging cord. When officers showed up to the scene of these two discoveries, they searched a nearby lawn and found clumps of blonde hair. All of this evidence was collected a very short distance from Nikki and Doug's home. And when everything was sent in for forensic testing, it was found that it all belonged to Nikki. That's when the police arrested Doug. The theory that cops had at the time was that maybe Nikki had gotten home, had another argument with Doug, then the two had gotten into an altercation in the street or the driveway. Then once the deed was done, he used Nikki's car to transport her body to a field. Nikki's back had a lot of shoe prints on it. 
they had a distinct herringbone tread pattern, which is present on some Air Jordan and other athletic shoes that were popular at the time. Detectives found a similar pair of shoes in Doug's house. Suspiciously, they had red drops on the bottom and some red staining. Doug also didn't have a rock solid alibi. But that's also where the evidence against Doug stopped making sense. Surveillance found that Doug left his car at the watering hole that evening. Data from Nikki's car revealed that it hadn't been driven on the night of her passing either. Even though police were suspicious of him, forensics didn't reveal any of Doug's DNA anywhere on Nikki's body. They did find male DNA, but it didn't belong to Doug. When detectives found traces of blood in Doug's garage, they thought they had finally pinned him. But then they found out that this blood wasn't even human. It had come from a turkey. There was blood found in Nikki's car but this was confirmed to have come from an injury one of her children had recently sustained. Greg was questioned by the police too. Greg, if you remember, is Doug's friend who'd initially invited Nikki and Doug to the watering hole that evening. Greg wasn't exactly forthcoming with information. When they asked Greg for someone who could vouch for where he was during the 60 minutes after he left the bar, but before Doug relieved the babysitter, he literally just got up and left the room, just walked out. But his story and timeline matched Doug's. And when police retrieved location data from both of their phones, it backed up their claims. Police didn't have anything concrete against Doug or Greg at this point, but things kept looking worse for Doug. Not only were the cops suspicious of him because he didn't seem to have actually looked very hard for his girlfriend after their argument, but her family also accused him of being abusive. Nikki's sister, Heather, said that Doug not only drank heavily, but also used illegal substances. Nikki had also recently admitted to her mother that Doug had been physical with her in the past. Then Doug's ex, Rebecca Mott, told detectives that he could sometimes be both jealous and violent, saying that he'd broken her ankle once and would repeatedly throw things. 16 days after his arrest, Doug was released, simply due to a lack of evidence. The case against Doug was quickly unraveling as they couldn't find any solid evidence that directly tied Doug to the scene of the crime. In fact, at the end of it all, they were able to definitively clear Doug using a bit of technology. Detective Slinger said, quote, we went back and looked at the videos and we'd noticed that Doug was wearing his Fitbit the day that we interviewed him at the house when he called in the missing person report. We started to think about, can we get the data off that Fitbit? Was he moving around that night? When the Fitbit was brought in for analysis, it was confirmed that Doug wasn't moving around at the time that Nikki had lost her life, proving he couldn't have been involved after learning of the violent nature in which Nikki met her end. As far as his Fitbit was concerned, Doug was immobile from the moment he got home to the moment he woke up, aside from a small amount of activity that would have been consistent with the trip to the restroom. This evidence cleared Doug because he couldn't have gotten up committed the crime, drove a few miles out, disposed of the body, and then drove back home while only recording a few steps on the Fitbit. It simply wasn't possible. Doug was not their guy. But if Doug didn't do it, who did? It took another two months before investigators received another break in the case. They were able to pull DNA from Nicole's socks, of all things. When running the DNA through their database, they got a hit from a Virginia man named George Birch. Now, you're probably wondering how DNA from a man in Virginia was discovered on a body in Wisconsin. Well, George had actually been living in Green Bay for about three months, and George was a really problematic individual. Everybody called him Big Country because of his massive six foot eight frame. In 1998, he'd been tried for the homicide of a gang leader in Virginia named Joey White. Apparently, George had been assaulted by Joey and some of his crew two different times. This resulted in a big fight, and Joey lost his life by the end of it all. George was found not guilty. That same year, George was charged with burglary. He was actually kept in police custody so that the gang wouldn't retaliate against him for Joey's passing during this time. He also had a felony firearm charge. This man was bad news all the way around. From there, he moved to New York with his wife and their two kids to start over and hit the refresh button. But eventually that marriage ended and he felt the need to move yet again. He moved in with his friends Edward and Linda Jackson in Green Bay, Wisconsin. The Jacksons described him as being a quiet, charming, and personable man. 
he was an all-around likable guy in his new atmosphere. He'd become a regular at a bar three blocks away called Richard Cranium's, and he had a girlfriend who was 18 years younger than him. And although this was a little odd, everything seemed to be going all right for George. The Jacksons were completely taken aback by George's arrest for the violent crimes against Nicole Vanderheiden. They had no idea. In fact, Ed and George actually went on a fishing trip that day that Nicole's crime scene was discovered. Detectives paid George a visit, and while questioning him about the evening that Nikki lost her life, they asked George if they could take a look at his phone. George handed over his phone, and investigators were able to clone it. Detective Slinger said, quote, It basically mapped out that night and gave us all of the answers we needed to have. Google location data revealed that George was at Richard Cranium's into the early morning hours of that night. After that, he was outside Nicole and Doug's house from 3 a.m. to 3.15 a.m. He was at the farm where Nicole's body was discovered at 4 a.m., and the location further down the road where her clothes were found at 4.05 a.m. Then he went home. This man was everywhere investigators suspected him to be, at precisely the exact times when they suspected of him being there. On September 7th, George was brought in for questioning, but he refused to talk, so he was immediately arrested. His trial started in 2018, and he definitely had an interesting story to tell the jury. George claimed that he met Nikki at a bar. They started flirting with each other, and things got hot and heavy between them. He made the claim that they had relations inside his car outside Nikki's house, but then he said that someone came over to the car and hit him in the head with something, which knocked him unconscious. He continued, saying, quote, The next thing I remember was literally waking up on the ground outside the truck. He said that he saw Nikki was no longer alive. At this point, he says that Doug held him at gunpoint, forcing him to drive him to various locations and assist him with disposing of Nikki's body. Once he disposed of the body, he says he pushed Doug down a ravine and sped off, tossing Nikki's belongings out along the way. Now, this story may just sound totally ridiculous, and it is, but the police did look into it just in case there was a bit of truth to it. There wasn't. According to investigators, what they believe took place makes a lot more sense. They believe that Nikki ended up at the same bar as George that night, and the two struck up a conversation. After the evening had ended, George offered to take Nikki home, believing he was going to be, well, rewarded for making sure she got home safely. Nikki, on the other hand, had no such intentions. This caused George to become incredibly angry, at which point the assault on Nikki unfolded leading to all the awful and gruesome injuries Nikki was left with that night. Officers say that at some point during the ordeal, Nikki fell out of the vehicle and George continued to stomp on her, eventually ending her life. Now, George's defense team did dig up a little bit of dirt on Doug, Nikki's boyfriend, but all they were able to confirm was that Doug was having second thoughts about being a father, and he didn't believe he was cut out for the job. Depending on how you read these messages, Doug may have planned on ditching Nikki and leaving her to fend for herself and the children, but we'll never know as things never got that far. All we can say for certain is that Doug was just terrified. In the end, the jury took only three hours to come back with a verdict for George. Guilty. The judge had a lot to say about this case, saying, quote, You drop the body off in a field, and then 12 hours later, go on a boat and be smiling like nothing happened. Like you didn't have a care in the world. How can we explain that? That isn't human. That isn't normal in Wisconsin. This is the most brutal case that has ever been committed by one person in the history of Brown County. That's how severe this case is. This is a crime that would, I believe, merit the death penalty, and for that reason, you have to die in prison." End quote. George was ultimately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And when it comes to cases like this, with so many twists and turns, it can be easy to lose sight of what matters, and that's the victim, Nicole. According to everyone who knew her, Nicole Vanderheiden was a good teacher with a drive and passion for teaching young children. And she was an exceptional mother who wanted nothing but the best for her kids. What was supposed to be a relaxing night out for Nicole and her boyfriend, well, it turned into something much more than she anticipated. Not only did she feel betrayed by Doug, but in the end, she was betrayed by a complete stranger, all because she wanted a ride back home after an already terrible evening. Now, I didn't know Nicole, so I can't vouch for her on a personal level, but considering what her friends and family had to say about her, 
I can't help but imagine that Nicole was just a young mother trying to figure out what she was going to do with her life and who she was going to spend it with. And she was desperately trying to hold together the relationships with the fathers of her children. She probably made a few mistakes along the way. Doug was happy to put all of that out there. But that doesn't mean she deserved this. No one deserves this. If there's anything to be learned from her story, never ever abandon the people you love. It doesn't matter if you're just wanting to hang out with your bros from high school for a little while. It doesn't matter how mad you may be at your spouse or significant other. When you're both in the vulnerable position of being out in public among strangers drinking, look out for one another. Don't just walk off and leave someone after some stupid argument. This whole situation could have been prevented in so many different ways. But the fact of the matter is, it wasn't. And Nicole paid the ultimate price. Many young people have made the move to Los Angeles with dreams of making a name for themselves and film, despite the chances of those plans being realized being very low. Those who succeed usually go on to enjoy a prosperous and fulfilling career, but those who fail are either forced to return to their hometowns or keep trying in hopes that one day they'll get their big break. 21-year-old Juliana Redding was one such aspiring actress who moved from Arizona to Santa Monica in 2005. But her story would have a tragic ending with many twists and turns along the way. It's a case that's resulted in many people questioning whether justice was served, since the outcome was not what anyone expected. And today, Juliana's family must live with the knowledge that the criminal who took her life may never face the consequences of their heinous actions. Juliana grew up in Tucson, Arizona, where she attended South Point Catholic High School. And by all accounts, she had a great childhood. She was close with her family, and after graduating, she decided to move to California as she had aspirations of becoming a model. But her real ambition was to own her own business one day. And she told her parents, Patricia and Greg, that she would like to open a boutique in the future. After arriving in Los Angeles, she kept in touch with her family on a regular basis. She would often call her parents and catch up and let them know how her plans were going. They would also text each other often and on occasion she would make the trip back to Tucson for a visit. By 2008, she was living alone in a bungalow in Santa Monica while she was studying at Santa Monica College. To make extra money, she worked as a hostess in a restaurant while looking for opportunities in modeling or acting. For the time being, Juliana seemed content with her situation. But all of that would change on the 16th of March of that year, when Patricia found out that she couldn't make contact with her daughter. What's known is that Juliana played a round of golf on the 15th of March, after which she returned to her bungalow and opted to spend the night in, watching TV, specifically Seinfeld reruns. The following evening, Patricia became increasingly concerned when she received a call from Juliana's neighbors, who informed her that they hadn't seen her at all that day and her dog was seen inside her bungalow, but the place seemed completely deserted. Patricia repeatedly dialed her number in hopes that she would answer, but she never did, and also never returned any of her mother's calls. At first, she thought she may just be busy, but when she hadn't received a reply by 6 p.m., she knew something wasn't right. It was then that she decided it was time to call the police. Patricia explained the situation to investigators and asked whether they could do a welfare check, to which they agreed. Officers traveled to the bungalow and looked around outside, but saw nothing out of place or suspicious. Her car was still parked in the driveway, which suggested that she should be home, but the bungalow was silent. But when they entered the building, they knew something strange had happened. They noticed a candle burning in the bungalow's main entrance and then immediately detected the odor of natural gas, which they then discovered was coming from the gas stove that had been left on. But the burner wasn't lit, meaning the entire room was now essentially a time bomb. Then they made an even more unsettling discovery. After searching through the house, they walked into the back bedroom and here they found Juliana. Unfortunately, she was no longer alive. 
It didn't take detectives long at all to realize that she'd been strangled, but it was also obvious that she put up quite a fight against her attacker. From all indications, it seemed that a violent struggle had taken place throughout the apartment. This theory was confirmed when it was revealed that Juliana's DNA was present under her own fingernails, suggesting that she was attempting to remove her attacker's hands from her throat. There were very few clues as to who had ended her life, but one thing that was certain was whoever entered the apartment had plans to cover their tracks by blowing up the apartment. They'd hoped that the gas emanating from the stove would react with the lit candle, thereby creating an explosion that would have wiped out a lot of evidence at the scene. It's believed that, thanks to the age of the building, the gas never had a chance to build up enough to cause an explosion. And before long, investigators started to piece together what they believed happened in the moments leading up to Juliana's death. They believed someone entered the bungalow at around 10 p.m. on the night of the 15th of March. After gaining entry, they attacked Juliana and at some point had caused injuries to her head by hitting her against the floor. Since this was a prolonged attack, investigators believed that her assailant didn't expect her to put up such a fight, and in the end, they had to resort to strangulation. It would later be determined that Juliana attempted to contact emergency services at some point, as her phone records showed that she dialed 911, but the call ended before it could connect. The neighbors who'd contacted Patricia told officers that they heard the sounds of furniture being moved around and someone screaming at about 9.53 the previous night, but added that they hadn't seen anyone suspicious in or around the building. And it's certainly a shame they didn't take the situation more seriously, but you can't really blame them too much. Like they said, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and it could have been a small party or something for all they knew. Evidence was collected from the scene of the crime, including several DNA samples that were found on the building's front door, the phone, Juliana's clothing, and on her throat. These samples were sent into a lab for analysis, but they would take some time to reveal who'd been inside her apartment. In the meantime, investigators interviewed Juliana's family and friends, who gave them as many details about her life as they could. When speaking to crime scene experts, Juliana's father suggested that they contact a man named John Gilmore, with whom Juliana had been in an on-again, off-again relationship. He added that he was concerned about Juliana when he found out they were dating, since Gilmore was known to have had a violent temper, which became all the more apparent when he kicked in her car door on one occasion, and had also forced his way into her apartment. When investigators heard this news, they felt like they finally found the lead they'd been hoping for. They immediately set out to locate John, and it didn't take long at all before they found their man. When John Gilmore was interviewed, he stated that he'd been to Juliana's place that Sunday morning, but got no answer at the door, despite her car being parked in the driveway. He looked in through the security gate, but could only see the burning candle, though he'd never smelled any gas. When asked about the violent incidents that they'd been told about, he admitted that he and Juliana had on occasion gotten into fights, one of which took place that Saturday night when they started arguing about his plans for the evening. He called her to tell her that he was planning on spending some time with some of his friends that night, and this must have irked her, since she abruptly ended the call. He claimed that she then decided to spend the evening with one of her own friends, and he ended up going to a house party at a residence a few miles from her apartment. While there was still some tension between them, they kept texting each other throughout the evening, but then at around 10 p.m., she stopped responding to his messages. When he still hadn't received any reply the following morning, he attempted to call her and sent several text messages, but again, he got no response. This is when he went to her building, but had no choice other than to leave when he couldn't find her there. While he was certainly the first suspect, his name was soon cleared thanks to surveillance footage from the night of the attack. Security camera footage showed him visiting a convenience store and a jack-in-the-box restaurant. Several people from the house party were able to confirm that he was there when the attack took place, since they saw him there between 9.45 and 10.15 p.m. His innocence was fully confirmed when it was revealed that much of the DNA found in the apartment belonged to a woman, not a man. And police now had a lot of unanswered questions. They then started the task of speaking to all of the women in Juliana's life. There was suspicion that someone who knew her might have become jealous of her looks or her lifestyle, or that there was some sort of love triangle involved. Investigators collected DNA samples from everyone they spoke to, but this led nowhere, as no match was found for the samples that had been removed from her apartment. 
This is when they discovered that there was another man in the picture, a doctor by the name of Munir. Upon further investigation and questioning, investigators learned that Juliana and Munir had met each other while she was employed at a restaurant in 2007. She must have made quite an impression on him since he offered her a job as a medical assistant and she readily agreed. Working as a hostess or a waitress in a restaurant obviously doesn't pay very well, at least not considering all the crap you have to deal with from patrons, and she must have jumped at the opportunity to earn a little more money. But their relationship wouldn't remain merely professional for long. Before too much time had passed, she agreed to move in with Munir, and during this time Munir would bring her gifts and allow her to live in his upscale house that was located in Beverly Hills. While this notion must have been flattering for a while, it didn't take long for Juliana to become concerned about Munir's behavior, as she started feeling as though he was obsessed with her. He told her that he wanted to buy her an expensive car when she turned 21, and at one stage he even suggested that they get married. There was no doubt that she would be left wanting for nothing since he was a very wealthy man, but he was known to waste money on jewelry, cars, and women, which she found overwhelming and somewhat concerning. It's unclear if Munir simply got the wrong message from Juliana, or if he was making things out to be much more than they really were, almost some sort of delusional wishful thinking. But whatever the case, Munir's behavior only got stranger and stranger from here, and it didn't take Juliana long to realize she needed a way out. Juliana eventually got her wits about her and decided she needed to end the relationship with Munir, after which she relocated to the bungalow in Santa Monica, which was being paid for by her father. The pair parted ways on good terms, and they even stayed in touch, which is a little bit surprising. One of Juliana's friends would later reveal that she, Juliana, and Munir traveled to Las Vegas on one occasion to celebrate her friend's birthday. But all was not as it seemed, as her father started looking into Munir's background and what he found was seriously startling. He discovered that Munir not only was married at the time of his supposed relationship with Juliana, but that he had three children who were living in Lebanon. He was certain that his family didn't know about Juliana or any of the other women that he'd been seen with, and so he relayed what he'd found to his daughter. She was taken aback and upset by the news, and immediately told him that she no longer wanted to see him, and she even told him to never speak to her again, which was probably the right move. While Juliana and Munir were no longer on good terms, her father Greg, who was a pharmacist, still kept in touch with Munir, since they'd been working on a business deal together, but it never came to fruition as the deal fell through after Greg became concerned that Munir was running his business somewhat illegally. Evidence was quickly beginning to stack up against this man, and it quickly became clear he simply wasn't the man he portrayed himself to be. Investigators found it strange that Juliana had her life ended just a week after this deal had gone sour, and they soon started suspecting that Munir knew much more than he was letting on. But bear in mind, his DNA was not found at the scene of the crime. They were unable to interview him at the time, since he'd left the country, go figure, but they decided to start digging into his past in the meantime. Since he was known to have had a somewhat sordid history with women, they started looking at the women who'd worked for him in the past. They had a suspicion that the female DNA found at the crime scene may somehow be connected to Munir, but they had no proof to confirm these suspicions. Most of his former female employees were either no longer in touch with him or had no knowledge of Juliana. But when they looked into the history between him and a 47-year-old woman named Kelly Sue Park, they started to grow even more suspicious. He'd made several substantial payments to her, totaling over $1 million in just 18 months. She'd been involved in several of his business deals in the past while she was working as a real estate broker. While they were by no means certain that Park was connected to the attack on Juliana, they decided to have her followed in hopes that they could collect a DNA sample without her knowledge. If she was somehow connected to the crime, she may have alerted Munir to the fact that the authorities wanted to collect her DNA, and so it was decided that this should be done without raising any suspicions. Their patience eventually paid off when they were able to collect one of her discarded cigarette butts, and it was sent away to be analyzed. Before long, investigators were informed that they'd finally made a breakthrough in the case, as it was found that Park's DNA was a perfect match for the samples collected from Juliana's bungalow. There was now no doubt that Park was present when the attack was carried out, 
and there was a good chance that Munir was involved somehow, though he still hadn't returned to the US and so couldn't be questioned yet. Obviously, Park was apprehended and immediately charged with the crime against Juliana. It's believed that Munir found out about her arrest just a few days later since he suddenly vanished into thin air, though it's believed at the time he was likely somewhere in Lebanon, possibly to avoid being tracked down by the police. The only problem was the motive for Juliana's crime was still unclear. It was suggested that Munir didn't take kindly to their relationship coming to an end, or that he'd gotten upset when his business deal with her father fell through. So it was theorized that he'd hired Park to carry out the attack in retaliation. One of the most widely accepted theories was that Munir had instructed Park to intimidate Greg into accepting the deal that they were working on and that as part of this intimidation, she was to pay an unfriendly visit to Juliana in her apartment. But when Juliana started fighting back, Park was taken by surprise, and she ended up ending her life as the two women struggled for survival, though this was still just a theory. This would be a point that was brought up in court later on, as it was argued that Munir agreed to pay Park a six-figure sum to follow through with his plan. When news of Park's arrest made it to the media, the LA Times published details revealing that she was known to have had intimidated people in the past whenever they went against Munir's business plans. So it made sense that she may have been involved this time as well. On one occasion, she intimidated a bank manager who had also canceled a deal. And on another, she was told to intimidate one of his clients who'd failed to keep up with his payments as promised. But despite the wealth of evidence found in Juliana's bungalow and DNA placing her at the scene, Park decided to plead not guilty to second-degree homicide charges. Her defense attorneys revealed that they would be willing to tell the court that the two women never met each other and that the only connection between them was Munir, who was still out of the country. The prosecution, on the other hand, intended to reveal that Park had been hired by Munir as an enforcer and that her attempt at intimidation ultimately led to Juliana's life being ended. But this didn't have the intended effect. The judge in this case ruled that this theory could not be used during the trial, since there was no solid evidence to back it up, and instead the state would have to rely on evidence found at the scene, including the DNA that was matched to Park. They would also mention the fact that Park stood nearly six feet tall and that she was an intimidating and self-assured woman who could easily fulfill the role of an enforcer or intimidator if Munir ordered her to do so. This woman was genuinely scary to be around, and she apparently just had a personality and energy about her that was just difficult to get past. The evidence against Park had mounted, and it seemed all but certain that she would be found guilty of ending Juliana's life. Her DNA had been found in several places in the apartment, including on Juliana's clothes, inside the locks on the front door, on the telephone, and most incriminating of all, on her throat. On a plate that had been left in the kitchen sink, crime scene investigators found a drop of blood along with the fingerprint that belonged to Park. This, according to the prosecution, was undeniable proof that Park was inside the apartment that night, and since the two women didn't know each other, she would have no reason to be there other than to carry out an attack as ordered by Munir. Furthermore, they believed it was indisputable that she had ended her life since her DNA was found on her throat, indicating that Park was the one who ended her life via manual strangulation. But pinning this woman for such a crime was much easier said than done. She wasn't going down without a fight, much like the night that she encountered Juliana in her apartment. Her defense team had more than a few tricks up their sleeve, and they were willing to pull out all the stops to get Park off the hook. Kelly Park's defense team had a different theory that they claimed cast doubt on the suggestion that she was in the apartment with Juliana on the night of the crime. Since there were no witnesses that night, they contended that there was too much uncertainty as to what had transpired, and furthermore, they theorized that Park's DNA could have ended up in the building through DNA transfer. This occurs when someone touches an item belonging to someone else, and that item is then found at a crime scene resulting in an innocent person being suspected of a crime when it's discovered that their DNA is present. Another example of this is when an item is touched by two people, resulting in DNA from one person being transferred to the other. In other words, Park may have touched an item that was also touched by Juliana's killer, and they then unwittingly transferred her DNA to the crime scene. In this case, they made reference to a towel that was possibly used by Park when she was in Munir's Beverly Hills home five months earlier. 
They suggested that the killer committed the crime and then attempted to remove their fingerprints and DNA with the use of that same towel, transferring Park's DNA to the scene in the process. They mentioned that Park would have visited this house on several occasions since she was known to be a business associate of his, and since Juliana had lived in that same house at some point, Park's DNA might have inadvertently been transferred to Juliana's bungalow. When discussing Munir's role in the crime, the defense argued that a failed business deal with Juliana's father didn't seem like strong enough motive to have her life ended, and neither was the fact that she had ended their relationship. As for the large amount of money that was transferred from Munir into Park's bank account, they argued that these were simply payments that were owed to her, since she and Munir were known to have conducted business with each other. The prosecution revealed to the court that Munir had, in the past, boasted that he employed a woman who was the female equivalent of James Bond, and they built their case around the suggestion that she was paid to work as an assassin, and that Munir had more than enough motive to order a hit on Juliana. The case was just getting wilder and wilder, and some aspects of the court proceedings are just downright unbelievable. The LA Times reported that Park's telephone records showed that she called Juliana's place of work, and that she was present outside her bungalow the night before the attack was carried out. Since they had never met, there could only be one reason for Park to try and contact her, to figure out her schedule and to stake out her apartment while planning the attack. It was also alleged that Park and Munir had collaborated on a health insurance fraud scam, and that at the time it was still being investigated by authorities. The trial would last until 2013, an incredibly long time, but the verdict the jury reached on behalf of Park, it shocked everyone. After all the court proceedings had been carried out, the jury found Kelly Sue Park not guilty. Juliana's friends and family members who were present at the proceedings were outraged at the verdict and made their feelings known, shouting that she knew she was guilty and that something had gone terribly wrong while she was being let out of the courtroom. This meant that no one would be held accountable for the loss of Juliana's life, and that the one man connected to everyone involved in the case would not even be questioned since he couldn't be reached. This verdict, for all the painfully obvious reasons, must have had a devastating effect on her family who only commented on the outcome via a written statement, in which they expressed their sadness and shock at the fact that justice had never been served. Worse yet, Lebanon doesn't have an extradition treaty with the United States, and the country does everything it can to protect its own citizens, meaning that as long as Munir stays put, he'll never face judgment for his actions. They found it unbelievable that the massive amount of evidence against Park and Munir wasn't enough to see them convicted. They've done their best to come to terms with the decision, and her mother, Patricia, now uses her daughter's room when she paints, helping her feel some small level of connection to her daughter, even after all these years have passed. She says that she's resorted to using art as a coping mechanism, since she produces her best work when she's emotional. At times, she feels as though she and Greg, along with their son Patrick, are still stuck in 2008, when the attack took place, since they still find it hard to believe that Park and Munir walked away scot-free. But thankfully, she's found new meaning in her life, since she remembers her daughter through her art, and after overcoming breast cancer, she started looking for the positive aspects of any obstacles she faces. As for Munir, it's believed that he joined his actual family in Lebanon after fleeing from the US, and today he still maintains he's innocent in the matter. He's never been charged or even questioned. He was placed under arrest in Germany in 2015, when it was suspected that he was committing medical fraud, but nothing ever came of this. It's alleged that he allowed a physician's assistant, who had never attended medical school, to perform surgeries when his patients were assured that he would be the one to perform the surgeries. More than 20 of his patients have come forward to report that they've been left with permanent damage as a result. For reasons unknown, he was released and then traveled to Lebanon once again, where he was again suspected of committing medical fraud. Park was also arrested in 2015 in the German case, when it was found that she was involved. She was charged with conspiracy, lying to patients, disfiguring patients in botched surgeries, and cheating insurance companies out of $150 million. She was eventually released on $1.5 million bail, and once again managed to slip out of the grasp of police. Juliana's case is one with no happy ending and no easy answers. Her family did their best to protect her from Munir when it became apparent that he was living a double life, but in the end, he walked away without so much as a slap on the wrist. 
Some may consider this to be an unsolved case, but I think we all know the truth here. Sometimes the justice system simply fails those who trust that due process will prevail, no matter the amount of solid evidence that's presented. One can only hope that lessons are learned from this case and hopes that similar failures don't become commonplace in the future. The story of Grace Holland is bizarre. The mother of four was raising her children alongside her long-term boyfriend, Robert Douse, a local fire captain. But in July of 2020, their world would be changed forever when Grace unexpectedly lost her life. The official report claims that Grace Holland ended her own life right in front of Robert. But some investigators and detectives, well, they're not so sure. See, Grace was right-handed, but the wound came from her left side. Robert says that Grace was incredibly depressed, but her family and friends say otherwise. Grace left a handwritten note behind at the scene of the crime, but many people say that anyone with eyes can tell that this handwriting isn't hers. But the most mysterious aspect of all is just three years after the tragic loss of Grace, Robert's new girlfriend, Dr. Sarah Sweeney, also lost her life right in front of him, just like Grace. Robert insists that this is all a misunderstanding. But recent advancements in the investigation, well, they cast the situation into a whole new light. I hope you guys are ready because this is a strange one. In 2020, Grace Holland was living in Crevcore, Missouri, alongside her boyfriend, Robert Dows. Grace was known for being a fairly perky woman with lots of energy. When she and Robert first met sometime around 2016, Grace had just gotten out of a rather tough marriage that doesn't seem to have ended particularly well, though the two did stay on civil terms after their marriage was called off, mostly for the sake of their children. Funny enough, when Grace met Robert for the first time, she was impressed by his car more than anything. Driving a Porsche to and from work, Robert was a man that certainly caught a lot of attention. He was a man who was very well known in the local community for being an incredibly upstanding citizen a guy who'd fight for justice and peace any chance that he could. Considering he was the local Maryland Heights fire captain, he had quite a reputation to uphold, and he seemed to have been doing a great job at it. Everyone in the Maryland Heights area knew of Robert. Everyone looked up to him. He was a guy that many young boys and girls in the area aspired to be. Robert wasn't only involved in the local fire department, though, but he also had deep ties to the local police department as well mostly due to the nature of his job, but also just through traditional relationships with locals. What's really impressive is that Robert wasn't the only person from his family to dedicate their lives to helping others. He actually came from a family of first responders, and his own father was the former fire captain of Maryland Heights, passing the title down to Robert when he retired. If this isn't enough to convince you of the character of Robert Douse, his family also owns a small company known as Liberty Artworks who makes memorials for local police officers and fire officers who've passed on, with this business being an endeavor that Robert's father launched in his free time to help out families of those who've lost loved ones in action. When Robert met Grace, it was basically love at first sight. The two had some baggage from previous relationships, but it was nothing they couldn't handle. Grace brought along her four children from her previous marriage, and Robert had a son from a previous relationship too. For Grace, Robert was the total package. Grace was known for having a remarkably deep respect for first responders, police officers, detectives, firemen, you name it. From a very young age, she dedicated her life to helping others find justice. She even became a member of the Police Explorer program when she was just a teenager, a program for teens that want to learn more about the inner workings of a police department, how investigations play out, and how officers track down suspects and bring them to justice. When Grace finally graduated high school and moved on to college, she decided to pursue a degree in criminal justice and, after graduating, took every chance she had to give back to her local community and help out the local law enforcement whenever she could. As far as I can tell, Grace was never given the chance to put her criminal justice degree to work because no sooner than she got her degree, it seems as though the first of her children came along, and before long, she was spending the bulk of her time raising her four kids. As years passed by and she met Robert, 
Grace was given the opportunity to become what her sister dubbed as a police wife, becoming a full-time stay-at-home mom for the most part, while Robert helped provide for the family financially, fighting fires and solving crimes. For Grace, this seems to have been a dream come true. She loved her kids more than anything and couldn't imagine being anywhere else than with her children. But that's when tragedy struck. We don't know the specific dates, but sometime in 2020, Grace was hit with the most awful news any mother could ever imagine. She'd encountered a miscarriage. She and Robert had been trying for several months to have a child of their own, and no sooner than they found out they were pregnant, they unfortunately lost the baby. I'm not even going to pretend to understand the heartache, the grief, and the crushing emotions that come from a situation like this, but it was very clear that after this loss, Grace was suffering severely. The once happy-go-lucky woman had seemingly overnight turned into a shell of her former self. She found herself caught up in a depression that is incomprehensible. She was seeing a doctor for this, but the medications just couldn't seem to keep the dark thoughts at bay. Several sources say that this was basically the beginning of the end for Grace, and Robert seems to have suggested this as well, but no one in Grace's family could have ever expected just how right he would be. If you're into true crime stories and unsolved mysteries as much as I am, you're gonna love what I'm about to show you. June's Journey is a hidden object game, but with a pretty interesting story involving a murder mystery. It takes place back in the 1920s, and each new scene and level takes you through a different chapter of the story, with June Parker as she works to solve the murder of her sister. This game is completely free to download, and the basic idea of the game is hunting for clues and hidden objects that may help bring June one step closer to solving the case. You can customize and remodel your mansion, as well as your garden island along the way. It's super relaxing to play and easy to pick up when you have a few free minutes here or there throughout the day, and the story is pretty engaging. You can click the link below in the description to download the game on iOS and Android devices, but it's also available on PC through Facebook games. So if you're ready to dive headfirst into a captivating murder mystery and help June solve the mysterious case surrounding her sister, just click the link below to download June's Journey. Thanks to June's Journey for sponsoring today's video. It was July 22nd, 2020. Laura Holland, Grace's twin sister, woke up to a Facebook message she couldn't believe. One of her friends asked her, is it true your sister is dead? Laura was taken aback for a moment. She had no idea what was going on, nor what the friend was talking about. The friend who messaged her was a teacher at Grace's daughter's school, Laura's niece, and this teacher had heard the news from the school's resource officer. Just like that, the relationship Laura had with her sister was over gone without so much as a single word from Grace herself. Laura says that when she heard the news, she was in complete shock. She called everyone in her family, and one by one they each learned the terrible news of Grace's passing. One of the most heartbreaking details about this whole ordeal is that when the news broke, one of Grace's four daughters was anxiously awaiting her mother to come home so that the two could go on a shoe shopping spree together. But that trip would never come. Grace never showed up and none of her children ever saw her again. The news first came through at about 5.10 a.m. that morning. Without any sort of warning or lead up to the tragedy, Robert Douse called 911 and very calmly identified himself as the fire captain of Maryland Heights. Without so much as a stutter or a sigh, he told the dispatcher that Grace had used a weapon to end her own life right in front of him after battling depression for months. When first responders arrived, they quickly learned that Robert hadn't attempted any form of resuscitation, nor made any attempts to save Grace's life in the off chance that she'd survive the blow. This was the first red flag. A coroner then learned that Grace took a single round to her left side temple with a slight downward trajectory. But Grace was right-handed, so if she were going to take her own life, wouldn't she be holding the weapon in her right hand? This was the second red flag. Rather strangely, immediately after police arrived at the scene of the crime to collect evidence, Robert decided to call his attorney. Before saying a single word to any of the officers who showed up at the crime scene, Robert ran everything past his attorney, with his attorney telling him what he should or shouldn't say to the investigators. This was the third red flag. Investigators managed to find two notes left at the scene of the crime, both of which were determined to have been handwritten by Grace on the same day she lost her life. In the first note, she addresses her daughters, tells them how proud she is of them, and how they're each going to do amazing things throughout their lives. 
In the second note, she addresses Robert, saying she wishes he could understand that there's more to life than things and money. She signs this letter off by saying, goodbye, my love. In the days and weeks that followed this, Robert wasn't really investigated much at all. The case is basically open and shut. Grace was listed as having taken her own life due to depression, and that was that. After all, everyone in the area knew Robert as one of the most upstanding people in the community. If anything, they felt bad for him, not suspicious of him. But as soon as Laura heard the news about Robert deciding to lawyer up before ever even being considered a suspect, she knew something was wrong. As of a turnout, in the months leading up to her unexpected passing, Grace had confided in her sister Laura that Robert wasn't the man he portrayed himself to be. According to Grace, Robert was incredibly abusive, and as time went by, this abuse only got worse. It grew to such a degree that she decided to start keeping logs of everything, even going as far as recording Robert's abuse so that she would have evidence to use against him in court if the need ever arose. Laura recalled witnessing several bruises on Grace, and it was clear that the violence was getting out of hand. One evening, Grace actually made the mistake of playing one of her recordings for Robert, hoping that he would hear himself on the recording and realize just how cruel he was being. Unfortunately, he didn't. Hearing the accusations from Grace and his own voice on the recording only made things worse, and Grace's family admits that this would prove to be a tragic mistake. Grace was so overwhelmed by Robert's increasingly erratic behavior that she went as far as contacting the Maryland Heights Fire Deputy Chief Medical Officer, hoping he may be able to explain why Robert had been so aggressive lately. Best I can tell, her calls and requests for answers were pretty much ignored by this man, and the whole situation was brushed off. According to Laura, Grace truly believed she could help Robert. She thought there was something she could do to get him the help that he needed and she even attempted to enroll the two in counseling, but this obviously didn't work out. As time passed by, Robert just grew angrier and angrier. And if Grace's family is to be believed, he eventually snapped. Grace's family says that Robert's behavior towards Grace was simply unacceptable. He'd begun to control every aspect of her life, even going as far as telling her who she could spend her time with and how she could spend it. He controlled how much gas money she could use in her car and would even go as far as telling her when and how often she could see her own children. When Grace's sister Laura spoke about Grace's funeral, she commented that no one even showed up. She says not a single one of Grace's friends appeared at her funeral because Robert had forced her to burn bridges with everyone she knew. Her best friend had even cut ties with her in the weeks leading up to her passing after particularly bad experience when having dinner with Grace and Robert, though the exact details of what unfolded at this dinner have never been fully revealed. Laura says that Robert went as far as forcing Grace to quit her job and work for his company, Liberty Artworks. But strangely, he refused to have her name appear on the payroll. Instead, all of her payments were considered under the table, meaning she wouldn't be able to reap any benefits from this job nor show any income on the couple's taxes, making her solely dependent on Robert for pretty much everything. He was even the guy that wrote her under the table checks each month. According to Crime Scoop, as soon as Grace lost her life, Robert wasted no time. He packed his bags and moved out of the couple's home immediately. He now lives in a new home that he and Grace actually picked out together just weeks before the tragedy a home in which Laura says Grace picked out every last light fixture, the details of the fireplaces, everything. Just days after this move took place, Robert was heard telling people around town that he had, quote, one foot out of their relationship for months before Grace lost her life, explaining that this was how he was able to move on so quickly. This is a statement that, for all the obvious reasons, just rubs me the wrong way. Rather than seeming like a grieving partner who just lost love of his life, Robert was coming off to most people as generally being a jerk who couldn't have cared less. Based on his statements to friends and acquaintances, he didn't really show any signs of grief or remorse. If anything, he seemed almost satisfied that the relationship had ended so abruptly and so quickly. When speaking about Grace, he didn't paint her as being a victim of her own mental health, a victim of his abuse, or anything else. Instead, as Crime Scoop puts it, he painted her as being nothing more than desperate and delusional. But here's where things just get downright crazy. We've all heard true crime stories that have sudden and unexpected twists. Well, this one is just wild. 
when police were collecting information about Grace, the events leading up to her passing, and many of the aspects of Robert's life that took place after Grace was gone, they learned some very interesting news. Robert hadn't been faithful to Grace for a very, very long time. I mean, go figure, an abusive husband who cheats on his wife? Never. But that's not the crazy part. The crazy part is he wasn't just seeing other women, he was seeing other men as well. And this is a proven fact. The information was revealed to police through redacted text messages that were pulled by Robert's own lawyer. Around this same time, Robert cut all ties with Grace's family, including her four daughters that he'd helped raise for the last few years. Like turning off a light switch, he just shut down and opted out, never speaking another word to them. He never asked to be a part of Grace's funeral, and I haven't even been able to confirm whether or not he attended the funeral. He also went as far as directing the Maryland Heights Fire Department to never speak to Grace's family again. Immediately after this, in the eyes of Grace's loved ones, Robert basically ceased to exist. In the blink of an eye, he just disappeared from their lives. Interestingly, sometime around this point, detectives with the Crevcore Police Department decided to reach out to Robert to take his statement and interview him about the loss of his wife's life. He was taken into an interrogation room where he was asked to give a handwritten and a verbal statement, with the entire event being recorded for evidence. But as soon as he left the room that day, that recording was deleted. The Crevcore Police Department says this was nothing more than a simple mistake, a digital error. But I'll be honest, I'm not so sure. Considering the ties that Robert had with the local police, is it really so hard to believe that he may have slipped up and said something he shouldn't have and one of his friends at the police office helped make that tape disappear? Now, I always try to keep my own opinions out of cases like this and just share the facts and the evidence, but this is just beginning to be a bit too much to ignore. But if this isn't bad enough, there was also a recording of Robert arguing with his young son that was mysteriously deleted while in the police's possession. This tape could have been used against Robert in courts to prove that he was, in fact, the abusive man that Grace claimed him to be. But now that this tape had also vanished, he got away scot-free. But if all this wasn't bad enough, things were about to get much, much worse. Laura Holland has reached out to various news outlets in the wake of her sister's passing, and has shared a very extensive list of crimes and oversights that she believes were committed by the Crevcor Police Department. According to Laura, when investigating the scene of the crime, the coroner didn't correctly identify the entry wounds and exit wounds on Grace's body. Police misreported Robert's location when Grace passed away. By his own admission, Robert was standing right next to her, but some police reports suggest otherwise. They failed to remove friends of Robert from the investigation. They've closed the scene of the crime before ever speaking with family. They didn't investigate an engagement ring that was missing from the scene of the crime. They failed to collect forensic evidence from Robert's hands or Grace's hands to prove who was really holding the weapon that evening. They lost multiple video recordings, didn't document obvious bruising on Grace's body, failed to verify the handwriting on the letters that were found at the scene of the crime, and never bothered questioning Robert for 14 months after the crime occurred. Now, you may remember that I mentioned the notes found at the scene of the crime, as well as the fact that police never verified the handwriting on these notes. Well, Gavin Fish has done an excellent job compiling evidence for this case, and he managed to track down scans of the notes that were found at the scene of the crime, as well as other handwriting examples from Grace when she filled out paperwork or had written down notes in the weeks or months leading up to the crime. Take a look at this image here. The image on the left is taken from the note that Grace allegedly wrote to her daughters on the day she lost her life. The image on the right is taken from sticky notes that Grace left behind for one reason or another. Now, here's the thing. I've heard several people voicing their concerns that this handwriting simply doesn't match. Laura, Grace's sister, also seems to believe that the handwriting isn't a match for Grace. But I've got to be totally honest with you here. If you look at the confirmed handwriting on the right side and compare it with the alleged handwriting on the left, I'm not seeing any major differences. Now, I've highlighted the words love and proud in both images so you can see a clear example of the same words written several weeks apart. And they don't really look that much different to me. It would certainly make for a more compelling story if the handwriting was different, but it's just not. Now, that certainly doesn't discredit Laura's allegations against Robert, not by a very, very long shot. 
But let me know if you guys see something I don't in this handwriting, because it seems pretty clear to me that these notes were written by Grace. But now, here's where things take another turn, and unfortunately so. I think it's pretty clear to assume, based on Laura's allegations and her claims against Robert, she believes that Robert was involved in Grace's passing. Either he directly claimed her life, or he led to her claiming her life by being abusive and manipulative. But I think I can pretty much debunk the theory that Robert took Grace's life outright. Now, unfortunately, because of the nature of the next few photographs, I can't show them in their entirety in this video, or YouTube would pull it down so fast it would make your head spin. But during the police investigation into Grace's passing, they managed to get a hold of several text messages that Grace sent to her family or to Robert. And these texts and images, well, they paint Grace in a very different light. In one image, Grace sent a photo of the weapon that she would eventually use to claim her own life. This was coincided by texts that read, Goodbye, you failed me, I loved you. Tell the girls I love them. You chose this. Detectives also uncovered another image of that same weapon, likely taken around this same time. There was also a photo of Grace holding the contents of an entire bottle of pills in her hand, with these pills being an antipsychotic medication that was prescribed to her. Finally, there's a photo of Grace herself holding the very weapon that she would soon use to take her own life. The most shocking and concerning part about this image is that, well, she's holding the weapon in her left hand, even though she was right-handed, just as the wound was described in the coroner's report, which basically puts that theory to rest. So here's the thing. Was Robert involved in Grace's passing? Well, I find it hard to believe he wasn't. According to Robert, after their miscarriage, Grace was known to fly off the handle at the most random of times. But how could you blame her? The grief she was experiencing was unlike anything you could imagine unless you've been through something like this. Not only was she naturally grieving, but her body was also flipping out on a chemical level because of the miscarriage. So there was only so much of her behavior she could realistically control. Robert's abuse added on top of this certainly wouldn't have made things any better. His hatred and mistreatment of Grace is so well documented that it's pretty much irrefutable to say that he did play some role in Grace's claiming her own life. Not that he took her life with his own two hands, but his actions certainly pushed her there. But is that enough to see him convicted somehow? Well, I'm just not sure. Considering so much of the evidence against him has been deleted by the local police department, I don't think we'll ever see the day this man is put behind bars. But there's one more aspect of this story that we need to cover. What about Robert's most recent girlfriend, Dr. Sarah Sweeney? She too lost her life in front of Robert, just like Grace. Dr. Sarah Sweeney was a doctor and podiatrist, someone who specializes in disorders of the feet or ankles, who'd recently opened up her own practice in Crevcore, Missouri. When she was young, she was diagnosed with an illness known as Perth's disease, which affects the joints in your hips and can make it incredibly difficult to walk. We don't know specifically when she met Robert Dows, but the two had seemingly been dating for a number of months when, without warning, she lost her own life in Robert's home. According to the local police, she showed no signs of trauma, and her lawyer claims that she'd been suffering from a life-threatening medical condition. But according to the coroner's report, the actual reason she lost her life was due to an overdose of pain medication, likely the same medicine used to treat her Perth's disease, but I haven't confirmed this part. Now here's the thing. Officially speaking, there's no link between Sarah's passing and Robert, except that in the months leading up to her losing her life, she'd been outspoken against Robert, telling those close to her that she personally suspected he may have played a role in how Grace lost her life. His own girlfriend said this. Her friends say that she spent her days living in fear of Robert, and she didn't know what to do to get out of the situation. Now, we know that Sarah had recently opened up her new podiatry practice in Missouri, but this came about after she filed a lawsuit for wrongful termination against her former employer, claiming that she was subjected to gender discrimination, disability discrimination, as well as sexual harassment in the workplace. But if we look at the counterclaims filed by her former employer, they actually claim that her employment was terminated on the grounds of her having issues with both her mental and physical health that prevented her from performing her job properly. In one of her other remarks, she mentioned that she'd been homeless, 
was feeling rather hopeless and couldn't even get her car legally registered in Missouri because it had a broken headlight and windshield, and she had no money to get either of the two repaired. With all of this in mind, pieced together with Sarah's unexpected passing due to an overdose, what are we to make of this? Is it possible that Robert played a role in her passing as well? Well, yes, certainly, especially since she claimed she was living in fear of him, just like Grace had been. But if we look at this purely from an evidence standpoint, I just don't see what leg this investigation has to stand on. Sarah was obviously severely troubled in the months leading up to her passing, just like Grace was. The fact that she passed away due to an overdose, it really makes you wonder if she had just had all she could take. But it also makes you wonder if Robert could have played a role in the overdose. It wouldn't be that hard to do. If they lived together, he obviously had access to all of her medications. But in the end, there's just too many loose ends here to really be able to say for sure what happened. Personally, I find it awfully bizarre that both women, both of whom had very well-documented mental health issues, would pass away right next to this guy in his own home within such a short period of time. I also find it pretty strange that they both classified him as controlling, scary, and in Sarah's own words, capable of taking the life of his former lover. This is, unfortunately, just another one of those cases that doesn't have a silver lining or any clear ending. There's no lesson to be learned. There's just heartbreak and despair for both families who were involved in this. Thankfully, Robert is still actively under investigation, and I hope the truth will come out one day. That is, if he really was involved in one or both of these cases. But for now, tragically, the story remains unsolved. Tokyo, the city of neon lights, endless energy, and a heartbeat that never slows down. But beneath the surface of this vibrant metropolis, a chilling darkness lurks. In May of 2012, the city's bustling rhythm was shattered by a shocking and tragic event that left a sickening mark on both Japan and Ireland, ending in an innocent woman losing her life. This is not just a tale of crime. It's a story of loss, justice, and the quest for truth in the face of unspeakable tragedy. Nicola Furlong was born on December 17, 1990, to her parents Andrew and Angela, in a picturesque village in County Wexford, Ireland. Nicola had two younger sisters, Andrea, who was three years younger, and Hannah, who was nine years younger, and she was close to both of them. Growing up in a close-knit community in Wexford, Ireland, Nicola was known for her bright smile, warm, stunning, and generous personality, and had an infectious zest for life. From an early age, Nicola showed a passion for music and sports. She played the piano beautifully and was an avid athlete, often seen playing soccer and running in local competitions. Nicola's dedication and hard work extended to her studies as well. She excelled academically and was determined to make the most of every opportunity that came her way. After graduating from high school in Ireland, Nicola enrolled as a student at Dublin University to pursue a degree in international business and language. But when an opportunity came up to continue her studies abroad, her father Andrew suggested she go, specifically to Japan, since she enjoyed taking the course so much. Her love for exploring new cultures and languages led her to take up an exchange program in Tokyo's Takasaki City University of Economics back in 2011. This opportunity was a dream come true for Nicola, combining her academic ambitions with her love for travel and new experiences. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and she just had to take it, even though it meant being away from her family and friends and her boyfriend for a full year. Tokyo was a huge adjustment, one that Nicola may have underestimated. At first, she struggled to find her way living in Japan. The area she was living in was about two hours away from Tokyo, which is stunning in terms of its beauty, but being outside of a major city means that it offers a more traditional Japanese lifestyle meaning many people don't speak English like they may in a more modernized area like Tokyo. Beyond that, the time Nicola spent missing her family overshadowed much of her experience in Japan. While she enjoyed spending time in Japan, she was mostly just looking forward to finishing up her year in the exchange program and getting back home to her family. 
Nicola eventually adapted to her new surroundings, making friends and immersing herself in the vibrant Japanese culture. She was known by the locals to be kind-hearted and approachable. Nicola was more than just a student. She was a young woman with a bright future ahead of her. Her love for music continued in Tokyo as well, where she often attended concerts and enjoyed exploring the local music scene. Her weekends were filled with adventures, from visiting historic temples to trying new foods, and she often documented her experiences in a blog that kept her friends and family back home updated on her journey. But Nicola would make one final blog post before her future changed forever. And that's because in the blink of an eye, everything Nicola had worked so hard to build, all the relationships she'd formed in Japan, the memories she had with new friends and new family, they would all vanish in the blink of an eye when Nicola unexpectedly had her life stolen. In May of 2012, Nicola was just a couple of months away from returning home to Ireland. On the night of May 23rd, 2012, Nicola and her friend, another girl from Ireland who's not been identified, decided to attend a Nicki Minaj concert in Tokyo. It was supposed to be a fun night out with friends, an escape from their busy college schedules. But little did they know that this night would take a dark and sinister turn. Nicola and her friend traveled to Tokyo by train, and it was about a two-hour trip. The plan was to go to the concert and then spend the rest of the night visiting bars in the Tokyo area, catching the first train back to school the next morning. But while they were looking at a transit map and making plans, they were approached by two American men, 19-year-old Richard Hines and 23-year-old James Blackston. The men explained to the ladies that they were visiting Japan from the States, striking up a conversation. While the girls had no idea who these men were, and didn't show too much interest in them at first, they were probably just happy to have met someone who could speak fluent English. Richard was from Memphis, Tennessee, and he was there working as a professional musician, while James flew in from LA and was there as a professional dancer. The men appeared super friendly, and because they were familiar with the nightlife of the city, they offered to help the young women find their way around. Nicola and her friend thought they seemed friendly enough, so they agreed. The four of them eventually took off in a taxi together. As they were riding around town, Richard and James let the two ladies know that they had two rooms booked and paid for at the Keio Plaza Hotel in the Shinjuku district, an area known for its vibrant nightlife. The men offered to let the girls have one of the rooms for the night, free of charge. But Nicola and her friend declined, saying that they'd be fine to just stay up and take the train back in the morning. The thing is, unbeknownst to the girls, the Shinjuku district, while famous for its nightlife, also has a dark side. Amidst its neon-lit streets and bustling entertainment hubs, this was an area known for its seedier elements, with a much higher crime rate than the rest of Japan. While the girls were just happy to have made a couple of new friends, they had no idea about the twist of fate they were about to walk right into. As the group made it to Shibuya, they decided to visit the Scramble Bar. Nicola and her friend bought the first round of drinks, and Richard and James bought the second round, which was shots of tequila. But Nicola's friend reported that the shot of tequila hit her differently than usual. One minute she was sitting there enjoying drinks and conversation, and the next minute she blacked out. This is where the events of the evening become somewhat of a blur. But just before 1 a.m., security footage from a taxi showed Richard and James putting the two heavily intoxicated women into the back of a car before getting in and telling the driver to take them to Keio Plaza Hotel in Shinjuku, about a 10 or 15 minute drive away. Once they arrived at the hotel, things took a turn for the worst. Nicola and her friend were separated, each going to different rooms with one of the men. It's believed at this point both women were still completely powerless against these men, and they didn't really even have a full understanding of what was going on. The lobby of the Keio Plaza Hotel has, for years, been a symbol of Tokyo's prosperity and openness, where tourists mix with local travelers on their way up to the Twin Towers overlooking the city center. But as the night of May 23rd turned into the early hours of May 24th, the vibrant energy of Tokyo's Shinjuku district began to fade. In a hotel room high above the bustling streets, an unthinkable crime was unfolding. Nicola Furlong, a bright and adventurous young woman, had unknowingly stepped into a nightmare. It was around 12.50 a.m. when the men, alongside Nicola and her friend, arrived at the hotel. Security footage revealed that Richard and James clearly understood just how intoxicated Nicola and her friend truly were. 
In fact, in this footage, the men can be heard taunting the girls, laughing and gloating about what they planned to do to them when they got them back to their hotel rooms. When the taxi arrived at the hotel, the girls were so far gone they couldn't even walk. The men ended up having to ask hotel staff for two wheelchairs so that they could take the girls up to the rooms. The hotel workers happily obliged without so much as a second thought. Thus, these girls were wheeled away by these two men, with neither of the girls knowing that, for one of them, this night would be their last. In the bizarre security footage, we can see the girls being wheeled away completely against their will. Richard was in control of Nicola, while her friend was being wheeled away by James. At approximately 3.20 a.m., a noise complaint was called in and the hotel manager on duty went to room 1427, the room where Richard was staying, to see what was going on. He knocked on the door a couple of times, but when no one answered, the manager entered the hotel room and discovered Nicola lying face down on the floor. It was clear something had gone horribly, horribly wrong. Emergency services were then called to transport both Nicola and her friend, who was found in the other room, to a nearby hospital. But despite the best efforts of medical professionals, Nicola never regained consciousness. Shortly after 3.55 a.m., it was announced that Nicola was gone. The initial cause of her passing was unclear, leaving her family and friends in a state of shock and grief. After all, she'd just spoken with her friends and family about how happy she was to be attending the concert that evening. She was over the moon about it. How, in such a short span of a few hours, could things have gone this badly? Thankfully, it wasn't difficult for the police to track down who had done this to these two young ladies. After all, the hotel rooms were registered under the names of Richard Hines and James Blackston, the two American men who they'd been at the bar with that night. The men were very quickly tracked down, with both of them being arrested and taken in for questioning. At first, the men were not charged with taking Nicola's life. They were merely charged with assaulting the one woman in the backseat of the taxi that they'd taken earlier that night. Police had strong suspicions that both women had been dosed before they fell unconscious, but at this point this was merely a theory. A toxicology sample was taken from Nicola, and investigators were waiting on the results of this analysis before placing any more serious charges against the two men. While this was being carried out, an autopsy was being conducted on Nicola to determine specifically how she lost her life. These results wouldn't come back until the 15th of June, and they were surprising to put it lightly. Professor Kenichi Yoshida carried out the autopsy and reported back that Nicola had not overdosed. Instead, she had her breathing restricted, most likely with an object, something soft like a towel. It was added that Nicola likely didn't lose her life quickly, and it most likely took several minutes and great amounts of distress, which likely lended to the noise complaint that was called in by the other hotel patrons. Now that the police had determined exactly how Nicola had lost her life, they were ready to step the investigation up a notch, and they officially placed first-degree charges against both James and Richard. The crime sent shockwaves through both Japan and Ireland. Nicola's family, devastated by the loss, demanded justice for their beloved daughter. Her mother Angela and father Andrew traveled to Tokyo, enduring the painful process of dealing with their daughter's passing in a distant and unfamiliar country. They sought answers and accountability, hoping that the Japanese legal system would deliver justice for Nicola. Thankfully, the Tokyo Metropolitan Police responded quickly, treating the case with the seriousness that it demanded. They gathered evidence, sent in security footage for forensic analysis, and carefully pieced together the events of that fateful night. The hotel room was thoroughly searched, revealing clues that pointed directly to Hines and Blackston. But the case wouldn't be so simple. These men, though clearly responsible, were not going down without a fight. On the night that Nicola lost her life, detectives say that Richard's actions were most likely driven by a mixture of intoxication and simple aggression. Having grown up in a very rough home environment, Richard had a lot of hatred and resentment towards others. As the investigation revealed, he'd grabbed a hold of Nicola in a fit of rage, an act of unthinkable violence that left her family and friends in utter devastation. What specifically caused him to fly off the handle is still a matter of debate. We don't know if Nicola may have said something that triggered him, or if he was already acting violently before even getting Nicola to the hotel room. But whatever the case, Nicola received the brunt of his aggression and paid dearly for it. While all of this was unfolding, James was in the other room having his way with Nicola's friend. 
Richard Hines would deny purposefully claiming Nicola's life. He claims that their actions that night were completely consensual, but that things got out of hand when Nicola lost her life as a result. He insists that whatever happened to Nicola, it was an accident. But police were not buying this. As the case went to trial in March of 2013, even more details emerged that admittedly didn't really make the situation any better, and they merely confirmed investigators' darkest suspicions. The prosecution alleged that on the night in question, Hines and Blackston dosed Nicola and her friend without their knowledge, intending to bring them back to their hotel rooms against their will. This much has basically been confirmed. But according to Professor Yoshida, who performed Nicola's autopsy, Nicola had scratch marks on her neck, indicating that she'd tried to fight back against her attacker and likely did so for quite some time. Yoshida says that the method used to claim Nicola's life, it was monstrous. This man would have had multiple minutes to just stand there staring into the eyes of his victim as she fought back, desperately clinging to life. It was brutal, utterly brutal. This was not something that could have in any way been an accident. Nicola's friend was called to testify during the trial, and she did her best to piece together the events of that evening, leading up to the shot of tequila that caused her to pass out. She spoke of how the men offered to take the girls back to their hotel rooms, but that both of the girls declined, as they were in committed relationships. The men acted as if they were going to back off, but they never did. This is when the tequila came out, and Nicola's friend says she lost consciousness just minutes after taking the shot. She has no memory of what happened after this, and the next thing she knows is waking up in a hospital bed. The defense team painted Richard Hines as an honest and decent man who simply wanted to help these two young ladies get to a safe space, like their hotel room, so that they could sleep off the effects of the alcohol they'd been drinking. But investigators were able to dig up CCTV footage from the cab ride to the hotel in which the men could be heard excitedly shouting about how these girls had, quote, fallen into their lap. As they were looking at the two women and chatting about what they were going to do to them, they even bumped fists with one another. This was by no means any sort of accident. This was calculated and planned down to the finest of details. Worse yet, as investigators continued digging into these two men's pasts, they found out this was not the first time that James had been pinned for a crime just like this. In fact, less than a month before Nicola lost her life, James was accused by another woman of spiking her drink and taking advantage of her. When Richard was given a chance to defend himself, he painted Nicola as nothing more than a bar hopper who was looking for someone who could easily get her drunk. He basically suggested that she left her school that night with every intention of getting blackout drunk and suggested that she was willing to set up shop with whoever would get her the drunkest the quickest. I don't think you need me to tell you that this could not have been further from the truth. For me, I think the most heartbreaking part of this entire trial was when the prosecution showed the footage from the hotel lobby. These two girls were desperate for someone to step up, literally anyone to help them out of this bad situation they found themselves in. But not one single hotel worker bothered to ask these girls if they were okay. No one stepped up and said, hey, uh, maybe we should call somebody because these girls are clearly too drunk to even know what's going on. Not one person offered any assistance. They just got them in the wheelchairs they requested and even went as far as to help load the girls into the wheelchairs. It's just sickening and I, I can't wrap my head around it. It just truly blows my mind. Nicola's family was present at the trial and they had to sit through all of the awful retellings of what happened to their daughter. They would deliver a victim impact statement in which they requested the judge hand down the gravest possible punishment. But unfortunately for them, the punishment that this man would receive would be little more than a slap on the wrist. See, at this point in Japan's history, Richard, who was 19, was still considered a minor. The problem is that minors cannot be legally sentenced to the same level of punishment as adults. While these laws have changed in more recent years, that really doesn't matter in Richard's case, because in the end, he was found guilty, but he could only be sentenced to a maximum of five to 10 years in prison, and he's now a free man. As for his partner in crime, James Blackston, well, he was convicted of assaulting Nicola's friend, but his sentence was even lighter. He was sentenced to three years of hard labor, being released in 2015. He then returned to the United States and continued his career as a dancer, with his crimes in Japan being little more than a footnote in an otherwise great life. These two men have proven themselves to be serial criminals, and they just got away with it. 
In the years following Nicola's passing, her family has worked tirelessly to honor her memory, creating scholarships in her name and advocating for the safety of young travelers abroad. In the wake of this tragedy, there has been some positive changes aimed at preventing similar incidents in the future. Awareness campaigns about travel safety, particularly for young women abroad, have gained traction among students in the Tokyo area. Hotels in Tokyo and other major cities have implemented stricter security measures to protect their guests, hoping to prevent situations like this from ever unfolding again. These steps, while small, do represent a collective effort to ensure that no family has to endure the pain that Nicola's family has suffered. Not to mention the pain that her friend now has to live with on a daily basis. Nicola's family has shown incredible courage in sharing their story, hoping that Nicola's experience will serve as a warning and a lesson to others. They continue to celebrate Nicola's life, remembering her for the vibrant, loving, and talented young woman that she was. At the end of this story, we're left with just one main takeaway. Justice was served, but sometimes that's simply not enough. These two men should have spent the rest of their lives paying for what they did to these girls. But instead, they're out there living their best life while Nicola's family is left in shambles, and her friend is left to sift through the ashes of the life that she once knew. For both of these families, every semblance of safety and security was ripped clean out of their hands. They will never know true peace again. But for the two men who forced this fate on these women, they just get to move on with their lives and act like the whole thing never happened. And somehow we're supposed to accept this as some form of justice? I don't think so. Faith can be an incredible thing. For some people, it's the only thing that gets them through their day, while for others, it serves as a source of renewal and inspiration. But it can also be a very dangerous thing when faith is placed in the wrong person. Those of us who grew up in the church will know that ministers, elders, and deacons are held in high regard in their respective church families, since they're seen as the leaders of the church and are tasked with helping and guiding their congregation. But some of those who call themselves ministers of God they're not at all what they see. Matt Baker served as a Baptist minister at the Crossroads Baptist Church in Hewitt, Texas back in 2006. He and his wife Carrie were well known in their community, and from the outside their marriage seemed perfect. The couple met while they were both still students at Baylor University in Waco, and they immediately hit it off. Just three months later, they would tie the knot at Carrie's parents' house, and following this, Matt would attend the George W. Truitt Theological Seminary at Baylor University, where he completed his studies to become a pastor. The future looked bright for the young couple, since they were both active in the church and had found happiness in each other. That joy would only grow when they had three daughters, Kinsey, Cassidy, and Grace. But things would take a tragic turn when Cassidy was diagnosed with a brain tumor in 1998. Once the tumor was found, she started receiving treatment that at first seemed promising, and she was released from the hospital. But in March of the following year, Matt found her unresponsive in her bedroom and realized she'd sadly passed away. And this understandably brought Carrie's world crashing down around her. Due to the effect that the tragedy had on her, Carrie started attending counseling sessions and would often remember her daughter by writing passages about her in her Bible. This, along with her faith and her two other daughters, kept her going during a time that many people would have found too hard to endure. But no one could have foreseen the events that were about to unfold in the family's household. It all started with a 911 call that Matt made a few minutes past midnight on the 8th of April, 2006. Matt told the operator that he left the house to get a movie and to put gas in his car. But when he returned, he was shocked to find Carrie lying lifeless on their bed with a note and an empty bottle of sleeping tablets next to her. The note read, quote, Matt, I'm so sorry. I'm so tired. I just want to sleep for a while. Please forgive me. Tell Kenzie and Grace that I love them very much. Please continue to be a great dad for our little girls. Love them every day for me. I'm sorry. I love you, Carrie. 
He told the operator that he had tried to revive his wife, and when he realized that she wasn't breathing, and since she wasn't clothed, he started trying to dress her one hand at a time while speaking to 911 on the phone, which he had trapped between his ear and one of his shoulders. The operator then instructed him to start administering CPR, which he did, and when EMS arrived, they took over. But Carrie was pronounced deceased when they were unsuccessful. Matt then supplied investigators with the details of what had happened that night. He stated that he left the house at around 11.10 p.m because he wanted to rent a movie, and while he was out, he decided that he might as well get gas for the car. He was surprised when, upon his return, he found his and Carrie's bedroom door locked, and she wouldn't answer when he knocked. He became concerned that something was wrong and grabbed a screwdriver, and he was able to lever the door open, and the door lock finally popped and he stepped inside. He found Carrie lying on the bed with her arms outstretched. He then managed to dress her in a t-shirt and underwear while speaking to the 911 operator. To everyone at the scene, it seemed that Cassidy's passing had just been too much for Carrie, something that most parents would never judge her for. Jim and Linda Doolin, Carrie's mother and father, were informed of what had happened and they raced over to the house in disbelief. They knew that Carrie had been struggling, but never imagined that she would take her own life. But it wouldn't take long for their suspicions to be roused when Linda was told by her three sisters that Matt wasn't as clean cut as he pretended to be. They knew of multiple women who Matt had made advances towards while serving as their minister, but they decided not to say anything since they didn't want to cause trouble in his and Carrie's marriage. Since she was still in disbelief over the ruling that Carrie had ended her own life, she decided to do some investigating, starting with Matt and Carrie's cell phones that had just been added to her and Jim's plan. She immediately found something strange. In the weeks after Carrie had passed away, Matt had been placing calls to her number, in one instance, he'd called that number 17 times, and in total, he had dialed it 180 times. She then found out that the phone was no longer in Matt's possession, since he'd given it to a member of his congregation, a woman named Vanessa Bulls. Linda then contacted Bill Johnston, a former assistant district attorney and assistant U.S. attorney who, along with U.S. Marshal Mike Nemera and Agent John Bennett, started their own investigation. They were able to confirm that Matt was somewhat of a ladies' man, since he'd made advances to women not only while he and Carrie were married, but also while they were dating, and while he was still in college. As is often the case, things started to look even more suspicious when they checked Matt's internet history. He'd not only visited several adult websites, but more alarmingly, had performed searches for terms that alluded to taking someone's life with sleeping pills, as well as an overdose. He also researched how one would go about obtaining the sleeping pill Ambien without the need for a prescription. Everyone involved started to feel that something untoward was going on here, and the police had missed many details that pointed towards Carrie's passing being a homicide rather than her taking her own life. Through much trial and effort, Johnson was able to eventually convince the authorities that there was a need to have an autopsy conducted. And three months after that tragic night, this was finally done. And the results were interesting. Since so much time had passed, it would have been impossible to find medications in Carrie's blood. But the results showed that she had a type of sleeping medication called Unisom in her muscle tissue. This can be purchased over the counter. Ambien, the drug that Matt had researched, was also found, which was strange since Carrie was never known to have taken that particular pill. Following these findings, the ruling was changed to an undetermined cause of death. Not only were there inconsistencies as far as Carrie's passing was concerned, but there were now also rumors that Matt had been having an affair with Vanessa Bulls, to whom he'd gifted his wife's phone. Investigators realized that everything was not as it seemed, and they started suspecting that Matt may have ended Carrie's life. He was arrested in September of 2007 and charged with claiming the life of his wife, but thanks to his defense attorney, guy James Gray, he was released on bond. Gray was certain that Matt was innocent, and on one occasion told a news outlet that he only accepts cases that he has absolute faith in. He believed that it would be impossible to establish the cause of Carrie's passing, and that prosecutors would not be able to prove that this was a homicide. Linda was even more upset when she found out that the assistant district attorney had decided to drop all charges against Matt just six months later since he felt that the evidence in the case was merely speculative and that it could not be proven that a crime had been committed. But she refused to give up without a fight. 
She filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Matt. It would be a civil case, but she hoped that the authorities would uncover further evidence during their investigations, and that they would eventually be able to build a criminal case against him. Matt had to endure a deposition, during which he would be questioned under oath. Johnston later remarked that Matt could have opted to remain silent at this point, but likely because he wanted to make it seem like he had nothing to hide, chose to answer his questions instead. He denied ever having an intimate relationship with Vanessa Bowles or anyone else while married to Carrie. But much of his testimony regarding the events of that night didn't seem to add up. He stated that while he was talking to the 911 operator, it took him mere seconds to dress his wife, despite the fact that she was unresponsive and that he had to do it mostly one-handed. But Matt's defense attorney still had the upper hand. All the evidence against Matt was circumstantial and speculative at best. And unless prosecutors were able to speak to Vanessa, it seemed likely the case wouldn't go much further. When investigators interviewed her on an earlier occasion, she admitted that she and Matt had been seeing each other, but insisted they only started doing so after Carrie had passed away. But she'd failed to convince Linda and the prosecution. It had come to light that Matt and Vanessa had been seen at a jewelry store in the weeks after the incident, and that they'd been looking at wedding rings. It seemed implausible that they would consider getting married if they'd only been dating for such a short time. But stranger things have happened. They also found Vanessa's demeanor to be deceitful, either because she was lying or because she was withholding information that could prove detrimental to Matt's case. To get to the truth, Vanessa was ordered to testify in Matt's case, where she would come face to face with a grand jury. To ensure her full cooperation, Vanessa was told that she would not face any consequences as a result of her testimony. But she was told that if she was found to be lying under oath, she would be charged with perjury. When she finally appeared in court, she insisted that she had told the police the truth. But she would then suddenly make a startling confession when asked whether Matt had ever discussed that night with her. She confessed that during one of their meetings, he told her that he wanted to tell her what had happened and that he would only do it this one time. After that, it would never be discussed again. His exact words to Vanessa were, I killed her for you. When speaking with Vanessa about the crimes against Carrie, he went into further detail, telling her that he'd emptied out a few of Carrie's medication capsules and replaced their contents with Ambien. He then made sure that Carrie took them and when she started to get drowsy, he helped her to the bedroom. There, he handcuffed her to the bed and she soon drifted off. He remembered that she started snoring and this is when he enacted his plan. He kissed her on the forehead, told her to give Cassidy a hug for him, then started smothering her with the pillow. When his heinous act was complete, he uncuffed her and typed out the note that was found beside Carrie, making sure to rub it on her hands so that her fingerprints would be present. He then staged the scene and left the house to ensure that he would have an alibi. The police officers who attended the scene never thought to check Matt's computer, which they soon discovered still contained the note that he had typed, and it was never confiscated as evidence. She also revealed that Matt had sent her an MP3 file of the All-American Rejects song, Dirty Little Secret. And I think the implications are clear here. He told her to keep all of this information to herself, lest she wanted to become his next regret. It should be noted that by this point, Matt and Vanessa were no longer dating as she had already ended the relationship. Linda was elated at the news that so much information was gathered against Matt, and he was arrested once again in March of 2009. He was again charged with ending Carrie's life, but this time the prosecution would have Vanessa on their side, something that would likely not have set well with Matt. It took about four years to get to this point, but for everyone who was close to Carrie, the wait was well worth it just to see justice done. Matt continued to profess his innocence and insisted that he and Vanessa never had an affair. The court and everyone in attendance were expecting Matt and his defense attorney, Guy James Gray, to continue asserting that he never had been intimate with Vanessa. But to everyone's surprise, Gray stood up in court and proclaimed that he had been fooled by his client, who now admitted that he had cheated on his wife. He would later admit that this revelation took the wind out of his sails and that he no longer wanted to defend Matt, since it went against his policy to defend someone that he didn't have 100% confidence in. He requested to be removed from the case, but Matt insisted that he remain with his lawyer, and the court agreed. He did state that just because Matt wouldn't initially own up to the fact that he'd been unfaithful, 
it didn't mean that he was guilty. Though the fact that he'd been lying for almost four years painted him in a less than favorable light. Instead, he focused on Carrie's depression after Cassidy passed away. He reiterated that she was using a mix of medications that included sleeping pills, and that this would have made it easy for her to end her own life. But we can't forget the fact that she was never prescribed Ambien specifically, even though Ambien was found to have been in her system. Furthermore, he reminded the jury that no cause of death had been established, and hence they couldn't convict anyone of claiming her life. But luckily, Matt wasn't the only one who was aware of Carrie's state of mind. Many of her friends told investigators that although she was finding it hard to deal with her daughter's passing, she was no longer depressed. This was confirmed by her grief counselor, who had also shared another detail from the case. During her testimony, Linda told the court that the grief counselor spoke to her one day and told her that Carrie had found crushed up pills in Matt's suitcase. She also revealed that she was afraid of Matt, or rather, afraid that he was planning to harm her in one way or another. She questioned Matt about the pills, but he assured her that they didn't belong to him, and that they'd likely been put in his briefcase by one of the people present at a youth center where he worked. He told her that as soon as he realized they were in his briefcase, he reported it to the youth center's security, but no record of such a report was ever found. As the case continued, more and more of Matt's statements about that night just didn't seem to make sense, and it seemed as though his case was starting to fall apart. The prosecution then started focusing on his claims of what happened after he found Carrie unresponsive. They expressed their doubts about his ability to not only dress Carrie in just four minutes without any help, but also the fact that he'd performed CPR while talking to the 911 operator on his phone. He'd also stated that he found Carrie lying on her back with her arms outstretched. But photos from the scene prove that lividity had already set in. This term means that a deceased person's blood has started to settle towards the lowest parts of their body. Since the photos show that more lividity had occurred on Carrie's left arm, they suggested that this arm may have been hanging off the bed, which is contradictory to the way Matt claimed to have found her. The next witness to take the stand was a man who owned a website in Japan. He told the court that his online pharmacy section of his website was accessed by Matt before Carrie's passing and that he placed an order for Ambien, but that he failed to complete the transaction. The case had grown in intensity by this point. There was still no telling what the jury would decide, but the atmosphere in the courtroom was about to get even more intense, as the time had come for Vanessa to take the stand. When asked whether she had lied about having an affair with Matt, Vanessa immediately admitted that she had been untruthful. She then recounted meeting Matt in church one day in 2005. At the time, she was in the process of getting divorced and had been having a difficult time adjusting to life as a single mother. She went to church and was sitting by herself when Matt sat down next to her and they started talking. They would often meet up after that and at times he would talk to Vanessa about Carrie. He explained that she was growing ever more depressed and that she wasn't taking care of their children anymore. Given that he was her minister, Vanessa believed every word and so didn't find it strange that he'd asked her to come to his house for counseling. While praying together, he took hold of her hands and kissed her, which caught her off guard, and she stated that this is when the affair started. He would then often tell her that he wanted Carrie out of his life, and that he had, on several occasions, spoken about ways in which he could end her life without being caught. He considered drugging a milkshake, tampering with her car's brakes, or ending her life in a drive-by. He'd also spoken about making it seem as though she had taken too many sleeping pills. He'd even gone as far as to tell her what date on which he planned to end Carrie's life, the 7th of April, 2006, since this was close to the date that Cassidy had passed away. Committing the act on this date would make it easy for him to claim that Carrie had taken her own life since it was close to the anniversary of Cassidy's passing, and hence would make his claims that she was depressed more believable. Unfortunately, Vanessa kept all of this information to herself rather than reporting it to the police and preventing Matt from claiming the life of his wife in the first place. It's a factor in this case that Linda still struggles to come to terms with, especially since Vanessa had been granted immunity and could not be charged for withholding such information. Vanessa claimed that she chose not to speak up because she was worried that no one would believe her given Matt's position as a minister. She also didn't think that he would do the same thing to her, despite being told by him that she would become his next regret if she didn't keep his secret. 
In Matt's defense, Gray asked an expert witness about DNA found on the note that was found next to Carrie. He testified that Carrie's DNA was by far the most abundant, which indicated to the defense that she had indeed typed it and printed it out, since she would have handled the paper more than anyone else. Soon enough, the trial was over, and all that was left was for the jury to make their decision. They left the courtroom, and Linda, along with the prosecution, were hopeful that they would return quickly, since this is usually a good sign that a guilty verdict had been reached. But over the next seven hours, their hopes started to fade, as the jury asked to see Matt's deposition video, a transcript of Vanessa's testimony, and for clarification on whether Matt could only be found guilty of drugging and suffocating Carrie. As the defense had not decided to put Matt on the stand, the jury would have to rely on witness statements and those made by Vanessa, since the prosecution was not allowed to question him in court. Guy James Gray had lost all confidence in his client and was concerned that he would incriminate himself if he were to testify since the prosecution had planned for Matt to reenact his actions that night with the use of a dummy that weighed about the same as Carrie. Had this been done, he would undoubtedly have struggled to demonstrate dressing the dummy while on the phone and his case would likely have fallen apart very quickly. But in the end, this made very little difference, as the jury eventually returned and announced that they had found Matt guilty of taking the life of Carrie Baker. And even then, Matt claimed that they made a mistake and that he truly believed in his own innocence. The verdict resulted in Matt being sentenced to 65 years behind bars with the possibility of parole after serving a minimum of 32 years. This man most likely will never leave prison. In the years that have passed since the crime occurred, Linda and the rest of Carrie's family have since forgiven Matt for what he did, since they realized that holding on to a grudge this big could only lead to further misery in their lives. Holding on to this level of resentment, it's like punching yourself and hoping someone else gets hurt. At some point, you just have to stop and admit that what is, is. They've made peace with the fact that Carrie's passing could have been prevented by one person who knew of his plans and the fact that she would ultimately face no consequences for withholding such valuable information. Linda and Jim have now been given custody of Kinsey and Grace, and they continue to live as a loving family in defiance of the heinous acts committed by a man who many people trusted as an advisor, a spiritual guide, and a mentor. This case is another shining example that just because someone claims to be a Christian, a minister of God's word, or any plethora of things, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a good person or that they're even being truthful. A person's true intentions are almost always seen in their actions, not their words. I've said it before and I feel that it fits here as well, Matt was not a Christian man. Matt was not a man of God. He was a wolf in a sheep's den and he was out for blood. To him, I say good riddance. And I hope with every fiber of my being that he's able to turn his life around in prison but I think we all have to admit this is probably a long shot. Rachel Mellon Skemp was 13 years old when she went missing after staying home from school one day in 1996 because of a sore throat. She was curled up in a blanket with pillows when she went missing later that day. 26 years later, there's no trace of her. Not even the blanket or the pillows have been found. But detectives did find a disturbing diary entry written just days before she vanished and it might reveal her kidnapper. Rachel Mellon Skemp was born in October of 1982. She lived in Bolingbrook, Illinois and attended the BJ Ward Middle School. While she was doing great in school, managing to get amazing grades and make her way onto the honors list, her home life was a much darker story. Rachel had been the victim of abuse for most of her childhood. Her parents, Jeff and Amy Skemp, had split up when Rachel was very young, less than three years old. By 1985, Amy had moved on to someone else, a man named Vincent Mellon. Vincent offered to take Rachel in and raise her as his own, hence how her last name ended up being hyphenated as Mellon Skimp. Before long, Amy and Vincent had two more children, a son named Jason, who was born in 1988, and a daughter, Ashley, who was born in 1990. While the family kept good appearances from the outside, 
What was happening behind closed doors was far worse than any of their peers could have imagined. Rachel was being raised in a literal house of horrors, being subjected to unspeakable evils at the hands of her parents, most notably her supposedly kind and caring stepfather. Amy and Vincent had been together for around five years when the true colors of Vincent had begun to show. To people like you and I, he doesn't look like anything other than your average guy, no one you'd really think twice about. However, for Rachel and for the rest of the family, they couldn't help but think of him every hour of the day, mostly because they were scared. They were afraid of his explosive personality. Vincent was a time bomb just waiting to blow. It was 1990 when things began to take a turn for the family. Vince and Amy had been arguing about God knows what when Vincent began to grow more and more angry with each passing moment. In a fit of blind rage, a feeling Vince knew all too well, he backed Amy up to the staircase of their home and pushed her down the stairs. Amy went tumbling down, but thankfully she wasn't injured too badly. After she recovered, she went straight to the police and filed for a restraining order against Vince, which appears to have been granted to her. Before long, though, Amy decided that she wanted to make amends with Vince and decided to drop the charges against him. I can't say I would have agreed with this decision, but that's what she decided to do. But as you might expect, their reignited love didn't last long. And Vince very quickly put an end to what could have been a new beginning when he continued his abuse towards the family now turning his attention towards Rachel as well. Before long, Vince was back to his old habits and had now begun to make threats against the lives of both Amy and Rachel. It seemed that contrary to what he led Amy to believe, he never truly accepted Rachel as his own and always kept her at a safe distance, using her as leverage any time the two got into a disagreement. By 1995, Rachel had finally had enough. She was only 12 years old when she ran away from home. She kept running until she made her way to a friend's house. She never went inside the house and it doesn't even seem like she ever knocked on the door. She found a safe place outside the home and slept there for the night, waiting until the next morning to reach out to her grandparents for help. Her grandparents showed up and took her home, placing her right back into the hands of her cold and callous abuser. Later that summer, Rachel was allowed to spend a few weeks with her biological father, who now lived in Texas. While she was in Texas, she begged her uncle to allow her to move to Dallas. It doesn't seem like she explained the full details of the situation to him because surely he would have helped her out if he'd known just how bad things truly were. But unfortunately, her pleas fell on deaf ears. No matter how hard Rachel begged, she was later forced to go back home to live with her mother and the living, breathing monster that she called her stepdad. By the fall of 1995, Rachel had begun her seventh year of school at the BJ Ward Middle School. Rachel was quite popular at school, and to an outsider, she was a little girl who seemed to have it all. She was a great kid with good grades, countless friends, and seemed to be super happy. Only her closest friends knew about the darkness that overshadowed her home life. Rachel's best friend was a girl named Carrie. Carrie remembers Rachel as being full of joy in life. Nothing ever seemed to bring Rachel down. In more recent months, Rachel had taken an interest in recycling and protecting the environment, and even began to dip her toes into the world of music and dance. Her school life and social life was looking up, but her home life was about to take a grim turn. A few months later, in January of 1996, Carrie found Rachel crying by her locker. This wasn't something Rachel had ever done before. No one had ever seen the happy-go-lucky girl cry before. When a few of her friends asked what was wrong, Rachel wouldn't tell them. All she would explain was that she wasn't feeling well and had a problem that she would take care of herself. She shut her friends out and wouldn't answer any other questions. This was the last time that any of her friends would ever see Rachel. After she left school that day, she never returned. She called in sick the following day with a sore throat. Then she vanished. It was January 31st, 1996. Rachel was home from school alongside her stepdad, Vince, who had been unemployed for a while. This was a particularly chilly winter day, with temperatures reaching around negative 20, with strong gusts of wind and snow flurries. 
Rachel and her stepfather were essentially snowed in with nowhere else to go. At around 10.45 that morning, Rachel called her grandmother to thank her for the Christmas gifts that she'd recently sent over for her. I can't tell for sure, but this conversation appears to have been with her maternal grandmother or her mother's mother. The reason I say this is because towards the end of the call, her grandmother, Lucy, noticed that Rachel had begun to get very quiet. Lucy picked up on this and asked, is he there? Referring to Vince. Rachel simply replied, yes. And a moment later, she said that she needed to go. According to Vince, Rachel hung up the phone and the two played Nintendo for a while. After about an hour, Vince says that Rachel decided to go to her room for a nap. She was wearing yellow pants, red slippers, and a pink sweatshirt. She wrapped herself in a blue blanket, hopped onto her bed, and went to sleep. This was allegedly the last time anyone saw Rachel, but her story only gets more twisted and disturbing from here. At around 2.30 p.m., Vince says that he checked in on Rachel and noticed that she was still sleeping. The following series of events takes place from Vince's point of view, detailing the information that he relayed to police later on that day. Vince says that he left the home after checking on Rachel and headed out to walk the dog. Keep in mind, it's negative 20 degrees with strong winds and serious snowfall. He says that despite this, he walked the dog for a full 30 minutes before heading back home. But on his way back home, their dog, a German shepherd named Duke, noticed a rabbit running through a field that they passed by. Vince says that Duke slipped out of his collar and took off after the rabbit. Vince didn't even try to get Duke back on his leash. He just walked away and left him there, running off into the unknown. Vince explained that he felt that Duke would find his way home later that day, but he didn't. Vince returned home around 3 p.m. that afternoon. He says he didn't bother to check in on Rachel. He just went about his daily doings. By 3.15, Rachel's young sister had returned home from school and immediately noticed that Rachel was missing from her bedroom. Her sister asked about her, but Vince wasn't concerned. We don't know if he made up an excuse or genuinely just couldn't care less, but either way, Vince never looked for her. Several hours later, a real estate agent was passing by the area when she noticed a dog running in a field near the melon hole. She recognized the dog as Duke and quickly called him over, taking him back to his family. This was sometime between 4.30 and 5 p.m. Amy, Rachel's mother, returned home around this same time alongside their son, Jason. When Amy noticed that Rachel was missing, she immediately called the police to help investigate. Now, fair warning, this case is about to get extremely dark. You guys know I won't get into any details that are too gruesome, but the implications here are gonna be very clear. When police arrived at the family's home a couple hours later, they began their investigation with a search of Rachel's bedroom. It didn't take them long to realize that something wasn't quite right here. The evidence that had been left behind, coupled with the information that Vince provided, just didn't add up. Something was wrong and the police were determined to get to the bottom of it. Police found several key pieces of evidence that pointed toward Rachel being kidnapped. For starters, they noticed that her coat, shoes, wallet, purse, and her Sony Walkman were all left behind. These were items that Rachel took everywhere with her, regardless of where she was going. Plus, on a negative 20 degree day, why would Rachel have left behind her coat and especially her shoes? The blue blanket that she kept on her bed was also missing, as were two of her favorite pillows. After being alarmed by the missing items, the police checked the front door of the home and found that there were no signs of forced entry. Vince explained that when he left to take the dog for a walk, he left the door unlocked, so if someone had snuck in while he was gone, this would explain why there was no damage done to the door. But investigators soon noticed something very strange. Vince's arms had been covered in scratch marks, some of which looked quite painful. When the detectives asked where these marks had come from, he said that he'd been working on a car earlier that day and had gotten scraped and cut while reaching inside the engine bay. If you ask me, this information doesn't make much sense. As someone who works on vehicles more days than not, a couple bumps and scrapes and bruises are common, but these types of minor injuries don't compare to the scratches and cuts that were described as being on Vince's arms. An intense search of the area was conducted by police, both on the ground and by air. No signs of Rachel ever turned up. Police even went as far as checking with local airports to make sure that she didn't try to book a flight to Dallas to visit her father, but there was no sign of her during their investigation. But this is where things really begin to paint a chilling portrait of Vince. 
Now, if you're a survivor of abuse, I wanna make sure to let you know that this next segment might trigger you. So maybe skip ahead a little bit and just know that Vince had feelings for Rachel that extended far beyond her simply being his stepdaughter. Police began investigating Rachel's room and soon found her diary. She wrote in her diary quite often and would detail all of her emotions, experiences, and her abuse. Police were particularly shaken by one particular page in which she revealed several crimes that her father had committed against her. Rachel explained that one day in August of 1995, Vince had entered her room and had begun to kiss her, among other things. According to her diary, Vince said that he was doing this so that she would know how predators acted so that she could avoid them. But there was no avoiding her father. Police also found an out of print book titled Daddy Kisses that details father daughter relationships for lack of a better phrase. But most chilling of all, police found one particularly shocking piece of evidence under Rachel's pillow, a knife. I wanted to add something that I remembered while editing this video. A viewer named Ashley McCoy pointed out that Drew Peterson was one of the lead investigators on this case working for the Bolingbrook PD. Drew is a man with a very dark history. He'd been married four times and he's currently in prison for the murder of his third wife. But get this, his fourth wife went missing and she's never been found. I say all of this because there are rumors circulating online that the detective may have been friends with Rachel's stepdad. Now, I haven't been able to find any evidence to confirm this, but it's a rumor that's been circulating for a while. I don't want to be the one to point fingers in the wrong direction, but the implications here are very serious. At 6 p.m. on the evening that Rachel went missing, Carrie, Rachel's best friend, heard the news. Carrie gathered a group of friends from school and explained what had happened, and they all headed out to help search for her. They spent over an hour outside in the blistering cold, desperately searching for their lost friend, but they came up empty-handed. They searched all of the nearby streets and parks, but she had simply vanished. Carrie says that at this moment, all of the friends huddled together and began crying, realizing that their friend was truly gone, but hopefully not forever. It was around this same time that Jeff Skemp, Rachel's biological father, received the call, telling him that his daughter was missing. Jeff quit his job, effective immediately, and got on the first flight that he could to Illinois so that he could help search for her. While Jeff may not have been around for much of Rachel's childhood, he was the father that Rachel had needed all along, not Vince. By the time he arrived at the home of Amy and Vince, there wasn't much that could be done. He headed to Rachel's room and laid down on her bed. He grabbed her Walkman and put on the headphones, then pressed play. Rachel had been listening to a song called Hand in My Pocket. It was her favorite. She'd mentioned how much she liked the song when she spent the summer with her father just a few months earlier. Jeff says that while he was at Rachel's home, he confronted Vince about what had happened. Jeff says that the only response that Vince offered was that Rachel must have been snatched while he was out walking the dog. By all means, Vince seemed largely unconcerned. Ever since that day, in 1996, Jeff has kept the same phone number, hoping that at some point, Rachel may try to reach out to him. But she never has. In January of 2000, a grand jury managed to retrieve a warrant to take DNA samples from Vince. On January 29th, police picked up Vince from his home and kept him in custody for more than nine hours while they interrogated him and took the aforementioned samples. During their time speaking with Vince, he refused to answer many of the questions pertaining to Rachel's disappearance. He was ultimately forced to hand over samples of his DNA and hair, and police had officially begun to investigate him under suspicion of first-degree murder. This investigation came after rumors had begun to spread, claiming that Rachel may have been pregnant, and the baby may have belonged to Vince. Granted, without Rachel being found, there's no tangible evidence to support this theory. However, the entries in Rachel's diary are seriously concerning, and personally, this is a theory I could pretty easily get behind. Vince was also given a lie detector test, and he failed. Amy was questioned by police later on as well, but she found no reason to believe that Vince may have been involved. Now, this may have been because she was blinded by her love for him, or it could have been because she knew him better than anyone, and while he may have had his flaws, he wasn't a murderer. If you ask me, I don't believe that for one second, though. 
Amy was given a lie detector test as well, and she passed. But after this, both Amy and Vince have refused to help police with the investigation, which was a seriously unexpected turn. Amy and Vince both refused to hold any memorial services for Rachel. It wouldn't be until 2002 when the city of Bolingbrook took matters into their own hands, planting a tree and erecting a plaque in honor of Rachel placing it directly across the street from her former home. To take things a step further, the Bolingbrook Police Department has openly and clearly stated that they have every reason to believe that Vince murdered his daughter. However, without finding her body, they can't charge him. Both Jeff and Carrie have cemented themselves at the forefront of this investigation. While Amy and Vince have refused to help in any way since 1996, neither Jeff nor Carrie have forgotten and they continue to press on with bringing awareness to Rachel's disappearance, hoping that one day the case may finally see justice and Vince will be arrested or whoever Rachel's kidnapper was if Vince truly is proven to be innocent. The Bolingbrook police still consider the disappearance of Rachel Mellon Skimp to be an active investigation. So if you have any information in Rachel's case, absolutely anything at all, you're asked to reach out to the Bolingbrook police at 630-226-0600. Wherever Rachel may be, it's my hope and prayer that she finally found the peace that she so desperately had been longing for. Hannah Cornelius was a 21-year-old woman from South Africa who was spending the evening out with her friend, Cheslin. As they were sitting in their car, talking about the great time that they just had together, four unidentified men approached their vehicle and kidnapped them. Only one of the two friends would make it out alive. Detectives soon uncovered a crime scene unlike anything they had witnessed before. So I want to be clear, this case is by far the worst, most heartbreaking, and most disgusting case I've ever covered. And I'm not saying that to hype up the video. I say that as a warning. This case is just awful from beginning to end, so much so that I strongly considered scrapping the whole thing and just covering a different story. But the truth is, no matter how tragic and how haunting these cases are, the victim's stories deserve to be heard, and Hannah deserves to be remembered. With that said... This is the story of Hannah Cornelius. Hannah Cornelius lived in Stellenbosch, South Africa, but was born in Western Cape. From a young age, Hannah was always a very happy young girl. She was very close with her family, most of whom appear to have lived in Cape Town, about 45 minutes away from Stellenbosch. Anyone with eyes understands that Hannah was a beautiful young woman, and her parents, Willem and Anna, were incredibly proud of her. She'd done great in school as a teenager and was destined for success. According to one source, Hannah was doing remarkably well in her university studies, getting an 85% on her most recent final, studying for a BA in Humanities, a field that's predominantly focused on human history and literature. Outside of her schooling, Hannah was an excellent piano player and always dreamed of traveling to Paris to see all the historic sites that the town has to offer. She was also an advocate for animal welfare, but I don't know to what extent she was involved in the more recent animal rights movements. Hannah came from a well-established family, with her father being the former magistrate of Simonstown. While her childhood appears to have been great, all things considered, she did have a somewhat difficult home life at times due to her younger brother who suffers from severe autism. While many people with autism are able to still live relatively normal lives, her brother wasn't so lucky, as he requires round-the-clock care and has more recently been sent to an assisted living facility. Hannah had a number of friends who looked up to her and were there for her whenever she needed them. One of these friends was Cheslin Marsh. The interesting thing about Cheslin is that we don't really know how close he and Hannah were, though. I've seen various reports about the two, with some saying that the two were in a relationship, while others say that they were just friends. In fact, one report claims that the two had only met the night before the crime. Regardless of their relationship status, though, it seems safe to assume that these two had a very tight bond with one another, and Cheslin cared for Anna deeply. As fate would have it, Cheslin was with Anna on the evening that things went terribly wrong for her. What was supposed to be a relaxing, fun night out in town ended in what could very easily be described as one of the most gruesome, heinous crimes in Stellenbosch's history.
It was May 27th, 2017. Hannah and Cheslin had spent the night out drinking and dancing and had returned to their home at around 3.30 a.m. that Saturday morning. CCTV footage shows the two pulling into a parking lot in Hannah's blue and white Volkswagen Golf. After pulling into the lot, Hannah and Cheslin spend a fair amount of time chatting with one another, waiting to head inside to get some much needed rest. As they're sitting in their car though, four men walk by, men who were later identified as suspects in this case. These four men were on their way to a nearby apartment when they happened to walk by Hannah's car, noticing that two people were inside. It was at this point that their plans for the evening changed. The four men approached the car and without hesitation began to attack both Cheslin and Hannah. Police say that Cheslin was forced into the back seat of the car while Hannah was pinned in between the front two seats. After a few moments, CCTV footage shows Hannah's car driving away after one of the four men had fled the scene, catching back up with the gang later on. At 4.30 a.m., the car is seen pulling into a gas station parking lot. This was about an hour after the initial altercation, even though the footage was taken only a few miles away. By this point, Cheslin had been forced into the back of the car, with Hannah being restrained in the front passenger seat. As far as we know, this was the last time Hannah would be seen alive. One of the suspects soon exits the vehicle and enters the gas station, heading toward an ATM. He had stolen Cheslin's bank card and attempted to make a withdrawal from his account, but Cheslin had given him the wrong PIN number, meaning the suspect left empty-handed. The man was obviously angry about this and vowed that Cheslin would be punished later on. The men drove away from the gas station and police ultimately lost track of them for several hours. One of the suspects would later reveal to officers that Hannah remained quiet and stoic for the remainder of the drive. She didn't say one word to any of the men, nor did she obey any of their demands. She simply stared straight in front of her, silent for the remainder of the drive. It would be around 5.30 to 6 a.m. that the men pulled over into a secluded area, with Cheslin saying that it was still dark out at this point. He had been stowed away in the back of the car for nearly two hours by now, but the perpetrators soon opened the hatch and forced him out of the car, telling him to lay down on the ground and place his head onto a brick. We don't know for sure what took place next, but Cheslin says that the last thing he remembers is closing his eyes and praying, begging for forgiveness for whatever he had done to end up in this situation. He mentioned seeing two of the men holding bricks in their hands, but he has no idea what they did with these bricks, though I think it's pretty safe to assume what took place. The criminals believed that Cheslin had lost his life, so they abandoned him and drove Hannah several more miles away to an even more secluded location, this time in a patch of woods located just behind a paintball venue. Hannah pleaded with her attackers, offering to allow them to do whatever they wanted to her, only asking in return that she be allowed to leave with her life. The suspects say that despite her pleas and bargaining, she fought back every step of the way and wasn't going to make things easy for them. She refused to willingly exit the car once they arrived at the paintball venue, with the men prying her from the hatch before tossing her into the woods and taking advantage of her time and time and time again. After the men were done, they put her back inside of the car and drove her several more miles out to an area of secluded farmland. By this point, it's safe to assume that the sun had begun to rise, so the men needed to act quickly if they wanted to get away with their crimes without getting caught with Hannah's stolen car. Once they arrived on the farm, they pulled Hannah from the car, then attempted to end her suffering using a knife. When that began to take too long, the men forced her to lay on the ground, all the while she was begging with her every breath for the men to just leave her be. It was at this point that the men picked up an 80-pound rock from nearby and dropped it on top of Hannah, bringing the worst night of her life to a tragic, horrific conclusion. The gang then abandoned the crime scene, but their night of terror still wasn't over. Early the next morning, the men arrived back in town and chased down a woman who was walking to work. They ran after her until she ultimately tripped and fell, stealing her purse and other belongings and leaving her there, thankfully not going any further than just stealing her possessions. Unfortunately, a third woman wouldn't be quite so lucky. A few miles away, a third victim was kidnapped and robbed, but we don't know the extent of her injuries. As best I can tell, she seems to have gotten away without anything serious happening, but it's safe to assume that her life would never be the same after this, regardless of her making it out alive and with her dignity intact. By the following day, around 2 p.m., only two of the four men remained with Hannah's car. The men had been traveling through Stellenbosch once again. 
By this point, it appears as though police had been on the lookout for Hannah's missing car, and an undercover agent happened to notice the car pass by, with two unidentified men inside of it. The undercover cop called for backup, and before long, a high-speed chase ensued. The men drove police dozens of miles down the road to yet another area of farmland where they would abandon the car near a field and take off on foot. Thankfully, the two men were captured by officers and they were taken in for questioning. By the following morning, Cheslin had finally woken after being so badly beaten by his kidnappers. He somehow survived the horrific encounter with these men, but he certainly left the scene of the crime with more than a few scars and an unbelievable story to tell investigators. As he woke up, he headed toward a nearby series of houses and began begging for help. When he was taken to the hospital, doctors revealed that he, by all accounts, shouldn't even be alive. He ended up going deaf in one ear, but as far as I can tell, he didn't have any other lasting effects from the attack and appears to have made a full recovery. I can't confirm this with any certainty, but he seems to be doing okay these days. Cheslin obviously went to the police and reported what had happened. Thankfully, police had already picked up two of the perpetrators, and it didn't take long for the suspects to begin to turn on one another, each of them blaming the others for the crimes. At this point, it doesn't appear that police knew that Hannah had lost her life, but they would soon uncover all of the gruesome details of that evening and what these four men had truly been up to that night. Now, unfortunately, this is where the case gets a bit muddied. Every source I've found seems to tell a different side of the story, and most of these stories don't align with one another. All I can say for sure is that the four men continually blamed one another for the crimes, with each of the men pleading their innocence at trial. In fact, two of these monsters confessed to certain aspects of the crime during their interrogation, but when it came time for their trial, they claimed they weren't guilty. I'm not sure how they thought they were going to get out of this after being filmed during their confession, with this confession being used against them as evidence in court. They also had Cheslin as an eyewitness testifying against them, but regardless, they all claimed that they had nothing to do with the crime. Thankfully, though, Cheslin managed to heal enough in time for the trial that he was able to tell the judge and jury everything that he had gone through, though he appears to have been nearly suffering a panic attack throughout the entirety of his testimony. The only problem is that he wasn't around for Hannah's final moments, so he couldn't help out much in that aspect of the case. But in reality, it doesn't seem like police needed much help in pinning these men for the crime. After all, their DNA and fingerprints were all over Hannah's car. Their DNA was found across every inch of the crime scene, and two of the men were caught red-handed in Hannah's vehicle. This case was about as open and shut as it could possibly be, but if that weren't enough, there were also the two additional victims that the suspects attacked the following morning. I can't wrap my head around how any of these four men thought they would get away with even one of their crimes. Someone had witnessed almost every single aspect of the case, obviously excluding what took place in the woods that night, but the DNA that was found at the scene painted a very clear picture for detectives. At trial, three of the four men who took Hannah's life were given a life sentence. One of the men got away with a slightly lesser sentence because there was no evidence tying him to Hannah's final moments. In total, the men received a combined 358 years in prison, with the crowd of people who attended the hearing cheering as their sentences were read. But honestly, one of the worst aspects of this case is how the suspects acted during the trial. All throughout their time in the stand, they were making faces at the victim's family, telling jokes to one another, laughing and smiling, and throwing hand gestures at the crowd of people. One of the men even made suggestive remarks toward the judge who was reading the gang's sentence. These four men were all the lowest of low, true monsters that deserve everything they'll get behind bars, but the story isn't over just yet. As I'm sure all of you know, one of the biggest crimes in a situation like this, believe it or not, isn't actually what happened to the victim. It's what happens to the victim's loved ones who are left to face another day without the people they hold closest. The real tragedy is the families and friends of those who were taken away far too soon, who now have to figure out how their world is gonna keep turning when such a pillar in their lives has been stolen. You may have heard the phrase, the mercy of life is that it just keeps going, but for some people, it doesn't. Hannah's mother, Anna, lost her way after Hannah lost her life. Hannah was so deeply involved in her parents' lives that for Anna, it was just too much to bear. 
Anna had a remarkably difficult time coming to terms with the loss of her daughter. She went through all of the daily motions, but nothing mattered anymore. In the words of Hannah's father, when Hannah died, so did our family. The following year in 2018, Anna would head out on one of her daily swimming exercises. But on this particular day, she didn't make her usual rounds. She didn't make her usual laps around the ocean. Instead, she jumped into the water, swam into the distance, and just kept swimming. Her body was found washed ashore several days later. The pain of her daughter's loss was too much to bear, and Anna would ultimately lose her battle with depression. Anna's father would later speak about the loss of his wife and daughter, saying, Me and my son, we're not a family. We're the survivors who live in the ruins of what once was. If all of this weren't bad enough, Willem would soon be diagnosed with cancer. He fought a short battle before the illness overtook him, and he too lost his life. This left behind Hannah's brother, who's now being cared for in an assisted living facility due to severe autism. It's very likely her brother's unable to comprehend what his family went through and why his parents and sister no longer come to see him. This, this is the true tragedy in cases like this. In June of 1930, Joseph Mozinski left work one evening, telling his wife he was heading out to run some errands. In reality, Joseph was continuing a two-year affair with his 19-year-old mistress, Catherine May. Catherine and Joseph were sitting together in a parked car in Queens, New York, when an unidentified man approached the vehicle, and without warning, fired two rounds at Joseph, ending his life instantly. The mysterious man then handed Catherine a note, telling her not to read it until the following day. He then walked Catherine to a bus stop and left her there unharmed. Catherine did not immediately report the crime to the police. Instead, she waited until they approached her about a coat that she left behind that evening. She then handed the note over to investigators. Investigators were stunned by this note, partly because of the crazy story Catherine had shared about that evening, but also because the note didn't make any sense. All the note said was Joseph Mozinski, 3X3-X-097. Police had no leads in this case until they received a letter in the mail, describing Joseph as a rascal and a dirty rat. This letter warned detectives that 14 more of Joseph's friends would soon be joining him. Just a couple days later, police found another body. When police spoke with Catherine May about the night in question back in June of 1930, she gave conflicting accounts about what really took place that evening. You've got to keep in mind, this story unfolded nearly a hundred years ago, and the world was a much different place back then. Catherine was devastated by what had transpired, and rightfully so. There was a much bigger social impact here than what we may be accustomed to these days. See, Catherine had an image to uphold, so when police began interrogating her about what happened that evening, she repeatedly tried to cover her tracks and save herself from public ridicule. It's believed that this is why Catherine never even went to the police after the crime had taken place. She knew she'd messed up by having an affair with a married man, and if she informed police about it, it would only have made matters worse. So she did her best to conceal her true intentions that evening. When asked about the crime, Catherine first told police that she believed the suspect was an Italian gangster, specifically pinning a man named Albert Lombardo. But as police pressed her about this, they quickly realized that she was lying. In more recent years, many people believe that these accusations were racially or ethnically motivated, and that would certainly align with the average public opinion at the time. Officers realized rather quickly, though, that Catherine wasn't being entirely truthful. And when pressed about this, Catherine did eventually confess that her story was untrue. And that's when she began to change her tone. She finally explained that the man appeared to have a thick German accent. Worse yet, the man didn't just stop at ending Joseph's life. According to Catherine, after ending the life of Joseph, the man grabbed her and took advantage of her. He then began rummaging through Joseph's pockets, almost as if he was looking for something. He found some papers in one of Joseph's pockets. And rather strangely, he set the papers on fire then turned to Catherine and asked for her address. 
The man then grabbed Catherine and walked her to the nearest bus stop, boarding the bus alongside her as soon as it arrived. It was at this point that he handed her the aforementioned note. He accompanied her to the nearest bus station, then departed after telling her not to open the note until the following day. Catherine did not obey the man's wishes. As soon as he was out of sight, Catherine looked at the note and found an odd phrase written inside. Joseph Mozinski, 3x, 3-x-097. Now, there are conflicting reports about this note, with some sources saying that the note was handwritten, while others suggest that the phrase on the note had been stamped with red ink. Either way, Joseph's body was found the following day. With all of this unfolding, the editor of the New York Evening Journal received a bizarre letter in the mail. The letter began by saying, kindly print this letter in your paper from Ozinski's friends. This statement was followed up by a series of letters and numbers that didn't make any logical sense. The letter claimed that by printing this letter in the paper, the editor would be saving the lives of many people, saying, quote, by doing this, you may save their lives, and the women may know where the missing papers are and who has them, since they were given to Mozinski. We don't want any more crimes unless we have to. This letter was then signed, 3X, the man behind the gun. When police were informed about this letter, they looked at the postmark and found that it had been mailed out several hours before Joseph had even lost his life. This confirmed to investigators that the man behind the letter was indeed the man behind the crime. The next day, the paper did decide to report on the incident, but they never mentioned the letter in their write-up. Just a few days later, the paper would receive another letter from this elusive criminal. This time, his intentions were much more clear. It became obvious that this man wasn't going to leave until the job was done. In this letter, he clarified that Catherine May was nothing but an innocent bystander and that she had no involvement in the crime whatsoever. But he continued on and seems to have suggested that Joseph Mozinski may have been much more of a womanizer than his wife and Catherine even realized. He said rather cryptically, quote, Mozinski was nothing but a rascal, a dirty rat. Not two women as stated in the papers, but six and two young girls, one 14 and one 15, were with him in that same place. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but this seems to suggest that Joseph had been involved not only with Catherine, but at least six other women, two of whom were underage. The man continued on by saying, quote, I am the agent of a secret international order, and when I met Mozinski that night, it was to get him certain documents, but unfortunately they were not in his possession at that time. If his relative knew so much of his luck with women, maybe he would tell us what became of the following items. NYX 2673. NJ4344, Philadelphia, XV346. These papers must be returned to us at once, or 14 more of Mozinski's friends will join him. Mozinski's relatives and friends have until Monday, 12 p.m., to bring these documents to us. If no answer is received by that time, we will start merry hell for all of them. It was clear, whoever was writing these letters, they meant business, and they were going to stop at nothing to get what they believed was rightfully theirs. The letter was once again signed, 3X. On the evening of June 16th, five days after the crimes against Joseph and Catherine, Noel Sowley, a 26-year-old radio mechanic from Brooklyn, had picked up his girlfriend Betty, driving to a nearby salvage yard so the two could spend some time alone in the car. As the two sat in the vehicle, they noticed a man with a flashlight approaching. He shined the light in the window, then revealed that he was holding a weapon, aimed at Noel. This man, much like the man from the previous crime, spoke with a thick German accent and asked Noel for his driver's license. After reviewing his license, the unknown man then turned his flashlight into the distance and began flickering it in a pattern. When Noel asked what he was doing, the man said that he was telling his friends that he wouldn't be needing their assistance. The man then turned back to Noel and asked if he knew Joseph Mozinski. Noel replied no, and the man immediately fired at him. Despite his wounds, Noel was still alive and well, and managed to utter the phrase, I'm not the man you're looking for. The assailant then calmly walked to the back of the car, looked at the license plate and replied, you're the one we want, all right. You're going to get what Joe got. He then fired one more round and ended Noel's life. 3X returned to Noel's side and began searching through his pockets. He then pulled out a slip of paper and shouted, I have it. The man then turned to Betty, Noel's girlfriend, and started to advance towards her. 
She then grabbed a religious necklace that she'd been wearing, and that's when 3X decided to back off. He took Betty and, much like he did with Catherine, took her to a nearby bus stop. He handed Betty a note, and when she read it later on, it simply said, Sally 3X. Stamped in red ink, just like the letter that Catherine had received just days before. When police arrived at the scene of the crime later on, they collected several key pieces of evidence that seemed to prove that Noel certainly knew much more than he was letting on. When they searched his body, they found a newspaper clipping about the crimes against Joseph and Catherine, with the word Mozinski stamped in red ink, followed by the words, here's how, written in the margins. We don't know if Noel was the one who collected this clipping or if it had been left in his pocket by the mysterious 3X. All we know is that it was there when investigators arrived. If this weren't strange enough, investigators soon found a roll of cash that had been stashed inside of a magazine, with this being found in the back of the car. Prior to these discoveries, police still believed Catherine may have somehow been involved in the first crime. But after hearing Betty's story, they agreed that Catherine was nothing more than an innocent victim, just like 3X had said. 3X may have been nothing more than a cold-blooded monster, but he was now proven to at least be honest. Shortly after the crime was committed, the Evening Journal and police both received a letter in the mail. One of these letters contained a 23 caliber shell casing, as well as a note that mentioned Noel Sally, referring to him as V5 Sally. The letter that they received went on to state, quote, Some of our money was found on his person and the NY document. Thirteen more men and one woman will go if they do not make peace with us. It was at this point that the Evening Journal decided to post the letters they'd received from 3X, hoping this may put a stop to the crimes. Almost immediately after the publication went out, they received yet another letter. This one read, quote, Tonight, one more will go. You may let them know 3X is the man behind the gun. He asks for no quarter but will give none. On June 18th at 9 p.m., I will be at College Point to get WRV8. Police were desperate for answers in this case, and they set out on an incredible manhunt to try to bring 3X to justice before he could get a hold of whoever WRV8 was. Police were stationed all over the town that evening, but oddly, no crime was ever reported. The very next day, the Evening Journal received yet another letter. This letter was the first of its kind because it almost seemed hopeful in a strange way. It read, quote, WRV8 of CP has returned the Philadelphia XV346 to me tonight after reading your paper. Also $37,000 of blackmail money, thanks to God. The letter continued on by saying that since the items were returned, one woman and five men would have their lives spared. It's assumed that these individuals must have somehow been close with the would-be victim and that by fessing up, the man was able to save their lives. But there was a catch. The letter concluded by saying that NJ4344, as well as $39,000, were still missing. This meant that seven more men were still in danger. 3X referred to each of these men by their code names, saying that they each needed to follow orders if they wanted their lives to be spared. The threat to WRV8 may have been over, but as far as investigators knew, the real crimes had only just begun and Joseph Mozinski's brother was about to learn this the hard way. On June 19th, just eight days after Joseph Mozinski had lost his life, his brother received a letter of his own. The postmarks on this letter suggested that it had come from Philadelphia, and the writer ordered Joseph's brother, John, to deliver a series of valuable documents to him presumably referring to the aforementioned $39,000 as well as the NJ document. The letter requested that the documents be placed inside a newspaper and hidden inside the men's room at the Broad Street Station. As soon as John received the letter, he approached the police and an investigative team and explained that he had no idea what the letter was talking about, claiming to have no knowledge of these documents whatsoever. John was placed under police protection while the investigation was underway, and it seems as though John may have actually been telling the truth. This is because just two days later, investigators would receive their final letter from 3X. The letter stated, The last document, NJ4344, returned to us on the 19th at 9pm. My mission is ended. There's no further cause for worry. At this point, you're probably thinking the same thing that I was. Now that 3X's job was over, he probably planned to leave the area and never return, meaning we'll never actually find out who this man was or what he wanted. 
Well, that's not entirely true. See, 3X may have been a monster, but he wasn't one to leave loose ends. Before signing off his final letter, 3X came clean about his intentions, his origins, and why he'd shown up here in the first place. 3X explained that he was a former officer in the German army. He said that he'd been recruited by a secret organization based in Russia, known as the Red Diamond of Russia. One interesting thing to note is that when 3X signed all of his letters, he didn't technically sign them as 3X. He signed them as 3, followed by an upside-down V and a right-side-up V, giving the impression of a poorly written X. 3X went into extreme detail, explaining that the inverted V represented the Supreme Tribunal of the Order, and the normal V represented that he was a special agent. He went on to explain that Joseph Mozinski and Noel Sally both had their lives ended because they too were part of the Red Diamond of Russia. He said that they'd been affiliated with the organization, but had committed treason after joining a gang of blackmailers and smugglers. The three documents that 3X had been searching for were the property of the Red Diamond of Russia. The documents had been stolen for blackmail purposes, and it was 3X's job to get these documents back. He signed off his letter by saying that he would now be returning to Russia, clarifying that any further letters received by anyone claiming to be 3X would be considered fake. Police were interested in speaking with the family of Joseph and Noel, hoping that they'd be able to shed some light on this secret organization. But as expected, when the families were questioned, they claimed to have no knowledge of this red diamond of Russia, and even went as far as claiming that there was no way their loved ones could have been involved in such a thing. But one thing that's rather interesting is that just a month before Joseph lost his life, he deposited $8,000 into his bank account, the equivalent of around $150,000 today. It's never been publicly revealed where this money actually came from, and many suspect it could have been a payout provided by the blackmailers or the smugglers. After all was said and done, police did receive more letters from 3X, but as 3X's own letter stated, it's to be assumed that all of these future letters were nothing but fakes. Catherine and Betty were both called in on multiple occasions by police to take a look at a few people who police suspected could have been involved in the crimes. But both Catherine and Betty were able to clear each of these suspects of any involvement in the case. It's safely assumed that 3X did, in fact, return to Russia as he claimed. At this point, the case was, in a sense, solved. But neither 3X nor the Red Diamond of Russia were ever heard from again, and the identity of 3X remains a mystery. What I personally find so odd about this case is that you have to ask yourself, who's the real criminal here? As far as secret agents go, 3X seems to be a relatively level-headed person. After all, he gave each of his victims the chance to turn over the papers that were stolen, giving them the chance to have their lives spared, and 3X made good on his word. Each of the victims that did return the papers were allowed to live. That's extremely unusual in crimes like this. Most of the time, the criminal would have gotten what they wanted and claimed the lives of their victims anyway, simply for revenge, but 3X didn't. But even though 3X made good on his word, you have to remember, he took advantage of Catherine when she was a completely innocent woman, not to mention the fact that he took the lives of two other people. But you have to wonder, if Joseph and Noel were even half as honest as 3X was, would they have even ended up in this situation in the first place? I personally blame Joseph just as much as 3X for putting Catherine in such a dangerous position, whether he meant to or not, not to mention the two underage girls that he was supposedly involved with as well. Joseph Mozinski is just as much of a criminal as 3X is. It's just hard to feel bad for someone who built a life for themselves that was fueled by crime, regardless of which side of the table they were playing on. This case is still technically unsolved, but for all intents and purposes, at least in my own mind, this case has reached a perfectly reasonable conclusion. 3X showed up, took what was rightfully his, and left. It will be great to find out who this masked man really was one day and maybe even learn what was contained on those papers, but let's be real, that's simply not going to happen. Remember, this case took place nearly a hundred years ago, so even though 3X may have never seen justice in his life, he'll certainly be held accountable in the next one. The only remaining question is, whatever became of the Red Diamond of Russia? Jason Corbett was known for being a family man through and through. 
He loved his kids more than anything and was willing to do whatever it took to keep them safe and happy. But according to detectives and even some of the crime scene investigators, there was much more to Jason's story than meets the eye. Police have conflicting opinions about this case. Some officers believe that Jason truly was the family man he portrayed himself to be. But others believe he had a dark side that only showed up behind closed doors. Whatever the case, in August of 2015, Jason lost his life in one of the most vicious crimes I've ever covered here on True Crime Stories. But what makes this case so incredibly disturbing isn't just that someone took Jason's life, it's who took it and why. Jason Corbett was born and raised in Limerick, Ireland. His two children, 10-year-old Jack and 8-year-old Sarah, were the light of his world, and he did all he could to make sure that they had the best life possible. But unfortunately, Jason couldn't protect his kids from one of the most tragic days of their lives. See, when their kids were very young, their mother, Margaret, passed away unexpectedly from a severe asthma attack. Her passing came as a complete shock to the family and was particularly devastating for Jason, as you can probably imagine. While Margaret had issues with asthma in the past, no one expected her to lose her life in such a sudden, painful, and terrifying series of events. It was just so out of left field. This tragedy left Jason in a really difficult spot. Considering Jason was a plant manager for an international packaging company, his job required him to spend large amounts of time away from his children. Before, Margaret would help pick up the slack and ensure the kids had a pretty normal home life. But now that she was gone, well, it was incredibly difficult for the young family. It didn't take Jason long at all to admit that he needed help and quickly. This led him to find the help of a woman named Molly Martins, who offered to help look after the children for Jason while he was at work. But the thing about Molly is that she lived in the United States, halfway across the world from Jason in Ireland. She agreed to move in with the family, crossing the ocean over to Ireland. In, in exchange, Jason would help her get citizenship there. Truth be told, Molly didn't seem to have any nefarious intentions. She wasn't moving here with the hopes of becoming Jason's wife, nor did she plan on essentially becoming a replacement for the children's mother. But by the end of it all, that is exactly what happened. Now, Molly insists that she didn't have an ulterior motive when she moved in with Jason, but considering Jason is no longer around to tell his side of the story, we'll never really know what his intentions were. But considering this guy was so dedicated to making sure his children were safe and cared for, I'd find it hard to believe if he had any hidden intentions either. But either way, the relationship between Jason and Molly began innocently enough at first. But before long, the two had fallen for each other. But rather than remain in Ireland, the family now decided that their best chance at getting a fresh start would be to move to the United States. And that's exactly what they did, finding a place to call home in Davidson County, North Carolina. That same year, Jason and Molly officially tied the knot and got married. Everything went amazingly well for the family for the first several years. Jason went to work at the packaging plant while Molly helped out around the house and with the children, and eventually even took on a role of a children's swimming coach. But by the end of August of 2015, things had changed. In the early hours of the morning, a 911 call rang through to emergency operators. On the other end of the line was Molly's father, Tom. My daughter's husband, um, my son-in-law, um, got in a fight with my daughter. I intervened, and I, I think um, he's in bad shape. We need help. Okay, what do you mean he's in bad shape? He's hurt? He's, he's bleeding all over, and I, I may have killed him. Molly's father, Tom, a former FBI agent, had been spending some time with the family, visiting with his daughter, her new husband, and his newfound grandchildren. When the entire family was asleep, but all of a sudden, around 3 a.m. in the morning, Molly says that Sarah, their youngest daughter, woke up from a bad dream in a panic, believing that the fairies that were printed on her bedsheets were actually lizards and bugs. Molly ran in to calm the girl down with Jason close behind. But Molly suggests that rather than being calm and understanding of the girl's bad dream, Jason flew into a fit of rage. He began shouting at Molly as if this were somehow her fault. The two quickly got into a heated argument, and that's when Jason reportedly grabbed Molly by the throat. 
And that's when Tom walked in and, as he put it, intervened. By the time Tom was finished with Jason, he was left lying on the floor, bleeding profusely. Tom immediately called 911 for help. The 911 operator told Tom how to administer CPR, and he and Molly took turns doing this until paramedics arrived, less than 10 minutes later. But by the time they got to Jason's side, there was nothing they could do. He was gone. To say they found Jason in a bad state, well, that doesn't even begin to describe it. The amount of anger that Tom unleashed on Jason was unreal. This man had trauma consistent with being struck by a car or falling off a cliff, not being restrained by his father-in-law. When detectives showed up a short while later, they admitted that evidence was everywhere. They collected forensic samples from the floor, the walls, the bed, everywhere. This attack had clearly dragged on for quite some time, and Tom just wasn't letting up. As investigators began combing through all the clues and evidence left around the scene of the crime, they found a 28-inch baseball bat that had been leaning against a dresser in the couple's bedroom. It's believed that this was the primary item that was used to, in Tom's words, intervene. But as they kept looking, they noticed a small brick paver had also been dropped in the bedroom. This paver was found to have been covered in blood, which wasn't painting a good picture of what had unfolded here. When Molly and Tom were asked to come by the police station to issue a statement, Molly told detectives the story of Sarah waking up and being frightened by the characters printed on her bedsheets. Tom explained how he'd heard a commotion and went inside the bedroom to find Jason holding Molly by her neck, and that's when he jumped in. At this point, police were uncertain of how to proceed. If the attack had taken place exactly as these two claimed, well, then Jason likely lost his life in a bit of self-defense. Case closed. But considering the detectives found two separate weapons at the crime scene, both of which had clearly been used against Jason, this was beginning to look like something much more nefarious. Police were now looking more closely at the crime scene. When officers arrived at the home that morning, there was one particular scenario that just didn't make sense to them. If Tom stated that he'd woken up after hearing a commotion, and Molly stated that Sarah had woken up shouting out of fear, and their fight began immediately afterward, then wouldn't the children have heard the struggle? Yet, when investigators arrived, both of the children were fast asleep in their bedrooms as if nothing happened. This led police to a frightening theory. Jason didn't attack Molly that evening. In fact, he couldn't have. That's because when the crime unfolded, Jason was fast asleep. As police continued to dig deeper and deeper into the situation, they'd convinced themselves that Molly and Tom had to be lying. The evidence just wasn't adding up to the story these two had told to investigators. This is when they decided to press charges against both Molly and Tom for second-degree homicide, as well as voluntary manslaughter. It would now be up to the jury to decide who did what and how exactly this crime had played out. The defense team, the team working for Molly and Tom, painted Jason as being an angry, bitter man who would often lash out at Molly. But the prosecution, the team working on Jason's behalf, insisted that there was no indication and no evidence that Jason was an angry or violent person. He'd never exhibited this behavior before, and no one had anything bad to say about him. On the evening of the crime, Jason even offered to help bring Molly's parents' luggage inside for them, as they'd obviously planned on spending the night with them. He all around seemed like a great, family-oriented man. The family's neighbor admitted that he'd never really noticed any aggression between Tom and Molly. He even stated that Jason was known for his very calm demeanor. The two had actually been hanging out all afternoon on that day, and he said that nothing seemed out of the ordinary about Jason. They'd been chatting from about 3.30 p.m. to about 8.30 p.m. that afternoon, and their get-together only stopped when Molly's parents pulled up in the driveway, at which point Jason left to greet them. The neighbor added that when Jason saw them pulling up, his demeanor didn't change one bit. It was still completely calm, and he may have even been happy to see them. This is when detectives began to dig up some suspicious evidence against Molly and Tom. It would come to light that Jason had been making plans to move back to Ireland, but Molly didn't want to go. Jason felt that it would be best for his kids and for the family as a whole, but Molly was strictly against this idea. She feared that if she didn't agree, Jason may even take the children and move countries without her. And this wasn't just some theory that police concocted, this was somewhat of a proven fact. 
Evidence was later shown to the court that proved that Tom had struck Jason with a bat on the evening of the crime, and Molly openly admitted to striking Jason with the brick paver that was found in the bedroom. According to Tom and Molly, as soon as Jason fell to the ground, their attack stopped and they immediately called 911. But one of the paramedics noticed something odd. There was dried blood on Jason's body. The paramedics had arrived in less than 10 minutes, so how could this have already dried? One of the paramedics spoke at the trial and admitted that the scene of the crime was beyond gruesome. The trauma that was noted to Jason's head was just downright repulsive. There was nothing left of him. This was leading the court to a fairly universal opinion. This crime was no accident. Molly's parents hadn't just happened to stop by for the night, and that's because they've been planning on taking Jason's life all along. When Chief Medical Examiner Craig Nelson testified in the court proceedings, he announced that the cause of Jason's passing was rather obviously blunt force trauma. He noted a total of 12 injuries to Jason's skull, with several of these injuries showing repeated blows. He concluded that Jason had been struck in the head over a dozen times, but he believed this number could have been much, much higher. There just wasn't any way to say for certain, as there was nothing left of the guy. But this is where things get very interesting. When a toxicology report was done on Jason's body, it was found that he had a small amount of alcohol in his system, likely from when he was hanging out with his neighbor. But he also had trazodone in his system. Interestingly, trazodone is considered to be an antidepressant, but Jason wasn't considered to be depressed, nor had any doctor ever prescribed him this medication. This is when the family's doctor was asked to take the stand. When questioned about this medication, she admitted that Molly had recently come in and claimed that she was having trouble sleeping. Trazodone, as it turns out, isn't actually very effective at treating depression, but it works great for helping you fall asleep. Thus, Molly was given a prescription for the medication, not Jason. When Molly was initially taken in for questioning after calling 911 that night, detectives took several photos of her to document any injuries that she may have incurred at the hands of Jason, but there were none. She was completely clean aside from a small amount of Jason's blood that was on her. During her interrogation, she was seen repeatedly pulling and grasping at her own neck, to which an officer requested that she stop. But all throughout the interview, she just kept grabbing at her neck, as if she was trying to hurt herself. Maybe so that she'd have bruises show up in the photos later on, but this obviously didn't work if it truly was her plan. When Tom was questioned, there were no injuries or bruises found on him either. Both of these two were completely free and clear. Now, to be fair, when paramedics arrived at the scene, they did note that Molly had a bit of redness on her neck, but they also noticed that she kept grabbing at her own neck the entire time they were there as well. So it's unclear whether this redness would have come from an injury or if it was just the fact that she kept grabbing it herself. It would then come to light that Molly had also been struggling with some mental health issues, but it's not clear if these were previous issues or current issues she was dealing with. But whatever the case, the prosecution suggested that her mental health issues caused her to repeatedly ask Jason to allow her to officially adopt his children. Though, let's be real, the two had been married four or five years. It's not particularly unusual for a new spouse to want to adopt her stepchildren. But either way, Jason wasn't okay with this, and he repeatedly denied her request, which caused an understandable amount of anger in Molly. Molly was deeply in love with these children, and according to one report, one of her biggest fears was that Jason would one day take the children away from her. But it's never been explained why she believed this. After all, the two were married, their lives were tightly intertwined, and they were reportedly quite happy with one another. So unless she had underlying abandonment issues, I just can't understand why she would be so terrified of losing these kids. But then came the most shocking revelation of all the insurance policy. As it turns out, Jason had quite a bit of money. In fact, when they purchased their super nice home in North Carolina, he paid for the entire thing in cash, just wired the money right over to the United States without even being there in person. He also wired money over to pay for furniture. We're talking hundreds upon thousands of dollars. He even wired a $49,000 payment to Molly's father around this same time. And the note attached to this payment simply read, for the marriage. This payment has never been explained, but considering Molly was proven to have been an au pair, well, many people are a bit suspicious about this payment. When it was revealed that Jason's life insurance policy totaled around $600,000, there is a very clear image appearing here, and it didn't paint Molly 
or her father in a very good light. When you combine this with the fact that Molly refused to testify at trial, well, I don't know about you, but that's just downright suspicious. With all of this evidence stacked against her, the only reason I can come up with that would cause her to refuse to testify would simply be that she didn't want to be caught in a lie. After all, her father was a former FBI agent, so he would likely be pretty good at keeping a story straight. But when you throw Molly into the mix, well, that makes two potential points of failure rather than one. So it's best for their sake that she remain silent. But again, this is just a theory. Molly claims that Jason had been abusive toward her all throughout their marriage, but not a single shred of evidence was found to prove this. She never filed any police reports against him, and no one in the local community had anything bad to say about him. Molly insisted that Jason's children be asked to give a statement at the trial, insisting their version of events would perfectly line up with what she and her father had been claiming unfolded that night. But the children had already been taken back home to Ireland, presumably to live with Tom's parents. Because of this, their statements were never heard by the jury. But here's where things, once again, get very interesting. The defense team was able to dig up two interviews that were conducted with Jason's children. One interview was taken on the day that he lost his life, and another was taken after his funeral. In these reports, what the children had to say about their father was not nice. These interviews conducted with Jason's children really call this whole case into question and really make you wonder if Molly and Tom may actually have been telling the truth. A social worker who was employed by the Union County Department of Social Services conducted the interviews with each of the kids. Both of the children referred to Jason getting mad at Molly, and they claimed that this would happen on a regular basis. They also claimed to have once witnessed Jason grab Molly by the hair and, quote, smack her in the face. In another interview, the children reported that Jason would get angry over simple things such as bills or leaving the lights on. The kids each referred to multiple instances where Jason would hurt Molly. In one interview, Sarah explained that she would occasionally have nightmares and Molly would come in to comfort her in the middle of the night. She continued by saying that her father would sometimes get incredibly angry if she accidentally woke him up. Now, one thing that a lot of us have probably been asking is, what about the brick paver that Molly used to attack Jason? I don't know about you, but it's always seemed suspicious to me. Who keeps a brick in their bedroom? Well, the children explained this too. They claimed that they planned on painting the brick with Molly as a decoration, but that day it had been raining, so they weren't able to get the brick painted. In the end, none of these statements from the children were allowed to be used at the trial, as the children had already left the country. This meant that when all was said and done, both Molly and Tom were found guilty and they were each sentenced to 25 years behind bars. But all hope was not lost. Both Tom and Molly appealed their sentences. Molly's first attempt failed, but after a while, they were both allowed to bring their appeals before the North Carolina Supreme Court. Here, the court ruled that the two were allowed to be released on a bail of $200,000 each pending a retrial. They were both ordered to give up their passports, and they were not allowed to make any contact with either Jack or Sarah. But believe it or not, the twists in this story aren't over. After Molly and Tom were released, the children were finally able to be contacted for a follow-up interview. During this interview, they both admitted that they were, quote, coached to lie in their statements, admitting that none of the domestic abuse ever happened. They furthered this by saying that Molly was the one who convinced them to lie to the police, as well as to the social worker. So with all that said, where does this leave us? Well, it was announced in June of 2024 that a retrial had been completed. Both Molly and Tom took a plea deal in which they both pleaded guilty to charges of manslaughter. They each could have been held in prison for up to an additional 17 years, but the judge decided to only sentence them to 51 months each while also giving them credit for the time they'd already served. When you consider that they each already spent about four years in prison, that meant that their time was essentially already completed. I'll save you the math and just say that four years is equivalent to about 48 months. In the end, they each served about an additional seven months in prison, and they were now allowed to walk free. So at the end of the day, I'm not sure what to say about this case. Were Tom and Molly truly defending themselves that evening? I don't know. Were the kids lying when they mentioned the abuse Molly had endured, or were they actually lying about lying? No one really knows. All we know for sure is that Jason lost his life that day, and innocent or not, that simply didn't deserve to happen. 
Even if we assume that Jason was the monster Molly made him out to be, who is she to decide whether he lives or dies? Everyone deserves a chance at redemption. And if Jason was as violent and angry as Molly claims, calling the police would have been the best option. Though I do admit, in abusive relationships, sometimes this only makes things worse when there truly is no way to escape. On the other hand, if Molly and Tom made the whole thing up, then this innocent man lost his life for no reason at all. Literally, no reason at all. Because Molly isn't even eligible for the life insurance payout now that she pleaded guilty as part of the plea deal. This case is just tragic from all angles, and I just hate it for Jason's kids more than anything. Because regardless of whether he was an angry man or one of the greatest fathers to ever live, every child deserves to spend a childhood with their parents. But for these two incredibly unfortunate souls, both of their parents have now been taken away. Noelle Paquette would leave for work every day with two lunches in hand, one for herself and one for a child who was in need. Noelle had been teaching at the St. Matthew's Catholic School for a few months, and she quickly noticed just how many children were in desperate need of help, both financially and emotionally. While it wasn't part of her job description to do so, Noelle went out of her way to help every one of her students as best as she could. The children loved her for it, and she was a favorite teacher for many of the kids. Noelle was on a path to make a tremendous difference in the lives of children who attended St. Matthew's but her plans were tragically cut short on a cold winter evening in 2013. Detectives say that Noelle was heading home from a New Year's celebration. She was ambushed by two criminals with a hauntingly demented plan for the evening. Investigators believe that Noelle was grabbed before she ever even knew what was going on, and within minutes, her life was over. Police honed in on two primary suspects, but believe me when I say they are no one that any member of the investigative team would have ever suspected. Noelle Paquette was just 27 years old in 2013. She'd been living in Courtright, Ontario for a while, settling down and finding a job as a substitute school teacher at St. Matthew's Catholic School. There isn't a whole lot of information available about this school online, but I was able to learn that an incredibly large portion of their students are considered to be living in poverty, or at a minimum, in low-income households. To make matters worse, only between 50 and 70% of the students are considered to have passing grades. It's clear that many of these students are in desperate need of help, and Noelle wasted no time in jumping into action. Noelle was hired at St. Matthew's after another teacher requested time off for maternity leave, meaning Noelle would be in charge of this teacher's classroom for several months. Noelle was known for having a very unique philosophy for teaching. She didn't just want the children to excel in life, she wanted them to be so-called smash hits, a term she coined to describe the level of success that she vowed to help her children achieve, not just in school, but all throughout their lives. As soon as Noelle began working for the school, she noticed that there was a much larger problem plaguing these students than simply their less than ideal grades. It didn't matter that over 60% of students were failing math because nearly 50% of these students' families didn't have enough money to buy proper clothing or food. A shockingly large number of these kids didn't even wear shoes to school, and an even larger number didn't own warm coats for the winter. Noelle wanted to help these students in any way that she could. So she and her mother teamed up to begin buying as much clothing and food for these children as they possibly could. Noelle's mother says that this became a regular occurrence for them, and they would often travel out into town to scrounge up as many of life's essentials as they could find, providing them to the students who needed them most. One of Noelle's closest friends, Kyle, says that this is just the type of person that Noelle was. He says that there was no better profession for Noelle, and she was meant to be a teacher and a guardian for these students. You know, it's often the case that after someone passes away, we only recall the good things about them, and we cover up the bad. But in Noelle's case, she truly was a great person. She cared in a way that is so rare these days, and her character is something that should be celebrated. But Noelle's passion, her drive, and her dedication to her students would meet its end long before her journey should have been over. 
There are still countless students who truly needed her, but their pleas would go unanswered after one cold winter night in January of 2013. I want to let you guys know about Pia, an amazing VPN service that you can use on any smartphone, and also the sponsor of today's video. If you're an active internet user, and since you're watching this video, you are, then you need to know one thing. Everything you do on the internet can be seen by someone else, whether you realize it or not. Using the internet without Pia is like having Facebook post your diary. Your friends and family can all read your secrets. Pia, short for Private Internet Access, uses a virtual private network or a VPN to hide your IP address from would-be hackers, scammers, and other elusive people, and it helps to safeguard your internet connection using an encrypted tunnel. If you're like me, you're probably using Wi-Fi when you're in public places like the supermarket, coffee shop, or even an airport. When you do this, any hackers that may be connected to that same network can see everything you do everything. But with Pia, that will no longer be true. You can even use Pia to grant you access to region-restricted content from all over the world, including hidden content on BBC, Prime Video, Netflix, Hulu, and so much more. One of my favorite reasons for using Pia is to access region-restricted content on Netflix, such movies like The Godfather or Shawshank Redemption, which you can access by switching your location to Germany. One of my favorite things about Pia is that you can use just one subscription to protect all of your devices including your computer, phone, tablet, everything. Pia is the world's most transparent VPN provider, hiding your IP address and encrypting your internet connection, all while giving you access to heaps of content that may have otherwise been hidden from you. Join Pia using my link below to get 83% off your subscription. That's just $2.03 per month. Better yet, Pia is even throwing in an additional four months of protection, absolutely free if you sign up using my custom link. Just go to piavpn.com slash truecrimestories to get 83% off your subscription. Then get four additional months completely free. Thanks to Pia for sponsoring today's video. It was just after 2 a.m. on New Year's Day of 2013. Noelle had been attending a New Year's Eve celebration with her boyfriend, something they'd both been looking forward to for quite some time. The party was going relatively well, but at around 2 a.m., Noelle and her boyfriend got into a disagreement. We don't know what prompted this argument, but Noelle felt that things had escalated enough that it would be best if she just left for the evening and headed home. One of Noelle's friends tried her best to stop her, but when Noelle insisted on leaving, the friend decided to leave alongside her. The two walked together for several blocks, but eventually they went their separate ways. The party had been taking place in Sarnia, but Noelle had recently moved to Courtright, just south of Sarnia. She purchased a house here a short while back, and regardless of how long the walk was, Noelle was adamant that she was going to take the long trek back to her home, even though it was quite cold out and in the dead of the night. Noelle and her friends were spotted on several CCTV cameras in the area, but before long they had wandered out of view and were on their own. Throughout her walk home, Noelle texted her boyfriend several times. It seems that whatever had happened at the party, Noelle was incredibly upset. She was spotted by several witnesses as she wandered through the streets, sobbing about what had taken place. Her boyfriend has never spoken up about what transpired that evening, but whatever it was, Noelle was devastated. This brings us to around 2.30 a.m., only about 30 minutes after Noelle had left the party. As she was still within the boundaries of Sarnia, a few witnesses reported seeing a man walking behind her. Considering it was so dark, descriptions of this man were less than helpful, but it seems as though witnesses recalled him following her for quite some time. Within minutes of these witness sightings, Noelle's cell phone activity suddenly stopped. She never responded to her boyfriend's texts after this, and all of her calls went unanswered. Investigators used witness statements to piece together what transpired after this, and they determined that a white Pontiac Grand Prix pulled up alongside Noelle as she was heading home that evening, or early morning at this point. The car was driven by a woman in her early 30s. We don't know what the woman said to Noelle, but after a brief discussion, Noelle seems to have agreed to get inside the car. As soon as she entered, the car switched into reverse and backed up down the street, picking up the man that had been walking behind Noelle all this time. The moment he entered the car, they sped away into the night. About an hour and a half after Noelle had been picked up by the two unidentified strangers, two Ontario police officers had been patrolling the area. 
This was around 4 a.m. on New Year's Day. As they were patrolling the outskirts of Sarnia, they came across a white Pontiac Grand Prix that had broken down on the side of the road. When officers approached the car, a female stepped out of the driver's seat. She was crying and had blood on her face and hands, pleading with officers to help her, as her boyfriend had just accidentally cut himself in the passenger seat and she wasn't able to help him. Paramedics were called to the scene immediately. One of the paramedics helped out the passenger, treating his injuries and making sure that he was stable before taking him to the local hospital. The occupants of the car were then revealed to be Tanya Bogdanovich, age 32, and Michael McGregor, age 22. When investigators asked what had taken place leading up to Michael's injury, Tanya revealed some pretty interesting details about the two. She said that the two were heading out into the forest to engage in what she called knife play. She explained that this was some sort of risky sexual adventure that they were planning on acting out, but that their car had broken down on the way to the woods. So instead, they decided to act out their fantasy in the car. But things went downhill very quickly when Michael accidentally got cut on his hand. It would later come to light that Tanya's relationship with Michael wasn't even public knowledge. The two had been having an affair behind Tanya's boyfriend's back. Somehow, despite the large amount of time she spent away from home with Michael, her boyfriend was none the wiser. When the two were taken to the hospital, Michael was taken into a room for treatment while Tanya was asked to wait outside of the room. All the while, she was seen with her face pressed against the glass of the observation room, pacing back and forth in the hallway. Several of the staff members believed that she was Michael's mother, but they would soon learn the reality of their relationship. The two never really described themselves as dating. Instead, they merely referred to each other as a best friend or a friend with benefits. Turns out, the two had only known each other for a few months after they met through a website that connects individuals with certain interests. See, Tanya and Michael had rather dark histories of sexual fantasies. I'm not going to get into the specifics of their situation, but they were both interested in very violent activities, and the website that they met on specifically catered to people with these interests. But the problem is, their fantasies weren't just violent. They were full-on dangerous, hence how Michael ended up in the hospital. While they were in the treatment room, after Michael had been patched up, nurses and doctors recalled seeing the two lying down on stretchers, staring at each other, with their hands pressed over their faces, giggling and laughing. It seems that everyone in the emergency room thought that the two were very odd, but they never did anything wrong or illegal, so everyone just let them be. But then news broke that police had just uncovered a body that had been dumped in the woods about 25 kilometers away from the hospital. This is the moment that everyone's mood suddenly changed. The female victim had been subjected to a night of heartbreaking terror, and it was clear that this was not the work of an ordinary person. Whoever had done this to her took pride in their work, and it seemed as though they may have even enjoyed it. It didn't take long before the victim was identified as Noelle Paquette. As investigators showed up to the scene of the crime, they were taken aback by what had transpired. As detectives gathered up evidence and information from the scene, they quickly learned that the victim had been jabbed at least 49 times. She'd also been taken advantage of. A coroner revealed that the victim was alive during each and every one of the injuries. She would have lived through all of them, but she likely would have passed away quite quickly after that final strike was dealt. Whoever had done this to her, they were calculated. They wanted her to survive until that final blow. Police spoke with witnesses in the area, but no one had seen much of anything outside of mentioning that they had seen a woman matching Noelle's description walking alone around 2 a.m. But as police gathered up more and more witness statements, they came across the aforementioned witnesses who recalled seeing a white car that morning. Around this same time, Tanya and Michael were released from the hospital. Their car was towed to a nearby compound where it was revealed that the engine had run out of oil, explaining why they'd broken down so unexpectedly. After the two had left the hospital, they made plans to head to the compound lot that afternoon to pick up the car for repairs. But at some point during the day, Michael learned that the injury to his hand was going to require surgery. So the following day, he was asked to return to the hospital for an operation. Police had noticed how strange both Tanya and Michael were acting when they were taken to the hospital earlier that day. But investigators assumed that they were simply strange people, so they didn't think much else about it. 
But as witness reports of a white car that was spotted around the time of Noelle's disappearance began to pour in, detectives began to wonder if there was more to this story than meets the eye. It seems that police were hot on the trail of both Tanya and Michael long before they knew that they were even being suspected in Noelle's disappearance. As mentioned, the two had planned to pick up their car from the compound later that afternoon. But police were quick to react, and they asked a tow driver to hold on to the vehicle and not give it back to the couple until they had time to search it first. The tow driver agreed and held on to the car. We're not sure what the two were told when they arrived to pick up the car later on, but the tow driver did manage to ward them off while police conducted an investigation. When police searched the vehicle, they found that it was covered in red stains. To make matters worse, they even found a knife on the floorboard on the driver's side of the car. The knife appeared to have been cleaned off since the incident, but considering the state of the rest of the car, this did little to help. It seems that Tanya and Michael explained this discovery away as being related to Michael's hand injury but the police weren't so sure. This is around the time that the most concerning witness report of all was submitted to officers. Not only had a white sedan been seen in the area that morning, but a witness proclaimed to have seen the driver of the car pick up Noel. But that wasn't all. The witness also reported seeing Michael get into that same vehicle after Tanya had reversed to pick him up. At this point, police knew that there was much more to the story than Tanya and Michael were letting on. But the problem was, they needed to establish a motive. Otherwise, all three of these people may have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Without a motive, the case was sure to be kicked out of court. This led officers much deeper down a rabbit hole than they could have ever anticipated. When detectives really began to dig into the past of both Tanya and Michael, they quickly realized just how bizarre their relationship really was. The things these two were involved in were just plain weird. The two are big fans of the TV series Archer, so much so that Michael actually went by the name Archer, and Tanya went by the name Kane, referencing two of the lead characters from the series. Anytime Tanya referred to Michael, she would always address him as Archer. But everyone has pet names for people that they're close with, that's not terribly unusual. What makes these two so strange is just how far they were willing to go to satisfy their sexual desires, even if it meant hurting other people. The two met as a result of their dark fantasies, but what really helped them bond was how they each had a desire to end the life of a woman. Police were able to uncover texts that had been sent between the two that documented how they both longed to end the life of a female by taking advantage of her then using a knife to finish the job. But this wasn't just some demented, hateful desire. The two wanted to do it for sexual gratification. Detectives revealed that they also found text messages that proves that the two had lined up a victim for that evening. But for one reason or another, things fell apart and the victim never showed. This was the information investigators needed to secure a conviction. They'd finally tracked down a motive, at least for the most part. But they still needed to identify why the two had chosen Noel specifically. That same day, officers issued a warrant for the arrest of both Tanya and Michael. By this point, Michael had already returned to the hospital to have the procedure performed on his hand. Tanya was patiently waiting inside the hospital to hear about Michael's recovery. As she left the hospital later that day, she was arrested in the parking lot and taken in for questioning. Michael was released a few hours later and picked up outside of a hotel. When police got the two into interrogation rooms, all the pieces started to fit together perfectly. The two confirmed their relationship with one another and the violent sexual desires that they shared. Once they knew that they had nowhere to run, they even opened up about their intention to claim the life of an innocent woman that night. But they both insisted that Noel was not their initial target. As more of the story was pieced together, detectives learned that they merely chose to attack Noel because she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Her attack was completely random. After their initial victim was a no-show, the two were strolling the streets in their car when they happened to pass by Noel. When they saw her, Tanya turned the car around and dropped Michael off a short distance behind Noel. He stalked her while Tanya jumped back into action, eventually convincing Noel to get into the car with her. That's when she reversed and picked up Michael, driving Noel over 20 kilometers away into the woods to carry out their fantasy. Noelle had made significant efforts to fight back, but she just couldn't do it. 
Tanya and Michael were both handed mandatory life sentences for their crimes, but this did little to calm the minds of Noel's family. Impact statements were read by all of those who knew Noel, and despite their thoughtless crimes against an innocent woman, it seems as though Tanya and Michael may have actually realized the brevity of the situation. Both Tanya and Michael apologized profusely to Noel's family and friends, though they admitted that their apologies likely meant nothing compared to the nightmare that the family was living through. Michael addressed his own family, admitting that he had let them down and shamed them. Tanya expressed her regret at not confessing to the crime sooner, but their words may as well have fallen on deaf ears, because words can't change things, only actions can. In the wake of this tragedy, Noelle's family worked together to establish a charity known as Noelle's Gift. Her family recognized just how far Noelle was willing to go to help out students at St. Matthew's Catholic School. And with this in mind, they made it their life's goal to help Noelle's memory stay alive and to continue helping the students that she loved so dearly. The charity was established as a way to raise funds for children who come from poverty-stricken homes and may not have adequate food, clothing, or life essentials. So far, the charity has been an incredible success, and so many children have had their lives changed forever in Noel's memory. In 22 alone, the charity managed to bring in over $158,000 for children in need. In 2023, they gathered more than $188,000 for these children, with teachers at St. Matthew's School having direct access to this money to make sure that every single child gets the help they need. And these funds offer enough assistance to help out a minimum of 940 children. Noelle's final moments on this planet were marred by a heartless, callous crime. But in the wake of her absence, Noelle's family has proven that they will stop at nothing to ensure that her kindness, her compassion, and her genuine love for her children will never, ever be forgotten. It was April 24, 2000, when Denise LeClaire stopped by the post office to drop off some Easter cards for the holiday. Her plan was to quickly drop off the cards, then head home after a long day of work, but sadly, Denise would never make it home. Investigators discovered a confusing crime scene a few hours later, sending detectives on a 23-year hunt for a criminal. Daniel and Denise LeClaire had both been living in Burton, Michigan for quite a while, quietly raising their small family and enjoying their lives together in a great little community. Well, I say it's a great community. In all reality, Burton is one of the most dangerous places you could possibly live in the entirety of the United States. Burton isn't a town, so to speak. It's more of a suburb or a community. But there are so many people living in this area that many people consider it to be its own city anyway. Burton is located within Flint, Michigan. And if you know anything about the United States, you probably already know that most people wouldn't dare visit Flint after dark. It's very similar to places like Chicago, Jackson, Mississippi, or even Little Rock, Arkansas. Just crime on top of crime around every corner. But truthfully, in the area where Denise and Daniel lived, things weren't all that bad. Yes, there was crime, but as long as you kept your wits about you, you can make it around the area without encountering too much trouble. And for many years, Denise and Daniel did just that. They kept to themselves, didn't bother anyone else, and they didn't really have any problems. The couple had two young children, a three-year-old and an 11-year-old. Denise and Daniel had met back in the 1980s and had been together ever since. Both of them had graduated from Flint Northern High School, and both of them were raised near the popular Mott Park suburb. When they were still dating, Denise found out that she was pregnant with their first child. The two weren't quite ready to get married just yet, so they did their best to raise the child while they dated. But they did eventually tie the knot on Valentine's Day of 1996. But funny enough, they didn't have a traditional wedding ceremony. Instead, they opted to dedicate their lives to one another alongside 100 other couples as part of a local radio station promotion. Kind of a funny way to get married, but hey, to each their own, I guess. But regardless of their somewhat strange wedding, the two loved each other dearly and hoped to give their children the best lives they could possibly have. But unfortunately, this was little more than wishful thinking. 
In a tragic and heartbreaking turn of fate, these two young kids had their futures shattered, their lives irreversibly changed, and their mother taken. It was April 24, 2000. Denise LeClaire had been working at her shift at the nearby McLaren Medical Center. Denise seems to have loved her job, all things considered, and she mostly did office work at the medical center, with her official title simply being a clerk. I can't really find any additional information on what she actually did here, but it seems safe to assume she most likely helped patients check in or out of the hospital. Denise often worked a later afternoon shift, typically getting off work around 11 p.m. at night. Denise's plans for the evening of April 24th were to get off work, then head to the local post office to send out some mail that she'd been hanging on to. As she left work, she hopped into her Chevrolet Cavalier and headed off in the direction of the post office. This was the last that anyone would hear from Denise. According to investigators, she pulled into the post office parking lot, dropped off the cards, then began to leave. But she never made it out of the parking lot. A potential crime scene was reported later that evening when someone noticed that her car was left in the post office parking lot. The engine was running and the right side indicator was flashing and the driver's window was partially rolled down. When officers arrived at the vehicle, they knew something had gone terribly wrong. Police traced the car's plates and headed to the Leclerc home. It was about 2 a.m. at this point. Daniel was awoken to a loud knock on the front door and he was informed about his wife's disappearance. Police hoped that Daniel may have known where his wife had gone and why she had left her car behind in such a strange state, but Daniel hadn't heard from her since earlier that day. He made sure detectives understood how strange the situation was, and they obviously agreed with him. Daniel was taken to the scene of the crime at about 5 a.m., but there was virtually nothing that could be done. The crime had already been committed, and Denise was gone without a trace. Police collected all the evidence they could from the scene of the crime, but admittedly, there was very little for them to work with. Outside of Denise's own belongings, there wasn't anything left behind that seemed valuable to investigators. Her car had been left undisturbed, and there were no signs of forced entry into the vehicle. It was as if Denise had opened the door, walked away, and vanished into the fog. The only thing missing from the car was Denise's purse. Her cell phone was still in the car, and it was left plugged into the car's 12-volt jack. All these years later, her purse has still never been found. The most interesting aspect about the crime scene is that her car wasn't found in a parking spot, nor was it even close to the building. Her car was actually left near the exit of the parking lot, with the indicator flashing as if she was about to turn into traffic. What's particularly curious about this is that not only was the door open and the window rolled down slightly, but the car was also in park. So it seems like Denise may have willingly exited the vehicle. After all, if she'd been forcefully pulled from the car, the way I see it, the car would have been left in drive and may have even rolled away, but it wasn't and it didn't. By the following day, police had a lead. An employee at a local doctor's office had called investigators after he noticed a pile of clothing lying in an open field about 20 feet from an office building. I'm not sure why the man thought this was suspicious. I'll be honest, if I noticed a pile of clothes in a field, I wouldn't have a second thought about it. But for whatever reason, the employee knew that something was a bit off. When detectives arrived, they found the clothing and collected it for evidence. But that's when they noticed something just a little bit further out in the field. As they continued searching through the grass and brush, they came across something they never would have expected. They found the remains of a woman wearing nothing but a trench coat and her underwear. The detective who was working the case at the time said that this was his first homicide investigation, so he had obviously never seen anything like this before. According to the officer, at this point in time, cases like this were not common in Burton. Yes, there were crimes being committed every day, but it wasn't often that the crimes were taken this far. There's a major gap between petty theft and homicide, but what really took this case to the next level was what they found in nearby Denise's remains. After officers collected Denise's remains and began to search the surrounding area, they found a few disturbing pieces of evidence that helped paint a much clearer picture of what had taken place in this field. Detective Don Schreiber located a 9mm casing just a few feet from the crime scene. According to a coroner, Denise's life had been ended with a single round to the head. 
She lost her life instantly and likely never even knew what had happened. Officers managed to collect mountains of evidence, hundreds of public tips, and many photos to help tell Denise's story the best they could. But all of this amounted to nothing. Detective Schreiber says that they exhausted every tip and every lead that came in about Denise's case, but there simply wasn't enough evidence left behind to link the crime to any one person. That is, until they found something pretty strange near the dump site. As investigators were scouring the area in search of clues, they came across a small bundle of grass near Denise's body. In the middle of this grass tuft, they found a man's gold ring. Investigators took a look at the ring and found that it had a serial number etched into it. This was the evidence they needed to help blow the case open. They collected the ring for evidence and took it to the lab for further analysis and to have the serial number recorded. When officers determined the serial number, they contacted the manufacturer for assistance in locating the owner of the ring. But this is where things went from bad to worse. The manufacturer informed the officers that there was no way to trace the number. It wasn't a unique number. Thousands of these rings had been sold over the years, and each of them were marked with this same number. So while this narrowed down the list of suspects from millions to thousands, it ultimately didn't help much. Investigators say they feel certain that the ring wasn't just ditched here by sheer coincidence. They have every reason to believe that the ring is directly related to Denise's case, but until they track down the owner, it's pretty well useless. As you may expect, Daniel, Denise's husband, was one of the first people suspected of taking Denise's life. After all, shortly after her demise, investigators learned that Denise hadn't been as honest and kind-hearted as she pretended to be. In fact, they learned that she'd been having an affair behind Daniel's back, providing a perfect motive for the crime. Worse yet, Daniel's only alibi for the evening of the crime was that he'd been at home with the couple's two children, but considering how late into the evening it was, it seems fairly safe to assume that they'd been in bed by this point, so the kids didn't have much information to offer. Police were never able to find anything that tied Daniel to the crime, even though his alibi was somewhat questionable. It's strangely common in cases like this for the spouse to be responsible, but that just wasn't true in this case. Police investigated Daniel rather heavily. They even asked him to submit to a lie detector test and a DNA swab, but both of these yielded no results. His DNA was not found at the scene of the crime, nor was it found on the ring. His lie detector test also came back clear, though these tests are obviously notoriously unreliable. Daniel has only ever spoken lovingly about his wife, recalling her as a very sweet and helpful person. He openly admitted to being a pain for police officers over the years, but only because he wants to see his wife's case solved. The only strange thing about Daniel in regards to Denise's case is that in 2003, he was arrested after he visited her grave. After sitting near the grave for a while, Daniel stood up and kicked down Denise's headstone, breaking a porcelain picture that had been erected in her memory. Daniel describes this as a nervous breakdown, but several locals believe that this was some sort of sign of guilt, but this has never been proven. And can you really blame the guy for something like this? I mean, grief can present itself in very unusual ways. Investigators have had a number of other suspects over the years, including one in 2010 that seemed so promising that investigators were allowed to exhume the grave of one of these men. Unfortunately, this still didn't lead to any breakthroughs in the case. But that brings us to the lead suspect in this case, an x-ray technician who worked with Denise at the hospital. In April of 2000, investigators learned that Ralph Venucci had shown some interest in Denise. Considering the two worked so closely together, they had a bit of a casual relationship at work, but Ralph wasn't satisfied with just being friends. Around the time of the crime, Ralph's life was in complete disarray. He'd been grieving the loss of his son, who passed away in a drowning accident. This left him devastated for all the obvious reasons, but the grief didn't end with his son's tragic accident. The incident had weighed heavily on his marriage and ultimately led Ralph to get a divorce, his second divorce specifically. Ralph was doing his best to move on with his life and try to heal from the intense trauma that he had been through, and this led him to chatting up Denise and eventually asking her out. Ralph knew good and well that Denise was married, but he'd heard rumors that she was, well, less than faithful. So he asked her out, but she turned him down. 
Investigators learned about all this by speaking with Denise's co-workers at the hospital. Almost everyone knew about Denise's affair, explaining that she openly spoke about how terrible her marriage was, describing it as tumultuous at one point, though the affairs definitely weren't helping things. When one of the co-workers was asked if they believed Ralph would have been capable of such a crime, they responded by saying, I really couldn't say. This response was extremely concerning to detectives, but they quickly learned that Ralph had an alibi for the evening. Just like Daniel, Ralph had been at home with his children that night. Investigators spoke with Ralph about Denise, but they revealed they had no reason to suspect that he was involved. His alibi checked out, and they believed he was being fully transparent with them, showing no signs of lying or hiding any information. They said the same thing about Daniel and all of the other potential suspects. So where does this leave us today, 23 years later? Well, the ring that was found at the scene of the crime was tested, and it was determined that it did, in fact, contain a viable DNA sample. When this sample was run through CODIS, though, it didn't reveal any matches. To top this off, DNA was found on Denise's clothing as well. Unfortunately, this sample wasn't nearly as well preserved, and all it proved was that the contributor was a male, but police had already assumed this. But here's the kicker. With genetic genealogy being more promising now than ever before, it's entirely possible that investigators could use this method to narrow down the owner of this gold ring. So it's very likely that this ring may reveal Denise's killer, hence the title of this video. But unfortunately, for now, detectives have not been able to test the ring. I'm not sure if the ring simply doesn't contain enough DNA for testing, or if they just haven't gotten around to it yet, but police are certainly hopeful that this ring holds the key to solving this case. We don't know if police were able to compare the DNA from the ring to the DNA on Denise's clothes and confirm that they belonged to the same person, but we do know that, as mentioned, the sample found on the ring was considered viable. But I'd be lying if I pretended to know everything that would be required to submit this sample for genetic genealogy. So, more than 23 years later, the case remains unsolved. But investigators and locals are very hopeful that this case will be brought to a close sooner rather than later. In the meantime, officers are asking that if you recognize this ring, and you know someone who may have worn a similar one to it back in the year 2000, to call Detective Kevin Kissel at 810-742-2542. Amanda Doss was just 34 years old in 2011. She was at home on the afternoon of May 11, 2011, alongside her two children and a friend, when all of a sudden, someone clutching a knife unleashed on the family, then fled the scene of the crime. Just minutes later, the house went up in flames, destroying nearly every trace of evidence that had been left behind by this callous criminal. By the time detectives and investigators arrived at the scene of the crime, the smoke had settled, but the real mystery had only just begun. Who could have done such a thing to such a harmless family? Police would soon learn that the truth was much stranger than fiction, and it only took them about three months to get to the bottom of this heartless crime after a suspect made a startling confession. Amanda Doss was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma in August of 1976. Muskogee is located just outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and is home to around 36,000 people as of 2020. There isn't anything particularly interesting about Muskogee, it's a pretty ordinary town filled with ordinary people doing their best in life, and Amanda certainly fit that bill. Amanda moved at some point along the way, deciding to settle in Texarkana, Texas, a town that shares its border with Arkansas. Specifically, Amanda moved to Redwater, Texas, a small suburban area of Texarkana, with a population of about 853 people. We don't know too terribly much about Amanda's personal life, but we know that she must have gotten married somewhere along the way, as her maiden name is listed as Pruitt instead of Doss. Amanda gave birth to her first child, Guinevere, in August of 1999. Gwen was known for being a wonderful child, attending Redwater Middle School as she grew older. She was an active member of the Girl Scouts and all around a great kid. Gwen was remembered for being a selfless little girl who always cared about others. In fact, when she was just nine years old, she decided to give all of her birthday and Christmas money, including her presents, to a local orphanage. 
Every month for the rest of that year, Gwen and Amanda would work together to bake cakes and bring gifts and ice cream to all the children who were having birthdays each month. Just four years after the birth of Gwen, Amanda gave birth to her second child, a boy named Texas. Texas was born in May of 2003 and, much like his sister, was recalled for being an all-around great little boy. Following in his sister's footsteps, Texas decided to join the Boy Scouts and even attended Redwater School District as well. Amanda and her two children were known for being a happy family, and it seems they all got along well. But no amount of happiness could save the family from the impending tragedy that was about to strike. One that would destroy their notion of safety and leave behind nothing but ash and rubble. Before we continue with today's case, I needed to give you guys somewhat of a PSA. You probably didn't know this, but all of your online data might be getting sold to shady companies or individuals without you having any idea. At this very moment, there are thousands of data brokers out there that scour the corners of the internet simply looking to buy people's personal info so that they can sell it off to someone else and make a profit. This can include anything from your address to your phone number to bank account info or maybe even your social security number. The info they can get a hold of would seriously shock you. The good news is that you have the legal right to reach out to these people and request that they delete your info. But the bad news is that this would take you years to do on your own. That's why I've partnered with Incogni, because they'll do the work for you without you even needing to lift a finger. Incogni will reach out to thousands of data brokers on your behalf and request that they delete your data from their database, virtually eliminating your online presence automatically. All it takes is creating an account and providing Incogni with a few personal details so that they can better identify you. Then allow Incogni the right to work on your behalf. After this, you just have to sit back and watch them get to work. They'll keep you updated every step of the way. Some great examples of how your data gets into the wrong hands is, say you sign up for a free newsletter, then start receiving tons of spam immediately afterward. Maybe you're researching some medical complications, then start seeing ads for medical services you were never even interested in. The list goes on and on. Incogni is truly an invaluable tool, and I'm honored to be able to work with them to help you guys get the protection that you deserve. All you need to do to get started is click the link in the description below or use the code TIEKNOTS to get started. By using my personal code, the first 100 people to sign up will get 60% off your Incogni subscription. Thanks to Incogni for sponsoring today's video. It was May 11, 2011. Amanda, Gwen, and Texas had settled into their home for the evening, going about their usual nightly routines of having dinner, taking showers, watching TV, and eventually getting ready for bed. But this night's series of events would be much different. It was around 3 a.m. The children had been tucked away in bed, but Amanda seems to have still been awake, based on a report given by the Texarkana Gazette. At 3 a.m., a knock came at the family's front door. Amanda headed over to the door to see who it was, and she was greeted by 17-year-old Rachel Pittman. Rachel was an old family friend who would often come over and babysit the two children, and Amanda welcomed her into her home with open arms, as she had many times before. Rachel was someone that the Doss children looked up to as somewhat of an older sister. But unfortunately for the family, this visit would be far different from the many other times that Rachel had stopped by. Over the years, Rachel and Amanda had become friends with the woman who's never been named by police or news outlets. She's only ever referred to as the woman, so I guess police chose to keep her anonymous for some reason. For the sake of the story, we'll refer to her as Tanya, just to make things simpler to understand. It's unclear what relation Tanya had to Rachel, but we know that Tanya was an adult while Rachel, as mentioned, was merely 17. Tanya had moved out of state about five or six months before this, but she kept in touch with Rachel all the time. Reports claim that Tanya had previously lived near both Rachel and the Doss family, allegedly living just a few houses away in the same neighborhood. Tanya, Rachel, and Amanda Doss were all known to have been close friends, or at the very least, close neighbors. They'd often spend time together at Amanda Doss's house, sharing drinks and stories and generally being friendly with one another. But before long, darkness started to creep in. Rachel was considered by most people to have been a typical teenage girl. But as she grew older, she began to show signs of being a bit… unusual, so to speak. 
I say this because, according to Rachel, she believed that Tanya wanted to end Amanda's life. But Tanya claims she never suggested anything of the sort, nor did she have any bad intentions towards Amanda. They both got along great and enjoyed each other's company. But for Rachel, the message was loud and clear. Stepping back to the night in question, May 11th, Rachel arrived at Amanda's home at around 3 a.m. Once Amanda asked her to come inside, the two sat down and chatted for a while, talking about anything and everything. While Amanda was more than twice Rachel's age, the two were great friends and often confided in one another. But this particular get-together would be unlike anything Amanda could have expected. After the two spoke for a while, Rachel got up and began heading toward the door, suggesting to Amanda that she was ready to leave. But no sooner than she reached the door, Rachel grabbed a knife that she'd been hiding in the waistband of her pants, turned around, and ran towards Amanda. She ended Amanda's life in a matter of seconds, but at some point during the scuffle, Gwen and Texas woke up. To be completely upfront with you, the details of how things unfolded past this point are not very clear, but it appears as though Gwen knew something was wrong and ran away in fear. Rather than call the police though, Gwen grabbed a phone and called her grandparents. The call was incredibly confusing for her grandparents, as Gwen doesn't appear to have said anything that could be understood. All her grandparents heard were shouts and screams in the background of the call, followed by Gwen shouting for her mother. As any good grandparent would do, the two threw their shoes on and jumped in the car, driving as fast as they possibly could toward the Doss household. As they neared the home, their jaws hit the floor. They truly couldn't believe their eyes. The entire home had gone up in flames, and they knew that their daughter and two grandchildren were trapped inside. They whipped their car into the driveway, and without a second of hesitation, jumped out of the car and ran straight into the burning building. They found Gwen lying on the ground and pulled her from the fire. As they did so, both of the grandparents suffered severe burns that forced them to be admitted to the hospital later on. While they managed to pull Gwen from the blaze, they couldn't locate Amanda or Texas. Unfortunately, as the fire grew hotter, they were forced to admit that both of them were gone. Paramedics arrived at the scene just moments later. The grandparents were treated for their injuries and sent to the hospital, but as paramedics checked on Gwen, they realized that they were far too late and she was gone. The fire continued to rage on for hours after this, and it wouldn't be until the following day that the fire department was able to put out the flames, allowing investigators to survey the scene of the incident and do their best to determine what had taken place. Initially, detectives believed that the fire had been caused by a faulty electrical outlet, one of the leading causes of home fires. But as they retrieved the charred remains of the Doss family from the rubble, they realized that what they had stumbled upon was something far worse. As police did their best to piece together the evidence from the scene of the fire, they quickly realized that things simply weren't adding up. When the fire experts began to analyze the incident, they found that some sort of accelerant had been used. Worse yet, the body of Amanda appeared to have been where the fire had originated. For police, they knew that this meant one thing. The fire had not been caused by some sort of electrical short. Rather, it was intentionally set and detectives began to believe it had been done in order to conceal evidence of a murder. Police scheduled interviews with the local media outlets and announced what they had uncovered, offering a reward of over $40,000 for information leading to the arrest of the individual who committed this crime. But despite such a hefty reward, no tips were ever called in that led to the suspect being caught. Police spent weeks searching every square inch of the property for even the slightest clue, but they repeatedly came up empty-handed. But after about three weeks of searching, a tip was called in from a woman who lived all the way out in California. The woman, who's never been identified, was very direct in her statements. She claimed that she knew, for a fact, that Rachel Pittman, the 17-year-old babysitter, was behind the murder. Now, we don't know why she believed this or why she was so certain about it, but regardless, police didn't take the tip seriously. Now, many people may be quick to blame investigators for this, but in reality, you have to admit that the tip seems pretty strange. After all, Rachel was a child and a close family friend. But more than anything else, how would someone in California have such pertinent information about a crime that was committed in Texas? Well, as weeks passed by, police did their best to follow up on almost every lead they received, but they never managed to get around to speaking with Rachel. 
The tip was considered low priority for officers, and they felt their services would have been more useful investigating other suspects. It would be three months before police ever got any closer to locating the person responsible for this disaster. During this time, another $100,000 had been added to the reward for information, and soon enough, they would receive a call that turned the case on its head. As months passed by, it seemed as though Rachel's conscience had begun to catch up with her. The past always finds a way to catch up with you, and for Rachel, the guilt was becoming more than she could bear. One day, Rachel had been at her mother's home. We don't know the specifics of their conversation, but Rachel's mother detected that something was bothering her. After speaking for a few minutes, Rachel finally opened up and confessed what had taken place. She told her mother everything. Rachel openly confessed to the crime, but this is where things get pretty incredible. A mother's instinct is almost always to protect her children, but in this case, Rachel's mother could do no such thing. She knew the gravity of the situation and, without hesitation, called the police. The officer who accepted the call remembers that Rachel's mother was filled with grief, sobbing as she revealed what her daughter had confessed to. Interestingly, submitting a tip like this would have made Rachel's mother eligible to receive the $140,000 reward that had been set up, but she even went as far as refusing the money. Now, I don't know anything about the type of person that Rachel's mother is, but this act alone proves that she must have been a person of character. That's a ton of money to just turn it down. Soon enough, detectives arrived and Rachel turned herself over to the police without a fight. But it's what she revealed to police after the fact that really sets this case apart, because it took investigators by surprise and revealed a whole new aspect of the story that no one saw coming. When Rachel was in police custody, she came clean about everything, revealing every last detail about what had unfolded that day in 2011. She explained that she'd been speaking with Tanya and that Tanya had asked her to end Amanda's life. More specifically, Rachel claimed that Tanya asked her to end Amanda's life, but that she should do it when the children weren't home, as there would be no need for them to be caught up in the crime. Rachel claims that Tanya's request sounded urgent, and the more they spoke, the more Rachel felt as though this crime was a now or never situation. Thus, she decided to move forward with the crime without waiting for the children to leave, resulting in the entire family losing their lives. While this explains most of the story, it doesn't explain one major detail. If Rachel merely ended the lives of the family, then how did a fire break out? Well, the entire crime was premeditated from beginning to end. Rachel knew that if she took out the entire family, she was almost certain to leave behind some form of evidence, even if she did her best not to. So on her way to the family home, she decided to get a two liter soda bottle and fill it with gasoline. After carrying out the most gruesome part of the crime, she grabbed the bottle, doused the victims in fuel, and then set the house on fire, eliminating virtually any piece of evidence she may have left behind. But there's one part of the crime that Rachel didn't anticipate. During the scuffle, she accidentally cut herself with the knife that she'd been using to carry out the attack, causing a pretty serious injury to her arm. After she set the house on fire, she ran back home to clean herself up before anybody would notice. She did all of this without anyone ever realizing she'd even stepped out of her home in the first place. But in the chaos of all this, Rachel had jumped a fence connected to the Doss family property. So after cleaning up at home, she ran back to the Doss's fence to clean up any prints or evidence she may have left behind, again without being noticed by anyone. Once she got back home, Rachel removed her clothing and burned it in the backyard along with her shoes. To top this off, she took the knife that she'd used that evening and broke it into 20 pieces, scattering the metal in the woods behind her house, and burning the handle in the same pile that she burned her clothes in. Police were able to recover most of the pieces of the knife that Rachel had scattered in the woods, but nothing else was found. But as she spoke with investigators, they began to realize that there was much more to this story than meets the eye. Specifically, police were interested in the portion of Rachel's alibi in which she mentioned Tanya asking her to carry out the crime. Police tracked Tanya down and listened to her version of events. As they would quickly learn, Tanya had no ill will toward the Doss family at all and considered them to be close friends. But if this is true, then why had Rachel lied? Well, she didn't. Sort of.
When someone commits a crime of this magnitude, police will usually send the person in for a mental health analysis to determine if they may be suffering from some sort of mental health disorder. In Rachel's case, investigators were stunned by the reports that came back from multiple psychiatric investigations. One of the professionals believed that Rachel had been suffering from a form of paranoid schizophrenia. They believed that, in a way, Rachel had been telling the truth about Tanya. See, Rachel did truly believe that Tanya had asked her to take out Amanda Doss, but this simply didn't happen. According to the psychiatrist, the conversation that Rachel had with Tanya was nothing more than a twisted delusion. While the two did speak shortly before Amanda lost her life, the content of their discussion had nothing to do with Rachel claiming Amanda's life. The psychiatrist believes that Rachel's own mind was able to spin an ordinary conversation into a request for murder. This effectively cleared Tanya of any involvement, but many people question whether or not this cleared Rachel of involvement as well. Now, obviously, Rachel was the one who committed the crime, but if she wasn't of a sound mind, could she really be held accountable for such a tragedy? Well, according to one psychiatrist, Rachel knew that what she was doing was morally wrong. She knew that taking someone's life was, well, bad. The fact that she took every opportunity to conceal her involvement proved this. But the doctor believes that Rachel felt as though it was her only option, and in essence was the right thing to do, for whatever reason. A second psychiatrist weighed in and said that Rachel knew that her actions were wrong, but that she was influenced by statements made on television, billboards, and even conversations that didn't involve her. Rachel found hidden meaning in these various avenues and believed that the universe was telling her to do it, so she did. In one interview with doctors, Rachel spoke about hearing snakes that began talking to her. She believed these snakes were demons, and she also believed she could see ghosts. Later on, she mentioned encountering a pink cloud that she believed harbored the souls of her three victims. The doctors claimed that Rachel only decided to turn herself in after she made a deeper commitment to her religion presumably in an attempt to ward off these so-called demons. Now, as you might expect, Rachel's defense team wanted to enter a plea of insanity. And if her doctors are correct in their analysis, who could blame them? Rachel has exhibited every possible sign of being mentally ill, and the crime very clearly appears to have been committed while Rachel was dealing with serious mental challenges. But in the end, for reasons that I just can't seem to understand, Rachel decided to plead guilty to the charges placed against her. Rather obviously, because of her age, Rachel was placed in a juvenile detention center. But unfortunately, things only got worse for her from here. Her behavior behind bars greatly concerned the staff at the correctional facility. They say that she developed a cult following behind bars, and that she was very disrespectful to the staff members. She would often speak to her friends and followers about God's forgiveness, but she would do so in a warped and distorted way. While she gave outward appearances of being a calm and collected person, the slightest mention of her doing anything wrong would cause her to turn cold and distance. Ever since her incarceration, Rachel's behavior has been truly terrible. Reports about her stay in prison stopped being reported in 2012, but in that year alone, she's known to have begun multiple fights with multiple inmates. She attempted to break out of her cell. She knocked out an inmate's tooth, stuffed paper into the lock of her cell door so that she could open it whenever she wanted, and was caught plotting an attack against another inmate. One time, she successfully broke out of her cell and wandered off into the prison, doing her own thing. She even managed to get a hold of a blade from a pencil sharpener, but rather than use it to attack someone, she used it to cut her hair off so that her hair couldn't be used against her in a fight. All of the prison staff believe that Rachel needs some form of medical intervention if she has any chance of getting better, but there's been no word on whether or not this will be mandated. As it stands, she's now being held in an adult women's prison in Texas, but as far as we know, she's still shown no signs of improvement. She's expected to be eligible for parole after spending another 19 years behind bars, but unless she gets the mental help that she needs, it probably goes without saying that Rachel will never see the light of day again. Obsession can be a very dangerous thing, especially when that obsession is left to grow and fester, and certainly when it centers around a specific person who doesn't share the same feelings. When these feelings are coupled with rejection, 
Well, it's a recipe for disaster in many cases. And it's the innocent party who suffers when one of these obsessions spirals out of control. When we hear that someone has an obsession with another person, we usually think of it as creepy or disturbing. But in the case of 22-year-old Haley Anderson, it all started out very innocently, but ended in disaster. In 2018, Haley Anderson was a student at Binghamton University in New York. She shared an apartment with a few of her fellow students, Josie Arden and Michelle Topali. And everyone in the group was in their final year of college. Haley was studying nursing, and true to her nature, was not only looking forward to finishing college, but had already found a job in Long Island, where she would be part of the emergency department at Northwell Health. Haley's mother described her as being a millennial hippie, who was known to have a great love for music and a friendly and compassionate nature. This, along with her desire to help others, made her chosen career path obvious, and her future looked as bright as she had imagined it. During her studies in the nursing program, she met a fellow student named Orlando Tercero, who was born in Miami and grew up in Nicaragua. And despite their clear differences in upbringing, the pair instantly hit it off. They started dating but didn't take the relationship too seriously at first, and Haley's friends would later state that they broke up and got back together several times, but always remained friends. When Haley wasn't in the midst of studying for an exam or attending classes, she enjoyed hanging out with her roommates. And on the 8th of March of that year, that was exactly what she, Josie, and Michelle were doing. The group had decided to stay up late that night, and they shared a few drinks while they were playing board games in their apartment. At around 4 a.m., they decided to go to bed, and they each headed off to their separate rooms. None of them had any idea that by the following day, their lives would be irrevocably changed forever. Josie made it to her room that night and fell fast asleep fairly quickly. She slept throughout the night without a care in the world, waking up the following morning and deciding to reach out to her roommates after having her morning coffee. She headed over to Haley's room, but immediately noticed that Haley wasn't in her bed, but this wasn't terribly unusual. In fact, most college students would attest to this. Josie decided to send Haley a text to see if she was still willing to attend a poetry reading that night since Josie would be reading some of her work and she really wanted her friends to be there. But she got no reply. Calls to Haley's cell phone also went unanswered, and as the day went by, her friends started becoming more and more concerned, since Haley was always quick to respond. This was not like her at all. She was also usually very active on her social media accounts, but none of them had seen any activity since the previous day. And this was not a good sign. At the very least, Haley's friends felt that she would have at least notified her roommates about where she was, whether or not she was okay, and whether she'd be meeting them for the poetry reading later on. But they hadn't heard one single word. Her silence was completely out of character, and they started to think that something might be very wrong. Luckily, her roommates remembered that she was using an iPhone, and they could track it via the Find My Friends app. Thankfully, their efforts were successful, and they realized that her phone was on Oak Street, the same street that Orlando, her boyfriend, lived on. This is a perfectly reasonable explanation for why she'd suddenly just up and vanished. She'd spent the night out with her boyfriend and likely just lost track of time. But unbeknownst to Josie and Michelle, the situation was much worse. As it would turn out, the police had already been to Orlando's house earlier that day. His sister had contacted him to report that he'd sent her a very worrying text message earlier that morning in which he stated that he'd done something bad that would disgrace their family. But he didn't elaborate on what was going on. Since then, he'd fallen completely silent, and she'd been unable to get a hold of him. When Orlando hadn't responded to any of his sister's calls or texts, she asked if the police could stop by his house to make sure that he was okay, as he'd also been acting very strangely. Investigators were happy to oblige and travel to his house, but when they arrived, they got no answer at the door. The house seemed empty, and since nothing seemed to be out of place and there didn't seem to be any cause for alarm, they left without making contact with him, since they didn't have the immediate cause to enter the building. After all, it was very likely that Orlando just wanted to be left alone, and it's not their place to bother him. When Michelle and Josie arrived at the house later on, nothing had changed. The building seemed quiet as ever, almost as if nobody was home. Interestingly, Orlando's car was not parked in the driveway, but they knew that Haley's phone was inside the house and so they decided to investigate further. 
They walked around outside the house and managed to find an open window. Michaela climbed through first, quickly followed by Josie, and they started searching through the house while making their way to the bedroom, assuming that's where Haley's phone would most likely be. As they combed through the house, they quickly confirmed that Orlando was not inside as expected. But it was then that their lives were changed forever. As soon as they entered the bedroom, they saw Haley lying on the bed, partially covered by the sheets. They instantly knew something was very wrong, since she was pale and didn't respond to any of their shouts. The girls didn't immediately understand what was going on, likely because they were in shock. Worried that Haley may have been badly injured or worse, they called 911 and the police were sent back to the house to investigate. When officers arrived, the girls' worst fears were confirmed. Haley had lost her life. It didn't take investigators more than a few minutes to determine that Haley had lost her life after her breathing had been restricted. A local pathologist would later add that someone had done this with their bare hands. The pathologist also noticed a few other strange marks on Haley's neck, but he believed these were caused by the necklace that she'd been wearing. Naturally, the first question on everyone's mind was, where's Orlando? No one had been able to contact him, and he clearly hadn't been home all day. Investigators questioned Haley's roommates and quickly learned of Haley and Orlando's on-again, off-again relationship, which they immediately suspected may have played a part in the crime. Josie and Michaela explained that the couple had never gotten too serious and that Haley had finally decided to end their relationship for good as her graduation grew closer. She was more than willing to be patient with Orlando while the two were in school, but now that her life was moving on, her wants and needs changed and Orlando just didn't fit the image of what she pictured her future would be like. But it would then come to light that there was another man in the picture, Haley's ex-boyfriend, Kevin Ocampo. Haley and Kevin had gotten back together in September of 2017 while she and Orlando were taking a break. Orlando found out about this while the three of them were attending a house party, and he didn't react well at all, as he was seen shouting at her at one point during the night. It seems that when they were on a break, Orlando assumed that that just meant they'd be spending time apart, alone. But Haley believed that meant they could see other people. During that exchange, Orlando admitted that he was in love with Haley and he didn't approve of her dating anyone else. But Haley stood her ground and stated that she just wanted to be friends since she didn't share the same feelings that he did. When the party was over, Haley stayed over at Kevin's place, and this is when the first signs of trouble reared their head. When the couple woke up the next morning, Kevin walked outside and found that Haley's car tires had been slashed. Everyone was certain that Orlando was responsible since he was clearly very jealous of their relationship. She contacted the police, who then interviewed Orlando, but he maintained his innocence. Haley also knew that since the damage done to her tires totaled more than $600, Orlando would be facing felony charges if he was found to have been responsible. Since she didn't want to ruin his future, she told him that she would hold off from pressing charges if he just agreed to pay for new tires, but there's no word on whether or not he ever agreed to this. As time passed by, it seems as though Kevin and Orlando eventually mended fences and came to terms with one another. In fact, Kevin would eventually ask Orlando to join his fraternity, since they were the only two Spanish-speaking students on campus. But Orlando would lose his place in the group when it came to light that he'd spent a night with Haley while she and Kevin were still dating. Following this, Orlando repeatedly would make Haley feel guilty about what had happened, stating that he wanted to end his own life. While Haley was certainly getting sick of this, she never turned her back on him and continued their relationship but it was blatantly obvious that Orlando wanted more than she was willing to give. Before long, Orlando started acting obsessively, often driving past the apartment that she shared with Josie and Michaela, even showing up at their door unannounced. It was usually up to Josie to tell him that this was inappropriate behavior and that he needed to leave, but he just didn't get the message, no matter how plainly she laid it out for him. Bringing things back to the crime at hand, just about everyone involved in the investigation was certain that Orlando was responsible for taking Haley's life. But there were still many unanswered questions. For example, why did he leave the house that morning? When did he leave the house that morning? Did Haley go to Orlando's house by herself or did he pick her up? Luckily, his house was surrounded by surveillance cameras and investigators managed to find footage showing Haley and Orlando arriving at the house together and walking inside. They noted that Haley seemed to be there willingly and nothing suspicious came from the footage. The pair then stayed inside the house for a few hours, and eventually Orlando could be seen walking out of the building and clearing trash from the driveway. 
Following that, he went to a nearby pharmacy and bought a bottle of sleeping medication and melatonin. This was determined after a receipt from the pharmacy was found inside the house. He then went back to his house and remained inside for the next seven hours, after which he could be seen exiting and walking into the house's basement. This was the first major clue that investigators found. They now decided to head down to the basement to see if any evidence could be found here that may allude to where Orlando had gone. But nothing could prepare them for what they were about to walk into. When the basement was searched, it became clear to detectives that Orlando attempted to end his own life while he was down there. They discovered a set of hooks that had been screwed into a doorway, along with a length of rope, though some sources state that it was in fact a tie, not a rope. Police also found blood on the floor, leading them to believe that Orlando had fallen and injured himself during the attempt. Lastly, investigators discovered a note written in Spanish, which translated to, I'm really sorry about this. I never felt I could be capable of doing this. Father, I'll see you soon. Since his father had passed away years earlier, investigators took the note as not only proof that he intended to end his own life, but also a confession to claiming Haley's. There's no telling what must have been going through his mind at this point, since Orlando knew that he would be the first person suspected of the crime. But since his attempt at ending his own life had failed, he must have been desperate to get away as far away as he could. Security footage then showed him leaving the property for the last time while carrying a suitcase, and his subsequent movements placed him at JFK International Airport, where he boarded a flight, his head still bandaged from the injury. And he escaped to Nicaragua, where he was a dual citizen, hoping police couldn't find him there. But the main problem with this plan is that Nicaragua has an extradition treaty with the United States, meaning that even if he managed to successfully flee to the country, if United States investigators determined him to have been responsible for the crime, he would quickly be arrested and sent right back to the US. At least in theory. There have been instances where the Nicaraguan government has refused to extradite criminals back to the US, and the local district attorney believed that that may ring true in this case. District Attorney Stephen Cornwell stated that when he heard that Orlando had made it out of the country, he was certain he would never face justice for what he had done, since it would be up to the Nicaraguan authorities to decide whether he would be extradited back to the US or not. Since he had dual citizenship, the chances looked bleak. It would later come to light that Orlando's mother met him at the airport when his flight landed, and that they then drove for three hours north to her home. Here, he kept a low profile, since he must have known that he was being pursued by police back in New York. While all of this was unfolding, Haley's family was reeling from the news of her passing. To make matters worse, they had no way of communicating with authorities in Nicaragua, leaving them uncertain as to what could be done to bring Orlando to justice. They didn't know if the police in that country knew that he was being sought in the US, not to mention whether they were even looking to capture him. But unbeknownst to them, news of the case had already made headlines there, and although it never was confirmed, it seems that he then tried to end his own life once again, but was unsuccessful. This is safely assumed because investigators learned that his mother drove him to the hospital four days after his arrival, where he received treatment for self-inflicted wounds, though it was never specified exactly what types of wounds he was treated for. Unfortunately for Orlando, this would be the decision that would finally be his undoing. After he arrived at the hospital, someone recognized him from the wanted images that had made their way across the country. Whoever the witness was, they contacted the authorities and reported him. Detectives found him at the hospital where he was finally taken into custody. Back in the US, Orlando was charged with claiming Haley's life, and all investigators could do was wait and see whether he would be ordered to return so that he could be put on trial. For the next year, authorities from both countries debated whether he should remain in Nicaragua or be returned to the US, and eventually the decision was made for the trial to be held in his home country. And this was not the news that police or Haley's family had been hoping for. And if you ask me, it's just a blatant miscarriage of justice. The crime didn't even take place in Nicaragua. So all of the evidence and details of the investigation would have to be handed down secondhand. And we all know how that goes. This filled Haley's family with dread, since they also learned that the trial would be held without a jury, and that one single judge would have to decide what fate would be appropriate for Orlando's actions. To make matters worse, Orlando wasn't even charged with second-degree homicide, 
but instead faced a charge of femicide, which is considered to be a hate crime in Nicaragua. Orlando wouldn't even be asked to enter a plea, and this makes it very clear why Haley's family had their reservations about the process that would be followed. During the trial, the prosecution leaned heavily on the fact that Orlando had shown obsessive behavior towards Haley, and that those who knew her the most were well aware of this fact. Her friends reiterated that while Haley had entered the house willingly, showing that she trusted him, Orlando betrayed that trust by ending her life, possibly while she was asleep. They further claimed that Orlando's obsession had been festering for as much as six months when he was told by Haley that she didn't want a serious relationship and that she'd gotten back together with Kevin. But this news just didn't click with Orlando. He was determined to either get Haley back or take her out of the picture for good. The theory that the court was operating under was that Orlando had brought up the idea of reigniting their relationship once more on the morning that Haley lost her life. It's assumed she turned him down one final time and that's when he decided to end her life. Haley's friends were allowed to testify via live teleconferencing, and they reiterated Orlando's obsessive behavior in the months leading up to the crime. They revealed that he would sometimes be found sitting on their porch without being invited, that he was responsible for slashing Haley's tires, and they would often call the apartment to ask for her, even when he'd been repeatedly asked to stop. In the courtroom, the judge also watched the surveillance footage from outside Orlando's house showing him entering with Haley and then leaving on several occasions while she was still inside. Evidence of his attempt to end his own life was also heard. The pathologist who worked on Haley's case was also called to testify. He confirmed the cause of Haley's passing as manual strangulation, and the prosecution reiterated that Haley had her life taken from her by a man who couldn't accept the fact that she'd made a decision that he didn't agree with, and that it was his obsessive nature that drove him to commit such a despicable crime which was unforgivable in their eyes. There was no doubt by this point that Orlando was the one who carried out the crime. And hence, his defense team decided to build their case around the fact that he'd been drinking the night before he and Haley met up, a desperate attempt to clear his name. They claimed that he had no memory of the events that took place that night, and that due to his excessive drinking earlier that night, he'd gone, quote, temporarily insane when she rejected him, causing him to lose his temper and attack her out of jealousy. This was very obviously a last resort effort to at least have Orlando declared legally insane at the time of the crime, hoping to lessen his sentence or have the case thrown out entirely. In stark contrast to the prosecution, the defense only brought one witness to the trial, a psychiatrist who examined Orlando after he was arrested. He stated that when he questioned Orlando about what had happened, Orlando couldn't give any details of the crime, as he claimed that he'd been very intoxicated and couldn't remember what he had done. He claimed that he could only remember waking up the following morning and realizing that Haley was no longer alive. When asked what Orlando's state of mind would have been when carrying out the crime, the psychiatrist stated that he couldn't say, but added that there was nothing out of the ordinary about his state of mind when he interviewed him after the fact. His defense team also stated that Orlando wasn't known to be a violent individual, and that there was the possibility that he only carried out the crime after he was provoked, though they had no evidence to prove this theory. Once both sides had been heard, the judge left the courtroom for 90 minutes, after which she returned with a verdict. Guilty. While delivering the verdict, the judge stated that Orlando was clearly incapable of accepting Haley's decision, and that she felt that Orlando wanted to punish Haley for rejecting him yet again. He was found guilty of the charge of femicide, and she found that the maximum sentence of 30 years behind bars was appropriate. During the sentencing, she stated that all women have the right to life, and that these types of crimes against them should be met with the harshest possible consequences. So Orlando was destined to be sent away for 30 years. The case was unprecedented, since Nicaragua and the US had never worked together in this manner before, with law enforcement agencies collaborating from across borders to bring justice to a woman whose incredibly promising life had been ended by a man who just couldn't take no for an answer. When all was said and done, Haley's family stated that they were satisfied with the outcome, since they were expecting the trial to end very differently, but they were satisfied that the judge had made the right decision. It's often the case in these kinds of trials that something akin to a show trial is put on, all for the sake of publicity. And criminals are allowed to walk free after the fact. But Orlando was now set to pay for his actions accordingly. But Orlando wouldn't accept this verdict either. 
This man genuinely could not accept anything that went against his own way of thinking. He decided to appeal his conviction, despite the insurmountable amount of evidence against him, and his defense team later decided they wanted a different psychiatrist to evaluate him. In the end, his appeals for a new psychiatric evaluation and for a reduced sentence were both rejected, and he was told that he would have to make peace with the 30-year sentence that had originally been handed down. With all this said, it's unlikely Orlando will ever return to the US, since he still has an outstanding warrant for his arrest regardless of the fact that he would have already done his time overseas. This decision brought huge relief to Haley's family, who stated that they'd never seen any remorse from her killer, other than the regret that he showed at the fact that he'd been caught. The thing is, Haley had ambitions to make a difference in the lives of others, and this opportunity was taken from her by someone who only had their own best interest at heart. But her legacy has endured in the lives of those that she touched while she was still alive. Haley's mother, Karen, has stated that she's now on a mission to bring as much awareness as possible to crimes of femicide, and one of Haley's friends, Melanie Henney, is now a volunteer at an organization called RAIN, which deals with crimes that have been committed against women in the US, most often by the hands of the men in their lives. She stated that even if she saves just one woman from ending up in a situation like Haley's, she'll be satisfied. It's a sentiment that should be commonplace, but the sad reality is that Many women suffer at the hands of jealous partners on a daily basis, and a large portion of them never make it out. They're subjected to fear, assault, manipulation, and in the worst cases, have their lives stolen from them by people who just don't understand that each of our decisions is our own to make, regardless of anyone else's viewpoints on the matter. Unfortunately, it's impossible to predict when obsession will turn into something even more sinister. But what we can do is ensure that the women in our lives, and men for that matter, have a solid support system provided by the ones they love, and that their fears and complaints are not only heard, but acted upon when necessary. Unfortunately though, it's impossible to govern someone else's life, and the decisions they make at the end of the day remain their own. The unsolved disappearance of Ray Gricar is one of the most shocking and confusing true crime cases in Pennsylvania history. Once a well-respected district attorney, Ray Gricar would suddenly and tragically go missing in 2005 after taking a drive to clear his head after a long week at work. The only problem is, Ray would never come back. His notebook computer was later found at the bottom of a lake, but the hard drive was mysteriously missing. Ray's whereabouts have never been uncovered, and most people believe that he was likely involved in a secret life of crime that ultimately led to his demise. The story of Ray Gricar has been requested dozens of times over the years, so I figured I'd do a deeper dive into Ray's disappearance this week. And by the way, if there's any other stories you'd like me to cover, just let me know in the comments. Most of the topics I cover are recommendations from you guys, so I'm always looking for suggestions. The story of Ray Gricar may seem a bit boring and rather mundane at the beginning, but that's how some of the greatest true crime stories start out, making the crimes even more bizarre and unexpected. Ray was never a guy that you would expect to go missing under such mysterious circumstances, and his early years are certainly telling of this. Ray Gricar is most well known for being a lawyer who practiced in Pennsylvania for most of his life. Ray was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and grew up in what was once considered one of the greatest areas in all of Cleveland, Collinwood. In the years since, the town has certainly seen a bit of a decline, later leading to what many would call the city's downfall. It's now considered a historic region in Cleveland, but it's also known for being rather crime-ridden, an impoverished area these days. As of 2020, the area is home to around 26,000 people, but the median income is just 27,000, with a population that's around 10% Caucasian and 85% African American. Considering Ray grew up during the glory days of this area, he was quite privileged as a teen and a young adult, eventually attending a well-to-do Catholic school in Gates Mills. After leaving high school, he attended the University of Dayton, where he began studying law and interning at the local prosecutor's office. 
an internship that would drive him for pretty much the rest of his life, as he realized he didn't just have a passion for being a lawyer, but he had a passion for law and justice. Now, that may sound kind of redundant, but you've got to realize there's a big difference between being a criminal lawyer and being a criminal lawyer, and it seems like most lawyers fall into the latter category these days. Sorry for any lawyers who may be watching this, but you and I both know that's just the honest truth. If we fast forward a bit, Ray finished up his schooling and internship programs, and a few years later, eventually accepted a job at the county prosecutor's office in Cuyahoga County, Ohio, specializing in homicides. By 1980, Ray had made his way to Pennsylvania in order to be with his newfound wife, who'd recently accepted a job at Penn State University. But in a shocking move to many of his family members and peers, Ray decided to quit his career as a lawyer and prosecutor entirely, opting to become a stay-at-home father to his children. If Ray was anything, he was a great father and a great husband. No one has ever spoken ill about his family or his home life. He was a man who seemed to have put his family first in all of his endeavors. So it made things even more strange when, without any prior notice, Ray packed up his car and disappeared, leaving his family, his friends, and one heck of a mystery in his wake. While Ray was enjoying his life at home, raising his children and tending the family matters, his new lifestyle didn't last too terribly long before Ray got an itch to begin working again. He was soon contacted by David E. Grime, who worked with the Center County District Attorney's Office in Pennsylvania. David had heard great things about Ray, so he made him an offer that he couldn't refuse, leading Ray to begin working again, accepting a new position as the Center County District Attorney. This took place around 1985, when the former District Attorney had decided not to run for re-election, paving the way for Ray to swoop in and claim the election by a margin of just 600 votes. When Ray accepted this new position, he agreed to work only part-time, but by 1996, he had campaigned to begin working full-time, and this request was ultimately granted. The people of Pennsylvania loved Ray, re-electing him in 1989, 1993, 1997, and 2001. But it was around 1998 when Ray's relationship with the public began to sour a bit. Even though he managed to get re-elected in 2001, his election wasn't without its share of controversy. In 1998, news began to break about the Penn State assistant football coach, Jerry Sandusky. For any of you who may not be aware, Jerry Sandusky is a name that's now gone down in infamy in the world of football. While Jerry may have been a great coach in his own right, he had many dark secrets that he was hiding behind closed doors. 52 secrets to be precise. Jerry had been putting on a front that he was a family man and all around a nice guy. But as it would turn out, he had been accused by countless young boys of, well, you can fill in the blank, but he had a thing for them. In 2011, he would be convicted of 52 counts of violations against minors. He was sentenced to serve between 30 and 60 years in prison. But now, you may be wondering how all of this pertains to Ray Gricar. As it would turn out, Ray had allegedly known about these crimes all the way back in 1998, and Ray was asked to press charges against Jerry, but he refused. According to Ray, there simply wasn't enough evidence against Jerry at the time, so he let the case slide. Now, in the years since, the details of the situation have faded a bit, so I can't say for sure whether or not Ray was in the wrong here. After all, it wouldn't be the first time an attorney's let things slide, especially when there may or may not have been under-the-table money involved. Mind you, this has never been proven, but a scumbag is a scumbag, and I wouldn't put anything past Jerry Sandusky. But I haven't found any reason to suspect that Ray was wrong in his claim that there simply wasn't enough evidence against Jerry at that particular moment. We know that the crimes were going on, that much is obvious, but if there isn't enough evidence for a conviction, then there's no reason to begin a lawsuit that's guaranteed to fail from the get-go. Thankfully, the evidence against Jerry mounted over the years and he was finally sent to prison. But for many people, this raised concerns about Ray Gricar's integrity. Some people even believe that this may have been what led to Ray's eventual disappearance. Maybe it was vengeance by one of the parents of the victims. Some believe that Ray didn't disappear of his own accord. They believe that he was kidnapped. It was 11.30 a.m., April 15th, 2005. Ray had moved in with his longtime girlfriend, Patty Fornicola, back in 2003, and the two were living in her childhood home in Bellefonte at the time. 
Ray had called Patty to let her know that he was going to take a drive through the Brush Valley area, just a short distance away from Center Hall. This wasn't out of the ordinary for Ray. According to those that knew him, Ray loved to take long drives to relax and clear his head. It was supposedly something he did quite often. But on this particular day, Ray's drive would take him much farther than he anticipated, and he would never make it home. Ray was expected to be home by dinner that evening, but he never made it back. Patty waited and waited for him to return, or at least call, but she never heard from him. As evening turned into night, Patty grew concerned and reported him missing. It would take investigators nearly 24 hours before they found any clues about where Ray might have gone. As they searched the areas around where he was known to have been driving that day, they eventually encountered a tip that his car had been parked outside of an antique store in Lewisburg. When detectives arrived at the vehicle, they found nothing but his cell phone inside. They knew that he had his notebook computer, wallet, and car keys with him that day, but all of these items were missing. But strangely, officers found no evidence of foul play at the scene of the crime. So wherever Ray had gone, he had gone there willingly, and he had taken his notebook computer with him. Or so it seemed. Police, as well as his family and friends, noticed that the scene of the crime seemed a bit familiar. It didn't take them long to realize that the circumstances in which Ray's car was found bore a striking resemblance to the situation of Ray's brother, Roy, who had taken his own life back in 1996 with Roy's car being found in almost the exact same situation. Ray's brother had left one day in May of 1996 to allegedly go purchase a few bags of mulch, but he never made it home. A few days later, his car was found after it was abandoned in Dayton, Ohio, near the Great Miami River. Roy had reportedly taken his own life by jumping off of a bridge into the lake after suffering from years of depression. Ray's car was found parked very close to the Susquehanna River, so police naturally suspected Ray may have ended up taking his own life as well. This led them to conduct a very thorough search of the river, but they found no signs of Ray or any of his belongings. Police later brought in sniffer dogs and had them search the area near Ray's car. We don't know specifically what led police to say this, but they claimed that the behavior of the sniffer dogs led them to believe that Ray had been meeting up with someone that day and may have left the scene of the crime in another vehicle. Pennsylvania police at this point asked the FBI to step in. The FBI then gained access to Ray's bank records, credit card statements, cell phone records, and every other aspect of his personal life. Ultimately, they found no clues or anything that seemed suspicious. Ray was in a good financial situation, his life was completely in order, and he planned on retiring later that year. But for reasons unknown, he had simply vanished before being able to live out his golden years. It would be several months later before the case would see any more progress. By July 30th, a group of fishermen had been traveling down the Susquehanna River when they came across a notebook computer at the bottom of the water, located just beneath a bridge that separated Lewisburg and Milton. And I believe this is the same bridge that was within walking distance of Ray's car, the bridge that police initially feared he may have jumped from, but don't quote me on that. Police showed up to collect the notebook computer, but they found that the hard drive was missing. Now, this is interesting for two reasons. The most obvious reason is that it appears as though something was on the hard drive that someone either wanted access to or wanted it destroyed. As it would turn out, in the months leading up to Ray's disappearance, he'd spoken with several people inquiring about how he could erase his hard drive so that none of his information could be found or tracked. When Patty told police about this, she revealed that his search history on their home computer had alluded to some rather suspicious activity. He had searched how to fry a hard drive, as well as how to wreck a hard drive, and even water damage to notebook computer. Mind you, these searches took place just a few weeks to months before he disappeared. So while we don't know much for certain, it seems that Ray Gricar was hiding something on his notebook computer that, for whatever reason, the world simply couldn't find out about. If this wasn't weird enough, things are about to get even worse. As police continued looking through his search history, they found that he had visited the MapQuest website and searched the driving directions of getting from Bellefont to Lewisburg. But Ray had made this trip countless times before. He knew the journey like the back of his hand. So why would he suddenly need directions? Well, it's possible that he'd been looking up these directions so that he could print them out for someone else. The case got even more bizarre when investigators processed Ray's car for evidence. Inside the car, they found evidence of cigarette ash on the floorboard. They also noticed a strong cigarette odor inside the car. 
This is strange because not only was Ray not a smoker, but he hated the smell of cigarettes and all of his closest friends knew this. So someone else must have been in the car with him that day. This all became more plausible when just a few months later, someone found a mysterious unmarked hard drive on the banks of the Susquehanna River just 100 yards from where Ray's notebook computer was found under the bridge and also in close proximity to where his car had been found. Unfortunately, police weren't able to determine for sure if the hard drive truly belonged to Ray, but it seems a bit suspicious that it'd be found in such close proximity to his notebook computer if that weren't the case. Police sent the hard drive to a team of experts in the hopes of recovering some of the data from the drive, but it had simply been too badly damaged and there wasn't anything to be recovered, not one single file. No one knew what to make of Ray's disappearance. There were no signs of foul play ever uncovered, nor was there any indication that Ray had wanted to start a new life. After all, all of his money had been left behind untouched in his bank accounts. He made no plans to go anywhere other than visit Lewisburg that day, and it seems strange that if he wanted to vanish and leave no trace behind, that he would call his girlfriend and tell her about the upcoming journey. If he wanted to dip and run, he would have just done that without saying a word. Despite all of this evidence that proves otherwise, the Gricar family believed that Ray most likely met with foul play that day, and I'll be honest, I tend to believe them. It's far too much of a coincidence that police found evidence that he'd printed out instructions for a journey that he'd taken many times before, and later found cigarette ash in his car, as well as the sniffer dogs that believed that he left the scene of the crime in another vehicle, that just doesn't add up unless there was someone else involved. This all came to a head when a former district attorney and close friend of Ray spoke out in the months after Ray's disappearance. This friend came forward and explained that he'd recently been contacted by a prison inmate. This inmate, whose name has never been released, claimed that he had been cellmates with a man who claimed to have been involved in Ray's disappearance. The inmate claims that his cellmate openly confessed to taking Ray's life and had no problems talking about the crime. The cellmate supposedly wanted to take Ray's life because Ray had been the one who landed him in prison. The cellmate wanted revenge. He says that he claimed Ray's life in Lewisburg that day, then dumped his body on hunting grounds just outside of Lewisburg. The only problem was police found no reason to believe that this story is true. They claim that they have no evidence pointing to foul play, even after all these years. The district attorney believes that the inmate is telling the truth, but that police simply won't follow up on the lead well enough. But if this is true, and the cellmate did take Ray's life that day, then why was his laptop found in the river? And why was the hard drive removed and thrown in a different location? And what about the cigarette ash in his car? Truth be told, we simply don't know what happened to Ray Gricar. Many people believe his disappearance may have had something to do with his unwillingness to charge Jerry Sandusky back in 1998, but there's no evidence to suggest that there's any relation here, literally nothing. In the end, Ray Gricar was legally declared deceased in 2011. So what happened to him? Well, we may simply never know. In January of 2007, the Shetland Islands experienced a truly horrifying crime. Investigators say that famous children's author, Richard Horn, better known as Harry Horse, took his own life alongside his wife, Mandy, in an apparent romantic pact. But the story that detectives shared with the public, well, it isn't at all what it seems. Born in May of 1960, Richard spent the first decade of his life growing up in a farmhouse called Church Farm Cottage, located in Brandon Coventry, alongside his parents Derek and Josephine and his three sisters. Brandon is known for being a super small village with a population of just about 500 people. Now, this village is home to several incredibly old cottages and pubs, and when you think of old-timey England, this is probably the type of place you think of. Small, quiet, quaint, and super rustic. Richard's family also had a second home in Salka, where they would spend their vacations fishing and swimming and hanging out on their boat, which they named the Ormond. By 1970, the family moved to Warwickshire, and it's here that Richard found his true love, storytelling. He would tell his sisters that their house, known as Christmas Hill Farm, was one of the resting spots where Santa Claus stopped to take a rest while delivering Christmas presents to children all over the world. 
He was always coming up with crazy stories to tell others, and it seemed like he did a great job at it. These are pretty captivating stories that almost always seem to have some basis in reality, just enough to make them believable. Now, growing up in the countryside gave Richard a sense of freedom, and he loved horseback riding and spending time in nature. In fact, many years later after his passing, tales would be told of how his horse would often come home without him when Richard wasn't ready to head home yet. And that's pretty telling of how much Richard loved the outdoors when even his own horse would say, okay, I think that's enough. As for how he got the pseudonym that he was so well known by, well, it was all thanks to the headmaster at his school, who during roll call accidentally pronounced his surname as horse instead of horn. And the moniker stuck for the rest of his life when he decided that he would make it the perfect pen name, Harry Horse. At age 13, he would develop a love for cricket, a popular sport in the UK. He started playing cricket while attending Reckon College, and here Richard really began to hone his skills as a storyteller and an illustrator, and even won awards for his drawings. After graduating from Reckon College, Richard found a job at a lawyer's firm, where he started to gain some valuable experience. But for Richard, well, his attention was more focused on the artistic side of his personality, as was evidenced by a decision that he made when he turned 19. A decision that would alter the course of his life forever. While waiting for a train at Coventry Railway Station one December morning, Richard found himself thinking about the life that lay ahead of him, as he'd been thinking of relocating to Edinburgh. Unable to make up his mind, he chose to leave the decision up to a flip of a coin, with heads sending him back to London and tails meaning that he would move to Edinburgh. The coin landed tails up, and a short while later, he boarded a train that was headed for Scotland. Now, life in Scotland wouldn't be easy, and he didn't really have any jobs lined up as an illustrator, nor did he have anything else going for him for that matter. But he devised a plan. He dressed himself up like a college student and started attending drawing classes, unbeknownst to the rest of the students and the faculty members. He would basically just sneak into class, learn what the professor was teaching for the day, and then sneak out before anyone realized he was there. He basically pirated college courses. Richard used his skills to create a portfolio of his best work, attempting to get a publishing deal by showing it to local publishers. Now, unfortunately, none of them showed much interest, and things were not going the way he had envisioned, and so he had to come up with another cunning ruse. He'd already spoken to the well-known publishing house, Canongate, and he was turned down. But in 1981, he contacted them again, this time posing as his own literary agent. Richard claimed that his client, Harry Horse, was in Edinburgh for a short while, and that he would love to meet up to show off some of his work, and finally, they agreed. At the time, Canongate was owned by its founder, Stephanie Wolf Murray, and she found him to be just the type of talent that they were looking for. He was given a job as an illustrator for Magus the Lollipop Man, which was authored by Michael Mullen. And shortly after, he supplied the sketches for David Hamilton's The Good Golf Guide to Scotland. In 1986, an updated version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was announced, and Richard also supplied the artwork for that release, which was a pretty major job. He'd certainly made it as an artist by this point, but still unsatisfied with his life's trajectory, he decided to try his hand at publishing a book of his own. But Richard, he could have never guessed what the future had in store for him. Richard wrote his first book, entitled The Ogopogo, My Journey with the Loch Ness Monster. And quite unbelievably, his first efforts saw him receiving a Scottish Arts Council Book Award. This did his career a world of good, and soon he was producing many more popular children's books, most of which included animal characters. His book, The Last Polar Bears, saw him make his debut on the small screen as it was made into an animated movie. And shortly after, two of his other books, The Last Cowboys and A Friend for Little Bear, also made appearances on television. And Richard's career was now in full swing. He'd finally made it as a published author and illustrator, and his life was shaping up to be exactly what he had always dreamed of. By 1989, Richard had started to explore other aspects of his creativity, and had started his own band, touring across the country. In fact, they were in the midst of a tour in the Shetlands when he met Mandy Williamson, the girl who would eventually become his wife. The two got married the following year and found an apartment in Edinburgh, where they lived with their dog named Rue, who Richard would later feature in many of his stories. Now, the apartment didn't offer much room, but they were happy to make it work, and Richard's friends would describe Mandy as the counterpoint to his volatile nature. 
basically she helped even out Richard's wild nature and calm him down to a certain extent, but Richard was still hungry. See, Richard had a serious love for his dog, Roo. He was an animal lover through and through. The two could be seen everywhere together and even took him to business meetings. In fact, Roo would also be the catalyst for the next stage of Richard's career. After Richard and Mandy were married for about a year or two, Richard began to feel that his books featuring Roo weren't getting enough attention. Thus, he and Roo entered the offices of the Scottish newspaper, Scotland on Sunday, to complain about their lack of coverage of his books. Luckily, he'd brought several of his illustrations with him, and upon seeing them, the newspaper's editor suggested that he start working for them as a freelance political cartoonist. And while it was a pretty drastic change of pace for Richard, well, he accepted the offer. He would stay in this role for the next six years, drawing caricatures of famous politicians and the situations that they found themselves in at the time, quickly making a name for himself as one of the biggest political cartoonists of his generation, as his drawings could be seen in well-known newspapers that included The Guardian, The Independent, The Telegraph, and The Times. His reputation as a talented illustrator and cartoonist had now started to spread, and he even created the cover artwork for the New Yorker magazine on two occasions, while also drawing a satirical cartoon for the Scotsman on a weekly basis. But Richard and Mandy's life together, well, it wasn't as perfect as it seemed from the outside. After 18 years of marriage, it would all come to an end thanks to one unthinkable act carried out by Richard. By 2004, Richard and Mandy had decided to move back to the Shetland Islands in Scotland. This decision came after they received the unfortunate news that Mandy was suffering from a seriously aggressive form of multiple sclerosis, or MS. The change in Richard's demeanor from this point on is a testament to how much he loved his wife, as he became ever more depressed at her failing health, and before long he'd started to use illegal substances to cope with her loss of mobility and their lives together. His family would later reveal that he found it increasingly difficult to see her struggling with the condition, and it caused him to fall into a deep, deep depression. By 2004, Mandy's condition had worsened to the point where she was barely able to talk, and she had to receive constant care, which caused Richard a great deal of worry. In fact, he once commented to friends that he hated having to bathe and change his wife every day. Now, it's unclear if he hated doing this in general, or if he hated that her health had failed her, but I tend to believe it's most likely the latter, as Richard was more than willing to do whatever was necessary for his wife. Though, admittedly, Richard hated the fact that the two had moved back to the Shetlands to be closer to Mandy's family, as it was a very quiet and calm area, and Richard had grown used to the hustle and bustle of London over the years, thriving in the chaotic lifestyle. Those he spoke to about his concerns took it as a sign that Richard was still very much in love with his wife, and that the decline in her health was starting to take a toll on him. But these days, there are many people who disagree with this sentiment. See, since Richard was still taking illegal substances during this time, his behavior had grown ever more erratic, and it's believed that he started resenting the fact that he had to look after Mandy while living in a comparatively isolated area. By this point, Mandy had grown from being the center of his world to being more of an obstacle in his way. At least, that's the opinion of some people looking back on Richard's life. Richard had now become prone to fits of rage, and one social worker would report that he becomes so angry during a discussion about Mandy's rights to disability benefits that he punched a hole in a wall in their house. But this was only the tip of the iceberg. Richard's mental health would only get worse from here and it didn't take long before it reached a boiling point. And Richard, well, he finally snapped. In the days and weeks before the crime, Richard retreated further into depression, and his addiction got much worse. He would eventually cut off all contact with his family, an act that's always worrisome when someone's dealing with depression and struggling to come to terms with difficult circumstances. He did keep in contact with some of his friends, though, and in January of 2007, he invited two of their friends over to their place for dinner. But the evening didn't exactly go to plan, and Richard was acting strangely all night. The two friends would later tell investigators that Richard had, at some point in the evening, used an unspecified medication, after which he became agitated and on edge, which caused them pretty serious concern. They added that after taking the substance, he became more animated than normal, and he was walking around the house muttering to himself, 
at one point saying, it's a wonderful night for a killing. Prior to this, Richard had been, for the most part, his normal, happy self, but now they could hardly recognize him. What worried them most of all is that they noticed that Mandy seemed to be afraid of him. As they were getting ready to leave, she asked him to stay over for the night since she didn't want to be left alone with him. The friends declined the offer, likely because they didn't want to get involved in the couple's marriage issues, but also probably because they didn't want to deal with Richard's strange behavior anymore. This guy was clearly out of his mind at this point. After turning down Mandy's offer, the friends left and didn't think much else about the situation, believing it would all blow over soon enough. But by the following morning, a couple of the friends returned to the house as one of them had left a piece of clothing there the night before. But when they walked through the front door, they were met with a terrifying, horrific sight. The friends had just walked into a crime scene. As the friends entered the couple's home, they were immediately caught off guard. As they stepped into the entryway of the home, they were met with a grisly sight. The couple's dog and cat had both lost their lives, and it was clear the damage done was intentional. The friends didn't know what to think, and they immediately began calling out for Richard and Mandy. Realizing that something was very wrong, they rushed into Richard and Mandy's bedroom, and their hearts sank. The couple was found lying side by side on their bed, both deceased. And this is where the case gets really strange, and many people are still left wondering what the motive was for the story that was concocted by investigators after they learned of the couple's passing. Since Mandy's family was living close by, they were quickly informed of her passing, though it would take several days before Richard's family ever received the news. When they finally did, the details sounded like something out of a fairy tale. The police told both families that Richard and Mandy had attempted to end Mandy's life via an overdose, since she was suffering too much to carry on, and Richard could no longer stand watching his wife's health deteriorate. But tragically, the attempt failed, and this left the couple more depressed and desperate than ever before. The media reported that they decided to enter into a pact that would bring an end to the suffering for both of them, and it was even hailed as a quote, true Romeo and Juliet tale. They were portrayed as a loving couple who couldn't face the world without each other, and that they decided that they would rather end their lives together than have to live the rest of their lives alone. As one would imagine, both families were devastated at hearing the news, but they accepted the version of events that detectives had offered them, since in their minds, there was no reason for them to hide the truth. But the thing is, they would eventually learn that the couple's passing was anything but romantic, though it would be more than six months after the incident that the truth would finally be revealed to the public. Those who knew Richard and Mandy were horrified to learn that they had taken their lives after the dinner party that evening. As awful as this already was, the details that emerged thereafter were even more shocking. It would turn out there was no pact. It wasn't an act carried out as a romantic gesture, and there was no agreement between husband and wife that this had to be done. Instead, whispers began to spread about how Richard had grabbed a knife from the kitchen and attacked Mandy in a tragic act of violence. We know that this wasn't a consensual act since investigators found defensive wounds on her arms and hands, and it would soon be revealed that he jabbed her as many as 30 times before bizarrely turning the weapon on himself. But before he did so, the knife that he was using broke during the attack, which just shows the ferocity of the situation. Imagine the amount of force that it takes to break a metal blade. Thus, Richard went back to the kitchen grabbed another weapon, and then continued the assault until Mandy's life was over. The coroner's report would state that Richard had 47 self-inflicted wounds before he too lost his own life. The doctor who attended the crime scene was so shocked by what he found there that he had to take time off of work, stating it was the worst crime scene he had ever witnessed with his own eyes. While still under the impression that the couple had lost their lives in some sort of romantic pact, Richard's family agreed that they should be buried together. But when Mandy's family learned what had actually occurred that night, they were understandably outraged at how the case was handled by the authorities. More specifically, they were outraged that investigators had outright lied to them about the state of the crime scene. Mandy's father made it clear that he wanted everyone to know what had happened to his daughter, since Richard had been painted as being some sort of martyr by ending his wife's suffering and then claiming his own life in some sort of romantic gesture. At a press conference held after the true details of the crime were revealed, 
Mandy's father stated, quote, this was no pact, it was murder. Mandy had arranged to go with her mother to the dentist the morning they were found. She was not planning on ending her own life. In the aftermath of these revelations, Richard's mother spoke to the Sunday Times newspaper, and surprisingly, she took aim at Mandy and Mandy's family, revealing that she never liked Mandy in the first place. She claims that when attending the couple's wedding, Mandy's family had failed to arrange flowers for the church ceremony, as they had agreed to do. And she took offense to the fact that she and the rest of the family hadn't been invited back to Richard and Mandy's house the second half of the reception. Now, this may sound like petty squabbles between a bride and the groom's family, and this is commonplace, right? But that's not the full story. Richard's mother added that Mandy was a very difficult person to get along with, saying she was quick to criticize Richard when he was in the midst of doing something that she didn't agree with. She claims that Mandy would refuse to wash his cricket uniform since she didn't like any of the other players' wives. She was also critical of the way that he was raised as well as the schools that he attended. Richard's mother also says that she had to walk on eggshells around Mandy because she was so volatile and would fly off the handle at the slightest mention of anything she didn't agree with. But again, you could easily chalk this up to a groom's mother not liking his bride. Again, this is super commonplace. It should also be mentioned that the rest of Richard's family didn't necessarily agree with his mother's statements though, just to add a bit of context. In fact, the rest of Richard's family loved Mandy just as much as Richard did. But still, it gets worse. According to Mrs. Horn, Richard and Mandy had both been taking illegal substances in the months leading up to the incident. Mandy had been doing so to relieve the pain that she was in as her health was failing, and Richard eventually joined in to help cope with the impending loss of his wife. And while most of us may not agree with this decision, you have to admit it's somewhat understandable. Several of the couple's friends contacted Richard's family after the truth of the crime was finally revealed, saying how much they liked Mandy and how they were struggling to come to terms with how Richard could have carried out such a violent and unexpected crime. This heartbreaking tragedy took everyone by complete surprise. And considering how many people spoke lovingly of the couple, heck, even two of their friends who had dinner at their house that night couldn't have predicted this was about to happen. Well, it was just a shock to everyone. Now, rather obviously, there have been many people who are critical of how the police handled this case. Obviously, there was no point in lying to the family about what had actually taken place here. It's understandable they may have wanted to spare the family from the heartache and burden of knowing how the crime really unfolded, but that burden was the family's to bear. It's not up to the police to decide who gets to grieve a loss or how they grieve it. When questioned about this in interviews by the media, the Shetland police defended their handling of the case, stating that any suggestion that they attempted to hide certain details of the crime from members of the two families or the public was completely unfounded, though no one has been able to explain why Richard and Mandy's deaths were portrayed as a romanticized pact to end their own lives when that clearly wasn't the case. It's obvious from this statement alone, the police were just outright lying. When preparations were being made for Richard and Mandy to be buried, Richard's sisters, Kay and Mary Ann, revealed what they thought of the horrific crime and the events leading up to it. They believed that Richard had purposefully started distancing himself from his family since he'd been planning to end Mandy's life, as well as his own, for quite some time. They also speculated that he only did this to strengthen his resolve, or else he would have been made unable to follow through with his plans. Basically, if he would have maintained contact with his family throughout the months leading up to the crime, he may have felt too much guilt and been unable to actually go through with it. Speaking to a reporter, they also suggested that the move back to the Shetlands would have played a major role in Richard's state of mind, and that it would have added to his feelings of despair. Richard obviously didn't want to be there, and this was painfully obvious. Now, it should be noted that when the sisters made these statements, they were still under the impression that the couple had willingly taken their lives together. So while they knew that Richard had taken Mandy's life, they didn't know at this point in time that he had done so against her will. It would only be when they traveled to the Shetlands for the funeral that they were briefed on the actual events that took place. In the end, no one will ever truly know what was going through Richard's mind when he decided to end Mandy's life, as well as his own. But this case shows that anyone's life can be irrevocably changed at any time. And it's up to each of us to decide how we deal with those changes. At some point in our lives, we're all going to get horrible news. But that doesn't mean we have to go to the links that Richard did to try to make things right. It's not our job to play God. It's our job to make the best with what we have. 
When reading statements from people who knew the couple, it becomes clear that there was never any doubt that the two truly loved each other. But what drove Richard to carry out such an unthinkable crime? Well, we may never know. Some people believe he did it because Mandy's suffering had become too much for him to bear, while others think he may have been in the midst of some psychosis due to the substances that he was using. The truth is, we just don't know. Melissa Jenkins was a school teacher and basketball coach from Vermont who went missing under mysterious circumstances in March of 2012. Thankfully, she was found within 24 hours of her disappearance. But unfortunately, her discovery would reveal a disturbing crime that was committed by two suspects who claim they were her friends. Melissa Jenkins was a 33-year-old single mother who, on the surface, seemed like your typical American woman. But in reality, she was far more than that. Melissa was truly one of the nicest women in her area, and she would do just about anything for anyone. Everyone in her community, both before and after her untimely passing, had nothing but nice things to say about her. She made a living by teaching at St. Johnsbury Academy in Vermont. St. Johnsbury is a private school, but it's considered a non-profit as well, giving it a leg up over some other schools of this nature. Melissa was one of the school's science teachers who was loved by all of her students. Every year, it seemed like students fought as hard as they could to land a place in her class. She was a great teacher who got on well with all of her students and made sure that each of them felt welcomed, heard, and cared for. She always had her students' best interest at heart and had a true passion for furthering the future generations. When she wasn't teaching science, she spent her time coaching the school's basketball team, coaching grades 9 through 12 as far as I can tell. Melissa knew that if her students were going to succeed, they not only needed a proper education, but they needed an extracurricular outlet as well, and she was more than willing to provide this for them. Not only was Melissa an amazing teacher and coach, but she was a great mother as well. We don't know much about what led Melissa to become a single mother, but we know that she had a two-year-old son who was the center of her world. Unfortunately, she needed to work two jobs to make ends meet, but she was happy to do so if it meant building a better life for her son. To make this happen, she would spend nights and weekends working as a waitress at a local restaurant. Considering Melissa spent almost every waking minute of her day either at work or in the public in some capacity, it became all the more shocking when she seemingly dropped off the face of the earth on March 25th, 2012. None of her friends were able to get in touch with her throughout that evening, and she'd been watching her two-year-old son that evening as well. So her boyfriend grew incredibly concerned for both the safety of Melissa and for her son. After several hours went by and he had still been unable to reach her or locate her, he decided to call 911. It was March 25th, 2012, when police received a call from Melissa's boyfriend. He explained that he'd received a call from Melissa earlier that night about a couple of friends of hers that were having car troubles. He explained that Melissa had offered to come help the friends out, but he never heard another word from her after this, despite dozens of phone calls. Her boyfriend continued by saying that he'd gone out looking for Melissa that evening, but he couldn't find any trace of her. But this is where things get pretty interesting. He explained that Melissa sounded strange when he spoke to her on the phone, but he didn't think much of it at the time. But he grew incredibly concerned when he found her car abandoned on Goss Hollow Road. This doesn't seem to have been a road that she would have normally traveled down. It was just a dirt road a short distance from her home. But her boyfriend couldn't figure out any reason that she would have been in this area at this time of night. When he approached her car, he realized it was still running. He looked in the windows, but there was no sign of Melissa. But then he noticed the most disturbing detail of all. Her son was still strapped into his car seat in the back of the car all by himself. After telling police all of these details, investigators showed up within minutes. We don't know why the young boy wasn't given to his father, but he was sent to live with a family friend while police ironed out the details of what was going on. There were obvious signs of a struggle just outside of the car, including various shoe prints, scrapes, smudges, and unidentified tire tracks. A baseball hat was found on the ground near the front of the car, but it didn't belong to Melissa, and none of her friends or family recognized the hat. 
The tire tracks that were seen a short distance away looked as if the person driving the car had sped away in a hurry, but it was this next piece of evidence found near the tire tracks that made police all the more suspicious. They found Melissa's cell phone on the ground, crushed and rendered useless. Officers collected the phone for evidence, but there wasn't much information on the phone that proved to be beneficial to the investigation. By the time detectives had collected all of the evidence from the scene of the crime, it was beginning to get dark out, meaning their investigation met a new challenge. Regardless, police worked tirelessly through the night to collect every piece of evidence they could, but it seemed the suspects had managed to successfully leave the scene of the crime without leaving anything of significance behind except for Melissa's two-year-old son. As it would turn out, he witnessed the entire struggle, and he was willing to tell the police everything he saw. As with most missing person cases, the first person detective suspected of the crime was Melissa's boyfriend. Police interviewed the boyfriend, and he gave a few conflicting accounts to officers. According to Melissa's brother, the boyfriend wanted a serious relationship, but Melissa just wasn't into him like that, or at the very least, she wasn't ready for such a strong commitment so soon, considering she had a son now. She either wanted to break things off or just keep things somewhat casual. According to her brother, the boyfriend wouldn't let this go, and it seems as though he often pressured Melissa into committing, even though she wasn't ready. But when officers spoke with the boyfriend about this, he claimed that the brother was either lying or ignorant to the truth. According to the boyfriend, he agreed with Melissa's decision to take things slow. Police weren't buying this at first, so they decided to take a mold of his boots to compare them to the boot prints found at the scene of the crime. Turns out they weren't a match, and police decided to let him go. The following day, investigators called in the help of a detective who specialized in interviewing children. They brought in Melissa's son and spoke with him about what had happened that night, the night that his mother went missing. It turns out the boy, despite being only two years old, was able to reveal a lot of information to the police about the crime. He told investigators that his mother had been attacked by two people. Not only this, but when police asked him what happened to his mom, he grabbed himself by the neck, looked at the detective and said, mommy cried. After hearing this terrifying confession from Melissa's son, the next person of interest was the father of Melissa's son. Just to clarify things here, Melissa's boyfriend, the one that we've been speaking about up to this point, the one that discovered her car, was not the father of her son. The boy's father lived about 80 miles away in Burlington. Police interviewed him, but he had an alibi and was cleared almost immediately. This brought police back to St. Johnsbury. When they made their way into Melissa's home, they searched every square inch of the property, but found no indication of a struggle or anything that was amiss. It seemed as though they'd reached a dead end. But as they looked around, they noticed one small detail that seemed vaguely interesting. A business card for a snow plowing business, owned by Alan and Patricia Prue. The police didn't know if this business card was significant, but it seemed as though she'd only recently received the card, so they thought the owners of the business might have some details to share if they happened to be present prior to the crime taking place. By this point in the investigation, police strongly suspected that Melissa had already lost her life. They kept their options open, but they prepared for the worst, as the evidence found at the scene of the crime didn't suggest that the perpetrators intended to keep Melissa alive for very long, and time was running out. Police searched every possible area where someone might have wanted to dispose of incriminating evidence, but they continually turned up empty-handed. They even searched all of the local rest stops and ditches, but there was nothing to be found. It was around the 24-hour mark that investigators received a tip that would blow the case wide open. Someone had called in from a local boat launch and reported that they noticed something suspicious sticking out of the water in a local fishing spot. Investigators didn't think much of it, but they decided to investigate anyway. Once they arrived, they immediately knew that they had encountered a crime scene. As they drew closer to the mysterious object in the water, they found out quite quickly that this wasn't an object. It was a woman, and this woman was none other than Melissa Jenkins. A scuba team was called to the scene of the crime to help collect all of the evidence that may have been left underwater. Mind you, all of this was taking place in the middle of March in Vermont. The waters were borderline freezing temperatures, but the scuba team had a job to do, and they did it well. As they looked under the water, they found that Melissa had been secured in place with a few cinder blocks and rope. 
Thankfully, they were able to free her without much issue, allowing police to look into the case without too much degradation of evidence. Photos from the scene have been kept under wraps, but officers revealed that Melissa was placed in the water face down. She was then secured with the aforementioned cinder blocks and rope, and was then covered up with sticks and brush to try to conceal her location. But this seems to have been done in a haphazard rush, proving that the criminals weren't prepared for this crime ahead of time. None of Melissa's clothes were found at the scene of the crime, and there was virtually no other evidence to lead investigators to the suspects that may have done this. But when she was pulled from the water, police realized something that shocked them to their core. When police looked into the evidence that was collected directly from Melissa's remains, they found that she was covered in bruises and had several serious wounds that were inflicted immediately prior to her losing her life. These wounds were indicative of a stun gun being repeatedly used, but the next piece of evidence wasn't what officers would have ever expected. They found that someone had taken Melissa's life with their bare hands, an up-close and personal attack that wasn't consistent with the evidence officers had collected up to this point. They believed that they were initially investigating a crime of opportunity, but now they were investigating a crime of passion. When officers began to backtrack Melissa's steps from that day, they first checked her phone records to see who she'd spoken to that evening. They found one call had come in from a prepaid burner phone at around 8.30 that evening. They found that the burner phone had only been used to make this one single call. This led investigators to a store in New Hampshire where the phone had been purchased. When they asked the manager about the sale of the phone, they learned that the device had been purchased with a check. The signature on the check tied it to none other than Patricia Prue, the same name that had been printed on the business card that was found inside of Melissa's home. Police planned on calling in the Prues to interrogate them, but as it would turn out, they didn't need to call them, because when they arrived back at the police station, the Prues were there waiting on them. When officers spoke with the couple, Patricia said that she'd come into the police station to report her identity as being stolen, and she believed her ex-husband was behind it. But police quickly turned the conversation to Melissa Jenkins, and the couple both admitted that they had met Melissa before. In fact, they were friends of hers. They'd plowed her driveway a couple times the previous winter, and friends and family of Melissa also said that this was true. They learned that Melissa was very friendly with the Prue couple, but that she hadn't spoken to them in several months. They had been reasonably close friends leading up to this, but according to one of Melissa's friends, Melissa had to end their agreement because she was creeped out by Alan. As it would turn out, Alan Prue had romantic feelings towards Melissa, but these feelings were not mutual. Alan had asked her out on multiple dates, but Melissa repeatedly declined and eventually terminated their business agreement as a result. The Prues were allowed to leave the police station that day, but they were secretly placed under police surveillance over the next few days. Investigators knew that the couple were acting suspicious, and they believed that they may be involved in the crime, but they just didn't have any evidence to prove it just yet. Police eventually managed to retrieve the CCTV footage from the store where the burner phone had been purchased. And as expected, both Alan and Patricia were seen in the footage. During their interrogation with the couple, police noted that Alan mentioned visiting a drive through restaurant that same evening. So they requested footage from the restaurant as well. When the footage finally arrived, investigators were speechless. The CCTV footage showed Alan wearing the same hat that had been found at the scene of the crime that day the one that had been left in front of Melissa's car. Police called the couple back in for follow-up questions, this time speaking to them separately. Patricia denied any involvement and any knowledge about the crime, even when she was confronted with the CCTV footage and the images from the scene of the crime. Alan, on the other hand, buckled under pressure. Alan opened up to the officers and explained the details of what had taken place that fateful evening, and it wasn't pretty. Police knew that he'd previously shown a romantic interest in Melissa, but they couldn't have expected what he revealed next. Alan admitted that his wife was bisexual. Not only this, but she struggled with monogamy. She would often ask Alan if they could invite other partners into their bedroom, and he felt forced to comply. On this particular occasion, the couple had agreed to find someone willing to come home with them, and Alan specifically wanted to bring Melissa into the equation. The two hatched a plan to fake car troubles, calling Melissa to help them. 
It seems that the plan was simply to try to seduce Melissa into coming home with them, but the plan went south very quickly. Soon after Melissa arrived, Alan jumped on her and managed to overpower her, but he wasn't able to finish the job. Patricia then jumped in and put an end to things, and the two worked together to stow Melissa in the back of their car, now panicking about what they had done. All the while, Melissa's son watched from the back seat of the car, with both Alan and Patricia blissfully unaware that Melissa had even brought her son with her that evening. The crime wasn't premeditated, so to speak. Yes, they conspired together to try to get Melissa to go home with them, but both Alan and Patricia insist that they had no plans of taking her life that day, and the evidence certainly seems to support this. Alan says that even after things went south, he still had no plans of claiming her life. He admitted to police that he wasn't feeling like himself that night and seems to have been filled with misguided rage, but when he realized what he was doing, he stopped. But that's where Patricia jumped in to finish the job, allegedly against Alan's wishes. During the couple's court proceedings and future interrogations, Alan continually claimed that Patricia was the one to blame for claiming Melissa's life. He admitted to letting his temper get the better of him, and he was willing to accept whatever punishment the court deemed necessary, but he never admitted to taking her life. Regardless, a jury decided that they were both guilty and sentenced each of them to life in prison. Both Patricia and Alan have appealed their sentences since then, but their cries have fallen on deaf ears. In the years since the crime, both Alan and Patricia have continued to blame one another, passing the buck, so to speak. The truth is, we don't know which of these two was truly the mastermind behind the crime. All I can say for sure is that, thankfully, it doesn't look like either of these two will ever see the light of day again, and Melissa's family can finally begin their search for closure. Laura Babcock had a life that was seemingly perfect. She'd just gotten a college degree, was surrounded by friends who loved her, and she was on the path to secure the job of her dreams. But all of that changed when she got unexpectedly involved in a love triangle that she couldn't get out of. Laura was blissfully unaware that the man that she'd fallen for had a series of incredibly dark secrets that he'd been keeping from her. Investigators claimed that Laura was subjected to an unspeakable crime and it ultimately resulted in her losing her life and being disposed of in the most creative yet heartless way you could imagine. Detectives spent months collecting evidence and investigating this crime, and in the end, two criminals were placed behind bars. But they're not anyone you would have expected. This is a story that is bizarre from beginning to end. This is the twisted case of Laura Babcock. Before we keep going with today's story, I want to let you guys know about the sponsor of today's video, MyHeritage. MyHeritage is the leading global service for family history research, and they even offer DNA testing that adds a whole new spin on researching your genealogy. MyHeritage is incredibly easy to use, and it's super useful if you're trying to build your own family tree. I was able to set up my own personal family tree in a matter of minutes. Once you add in the information about your parents and grandparents, MyHeritage will make the rest of the process super quick and easy. Searching over 19 billion historical documents to help connect your family members to your tree. There's a really cool feature called Instant Discoveries that'll link you with countless people from your lineage, dating back several generations, introducing you to so many people that you probably never even knew about. I was able to trace my family all the way back to 1695. I found that on my maternal grandmother's side, my family were descendants of Native Americans. On my maternal grandfather's side, we all came from Europe. On my father's side, things were a lot more simple. We've basically lived in Mississippi for hundreds of years, even before the United States was even founded. And we're all still here today, too. The really cool thing about my heritage is that it'll even link you with documents, photos, and pretty much anything else that's been stored in the database regarding your family, letting you take an even closer look at the lives of these people you've never even known about. If you happen to find some old photos of your family, they even offer a feature to colorize these photos, bringing new life to these people that have long since passed. It's a super cool service, so I'd strongly urge you guys to check it out. If you click the link in the description, you'll not only be given a 14-day trial, but you'll also get 50% off your membership. Give it a try and let me know what you find. You never know, we may actually be related somewhere along the line. Thanks to MyHeritage for sponsoring today's video.
Laura Babcock was just 23 years old in the summer of 2012. Laura had a core group of friends that she depended on, as well as a family who cared deeply for her. She was known for having the most sincere love for dogs, but she also had aspirations of starting her own family one day and eventually settling down with someone she loved. Laura's personality was described pretty interestingly by one reporter who recalled her as being the perfect mixture of optimistic and conflicted. Laura was a strong young woman, but she also had a few demons. Laura had struggled with her mental health in the past, but she was on the path to making things better for herself. In 2012, she just graduated from college and got her degree in English as well as drama. She'd been attending the University of Toronto for a number of years and was super excited to finally put her life as a student behind her so that she could get to work on her career. She'd been spending her time searching for a more permanent job where she could begin to place her roots and grow. But she quickly learned that finding an honest, good paying job isn't as easy as some people would make it seem. After spending quite some time trying to find a suitable position and being unable to do so, Laura started to get impatient. Worse yet, she'd begun having disagreements with her parents. Although Laura was 23 and equipped with a solid education, she continued to live at home with her parents while she tried to make ends meet. Her parents were happy to have her, but they had strict rules that she was expected to follow. This was the cliche situation of stay at home as long as you want, but if you live under my roof, you live by my rules. Laura respected this to a certain extent, but tensions began to rise when Laura began to push back on her parents' rules about curfew. She'd missed curfew multiple times in the past, and this was beginning to be a problem for her parents. Rather than agreeing to her parents' rules, Laura decided that enough was enough and she'd moved out on her own. Well, sort of. She moved out, but she wasn't entirely on her own just yet. She wasn't able to afford her own place to stay, so she opted to hop from couch to couch, bouncing between the homes of her various friends. While this certainly isn't a great lifestyle decision, Laura just needed some space and time away from her parents while she tried to establish herself as her own person. Her father clarified that she'd not been banished from their home due to her curfew violations, but he made it clear that he didn't approve of her coming home at 2 or 3 in the morning multiple times a week, which is when Laura eventually opted to just move out. Without a job and desperate for money, one of Laura's friends introduced her to a new idea. While waiting for a more traditional job that utilizes her degree, why not try joining the escort business? To put it plainly, an escort is someone who's paid for their companionship. Escort services are widely available to people of all genders and walks of life, and most of the time it just involves accompanying someone to an event, or just paying the person to hang out with you and be friendly. But sometimes escort services require more than simple friendship, depending on the client's requirements and requests. Laura was apprehensive about this line of work, but she knew that she needed money, and she needed it quickly. So she opted to give it a try. Those around Laura noticed that pretty soon after she joined this particular workforce, her mood began to change. Her father recalls this time in her life and says that it was clear that Laura was growing frustrated. He said she always seemed agitated and on edge and would have a hard time staying still. One of her friends recalled her time working as an escort and said that Laura had a lot of emotional issues, but that they understood each other. And overall, Laura was a happy and outgoing person. But by the spring of 2012, that had begun to change. A darkness had begun to envelop Laura and there was nothing her family could do to stop it. By July of that year, Laura stopped contacting her family and soon after, she was never heard from again. It quickly became clear to those around her that Laura had been hiding some dark secrets from those that she held closest. Laura's boss, the owner of Last Minute Escorts, recalled that Laura had big aspirations of becoming an actress. He remembered Laura fondly, explaining that she worked for him multiple times in the past. Outside of this, three other men spoke up about their time working with Laura. All three men agreed that they'd never had intimate relations with her. Their business was purely professional. But a couple of other people she worked with weren't as open about the time they spent with Laura, leaving a lot of room for speculation. One of her former clients was a TV and film producer who let Laura stay at his house for at least two weeks. Another of her clients was a doctor who offered to help Laura pay for an apartment so that she could be on her own. But both this doctor and all of Laura's other clients stopped hearing from her in early July of 2012. It was around this same time that a man named Dellen Millard reappeared in Laura's life. 
Dellen and Laura went way back. They met back in 2008 and dated for a short while before calling things off. Dellen was incredibly well off, financially speaking. He's often described as a millionaire and was the heir to the thriving business Millard Air, which is an aviation company based out of Toronto. When Lauren and Dellen met, they hit it off instantly. They would share an on-again, off-again relationship before eventually losing contact sometime in early 2009. By 2010, Laura had moved on and met a new man named Sean Lerner. Sean and Laura shared a much deeper relationship and dated for about a year and a half before things were broken off around Christmas of 2011. We'll get back to Sean in just a minute, but around the same time that the relationship had begun to fall apart, Laura was struggling pretty seriously. She'd been admitted to a hospital in August of 2011 after she confessed to doctors that she felt as though she cried all hours of the day and was suffering from serious bouts of depression and anxiety. But it's never been publicly revealed why she was having these issues. It's possible that she was simply coming to terms with the fact that her relationship was falling apart, but it's also possible that there were deeper issues here that just haven't been shared publicly. Laura eventually confessed that she'd begun to harm herself, and that's when doctors began to take her case a bit more seriously, with one report suggesting that she began taking antidepressant medication as a result. By April of 2012, about six or seven months later, Laura had returned to the hospital at least 12 more times due to various mental health issues. Laura was losing it, and she was spiraling quickly. Her friends began to grow increasingly concerned, but there was very little that they could do other than just be there for her and comfort her. To make matters even worse, this is when Dell and Millard came back into the picture. While Dellen and Laura had broken up about four years prior, they still kept in touch from time to time. With Laura now being single, she decided to reach back out to Dellen to see if there was anything left between the two of them. And as luck would have it, there was. But there was also a catch. Dellen had begun dating someone about a year prior to this, sometime in early 2011. His new girlfriend, Christina, was a bit of an interesting character. She and Laura had multiple arguments, and what it ultimately boiled down to was Christina being jealous of the bond that Laura and Dellen shared. It was clear that there was something special between the two of them, and Christina felt threatened by this. To make matters even worse, Dellen and Christina weren't even in a committed relationship. While they were technically together, Dellen says that they were in an open relationship, and he claims that Christina was aware that he was actively sleeping with other people, one of these people being Laura. In February of 2012, Laura turned 23, and on her birthday, she received a text from Christina. The text read, Happy birthday. A year ago today was the first time I slept with Dellen. Laura, seemingly unfazed by this, responded by saying, That's fine, I slept with him a couple weeks ago. It was clear from this moment on, there was some serious bad blood between the two, but Dellen wanted no part of it. It would seem that Dellen wasn't looking to reignite anything serious with Laura. This became clear when he texted her a short while later and explained that he felt that Laura was a bad influence for him. He requested that she not contact him anymore until she'd made a quote, huge leap of self-discovery. He concluded this by saying, as I said before, good luck with life. It was very clear that Dellen was done with Laura, but Laura's version of events paints a different picture. While Dellen claims that Christina knew about his promiscuity, Laura doesn't believe that Christina knew the extent of Dellen's actions. A text that she sent to another friend named Andrew suggests that Dellen was cheating on Christina behind her back, and the two weren't actually in an open relationship. Laura seems to have regretted hooking up with Dellen to an extent, because she believed he and Christina were on the same page, but would soon learn after that they weren't. I'll spare you all of the he said, she said drama and cut to the chase. In April of 2012, Christina had had enough. She wanted Laura out of their lives for good, and Dellen admitted that he was willing to make that happen. He texted Christina and told him that he'd take care of Laura. He didn't even beat around the bush about it. When Christina asked what he planned to do, he said, quote, first I'm going to hurt her, then I'll make her leave. I will remove her from our lives. By June of 2012, Sean Lerner, the man who Laura had been dating for about a year and a half, stepped back into her life. He'd heard about how bad off she was and he wanted to do his best to help her. The two had no plans of getting back together, but Sean still cared for Laura deeply and wanted to help her get back on her feet. Sean had also learned that Laura had begun working for last-minute escorts. 
when he found out about how bad of shape she was in, he paid for her to stay in a motel for a few days and even gave her an iPad so that she could look for apartments in the area. When he pressed Laura about her involvement in the escort business, she repeatedly assured him that her business was not of a sexual nature and that she was nothing more than arm candy for lonely men. Sean says that he still believes there was more to it than this. If this weren't bad enough, several of Laura's friends also explained that around the same time, they have reason to believe that Laura had developed an addiction to illegal substances. Laura, to put it lightly, was not having a good time. You can't help but feel terrible for her after everything she'd been through. But at the same time, we also have to admit Laura was an adult capable of making adult decisions. It seems that she just kept making one bad decision after another, and it led her down a path that quickly became too treacherous to come back from. All throughout this time, despite Laura's claims that she didn't want to be involved with Dellen, and despite his claims that he didn't want to be involved with her either, Laura and Dellen remained in almost constant contact. In fact, in the days leading up to her disappearance, Laura and Dellen spoke on the phone at least 100 times. I wasn't able to confirm if this communication was via calls or texts, but either way, they were still on speaking terms and they were making the most of it. The two had made plans to meet up on the evening of July 3rd, and later that night, Laura headed toward Kipling subway station in Toronto, where Dellen picked her up, driving her to his home. An hour later, Laura's phone turned off and would never come back on again. Now, fair warning, the case takes a rapid nosedive from here, and the events all take place rather quickly, one right after the other. So buckle down and maybe even take some notes because things are about to get crazy in very rapid succession. After Laura met up with Dellen that evening, Dellen sent out a text message at around 7.30 p.m. to his friend, Mark Smitch. The message read, I'm on a mission, back in one hour. No further texts were sent after this. The very next day, Sean Lerner received a notification that the iPad that he'd given Laura had suddenly been renamed Mark's iPad. Safe to assume that Dellen's aforementioned friend, Mark, had come into possession of Laura's iPad. But how? Immediately after this, Dellen took a photo on his cell phone, showing an object wrapped in a blue tarp located on his farm in Waterloo. And it's been suggested that this photo was shared with Mark. Later that same day, Dellen accepted a same-day delivery for a brand new mattress. I think we can all tell what's probably going on here. Laura spends the night, then all of a sudden Dellen's taking photos of something wrapped in a tarp, then buying a new mattress? Things were getting fishy to say the least. But if this wasn't clear enough, things are about to get worse. In the days leading up to all this, Dellen had contacted his mechanic friend and asked him to make arrangements to deliver an animal incinerator to his farm. This incinerator arrived on July 5th, two days after Laura was last seen. This brings us to July 14th, 2012, the day that Laura's family decided to file a missing person report. See, Laura was known to lose touch with her parents from time to time. After all, they were still caught up in a bit of a disagreement at this point. But it was incredibly unusual for Laura to not make contact with her friends. It's been noted that she spoke to her friends literally every single day up to this point. But when the missing person report was filed, Sean Lerner says that police didn't seem concerned in Laura's case at all, especially after they learned about her mental health issues and her work as an escort. It was almost as if they completely shut down after learning this. Nine days passed by without any leads coming to or from the police who were working the case. But on the evening of July 23rd, Dellen sent a text message to Mark saying, barbecue has run its warm up. It's ready for meat. Immediately after this text was sent, Dellen made a Google search, seeking the correct temperature for cremation. Soon after, Dellen took a photo of Mark standing next to the cooker. The objects that were seen inside the cooker at this point were later described by a forensic expert as resembling human bones. By late July, Laura's final phone bill was delivered to her parents' home. Desperate for answers, her parents opened the bill and looked at her call history. They immediately noticed that the final calls she made were to Dellen, someone she'd supposedly written off and moved on from. This was the biggest red flag her parents could have possibly found, and they immediately called all her other friends desperate for more information about her secret relationship with Dellen. One of the people her parents reached out to was Sean Lerner. Sean took it upon himself to reach out to Dellen, asking if he had any information about Laura. He sent Dellen a text that read, quote, 
I'm not looking to point a finger at anyone, but we're concerned about Laura, and it looks like you were the last person to correspond with her. Dellen initially ignored these texts, but the two later set up a time to meet at a local Starbucks to chat about the situation. When the date finally rolled around, the two spoke briefly before Dellen began making allegations that Laura was nothing but an addict who continued hounding him hoping for a fix. Dellen says he repeatedly denied Laura's requests and had no involvement in her disappearance. But then he made a pretty shocking statement. As the two ended their conversation, Dellen informed Sean that he should have, quote, no reasonable expectation of finding her. This brings us to August of 2012, when the pieces finally began to fit together. Mark had invited a few of his friends over to his mother's home, and they were hanging out in the garage when Mark began rapping. I can't tell if he was rapping as a joke or if he was serious about it, but my gosh, is it awful. In this weird rap, Mark says that she started off as skin and bone, and now she lays on ashy stone. And he ends the segment by claiming, if you go swimming, you can find her phone. I don't know about you, but this sounds like a confession if I've ever heard one. Mark's friends were apparently shocked by this as well, and that's why they eventually agreed to testify against Mark, saying that he would later confess to claiming a girl's life, burning the remains, and then disposing of the evidence in a lake. Mark was very clearly terrible at keeping secrets. This was all investigators needed to pin both Mark and Dellen for the disappearance of Laura Babcock. But this isn't the end of the case by any means. After detectives learned of Mark's ridiculous confession, they obviously pieced together the connection to Laura Babcock's case. But they also started to reinvestigate another crime that involved Dellen's own father, Wayne Millard. Wayne had lost his life a while back, but investigators initially ruled that he'd claimed his own life, resulting in Dellen becoming the heir to his father's multi-million dollar estate. But now that they learned the extent of Dellen's involvement with Laura, they wanted to re-examine his father's case, planning to pin Dellen for that crime as well. If this weren't bad enough, investigators also learned of a third man who was involved with Dellen. This man had listed a pickup truck for sale on a local shopping app, and Dellen and Mark showed up to test drive it. While out driving the car, they claimed the life of the owner and presumably stole the truck. This victim was also disposed of in the duo's makeshift incinerator. Now, the story of Dellen and Mark goes much deeper than this, and pretty much everyone who knew the two were somehow involved in the case with a female friend of the two even being accused of helping clean up the scene of the crime and destroying evidence. If you'd like to see a more in-depth look at the crimes of these two, just let me know in the comments and I may revisit this in the future. But for today's video, I want to stay focused on Laura Babcock. For the duo's crimes against Laura, they were each sentenced to 25 years behind bars. Even though Laura's remains have never been found, Dellen has since appealed the charges placed against him regarding the disappearance of Laura, but it seems safe to assume that these appeals will most likely be denied. Thankfully, Laura's family were finally able to get justice for the horror that their daughter was put through. But in the end, this doesn't bring Laura back. It doesn't really solve anything at all. We may never know why Dellen went to such drastic means to get Laura out of his life. There's truly no sense to it. It's heartwarming to know that this pathetic shell of a man was finally taken off the streets of Toronto, but it doesn't change the fact that the damage is already done. Who would have imagined that a devoted wife and loving stepmother would vanish, leaving behind her loved ones? Katrina Smith was set for a big job interview on that fateful day. Excited about this new promotion, she shared the news with her family. But unfortunately, she never made it to the interview. Her colleagues called her husband, worried that their star employee was not at work that day. But here's the real shocker. Her husband didn't know where she was either. Panic set in and everyone asked, where's Katrina Smith? Little did they know that they would uncover a shocking truth that no one could have expected.
Katrina Smith was a 30-year-old wife and stepmother to three girls, ages 21, 18, and 60. She had two siblings, Miranda and Chad, who described her as the funniest woman they'd ever met. Katrina made growing up fun for them, and while at home, she went on shopping trips with them or visited random eateries to try out new recipes. Her siblings could talk to her about anything and everything, and even though Chad didn't spend much time with the family, Katrina visited him often. She was friends with his wife and always gave him good advice. He was amazed at how much his younger sister knew. He admired her wisdom and kindness, and to Chad, Katrina was more than a member of the family, she was a true friend. Katrina worked with her husband, Todd, in insurance before working in the Human Resources Department at Cameron Company in Belvedere. When Katrina wasn't working, she volunteered at Heartland Church. She had a bright, cheerful spirit that everyone noticed. She also enjoyed geocaching, a fun community game where you use a GPS to go on a small treasure hunt to find trinkets or hidden items. Katrina's family says that her smile was infectious and spread wherever she went. Katrina Smith lived in McChesney Park in Illinois. This town is part of a larger community of Rockford. Rockford's about 100 miles from Chicago and about 20 miles from the Wisconsin border, known for being a blue collar community. When you visit this town, you'll see many industrial plants as you stroll along the river downtown. To locals, this is what the city is known for, but to outsiders, this is a place famous for Rockford peaches. Unfortunately, Rockford ranks top among the most violent cities in the US. This was where Katrina lived with her husband, Todd, and the two had met when Katrina was in her 20s while Todd worked as a DJ. And despite Todd being 15 years older, it didn't stop them from falling in love. Katrina told her friends that Todd fit in with her family. Even though Todd had three daughters from his previous marriage, it didn't matter to her. They got engaged and then got married. Katrina and Todd shared hobbies together at home and even ran a family business. The two spent every waking minute with one another. They'd been married for about seven years at the time of Katrina's disappearance. In fact, they celebrated their wedding anniversary with a vacation just a short while before she vanished. As far as everyone could tell, these two were deeply in love. But unknown to her family, it was all a show. Katrina was tired of her marriage and wanted to leave Todd. She'd moved out of their home and stayed with a friend in Roscoe for a while, and she had even met with the divorce attorney. Turns out, Katrina had secretly fallen for another man named Guy Gabriel and told him how unhappy she was in her marriage. She hoped to finalize her divorce with Todd and start a new life with Guy. Despite Guy being arrested for domestic battery, Katrina saw him as a genuine, honest man. He was everything Todd wasn't. But before settling in with Guy Gabriel and officially leaving Todd, Katrina wanted to get a new job. The night before her big job interview, October 22nd, 2012, she visited Todd's place to do her laundry, as well as finally break the news that she decided to file for divorce. We don't really know how this conversation went over with Todd, but it seems as though he took the news fairly well, all things considered. Katrina finally left the house at around 9 p.m. that evening, but after that, she was never seen again. Her kids texted her multiple times, as did her husband and boyfriend but all of their messages and calls remained unread and unanswered. No sooner than Katrina left the home that evening, she was gone. Considering Katrina never checked in with Todd to explain how the job interview went, and considering she never answered any of his calls, Todd was getting worried and called Katrina's sister, Miranda, to tell her he believed Katrina may be missing. Miranda was hopeful that her sister would be found later on that day, but this never happened. Todd later phoned Paige, his oldest daughter from his first marriage, and he told her he hadn't seen her stepmom for quite some time and couldn't get a hold of her. Paige was confused. Like Miranda, she knew Katrina would not just leave without a note or something. It was totally unlike her. After reaching out to all of their friends and loved ones and learning that no one had seen or spoken to Katrina in nearly 24 hours, that evening, Todd contacted local authorities to tell them about the disappearance of his wife. Earlier that day, Katrina's boss called Todd, wondering why she didn't show up for work. Every time before this, when she knew she wouldn't be at work, she would at least call and give some sort of notice, but not this time. Guy was confused too. He hadn't seen her that day, but knew she was at Todd's house the previous night. Todd told the police that his wife was scheduled for the interview that day, but never appeared, and he confirmed that she'd been with him that night before, and they chatted briefly, but then she just vanished. Hours after Todd Smith reported the incident, Katrina's photo was plastered all around Rockford, 
The news spread like wildfire, with everyone doing their best to try to track her down. What's really interesting is that weeks before her disappearance, Katrina Smith reported that someone was stalking her. Turns out, a teenager had developed an unhealthy obsession with her. He followed her everywhere, desperately seeking her attention. Of course, the 30-year-old had nothing to offer him, repeatedly turning him down, and her boss also recalled that something bizarre had happened in the parking lot. A guy had thrown flyers out of his car window, containing some bizarre accusations about Katrina. The contents of these flyers have never been confirmed, but police began to wonder if this man may have been involved in her disappearance somehow. Family, friends, and volunteers knocked on every door. They went to nearly every home in the area looking for evidence. They asked both children and adults questions about any suspicious movements in the area. Hundreds of people gathered for a candlelit vigil to pray for Katrina's return, but it ultimately felt like feeding a lion with breadcrumbs. Their efforts just weren't working. Meanwhile, Todd conducted numerous media interviews to appeal to the public to help his wife return home safely. He originally didn't want to go on TV because he feared people would judge him, but somebody convinced him that it might help, so he gave it a shot. It was clear to everyone who saw his pleas for help that this man was seriously struggling. His whole world was flipped upside down. When detectives really began to dig into the case, the first person they spoke to was Todd Smith. As investigators questioned Todd, the search party was out searching for evidence. Around 24 hours after Katrina's missing person report was filed, detectives stumbled across her blue Chevy Cruze, abandoned on the side of the road in a residential neighborhood. A day later, her purse was found about 150 yards away from the car. The following day, her cell phone was found in a bush beside the road. While her family tried to make sense of these findings, a search group found blood-soaked paper towels in a field just south of where her car was parked. This was not the news anyone had been hoping for. A couple of weeks passed by, and the case took a shocking twist when an off-duty firefighter who was fishing in the Rock River near Byron noticed something floating down the river like a log. Because it was dark, he couldn't see what it was, so he took out his flashlight and shone it on the strange object. Even though he couldn't determine what it was, a gut feeling told him something was wrong. As the light hit the water, he saw clothing on what appeared to be a torso. His heart raced as he realized it was a body. He immediately contacted the Winnebago County detectives, who arrived in just minutes. As they pulled the body from the river, it became very clear it had been floating here for quite some time. Although the victim was clothed, her dress was faded and unidentifiable. She was in such bad shape at the time that no one even knew who this person was. But after a forensic analysis was carried out, it was unfortunately determined that this was Katrina Smith. She'd passed away from blunt force trauma to the head or possibly drowning. It was never confirmed which of these truly claimed her life. She suffered numerous bruises on her arms, body, and legs, and it was clear she had been through a lot before she lost her life. The missing person case now turned into a heartbreaking homicide investigation. Detectives had a long list of suspects, including some family members. But first, they had to start with the last person she was seen with, Todd Smith, her husband. Katrina's phone became a crucial piece of evidence in her investigation. When the police retrieved it, they uncovered some shocking evidence. They found an unusually large number of text messages from Guy Gabriel on the night that she disappeared. This sudden spike in communication suddenly raised their suspicions. But Guy was at work that evening, so he had an airtight alibi. As far as police could tell, there was no chance that Guy was involved. As the police looked further into Katrina's life, though, they discovered she was being followed, and not by the obsessive teen that I mentioned a moment ago, but by someone else. She had a second stalker. Nobody knew who it was, but the evidence suggested it may have been Todd. Police began to look very closely at him. Unknown to many, Todd had an interesting criminal history. In 1985, when he was 17, he confessed to disconnecting a gas line in the home that he shared with his mother, stepfather, and three half-siblings. He stood outside as the home exploded into flames with his family still inside. Luckily, they all escaped the blast without major injuries. But when the police investigated the case, Todd openly confessed to arson. He told investigators that he had a fight with his mom and wanted to get back at her. He figured that the only way to do that was to scare her. 
He not only scared her, but he destroyed the home that they'd been living in for years. Todd was sentenced to 30 months probation and 160 hours of community service. He pleaded guilty to arson and waived his right to a trial. Todd later married his first wife, Teresa, and they had three daughters together. At the time, he struggled to provide for his family, and Teresa was getting overwhelmed. She worked full-time, and the burden of supporting the young family fell solely on her. After their third daughter was born, the couple was forced to sell their home to pay off debts. This was the last straw. Working two jobs and caring for three daughters and a husband was just too much to handle. Eventually, she filed for divorce, and they shared custody of their three daughters. But when Teresa thought that she was finally free of this bad situation, something terrible happened. Something she never spoke to anyone about until Katrina's passing. One evening, just as she pulled into the driveway of her mother's home, someone snuck up behind her as she was getting out of her car, punching her in the face without any warning. The attacker was wearing a werewolf Halloween mask. She quickly fell to the ground, enduring the punches and kicks of this masked man who just refused to let up. She thought about what would happen if her mother came out of the house to find her lying lifeless in the front yard, and this thought gave her a rush of adrenaline that was enough to jump off the ground, push her attacker backward, and then run for her life. A neighbor who heard her screaming phoned 911 and filed a police report that very night. When police spoke with Teresa later on and asked her who the suspect could be, she said, my husband, Todd. Police took fingernail scrapings from Teresa and compared them to fibers on Todd's jacket, but the results were inconclusive. They wanted to test for DNA, but Todd refused. Because the police couldn't get a search warrant to obtain his DNA sample, they closed the case and that was pretty much the end of it. But after the divorce from his first wife, Todd would meet Katrina, and they eventually got married and moved to Rockford, Illinois. Todd gave investigators plenty of reasons to suspect him for claiming Katrina's life. First, he grew agitated when he was separated from his family and friends during questioning. He didn't like that he was considered a suspect. Todd was so angry that he called Detective Vince Lindbergh to complain about the information the police gave Katrina's family. He questioned why the police told her family about the blood that was found in her vehicle's trunk. But the thing is, police hadn't found blood in Katrina's trunk. In fact, they'd only just received her car to begin processing it for evidence, but nothing had actually been processed yet. So how did Todd know that there would be blood found in the trunk? If that's not bad enough, well, things only got worse from here. For instance, while interrogating him, Todd turned red-faced and buried his head in his hands while making noises that sounded like crying. But when officers looked closely, they saw no tears. When officers confronted him with evidence from his wife's affair, he pretended to be shocked. But it was clear that Todd knew all along about his wife's infidelity and the identity of her lover. And that's because he'd previously found a card in Katrina's car that had come from Guy, in which he described her as the love of his life. Todd denied ever throwing vulgar flyers about his wife into the parking lot of her place of work. But a surveillance camera in the parking lot showed a vehicle that had no license plate, and police believed it had been borrowed from a local car dealership. The cops scoured every car lot in town to find a match, and eventually they found the dealership. The owner confirmed that Todd visited the store several weeks back looking for a car. The black Volkswagen in the corner of the lot caught his attention, and he test drove it around town. He further added that anybody who test drives a vehicle must provide a photocopy of their driver's license. He helped investigators get the license copies, and they found Todd Smith's photocopied license at the bottom of the stack. This confirmed that Todd took a car for a test drive on October 9, 2012, the same day the parking lot incident took place. On October 30th, police got a warrant to search Todd's house. And without alerting anyone, they stormed in and retrieved his laptop and a baseball bat from the garage. This bat appeared to be covered in blood. Detectives immediately sent the bat to the crime lab for analysis. And about three weeks later, they found traces of Katrina's DNA on the bat. Todd was immediately arrested. On the night of October 22nd, 2012, Katrina left her Roscoe condominium and headed to her husband's house to do her laundry. But laundry wasn't the only reason she went there. She planned to tell Todd that she wanted a divorce, as mentioned a moment ago. They'd been living separate lives for quite some time, but they did their best to keep this on the down low until a decision had been made. Well, Katrina made that decision and the divorce was filed for. When she broke the news to Todd, 
Todd tried to talk her out of the divorce, but she insisted she wanted to leave him. He even suggested that they adopt children together, insisting they could fix this, but she was adamant about moving on. She couldn't continue pretending that everything was fine when it wasn't. As the conversation was winding down, Katrina grabbed her things and planned on leaving, but as she neared the door, Todd grabbed a bat and unleashed on her. After she'd fallen unconscious, Todd then placed her in her car, drove her to the Ventura Boulevard area, and tossed her into the river. He then returned to the house on foot after abandoning her car and cleaning up the scene. When police got a hold of his laptop, they saw that he had a file on Katrina. This file included all of the location data for the past several weeks. Turns out, Todd had placed a tracker on her car and was following her every move. At this point, everything was beginning to make sense. His computer showed that Katrina was last seen on the Latham Street Bridge, exactly where her body was found. It took many months before prosecutors put the case together and charged Todd Smith with the crime. Just before her disappearance, Katrina visited a U.S. cellular store in Belvedere three times in October. A sales rep from the store appeared at the trial and told the court that Katrina was scared about her husband accessing her text messages. She didn't want him to know who she'd spoken to and what they discussed. She showed up at the store that day to see about getting a new phone number and a private account that Todd couldn't access. By now, Katrina was convinced that her husband was using her phone to track her movements. But little did she know that the tracker was actually placed on her car. The sales rep advised Katrina to get a restraining order against her husband, especially after she noticed Katrina's hands were shaking and she looked as though she might cry. Katrina never did get that restraining order. Katrina's stepfather, Bruce Edland, also took the stand. He told the jury that Todd had told him about their failing marriage. He didn't believe him at first, but when Katrina stopped joining him for church on Sundays, he was convinced something was wrong. A week before her passing, Katrina texted Bruce, asking him how to obtain an Illinois firearm permit. She also inquired if she could practice at a gun range without such a permit. Edland didn't take much meaning out of these questions, and he shrugged off the feeling that something might be wrong. Prosecutors invited Guy Gabriel to take the stand. He opened up to the public about his relationship with Katrina. It turned out that their relationship started in the office where they worked together. She worked in HR while he was a supervisor in another department. They spent the weekend before her passing together at her condominium in Roscoe. A few days later, in her final messages with Guy, she told him she planned to do laundry at Todd's house and watch Monday Night Football afterward. She also opened up about her plans to divorce Todd. He encouraged her to come clean and communicate with him, laying it all out so they were on the same page. But her tone showed that she was scared of how Todd would react. In fact, she'd been deliberately keeping that information from him for fear of what he may do to her. Despite all of this evidence and all the witness statements, Todd maintained his innocence, but the judge disagreed with Todd. He called Katrina Smith's loss evil and senseless. He said, quote, the fact is, Todd Smith, you killed her. You beat her on the head with a blunt instrument and put her in the river. Your actions after the crime I find unfathomable. You threw her in the river, like a plastic bag going down the river to Oregon. Needless to say, Todd was found guilty and was sentenced to over 50 years behind bars. In the aftermath of the trial, Katrina's family was immensely grateful for the verdict. Her mother, Vicky, let go of a sigh of relief as she finally got justice for her beloved daughter. The trial had been emotionally exhausting for her family, but thankfully Todd was exposed as the monster he truly is. Katrina was laid to rest at Arlington Memorial Park Cemetery on Mount Vernon Highway. In her memory, her family opened a foundation named Sissy's Footprints Foundation. This foundation is dedicated to helping people who've lost loved ones, especially under tragic circumstances, helping them learn to cope and giving them a shoulder to lean on when they need it most. The foundation's website is sissysfootprintsfoundation.com and has a forum where people can share their stories of loss and connect with others for support. In the end, Katrina's family did their best to make the most of an awful, terrible situation. The senseless violence against Katrina is just heartbreaking, that's putting it lightly. To think that one man can feel so entitled, yet be so vile, such a nasty person, I just don't get it. In the end, Katrina had to pay the price for this man's senseless actions, and it just doesn't add up. I just hope that as time passed by, Katrina's family may find some level of comfort in knowing that this man can never hurt anyone ever again.
It was April of 2014 when Chris Kremers and Lizanne Frew, two young girls from the Netherlands, set out on a journey that was half vacation and half mission trip. The girls have been planning a trip to Panama, where they hope to do some hiking and touring, as well as help out some of the less fortunate locals, particularly kids, teaching them arts and crafts as well as learning some Spanish themselves. The girls set out on a scenic hike on April 1st, but less than a day later, the two would disappear. As they were hiking through the Panama jungle, something happened to the two girls that is yet to be fully understood. Months after the victims vanished, investigators came across several key pieces of evidence that left them scratching their heads. As more tips and leads began to pour in, detectives came across a camera that belonged to the two victims. And the photos they found on the camera are disturbing to say the least. Chris Krimmers and Lizanne Froome are the last people you would ever expect to become caught up in a national park disappearance. Most of us have probably heard of the various missing 411 stories that have been shared in recent years, but Chris and Lizanne didn't fit the bill of hikers that would typically go missing. After all, the girls have been planning this trip for more than six months, having their every move mapped out inch by inch. But somehow, tragedy struck and investigators are still working to understand what happened. Chris and Lizanne have been staying with a host family in the days leading up to the first major leg of their journey. The two left their host family's home on April 1st, 2014, to take that family's dog on a walk near some of the scenic forests in the area, passing by the Baru volcano in Bouquet, Panama as they walked. The two victims had come from Amersfoort, Netherlands, so a trip to Panama was unlike anything else they'd ever done in their lives, and they'd been looking forward to it for many months. At this point, the girls had already been in Panama for about two weeks, but this was the first major expedition that they would be taking part in on their own. When they returned from this hike, they were expected to stay in Panama for another four weeks before heading back home. Throughout the upcoming few weeks, their plan was to begin volunteering at a local school and teaching various kids at the school things such as arts and crafts. Unfortunately, their trip didn't go to plan. They headed out from their host family's home at around 11 a.m. on April 1st, and the girls would never be seen again. Before we keep going with today's case, I wanted to show you guys an amazing new mobile game called June's Journey. Now, if you're into true crime stories and unsolved mysteries as much as me, you're gonna love this game. June's Journey is a hidden object game, but with a pretty interesting story involving a murder mystery. It takes place back in the 1920s, and each new scene and level takes you through a different chapter of the story, with June Parker as she works to solve the murder of her sister. The game is completely free to download, and the basic idea of the game is hunting for clues and hidden objects that may help bring June one step closer to solving the case. You can customize and remodel your mansion, as well as your garden island along the way. It's super relaxing to play and easy to pick up when you have a few free minutes here or there throughout the day, and the story is genuinely pretty engaging. You can click the link below in the description to download the game on iOS and Android devices, but it's also available on PC through Facebook games. So if you're ready to dive headfirst into a captivating murder mystery and help June solve the mysterious case surrounding her sister, just click the link below to download June's Journey. Thanks to June's Journey for sponsoring today's video. Chris and Lizanne had spoken about their trip and their upcoming hike on Facebook. In one of their posts, the girls mentioned that they planned on heading to a local village for a tour of the town. Around this time, the girls stopped by a local restaurant to have brunch, and while there, they met two Dutchmen here before heading out on their hike. The girls were particularly excited to have met these two men, being Dutch-speaking people themselves, whereas everyone else in the area only spoke Spanish, at least for the most part. Needless to say, the girls were just happy to have someone to talk to in their native tongue. There weren't really any other updates from the girls after this post on Facebook. They'd planned to spend the rest of the afternoon hiking, planning to return to their host family later that evening. It doesn't seem that the host family was very concerned about the girls' safety. They rightfully assumed everything would be just fine. The path the girls planned on taking was known for being relatively safe, and nothing bad had ever really happened here before. I mean, after all, the host family let the girls take their family dog with them. It seems safe to assume that if the family had any fears about the girls' journey, the dog wouldn't have been allowed to go. 
But as the afternoon sun began to fade and evening crept in, there was no sign of the girl's return. Before long, the family dog had wandered back home alone, and the host family assumed that the girls would follow behind, but they didn't. Before long, the family realized that something wasn't right. The girls were nowhere to be found. The family searched the area surrounding their home, but they didn't find even the slightest piece of evidence. They decided to wait until morning before calling the police, hoping that the girls would turn up overnight, but they never did. It was April 2nd before any alarms were raised about the girls' sudden disappearance. Both Chris and Lizanne were scheduled to take a private tour of a local coffee farm in Bouquet, but they never showed up for their appointment. Their host family knew at this point that enough was enough, and it was time to call investigators to bring the girls home. It wouldn't be until the following morning, April 3rd, that detectives pulled out all of their resources and began an extensive search for the missing girls. A police helicopter was brought in and an aerial search was conducted, but investigators didn't find much of anything. Many locals worked together and volunteered to search more lightly wooded areas nearby, as well as the local village, but there was still no sign of the girls. It would be April 6th before authorities and the girls' family really began to panic. Police knew that the girls left home that day with a bit of food and water, but certainly not enough to sustain them for the five days that they had been missing. Fearing the absolute worst, Chris and Lizanne's families decided to fly down to Panama themselves to help out in the search for their missing daughters, bringing a Dutch detective along with them to help out with the investigation. The families, as well as countless investigators, police dogs, and volunteers searched the nearby forests for a total of 10 days. Eventually, these days turned into weeks, and the weeks turned into months. A search was conducted nearly every day for a total of 10 weeks, but there was no sign of Chris or Lizanne. Literally nothing, not a single shred of evidence. In all reality, it seemed as if the girls had never even entered the woods that day. But then, a breakthrough came. As the police search was winding down and investigators felt as though they'd reached a dead end, a local woman who'd been helping search for the girls turned in a blue backpack. When investigators searched the bag, they found that it contained two pairs of sunglasses, $83 in cash, Lizanne's passport, a water bottle, and two bras. But most importantly, police also found a camera inside the bag, as well as both of the girls' cell phones. Police were first interested in the cell phones. After all, if the girls had really come into trouble along their journey, they would have almost certainly tried to call someone. As it would turn out, they were right. But the results of their investigation were far more heartbreaking than anyone could have expected. As they looked through the call logs of the girls' phones, they found that the girls had made at least 77 attempts to call the police, but they had no service out here in the wilderness, so their calls never rang through to rescuers. Only one call is believed to have gotten through, but this call lasted less than two seconds before the phone lost service again and the call was dropped. Using these call logs, police were able to come up with a clearer picture about what may have taken place on the day the girls headed out on their hike. According to the logs, the girls had placed their first emergency call just hours after setting out from the host family's home. We don't know the specific timeline, but the girls had very clearly gotten into trouble just shortly after their journey began. Remember, their hike started out on April 1st. This is important because, as far as I can tell, all of their emergency call attempts took place on this date. The phones appear to have either been turned off later that day or on April 2nd. I wasn't able to confirm the specific time that the phones were finally shut down. But five days later, on April 6th, Chris's phone was turned on once again, and several attempts were made to unlock the phone using the wrong PIN code, resulting in the phone finally locking itself permanently. By April 11th, both phones had run out of battery. But while all of this information is pretty shocking, to put it lightly, it pales in comparison to what was found on the girl's camera. When police searched the contents of the camera, they found a batch of photos that was taken on April 1st, the day the hike began. It showed all the usual photos of the beautiful natural scenery as well as several photos of the girls enjoying their time on their hike. There wasn't anything suspicious found in any of these initial photos. But as police continued looking through the camera, 
they found a second batch of photos taken seven days later on April 8th. This batch of photos was taken in the middle of the night, between 1 and 4 a.m. The photos showed the girls' belongings spread out on a patch of rocks, neatly separated and divided up with intent and purpose. The images also showed candy wrappers, plastic bags, piles of dirt, and even a mirror, though it doesn't seem like this mirror was ever recovered. But one photo in particular was incredibly shocking to detectives. The photo seemed to show the back of Chris's head, with her hair in a mess. Now, several articles claim that a small amount of blood could be seen in this photo as well, but try as I might, I'm just not able to see anything like this in the photo. If you see it, be sure to let me know in the comments, but I think this information may have been made up or maybe I'm just blind. After finding these shocking and disturbing photos, police decided that this was more than enough evidence to continue with their investigation. They headed down to where the backpack was found by the search and rescue volunteer. The path led them down to a nearby river, and oddly enough, the bag was found in the very center of the river, wedged in between a few rocks. As detectives refocused their search efforts to this area, they soon found a neatly folded pile of clothing next to the banks of the river. About two months later, as the searches continued, they also found a pelvic bone and a boot with a foot still wedged inside. Now, this is the part of the story that I find particularly fascinating. According to investigators, this river is known to flood quite often. In fact, the river has been nicknamed the Grinder because of its frequent flooding and the tremendous difficulty to cross the river. One investigator admitted that finding the backpack and the pelvic bone was nothing more than a stroke of luck. They claimed that within a matter of hours, these two items would have been washed down the river during regular flooding, never to be seen again. Now, I've never heard anyone else mention this in any of the articles that I've read, so I have to pose the question. If this river frequently floods, and all of the items found in it were found purely by sheer luck, then why was there a neatly folded pile of Chris's clothes next to the river? After all, if flooding is such a serious issue, shouldn't these clothes have been washed away in the days or weeks that the girls had now been missing? To me, this suggests that by some crazy miracle, the girls may have survived out there much longer than anyone expected, crossing the river within a few hours or even a day or so of police finding the clothes. Or at the very least, maybe someone else had found the clothes and placed them next to the river more recently, suggesting that they may be, in some way, involved in the girls' disappearance. Now, there are several theories online about the girls potentially being followed into the woods that day and meeting with foul play. But I'll be the first to admit that this theory sounds like a bit of a stretch, but in reality, how else would the clothes have ended up there, neatly folded in a stack? As more time passed by, more and more bones were found along the banks of the riverbed. In the end, officers found a total of 33 bones scattered around the river. After a careful analysis of the bones, they learned that they belonged to both Chris and Lizanne, proving that they both eventually lost their lives in the forest. At this point, I think it's pretty safe to assume that most of us are beginning to believe that the girls had simply gotten lost in the forest that day and maybe eventually slipped and fell or succumbed to the elements. This theory is easy enough to pass off as being true. But you have to remember some of the strange pieces of evidence that were found on the girls' phones and camera. If you remember, the girls were known to have been traveling with only enough food and water to last them through the afternoon comfortably. After all, it was a pretty simple hike that they were taking part in, and they expected to be home by dinner. As far as we know, the girls left for their hike that day equipped with nothing more than a couple candy bars and a couple water bottles, with this taking place on April 1st. So if this is true, and it is, what about the photos that were taken on the girls' camera on April 8th, between 1 and 4 a.m.? The girls couldn't have still had food and water by this point. So how had they managed to survive in the wilderness for seven days with limited sustenance? Now, it could be assumed that they may have been drinking water from the river where their bones were found, but that still doesn't explain the strange photos. One theory that I've seen shared around online is that the girls may have simply been taking the photos so that they could see better in the dark. The camera's flash would have helped to light their way so that they could continue moving through the forest. But if this is true, why take the aforementioned photo of all their belongings neatly scattered out on that large rock? 
I don't know about you, but even in the dark, I think it would be pretty easy to feel the difference between a candy wrapper and a water bottle. They wouldn't have needed the flash to light their way. This has led some people to believe that the evidence that was found of the girls was tampered with and that someone discovered the scene of their demise long before police did, possibly the person who committed the crime. But if you ask me, there just isn't enough evidence here to convince me that a crime actually took place. One really interesting detail that's glossed over by most articles and videos is that Chris's pelvic bone was cracked when investigators found it. They have no way of knowing if this took place before or after Chris lost her life. But I've got a theory that could help explain the whole case, so let me know in the comments if you agree. My theory is that the girls headed out that day, very ill-equipped to handle the elements in the unfortunate possibility of them getting lost, which they obviously did. It's possible that at some point along the journey, Chris slipped and fell. Several people who are familiar with the area revealed that there are some very large boulders in the surrounding area, some that are larger than houses. These boulders would have been easy enough to slip and fall down, especially after dark when you can't even see your own hand in front of your face. In fact, one of these final photos that the girls took with their camera shows a cliff edge that would fit this bill. Considering both of the girls' remains were found near or in the river, this fall would have likely taken place near the aforementioned river. If we assume that this is what happened, and that this happened at night, Chris likely would have fallen some unknown distance down onto the river rocks below, resulting in the broken hip. With Chris now injured, Lizanne may have been using the camera's flash to try to navigate her way down to Chris. When she arrived at Chris's side, they may have used the camera's flash to determine the extent of Chris's injuries, and maybe even try to determine if Chris was still alive at this point, but really we have no reason to believe that she was. Lizanne may have also used the camera to see the contents of their bag to try to determine if they had anything with them that they could have used to help save Chris's life or even to treat any potential injuries. My honest guess here would be that Chris did in fact lose her life during that fall. The reason I say this is because five days later, Chris's phone was attempted to be accessed so many times with the wrong passcode that it permanently locked itself. Whoever was trying to use the phone clearly didn't know Chris's password, and Lizanne would fit this bill. Lizanne may have wandered off further down the river in hopes of trying to find help. She may have even noticed that she had stumbled into some decent cell phone reception on Chris's phone. So she tried to use the phone to make a call, but she could never get it unlocked. Eventually, she too succumbed to the elements. Mind you, this is all just a theory based on the evidence that police have found. I've heard a few other people chime in about what they believe may or may not have happened, so I just thought I'd add my own two cents to the case, even though I try hard to keep my opinions out of cases like this. In the end, the disappearance of Chris Kremers and Lizanne Froon is still technically unsolved and under investigation, but police haven't released any further updates since January of 2015. There are many people out there who firmly believe that the girls met with foul play, and that's definitely a possibility, so let me know which version of events you believe in the comments. There's a team of private investigators and authors who are still actively pursuing this case. In fact, they traveled to Panama in June of 2023 to try to collect more evidence, but ultimately ran out of time before finding anything too meaningful. They plan on returning to the forest next year in hopes of searching a dam that's located at the end of the river where Chris and Lizanne disappeared. Their belief is that whatever happened to the girls, the answers will be found in the filters of that dam. My sincere hope is that however the girls lost their lives, that their suffering wasn't too great and that their families have been able to heal in the time that's passed since their disappearance. It's so heartbreaking to know that these girls just wanted to head out on a once-in-a-lifetime journey to explore the jungles of Panama and help the less fortunate. But tragically, their once-in-a-lifetime journey proved to be their last. It was April 16th, 2003, a day like any other in San Antonio, Texas. Traffic along the I-10 was carrying on as usual, when out of nowhere and without any warning, a gold Mercury Tracer swerved towards the median and struck something, causing the car to launch into the air, bounce around for more than 1,000 feet, then crash back down onto the concrete. Every witness to the crash naturally assumed that something awful had likely happened to the driver. But here's the kicker. 
The car then just kept driving along as if nothing happened. The car continued down the highway for several more miles before finally veering off the road near the Johns Road exit and crashing into a patch of trees. When investigators arrived at the scene of the crash, they very quickly learned something wasn't right here. The driver of the car had been mortally wounded, but his injuries weren't caused by the crash. Craziest of all, the victim's nipples had been removed and he was missing a portion of his pinky finger. When detectives noticed that his hands and feet had also been duct taped together, well, that's when they knew they uncovered much more than a car crash. They had just stumbled onto a very bizarre crime scene. Before we keep going, I want to let you guys know about the sponsor of today's video, Factor. If you're getting too busy with your summer plans to cook, Factor can help you skip the process of making a menu, going to the store, prepping everything, and cooking meals that ultimately take you hours. Factor offers incredible flavor and nutrition that you just can't beat. With Factor's fresh, never frozen meals, you can have an amazing dinner ready to go in just two minutes, giving you more time to take care of the things that matter most to you. If you're ready to stick to your wellness goals while also saving heaps of time, I strongly suggest you give Factor a try. Every meal features high quality ingredients such as broccolini, leeks, or asparagus. The meal I had last night came with some shockingly delicious carrots, and I've never even liked carrots until now. There are more than 34 weekly restaurant quality meals to choose from, including bruschetta shrimp risotto, green goddess chicken, and grilled steakhouse filet mignon, all of which are ready in just two minutes. Now, I've been super busy with the channel lately, so meals like this are incredibly convenient for me. If I'm in the middle of making a video, I can literally literally take just two minutes to make some dinner, then get right back to work. Without having to go to the grocery store multiple times a week, I've got so much more free time in my schedule. One of my favorite things about Factor is that it's extremely flexible as well. For example, if I know I have dinner plans with friends or family one day next week, I can adjust the size of my order or even skip that week entirely. That way I won't be wasting money on a meal that I know I won't end up eating. Head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code TIENOTS50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. That's Factor75.com and use code TINOTS50 for 50% off your first order. Thanks to Factor for sponsoring today's video. Colonel Philip Shu was a licensed doctor who worked for the Wilford Hall Medical Center, located on the Lackland Air Force Base. Colonel Shu was a soon-to-be employed psychiatrist at the facility and had worked for the Air Force for more than 23 years, with plans to retire in October of 2003. Philip wasn't your average veteran. He'd been decorated with more awards and honors than I can count and was a man deeply dedicated to his country. His wife, Tracy, recalled Philip and said that she'd never met anyone else who had such a passion for life and all the little things that go along with it. Philip was fiercely loyal to his country and his uniform. Philip and Tracy had met back in 1988 when both of them were stationed at the Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Philip had just been coming down from a very difficult divorce from his former wife, Nancy, with her seemingly taking every opportunity to make Philip's life difficult, at least in his eyes. Strangely, around the time of their divorce, his ex, Nancy, took out two life insurance policies on Philip with each being valued at around $500,000. Philip did his best to have these policies canceled later on, but he wasn't able to do so, as the insurance agency claimed that he hadn't been the one who opened the policy, so they couldn't have them canceled without the policyholder's consent. Now, I'm certainly not a lawyer, but I don't understand how Nancy would have been able to take out a policy on Philip after the two had already been divorced, especially considering that their marriage had ended on very bad terms. But according to various sources, this was certainly the case. In fact, some sources even claim that these policies were given to Nancy as part of their divorce settlement. I just can't wrap my head around this, so if there's any divorce lawyers watching, be sure to let us know in the comments how all of this would have played out, because this just seems incredibly bizarre. And in reality, I'm not the only one who thinks this is strange. In fact, Philip found it very concerning as well. Philip wrote a letter to USAA Life Insurance, the company that offered the policy, and explained that the policy caused him to fear for his life, worrying that his former wife and her new husband may do anything within their power to claim the benefits of this plan, even if it meant ending his life. 
In his letter, Philip said, quote, My former wife and her husband would prefer that I die of natural causes. However, the longer I live, the more tempting it becomes for them to act on their plans for my murder. While there isn't any foolproof evidence to claim that Nancy was in any way involved in the case, Philip certainly believed otherwise. His fears were heightened even more when he began receiving a strange series of letters in mid-1999. But these letters weren't from some deranged killer, as you may expect. Instead, they were from an anonymous author who was actually trying to help Philip. Or so it seemed. The first letter was received in May of 1999. Philip had told his wife about the letters, and they scared him to such a degree that he even told his supervisors at work about them. The only problem is that no one outside of Philip's wife seemed to believe that the letters were anything to be concerned about. These letters Philip had begun receiving were more than just a little bit creepy, they were downright haunting. Just take a look at the first one and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Please read this letter. You may be in danger. I'm writing because I remember you as such a kind and caring doctor, and I can't just sit by and not help you by telling you what I know. I'll try to keep it short so you're certain to read it. A friend of mine who worked with Don, your ex-wife's husband, told me some scary things. I don't know Don or your ex-wife myself. Sorry, I don't even know her name. My friend told me they wish you were dead so they could collect life insurance. I don't understand why they would have life insurance on you, but that's what my friend told me. My friend thinks they may actually be planning something. I don't know if they would actually hurt you, but please be careful. I had to write. If I didn't, I couldn't bear the thought of something bad happening to you that I could have prevented by telling you what I heard. If I hear anything more specific, I'll let you know. Please be careful. Shortly after this, things started to go missing. For Philip, the most concerning item that was stolen was his laptop, which contained his nearly complete master's thesis. Philip reported his stolen laptop to the police in June of 1999 seeing that he was working in the library when he stood up and left his table to go use the restroom. When he returned, his laptop was gone. Evidence confirms that Philip's laptop was returned later on in July of 1999, after being left on the hood of his car. When he approached his car, he found a note that said if he reported anything else to the police, other people would die. When he booted up his laptop later on, he found that his entire hard drive had been wiped, taking his master's thesis with it. Philip would eventually confront his ex-wife about the letters and the rumors that she'd been plotting something. Naturally, Nancy claimed she had no idea what the author of the letter was talking about, and she claimed it was probably just some kind of joke. While Philip did his best to brush off the thought of someone coming after him, he couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. Throughout 1999, Philip was still attending schooling so that he could receive his master's degree and ultimately become a psychiatrist for the Lackland Air Force Base, as mentioned a moment ago. Just to clarify, it was during his final year of schooling that his laptop was stolen. One of Philip's counselors at the school had approached Philip about his master's thesis, explaining that he needed to turn it in soon if he planned on graduating on time. It was during one of these meetings with the counselor that Philip revealed that his laptop had been stolen but he was doing everything he could to get his thesis completed, though the only copy of it was on his laptop, and that had obviously been deleted during the theft. Around this same time, Philip also told the counselor about the threats on his life, as they'd been stressing him out severely. His counselor seems to have been one of the only people to take these threats seriously, and he immediately told Philip that he should contact the police. Philip was apprehensive about going to the police, insisting that they simply wouldn't care or wouldn't take him seriously. Though in reality, it's more likely that he just feared someone else may get hurt if he were to raise any more awareness about his situation. As far as the counselor knows, Philip never spoke with investigators about these allegations. Philip did eventually complete and turn in his master's thesis though. But things only got more strange from here. Just over a year later, in October of 2000, Philip was scheduled to take his aerospace medical board exam. He had obviously been preparing heavily for the exam, but when the results came back in, Philip scored zero points. It was as if he had never taken the test at all, but several people confirmed that he had been present that day and had actually turned in his exam personally. The crazy thing is, his test was multiple choice, so at some point during the exam, even if he had guessed most of the answers, he was bound to at least get one response correct. 
The professors believe that, for whatever reason, Philip intentionally failed the test, though no one knows why. One theory is that Philip had become dissatisfied with the Air Force and wanted to send a message to his superiors. This rumor is furthered by the fact that he planned on retiring from the Air Force entirely and beginning to practice psychiatry in a private environment. This has never been proven, but it's certainly an interesting theory, though I don't understand why failing his exam would have proven anything to his superiors. In all reality, it would have just made things more difficult for Philip in the long run. But when looking at Philip's medical history, things get pretty concerning. He began reporting panic attacks in June of 1999, the month after he received that first creepy letter. His records indicate that by the end of 1999, his anxiety had grown to such a degree that it had progressed into symptoms of depression. He was placed on medication for depression, and in December of 1999, his symptoms had improved, but his underlying fears did not. He still feared for his life, but the medication took the edge off so that he wasn't so focused on it all the time. Over the following three years, up until April of 2003, Philip worked alongside a psychiatrist trying various medications to help remedy his panic attacks, but they persisted all throughout this time. Philip's paranoia grew to a worrying degree, and his panic attacks continued to worsen in severity, to the point that Philip began to fear he was going to have a heart attack. Philip's psychiatrist worried that he wasn't being entirely truthful in their conversations. It wasn't necessarily that Philip was lying to him, but he felt that Philip was, instead, withholding important details in some of the scenarios. But that's when Philip finally dropped a bombshell on the psychiatrist and revealed the story about the threatening letters. Philip knew that the story sounded crazy, but the psychiatrist noted that Philip's anxious response to telling the story indicated that he was, without a doubt, telling the truth. Around this same time, on April 11th, 2003, Philip updated his will. He had previously had his son listed as a beneficiary. The problem is that his son was in the midst of some marital issues, and Philip feared that if he lost his life and his son received the money, he may end up losing most of it in a divorce settlement. To fix this, Philip updated his will and everything that was going to be given to his son was now going to be given to his wife. While this is the official explanation to this sudden change in plans, other people believe Philip was making final arrangements as he knew his life was about to end. But more on that in a moment. Philip's concerns about his job performance were taking a heavy toll on him. He knew his anxiety and paranoia were affecting his ability to work, and he confided in his psychiatrist that he was worried he was soon going to be unable to do his job. But that's when Philip revealed the most concerning thing of all. He came in one day and revealed to his psychiatrist that he'd experienced what he called a dissociative episode. Philip elaborates on this by saying that he had an episode, or a vision would be a better way to put this, about driving to work one day and losing control of his car after a great deal of violence had been inflicted on him. Now, this may sound like something out of an episode of The Twilight Zone, but I assure you, this story is entirely true, and unfortunately for Philip and his family, his worst fears, right down to the very last detail, were about to come true. It was the morning of April 16th, 2003, just days after his last meeting with the psychiatrist. Colonel Philip Shu was traveling along Interstate 10 just outside of San Antonio, Texas, just minutes after 8 a.m. Two witnesses reported seeing Philip on the highway just after mile marker 543. They reported that immediately after this marker, Philip's car began to behave erratically. He would swerve in and out of lanes, eventually crossing the median and remaining here for several hundred yards, then weaving in between light poles. As he was traveling along the median, his car struck something, though we don't know what specifically. After hitting this object, his car became airborne, with some reports suggesting the car bounced several times over a span of a thousand feet. I'm not sure what these reports mean when they say that the car bounced, but Judging by the photos of the aftermath, it seems safe to assume the car had been through quite the ordeal. Regardless of the obvious damage to the car, Philip continued traveling down the highway for several more miles, with witnesses saying that Philip corrected the car and seemingly drove normally again throughout this time. However, four or five miles later, as soon as the car passed the Johns Road exit, it crossed the side median and drove directly into a patch of trees, striking three of the trees and coming to a halt after the driver's side smashed into one final tree with some serious force. 
Both of the witnesses claimed that the car had been seen driving between 60 and 65 miles per hour throughout the entire ordeal, and neither witness ever saw the brake lights on the car light up, not even once. Reports indicate that Tracy says that Philip left home early that day, at about 5.30 a.m., so that he could catch up on some paperwork that he'd been lagging behind on. He had coffee with his wife as usual, and the two talked about their plans for the future. Then he left afterward, telling his wife, see you later. When he crashed his car later that morning, police noticed that Philip was actually headed in the opposite direction from his work, and no one knows what he had been doing between 5.30 and 8 a.m. It doesn't seem that anyone ever reported seeing him at work that morning, and none of the evidence found at the scene suggested that he had been there either. What he'd been up to during this time remains a mystery. When investigators and detectives arrived at the scene of the crash, they quickly determined that Philip had suffered fatal injuries. He was in such a bad state that there was never any attempt to resuscitate him. Police and first responders were initially treating the case as a simple car crash, but that's when they noticed the duct tape. When investigators made it to the scene of the crash where Philip's car had come to rest, they removed the door of the car and uncovered several pieces of evidence that just didn't make sense. They first noticed the strips of duct tape that had been wrapped around his wrists and ankles, with around four or five inches of tape dangling off of each extremity. Stranger yet, his work uniform had been ripped open and was covered in blood. When they examined him even further, that's when they noticed that both of his nipples had been removed, leaving disturbing wounds on his chest. While most videos and articles covering this case claim that his pinky had been entirely removed as well, in reality, only the tip had been removed, and this tip has never been found. Philip's cell phone was found inside the car. It was a clamshell-style phone, and while no calls had been made that morning, there was blood found on the inside of the phone, suggesting that it had been opened up at some point after Philip had been attacked. Philip was known to have had at least $47 in his wallet, but his wallet was missing and the wallet pocket on his pants had been cut open. But investigators don't believe this would have been a severe enough cut to cause his wallet to fall out somewhere, suggesting that they believe it was either ditched or stolen. The only other suspicious items found inside the car were a straight razor, two pocket knives, a latex glove, and some medical needles. Philip's DNA was later found on both the glove and one of the knives, but there was no DNA from anyone else inside the car or on any of the other items. The latex glove doesn't appear to have been ever worn, and detectives claimed that the knives they found would not have been sharp enough to inflict the injuries that Philip was found with. A large wound was found in Philip's chest during the autopsy. This wound, according to the autopsy report, does not appear to have been caused by the crash. It seems as though it was inflicted just minutes or hours beforehand. The coroner reported signs of hesitation around the wound, suggesting the perpetrator was either nervous or wanted to make the wound as painful as possible. The same hesitation was not found around his nipples, and they appear to have been removed with the utmost confidence and precision. The coroner ultimately found no evidence or any signs of a struggle as is true in many of these cases. But this is where the investigation takes a nosedive. After all of this evidence was gathered, after learning the man had been possibly restrained and duct taped by all four limbs, after his nipples had been removed, after his shirt and pants had been torn open, and after the tip of his pinky had been removed, the coroner ruled that Philip did this to himself. At the request of Philip's late wife, Tracy, a second autopsy was performed. The doctor who performed the second autopsy agreed with most of the findings from the first autopsy, but with a few exceptions. Mainly, this doctor didn't believe that all these wounds could have been inflicted by Philip himself. He did admit that there was a distinct possibility that Philip could have done this to himself, but most of the evidence suggested otherwise. The main bit of evidence that I personally find most concerning is the fact that there were no fingerprints found on the duct tape that was wrapped around his limbs. This would suggest that whoever put the tape there was wearing gloves or was being particularly cautious. But there's a bigger picture here that, to some extent, could actually help prove that Philip didn't do this to himself. Philip had recently announced that he planned on retiring from the military, with this retirement being scheduled to take place in just a few months. Philip had also been accepted into a fellowship program that he'd been highly anticipating, and he'd just purchased a new home with his wife Tracy outside of town. But to top all of this off, 
Philip's psychiatrist found no indication that Philip had any sort of plans to claim his own life, none whatsoever. In fact, Philip was looking forward to the future, though the creepy letters that he'd been receiving certainly put a damper on things. Philip's medical records showed no signs of mental illness outside of his depression and justifiable paranoia. When a toxicology report was conducted, the only thing found in his system was his prescribed medications and a small amount of lidocaine. Interestingly, the reports showed that Philip had stopped taking his antidepression medication at least a week before the crash. But both his psychiatrist and his wife say that they were not aware that he had discontinued his medicines. Worse yet, the levels of lidocaine in his blood were initially reported to have come from pain cream. But upon further analysis, it was determined that the levels in his system were far, far higher than what would have been usual in pain cream. And that's when investigators remembered the pack of surgical needles that had been found in his car. Investigators have concocted a narrative that, when you really think about it, could make sense. They believe, since Philip worked in a hospital, he was able to procure lidocaine injections for himself. They believe that he would have used the lidocaine prior to inflicting the injuries on himself. While this does make sense in a way, it doesn't explain the hesitation that was found around his chest wound or why he would have done this in the first place. Now, some reports say that this chest wound was quite deep, as were the wounds to his nipples. But I was able to locate an official legal report about the incident, and this report claims that all of Philip's unusual wounds were just superficial, meaning that they didn't penetrate deep enough to cause any lasting damage or threaten his life. So if this is true, the hesitation found around his chest wound may have meant that Philip did, in fact, inflict the wound upon himself, but he was apprehensive about doing so, either because of the pain or because he was unsure that he wanted to go through with it. To make things even more interesting, the duct tape that was found wrapped around his wrists was not tied in a way that would indicate that he was fully restrained by someone. In fact, the method in which the tape was applied wouldn't have restrained him at all. Now, I don't fully understand how the police described the tape being wrapped around his wrists, and there's no public photos from the case to prove anything, but they claim that any grown person would have been able to break the tape due to the way that it had been wrapped, even if it was tied behind their back. There were also no signs of stretching on the tape, as you might expect if someone was struggling to break free. But there's still one other piece of evidence that just doesn't make sense the missing tip of his pinky finger. According to first responders, while this is certainly a strange clue, it's most likely that he lost the tip of his pinky in the car crash. First responders noted that while there was a sizable amount of blood on Philip's clothing from his other injuries, there wasn't a large amount of blood coming from his finger, suggesting that it may have been cut off after he passed away, possibly being severed by glass or by his own car door during the crash. Now, we're all obviously asking the same question here. Did Philip really do all of this to himself? And if not, who's to blame? Well, according to his wife Tracy, the answer lies in another question. Who stood to gain the most? Tracy Hsu has been very outspoken about Nancy, Philip's first wife, and her potential involvement in Philip's demise. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there's no evidence to suggest that Nancy or her husband were involved outside of the mysterious letters that Philip had received. But in 2008, Tracy and Nancy were involved in a lawsuit with one another. During this lawsuit, Philip's passing was officially reclassified, and it's now being listed as a full-blown homicide. This allowed USAA to release the funds of Philip's life insurance. And who received them? Nancy and her husband. Tracy did her best to sue for the money, but she ultimately lost the court battle, and the funds were handed over to Nancy. It's been reported that only 500000 was paid out to Nancy, though, and we know that Philip had two policies, so I don't know where the other money went. It may be best to assume that this is why Philip changed his will, and he somehow managed to get the second policy switched to his current wife's name, but this is just a guess. I really don't know what happened to the rest of the money. So who's to blame here? Well, we still don't know. More than 20 years later, the case remains as mysterious as the day that it happened. There's so much that can't be explained here, such as why Nancy was given two life insurance policies on Philip's life, who had been writing the mysterious letters that Philip received leading up to the crime, and even stranger, how Philip had such a bizarre premonition about his crash just days before it happened. Well, there is one explanation for Philip's bizarre premonition about his crash. He planned it. He planned it down to the last detail. 
Now, I have a hard time believing the theory that Philip did this to himself, but it is possible. But considering the courts in 2008 determined that the case is now reclassified as a homicide, I mean, we just don't know. I could see this case going either way, especially considering that Nancy, Philip's first wife, has refused to make any comments about the case. In fact, she's pleaded the fifth more than a dozen times when asked about Philip's final moments. In a letter to USAA written back in 1999, Philip implicated his ex-wife, Nancy, and said, quote, thoroughly examine my eventual death for evidence of foul play, even if, on the surface, the cause would appear to be natural or accidental. And wiser words may never have been spoken. It was 2007 when Carly Ryan fell head over heels for her boyfriend, Brandon Kane. Investigators say that the two had everything in common, but Brandon had a few dark secrets that Carly was blissfully unaware of. Detectives would learn that Carly and Brandon had been dating for several months leading up to the crime, and everything was going well for the two. But one day in February of 2007, things would take a dark turn when Carly failed to return home from a night out with her friends. She'd been acting somewhat strange in the moments before leaving that day, repeatedly asking her mother for hugs. It seems almost like she knew something was wrong, but she was powerless to stop it. Carly's mother certainly felt that something was a bit off that evening, but she could have never imagined just how terrifying things were about to become. Carly Ryan was born in January of 1992 in Stirling, South Australia. She was raised by her mother, Sonia, for most of her childhood, but there's never been any mention about what happened to her father, so I suppose it can be assumed that he was simply out of the picture. The thing about Carly is that she was growing up in the midst of a social media hurricane. By the time she was a teenager, it seemed like there was a new social media platform coming out every other day of the week. And this was long before Facebook was the Goliath that it is today. Most of this case takes place back in 2006 and 7, so we're talking about the days of MySpace, Zanga, Tumblr, and the countless other online messengers that were around. It was an incredibly interesting time to be on the internet, but it was also a remarkably dangerous time because many of the safeguards that are in place today simply didn't exist back then. Considering Carly was just a teenager at this time, her mother, Sonia, was pretty critical about what Carly got up to online. Carly and Sonia were remarkably close, meaning Sonia knew pretty much every detail of Carly's life. She'd often walk by the computer and take a peek at what Carly was doing, but knowing that her teenage daughter was a smart girl, she trusted that Carly was being safe and cautious. Sonia says that she feels like she knew everything that was going on in Carly's life. She knew all of her friends, kept tabs on what was going on at school, and was an ever-present force in all that Carly did. Not in a helicopter parent kind of way, but in a pretty healthy mother-daughter relationship kind of way. You've got to remember it was just the two of them, so they were understandably super close. But the main issue here is that at this point in history, the internet was wild to put it lightly. Carly was known to spend a lot of time on a website called RateMyBody.com. For those of you that aren't familiar with this site, well, it's pretty much exactly what you would think. People post photos of themselves and anonymous users rate that person's body. The big problem with this website is that, as we've already established, there were virtually no safeguards in place. The website prided itself on anonymity, and that means that there was no way of knowing if the images you were looking at even belonged to the person who uploaded them. Worse yet, considering this website was often visited by teenagers, well, I think you get the picture I'm painting here. This was not a safe website, and it was a major hotspot for older men who had some rather nefarious intentions. Thankfully, this website has since been shut down. But Carly was often described as a scene girl. This is a bit of a vague term that's most often used when referring to teens or young adults who are super interested in the gothic punk lifestyle. These would have been the kids listening to bands like Black Veil Brides, Asking Alexandria Escape the Fate, all while reading Twilight or something similar. 
wearing all black from head to toe, black hoodies, black headphones, so on and so forth. And don't think I'm saying this in a judgy or joke kind of way, I was one of those kids too. Heck, I still listen to all of those bands. Dying Is Your Latest Fashion, one of the greatest punk albums of all time. For Carly, this was a group of people and a lifestyle that gave her a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging. She was known for being pretty active on websites like VampireFreaks.com, which is another goth or emo website and store. But most of all, she would spend hours upon hours on MySpace. Her profile was pretty much everything you would imagine it to be. It was full of gothic selfies, heaps of makeup, links to all of her favorite online forums, quotes from her favorite books, typical MySpace stuff. By sharing her interest in this genre of entertainment, Carly was able to make dozens of online friends. But there was one friend in particular who really caught Carly's interest, an 18-year-old named Brandon Kane. Brandon was a young musician who was born in Texas but had recently moved to Brisbane, Australia, the total opposite side of the country from Carly. The two immediately became friends as soon as they met. They liked all the same bands, had all the same interests. It was almost like they were meant to be. Before too long, their relationship grew into something more. Carly began to share stories of her new online friend with her real-life friends. It wasn't too long after this that Carly stopped referring to him as simply a friend. He was now considered her boyfriend. All of Carly's closest friends knew about Brandon, and Sonia knew about him too. It seems that in the early days of their relationship, Sonia was happy that her daughter had met someone that she could be so open with. Even though Brandon was a few years older, Sonia didn't find this too concerning. She mentioned that she would look over Carly's shoulder from time to time to see what the two were chatting about, but she never noticed anything suspicious or anything that concerned her in any way. Before long, the two started video chatting with one another, and by all means, Brandon appeared to be the guy that he claimed to be. Carly couldn't have been happier. Even though her boyfriend lived over 20 hours away, she was just ecstatic to have someone that she could be close with. But it didn't take long before things started to get, well, a bit unusual. Brandon was quickly becoming the main focus of Carly's life. Whatever the two were up to, the other person was immediately informed about it. They shared everything with one another. What I found particularly fascinating is that, as we all know, most teenage relationships don't last too terribly long, especially online relationships. But Carly and Brandon managed to keep their relationship going for more than 18 months, even though they'd never even met in person. After they'd been chatting for about a year or so, Brandon wanted to introduce Carly to his father, Shane, and he did this over a video call. As time rolled on, Carly started talking more and more about Shane. In fact, it didn't take long before Carly was talking about Shane just as much as she was talking about Brandon. This is when Sonia started to get a little bit concerned. She asked Carly why she suddenly had such an interest in Shane, and she explained that Brandon and Shane were incredibly close, much like Sonia and Carly were. Sonia reminded Carly to be careful, and Carly made it very clear that if anything started to get weird or uncomfortable, she would tell her mother right away. And for Sonia, this was enough to calm her fears, so she dropped it and let it be. Sonia would later learn that Shane had a job as a security guard, and this job caused him to travel for work events every so often. In February of 2007, he was traveling across Australia for one of these events, and on his way back home to Brisbane, he offered to stop by Carly and Sonia's home to drop off a few birthday gifts that he and Brandon had purchased for Carly the previous month. At first, Sonia thought this was a little bit strange, but when Shane showed up at the family's home, he was wearing his security guard outfit, so the story seemed to check out. Shane seemed to be exactly the man that he claimed to be. He was clean cut, professional, and nothing seemed unusual about him. In fact, Carly and Sonia felt so safe around him that they offered to let him spend the night at their home, inviting him to Carly's birthday party the following day. But while Shane was in town, he offered to take Carly shopping. Now, this, in my book, is definitely a bit strange. What would a 50-year-old man be doing taking a teenage girl shopping? Even if he was the father of her boyfriend, this seems a bit strange considering the two had only just met and there's been no indication that Carly's mother was even present during their trip. But the following day, at Carly's birthday party, that's when things started to get really bizarre. When Shane showed up at Carly's birthday party, it was immediately clear that something strange was happening. When Carly's friends and family members started showing up, 
Shane started to get visibly uncomfortable. There wasn't any particular moment where you could point to and say, see that, that's weird. But Sonia started to notice that Shane, for lack of a better word, seemed possessive over Carly. It seemed almost as if Shane and Carly were glued at the hip. He didn't let her wander off too terribly far, and he hung around Carly throughout the entire party, rarely ever speaking to anyone other than her for more than a few simple sentences. But the following morning, that's when things really started to get weird. As soon as Sonia passed by Carly's bedroom, she noticed Shane and Carly were lying on Carly's bed. In one report, it was claimed that Shane was actually lying on top of Carly, and Carly was visibly uncomfortable. Sonia immediately sprang into action and told Shane that he needed to leave immediately. It doesn't seem like he put up too much of a fight either. He knew he'd been caught. He grabbed his things and left. As soon as he was gone, Carly revealed that he'd made a few passes at her and that she had repeatedly rejected his advances, insisting that she was in love with his son, not him. Carly then told her mother about the birthday presents that Shane had shown up with. Now, because of YouTube's terms of service, I can't really explain the full extent of these gifts, but let me just say, one of them was an outfit that no 50-year-old man had any business gifting to the girlfriend of his son. This was the moment that Sonia truly understood what was happening here. She made all the right moves in the coming days, taking away Carly's access to social media, banning her from using her cell phone, keeping a much closer eye on her online activity, and calling Shane and telling him that he was never allowed to speak to her daughter again or she'd report him to the police. Mind you, this all may sound a bit harsh, but this wasn't done as a way to punish Carly in any way. This was all done in a bid to keep Carly safe. And based on Sonia's statements since then, it seems like she likely did a good job explaining this to Carly. It's awful that Carly lost so many of her freedoms because of this guy, but when it comes to the safety of your child, all bets are off. You do what you have to do. But the problem is that well, we've all been teenagers at some point. We all know that regardless of what your parents tell you to do, if you want to do something, you'll find a way to do it. And Carly wasn't willing to let Brandon go. She admitted that what happened with Shane was pretty insane, but Brandon wasn't to blame for this. No sooner than her mother forbade her from speaking with Brandon, Carly was right back up to her old antics, speaking to Brandon every chance she could get. Only this time, she was keeping it a secret, and her mother had no idea. A few weeks passed by, and it was February 19th, 2007 when Carly told her mother that she was going to be spending a night out with a group of her friends. She got dressed up in her best outfit, then headed for the front door. But strangely, Sonia says that it was at this moment that Carly's behavior began to change. She turned to her mother and asked her for a hug, then another, then another, and another. It was almost as if she was afraid to leave. Her demeanor had changed without any rhyme or reason. Sonia didn't really know what this was all about, but what kind of mother would turn away hugs from her daughter? Carly's last words to her mother before she left were simply, love you, mom. The door closed and Carly was never seen again. Carly never returned home from her outing with her friends that evening. When she still hadn't shown up by the following morning, Sonia knew something had gone terribly wrong. And that's when she called the police to report her daughter missing every parent's worst nightmare. But for Sonia, her nightmare was about to get far, far worse. Sonia would be subjected to something that no parent should ever have to face. As she was pacing around her home, pleading for some sort of news about her daughter, she heard a knock at the door, followed by two police officers with sullen expressions. As we all know, this never means anything good. Carly had been found, but not the way her mother had hoped. Investigators revealed that early that morning, detectives had come across a victim who'd been floating in Horseshoe Bay. That victim was identified as Carly Ryan. When she was taken in for further forensic analysis, it was determined that Carly had endured at least 19 injuries before she lost her life, each of which was more haunting, heartbreaking, and heinous than the last. Security cameras and witness reports would soon reveal that Carly was last seen on the beach in the Horseshoe Bay area at around 9.30 the previous evening. She was in the company of what appeared to be two men, but it would later come to light that this had been one man and a teenage boy. They had arrived in the area in a blue vehicle, and it was this vehicle description that was used to track them down later on. As it would turn out, the two males who were seen in the CCTV security footage were none other than Shane and Brandon. Except that's not entirely true. See, that's because Shane and Brandon, 
they didn't exist. 11 days after Carly was discovered in Horseshoe Bay, police closed in on Gary Francis Newman, as well as his teenage son. His teenage son has never been named due to laws in Australia that prevent the names of young offenders from being revealed. It would quickly become clear, though, that Gary was, in fact, both Shane and Brandon. He'd created an alter ego online to lure teenage girls and cause them to fall in love with him, faking interest in everything they loved and stalking them both online and in the real world. What makes this situation so much worse is that Gary had either convinced or forced his teenage son to play a part in the scheme as well. Considering there's virtually zero information available about Gary's son, we don't know if he was a willing accomplice or just as much a victim as Carly was. Basically, Gary was the one who was chatting with Carly for more than a year online. But anytime he needed to schedule a video call with Carly, he would ask his son to step in to make things more realistic. All the photos that had been shared between the two were also of his own son. When Shane, or Gary, was forced to leave Carly's home after being caught lying in her bed, he was understandably upset. After all, he'd been concocting this plan for more than a year and a half, and in the blink of an eye, it was all over. But he couldn't let this be the end. He needed to see Carly one final time, and this time, he would bring his teenage son along to help finish the job. Carly was lured out of her home that evening under the promise of finally being able to meet her online boyfriend in person for the first time. She lied to her mother and explained that she would be going out with friends, but in reality, she was due to hang out with her boyfriend. Or so she thought. The thing is, Carly knew that something was fishy about this situation. She had seen all the red flags. Her mother had warned her about both Shane and Brandon, but she chose to risk it all anyway. We know that Carly knew about the potential dangers because of how apprehensive she was to leave her home that evening. Her mother knew something was a bit off too, but considering Carly lied about her intentions that evening, there was little her mother could do, as she was blissfully unaware of the level of danger her daughter was about to place herself in. Now, don't think for one second that I'm blaming this on Carly. She was never anything more than a victim of this awful, heartless monster. I merely bring up the fact that she ignored all the obvious signs of danger as a warning to parents or teenagers that when your gut tells you something's unsafe, it's probably because it's unsafe. If you smell smoke, there's probably a fire. We've been given the gift of gut feelings for a reason, and you should pretty much always trust them. But if you could imagine, this story is about to get a whole lot worse. If you remember, it was nearly two weeks after Carly was found in Horseshoe Bay that Gary's home was finally raided by the police. When detectives showed up at his home, Gary was actually in the middle of chatting up another teenage girl online. When his home was searched and investigators combed through every square inch of his place, they found a notebook that had documented at least 200 different aliases that Gary had been using online. From what I can tell, he used this notebook to help keep his story straight so that his victims wouldn't see right through his charade. Brandon and Shane had been just two of the names, less than 1% of his total list of characters. In his notebook, investigators found names, ages, occupations, interests, everything that related to each and every one of these characters that he had created. If you consider that Gary used two aliases when speaking with Carly, that means that he could have had another 100 victims, assuming he pulled the whole father-son card for each of them. In reality, this number of victims could be substantially higher. There's just no way to know for sure. This notebook was also a gold mine for investigators because it even documented usernames and passwords for each of his fake online profiles, giving them every last piece of evidence that they needed to get this man behind bars. But we have to remember that putting someone behind bars does little to help calm the pain of the family who are now left with one less person at the dinner table each night. Worse yet, in Sonia's case, she's now left with no one at her dinner table each night. Sonia's world ended the day that she lost her daughter. Her purpose, her goals, her ambitions, they're gone, and she can never get them back. Thankfully, Gary was sentenced to life in prison. Unfortunately, though, he still will be eligible for parole after 29 years. But considering he was 50 when this crime took place, the man will likely be 80 before he ever has the slightest chance of seeing natural sunlight again. Though we can all hope that this day never comes for Gary. 
In the wake of Gary's sentencing, Gary's ex-wife came out and explained why the two had gotten divorced many years before this. She explained that Gary had been shockingly aggressive towards her, assaulting her multiple times, forcing her against her will on many occasions. When he then started turning his attention towards their own teenage daughter, that's when she knew that she needed to get herself and their three children out of there. Unfortunately, this wasn't even a wake-up call for Gary. He would later adopt a son of his own, the one that he used in his online schemes, and he simply repeated the cycle. After all was said and done, Gary's son was cleared of all charges, which pretty much secures the idea that his son was likely just as much a victim as Carly was. In the aftermath of such a tragedy, Sonia felt that she needed to do something, anything, to help parents whose children may end up in similar situations. This led her to form the Carly Ryan Foundation, a foundation that offers certified online safety programs and conducts regular seminars to help educate children and parents about the dangers of online predators. If this wasn't enough, Sonia was also able to establish Carly's Law, an Australian law that allows prosecutors to both charge and convict online predators before they ever lay a hand on a child. They can do this by establishing intent based on chat logs, as well as convict an adult who misrepresents their age to a minor. This law has already saved so many lives, and Sonia was the driving force behind this law every step of the way. If not for her, there's no telling how many other children may have ended up just like Carly. If you're a parent, or even if you're a teenager, I would strongly urge you to visit CarlyRyanFoundation.com to better understand everything that the foundation has to offer. The resources page has heaps of valuable information that's been updated for modern times to help keep kids safe on more modern platforms, such as Roblox, Fortnite, and the various other social media or gaming platforms that are predominantly aimed towards children. There's nothing that any of us can do to bring Carly back, but if Sonia has it her way, every child across the globe will become better educated about internet safety so that stories like this will one day be a thing of the past. No one should ever have to go through what Carly and Sonia dealt with. And it's our job, you and me, it's our job to keep these kids safe. From the outside, Susan and Jeff Wright had it all. They were the perfect image of a beautiful young family, but as we all know, every family has their secrets, and the Wrights were no exception. One fateful night, the world around them would collapse, and their lives would be changed forever. Detectives say that on January 13, 2003, someone took the life of Jeff Wright. The suspect attempted to clean up the scene of the crime, but investigators were hot on their trail. By the end of a rather lengthy investigation, after an extremely unexpected confession, prosecutors had finally caught the criminal. But it wasn't someone that any of the investigative team would have expected. The entire city of Houston, Texas was left frozen in fear when the culprit was finally revealed, and the family was left torn in two. Susan Wright was born in 1976 in Houston, Texas, to her parents Sue and Jimmy. Susan had a fairly interesting life from the very beginning. Her early childhood isn't spoken about much, but her teenage years reveal that she must have been battling some pretty serious demons. By the time Susan had turned 17, she'd begun making some interesting career decisions, as she began working as an exotic dancer. Now, I'm not an attorney, but I'm not even sure that something like this would have been legal for someone her age. But either way, Susan made a go of it and continued working as a dancer for a period of just eight weeks before quitting and trying to find something better to do with her time. Now, there's no mention of how much money Susan made during her two months as a dancer, but she must have been a pretty good one because after she quit, she began to put herself through college using the money that she had made. Susan initially began a nursing program at one of her local community colleges, but she quickly found out that nursing wasn't for her, and neither was college. Considering she was a young woman with her entire future in front of her, Susan felt that college was taking up far too much of her time, and eating away at the little bit of freedom that she had. So after only taking a few courses and seemingly getting no degrees or certifications out of it, she decided to quit and begin working as a waitress giving her far more time for herself and helping her to continue to have an income, 
unlike what was happening at college. This proved to be a good move for Susan. After leaving school, it seems like she had a pretty great time working as a waitress. She met all sorts of interesting people and generally seems to have been quite happy with her sudden change of plans. Her job forced her to commute to Galveston, with all this taking place in 1997, when Susan was just 21 years old. I couldn't find any mention of what specific restaurant Susan worked at, but we know that it was located on a beach, which brought in all kinds of tourists and other interesting people. One of these people was Jeff Wright, a highly successful carpet salesman who took a serious interest in Susan from their very first encounter. One of Susan's co-workers reported that after the two met, Jeff would call the restaurant two or three times a day and ask to speak with Susan. Thankfully, Susan shared this same interest, and the two began dating within weeks of meeting up. Everyone recalled Jeff as being an incredibly sweet man. From the moment that he walked into the restaurant, several of Susan's co-workers noticed just how calm and loving he was. Susan even remembers how Jeff would bring her flowers and gifts while she was at work, and he always took time out of his day to make sure that she felt special and cared for. Barely a year later, Susan was already eight months pregnant with their first child, a boy named Bradley. The two would get married shortly before the arrival of their son, with Susan recalling that Jeff was your typical American man who wanted nothing more than to settle down with a wife and kids and a dog in a traditional Houston, Texas home. But Jeff wasn't always this way. According to several people who knew Jeff, he spent much of his teens and 20s partying pretty heavily. Mind you, when he and Susan met, Jeff was eight years older than her. He'd been a pretty reckless person throughout his younger years, often going out to bars and parties with friends and partaking in various illegal activities. Jeff was a difficult man to tame, but once he met Susan, all of this changed for the better. Or so it would seem. See, everything wasn't perfect in paradise. While the couple kept up outward appearances of being happy and deeply in love, the picture they painted for others simply wasn't accurate to what was actually taking place in the Wright family home. Immediately after the birth of their son, Susan and Jeff moved into a picturesque home in the White Oaks suburb of Houston. It didn't take too long before Susan was pregnant again, this time with a girl named Kaylee. Susan always did her best to keep their home neat and tidy. After all, Jeff was bringing in so much money that Susan didn't even have to work. So she decided to stay home with the kids and seemed to be incredibly happy with her newfound passion for parenting and tending to the family's home. But just four years in, well, that's when the facade that they'd upheld in front of their neighbors, friends, and family began to show some cracks. While Jeff had initially believed that he was ready to settle down and start a family, nothing could be farther from the truth. In all honesty, Jeff may have honestly been ready to leave his old life behind him, but we all know that old habits die hard. After years of partying day in and day out, Jeff just couldn't shake off his lust for alcohol and illegal drugs. In fact, Jeff had developed a pretty serious addiction. Susan had done her best to let Jeff deal with his addiction in his own way, but as time passed by, Susan began to realize that his usage wasn't letting up and it may have actually been getting worse. She spoke with Jeff about this on multiple occasions, but Jeff was insistent that he was completely fine and that everything was under control. It wasn't. Susan says that as years passed by, Jeff's usage began to seriously affect their home life. After he would use, he would grow incredibly aggressive with both her and their children. Susan recalls being kicked, punched, slapped, and who knows what else during Jeff's uncontrollable fits of rage all of which stemmed from his years of substance abuse. Jeff also had a mentality that he provided everything for the family, so he should be able to do as he pleased regardless of who it hurt. As years passed by and the abuse only worsened, Susan's patience had begun to run out. She did her best to be a good person and a good wife. She didn't believe that divorce was ever the right answer, but she knew that something had to change. She feared for her own safety and for the safety of her children, and she knew that this nightmare needed to end, and she was going to see to it that, whatever the cost, she would end it. It was January 13th, 2003. Jeff once again was high. He'd been playing with the couple's son, Bradley, that afternoon, but things didn't really go as planned. While the two were having a great time at first, Jeff once again got a bit too aggressive with Bradley, 
accidentally hitting his son a bit too hard during their antics, causing him to cry. Jeff was thankful that Susan didn't seem to notice that this had happened, so he brushed it off and moved on with his afternoon. But unbeknownst to him, Susan did, in fact, notice. After a few hours had passed by, the two tucked their children into bed for the night. As Jeff was laying on the couch watching TV, he noticed Susan appear in the doorway, wearing nothing but a bathrobe. Without another second's thought, he turned off the TV and headed into the bedroom. As he entered the doorway, he found that Susan had placed candles all around the room and even had music play. Jeff couldn't have been more excited. He hopped onto the bed and without another word, Susan began to tie him to the bedposts. Jeff felt that the evening couldn't have gotten any better. After tying him to the bedposts though, Susan's expression began to change. As she stared down at Jeff, completely helpless, the years of abuse that she and her children had been subjected to spun around in her mind. She knew that she would never have a better opportunity to end her suffering and the suffering of her children. So she grabbed a knife that had been stored away nearby and began to execute her plan. Jeff quickly realized that the evening was not going to end the way that he had imagined, but he was helpless to defend himself. Try as he might, he couldn't break free of his restraints. All the while, Susan allowed her pent-up rage to flow freely, injuring Jeff a total of 193 times. Let that sink in for just a moment. 193 individual injuries, dozens of which should have been fatal, but weren't. But by the time the crime was over, Susan dropped the weapon and slid off the bed, collapsing to the floor after realizing what she had done. Jeff's life had finally come to an end. When Susan gathered the courage to turn the light on and look at what she had done, she was struck with an intense feeling of panic. As she stared at the crime she'd committed, she was overwhelmed. She knew she couldn't go to prison, it would destroy what was left of her family. She knew that she had to clean this up and do the best that she could to destroy the evidence of the crime, but she couldn't even determine where to begin. After a while, she decided simply to take a shower then returned to the bedroom to begin cleaning things up. After she was satisfied with her cleaning, Susan called Jeff's parents, who lived about 150 miles away in Austin. She began the call by sobbing, claiming that Jeff had just come home from his boxing lessons angrier than he had ever been before. She says that he began to unleash on both her and their son. Jeff's parents couldn't believe what they were hearing, but they had no choice but to trust that Susan was telling them the truth. Naturally, they asked to speak with Jeff, but Susan explained that he'd run out of the house and she had no idea where he had gone. She felt confident that Jeff had finally left her once and for all. Jeff's parents, completely blindsided by these accusations, asked Susan what had set him off into such a fit of rage. Susan explained that his addiction had grown increasingly out of control and he had finally snapped. As far as Jeff's parents knew, he'd stopped using four years ago when Jeff and Susan had gotten married. They truly had no idea just how bad his addiction had gotten. Susan cried on the phone with Jeff's parents for more than an hour before eventually hanging up. All the while, their son lay lifeless on the bed that he had once shared with his beloved wife. After Susan finally ended the call, she knew that her hard work had only just begun. In the weeks leading up to the crime, Jeff had been busy preparing their backyard for a new deck and a fountain that he had planned to install. At this point, it became glaringly obvious that this project was never going to be completed. So instead, Susan came up with a plan. She pulled Jeff to the backyard and dropped him into the hole that he had been digging for the fountain, meaning Jeff had literally dug his own grave just days prior to losing his life. As Susan tried to shove him into the hole, she quickly realized that this wasn't going to work. But she'd come too far to give up now. The sun was beginning to rise and she needed to think quickly. Unable to fit him completely inside, she just began throwing dirt over the top of him, doing a truly terrible job of concealing the crime. She knew that this wouldn't work long term, but with the amount of time she had before her children would wake up, she had to call it good enough and get back inside to begin cleaning up the mess that she'd left behind. Susan rushed back inside and began cleaning the floor, the walls, the ceiling, the bed, everything. In the end, she tossed the sheets in a trash bag in the backyard and even hauled the couple's mattress out back as well, assuming the children wouldn't find either of them. She then bleached the couple's bedroom from floor to ceiling, all in the nick of time. 
by the time her children got out of bed, she loaded them up and they all headed into town to run some errands, as if nothing had ever even happened. After Susan had spoken with Jeff's parents that evening, they anxiously awaited a knock at their door, assuming that Jeff would come to their home to cool off for a bit. But Jeff never showed up. They never even received a call from him. As hours passed by, his parents called Susan back and asked if Jeff ever returned home. Susan explained that he had, but that they ended up in yet another argument. So he grabbed some clothes and left again, destination unknown. She added that Jeff was so mad that he grabbed a bottle of bleach and shook it all over the bedroom, creating an alibi for why the home was filled with the odor of bleach and explaining why the carpet in their bedroom had been so damaged during Susan's secret cleanup. Before long, Jeff's boss called as well, and Susan shared the same story. When a neighbor inquired about Jeff later that day, she once again shared the same story, with the neighbor suggesting that Susan file a police report. Two days later, Susan agreed to this plan. She headed to the police station in Harris County and filed a report based on the version of events she had told all of her friends, family, and neighbors. Police took photos of the cuts and bruises on her hands, the ones she'd given herself while ending Jeff's life, and the police seemingly believed every word of her story. Fearful of what might happen if Jeff returned home to find that she reported him to the police, investigators even offered her a restraining order so that she would feel safer at home with her kids. By the following Saturday, Susan realized that she couldn't keep up the charade forever. The questions people had begun to ask were getting harder and harder to answer, but that was by no means the worst part. During all this time, Susan had not managed to find Jeff a more suitable grave. To make matters worse, the family dog had discovered Jeff's location and had begun to dig him up. Now, I can't go into too much detail about what Susan saw after this, but as she looked out the rear window of her home, she noticed that the dog had also, well, started chewing on what it had found in the hole in the backyard, and now there was evidence all over the place. Later that day, Susan had enough. She couldn't lie anymore. Her alibi had run its course, and she knew that there was nowhere else to run. She loaded up her children into the car and drove to her mother's house a few miles away. When she arrived, she told her mother the same story she had told everyone else. But her mother felt that there was something else going on here, as certain aspects of this story just didn't hold up under scrutiny. Finally, Susan's mother asked, Susan, did you kill Jeff? With a slight nod of her head, Susan confessed. Susan's mother helped her find a great criminal defense attorney. The couple's children were then sent to stay with Susan's sister, Cindy, while Susan went to the police and confessed what had taken place. Well, sort of. Susan obviously knew that she'd be caught eventually, but rather than share the true version of events with police, she concocted a story that painted her as a blameless victim. She claimed that Jeff had come after her with a knife and that she had managed to wrestle it away from him and use it to defend herself but that didn't explain why she had injured him nearly 200 times. She claimed that once she started, she couldn't stop, but the jury wasn't buying this. Susan did explain that after years of abuse, her rage had just overflown, but she still refused to share the full truth about what had happened. It didn't take long before everyone in the courtroom realized that Susan had been lying profusely and that the tears she shed in court were fake. Susan wasn't an innocent victim, she was a cold-blooded killer. After just five and a half hours of deliberation, the jury decided that Susan was guilty, and she was sentenced to 25 years behind bars. But that isn't the end of the story. See, one woman believed Susan. That was Misty McMichael, Jeff's former fiance. She came forward in 2005 and announced that she'd been subjected to Jeff's abuse as well during their four-year engagement. She believed that the story that Susan had been sharing may have been true after all. Police took these accusations seriously, and in the end, five years were taken off of Susan's sentence. This allowed her to be eligible for release in 2014, but her parole was denied. She was eligible again in 2017, but her parole was denied once again. Finally, in 2020, Susan applied for parole once more, and her request was granted. She was released from prison on December 30th, 2020. As of 2022, Susan has essentially fallen off the map. She's now living a very low-profile life somewhere in Texas and appears to be meeting all the terms of her parole. 
Her children were adopted by Jeff's brother during the trial and were allowed to live as normal of a life as possible, thankfully. At the end of it all, Susan's anger towards Jeff may have been justified. After all, you can only abuse someone and push them so far before they snap. But does that defend what Susan did? Absolutely not. Was Jeff a bad husband? Most likely. Substance abuse can destroy even the best of us, but there's no way to excuse what Susan did to her husband. She could have reported him to the police and had him sent to prison. She could have done a million other things than claim his life. But Susan was so blinded by her own rage that none of these possibilities felt like reasonable options to her. I'll never be one to paint an abuser as some sort of martyr or innocent victim, but Jeff certainly didn't deserve what Susan put him through. And that's just the honest truth. Susan has since become known in the media as the Blue-Eyed Butcher, a pretty fitting name considering what she's done. Susan's life has since moved on, but for Jeff's family, life will never be the same. Maureen Kelly was just 19 years old when she went out with a group of friends to Canyon Creek Campground near Cougar, Washington in the summer of 2013. At around 5 p.m. that evening, she stripped off all of her clothing and told her friends that she was leaving to go on a, quote, spiritual quest, claiming she'd be back by midnight. Maureen never returned. Her friends reported her missing the following morning, but investigators quickly realized that this case was far more bizarre than they could have ever anticipated. So what happened to Marie? Was this a simple case of misadventures in the forest, self-harm, foul play, or yet another disturbing missing 411 disappearance? Being out in nature while camping or hiking can be a very rewarding and relaxing experience, though most of us know that it can also be very dangerous, since there are wild animals to consider, temperatures could suddenly drop very drastically, or you could get lost, which obviously means that it's vital to be as prepared as you possibly can be. But not every excursion into the wild is planned ahead of time. It's good to be a little spontaneous, but even then, you need to keep your wits about you to ensure that you can make your way out of the woods and return home safely. But sometimes, even the most prepared people on the planet can still be bested by unforeseen circumstances, and Maureen Kelly is certainly no exception. In 2013, Maureen Kelly, known to her friends and family as Anu, was just 19 years old. She'd been born and raised in Vancouver, Washington in September of 1993, and was raised alone by her mother. Most of Anu's early life is largely a mystery. Her family's been pretty tight-lipped about her upbringing, and all we know for certain is that Anu was of Pacific Islander descent. As Anu grew older, she eventually began attending Lewis and Clark High School in Spokane, Washington. This was a school steeped in history, having first opened its doors way back in the late 1800s. For Anu, it was a great place to be. She seemed to have made many friends here, and all things considered, it seemed like a great place to have grown up. Her hometown of Vancouver, on the other hand, couldn't have been more different. According to Neighborhood Scout and City Data, Vancouver is in the top 10% of the most unsafe areas in the entire country. So to say that Anu grew up surrounded by crime would be an incredible understatement. I'm sure this played a part in Anu's personality and lifestyle choices. Despite being surrounded by the worst of the worst, Anu was an incredibly spiritual person. She loved to stay in touch with nature and embrace the more natural aspects of humanity. Anu felt that the moment we're born, we're about as connected to the planet and mother nature as we'll ever be. In her eyes, as we grow up, our connection with the world around us begins to fade as we become influenced by outside factors, many of which are less than ideal. When Anu wasn't out hiking, or generally being the respectful, carefree person she was known for being, she could be found singing or playing the ukulele. She loved to post photos and videos of herself online, enjoying music and the outdoors. She even had her own YouTube channel, where she would post about her many interests, predominantly her music. It was the 7th of June, 2013, when Anu created a post on her Facebook account, in which she asked whether any of her friends who had a vehicle were available to go camping on the upcoming weekend. See, Anu had made plans to take herself and a few of her friends on what she described as a spiritual quest. But unbeknownst to her loved ones, this quest would be Anu's last. 
Some sources state that Anu contacted her half-sister, Cherry, to ask if she could borrow some of her camping gear. But it isn't known whether she ever collected any of that gear or if she had any of it with her while she was camping and getting ready for her spiritual journey. We don't know much about the specifics of Anu's spirituality or her spiritual quest, but it goes without saying that she wanted to do everything she could to stay in touch with Mother Nature, and this journey was going to expedite that process. Cherry would later report that during the phone call with Anu, she seemed very excited about the prospect of going camping, and that she just seemed like her normal self, happy-go-lucky and full of life. With the ride sorted out and a group of friends to accompany her, Anu set out to campsite number three at the Canyon Creek Campground, which is situated in Gifford Pinchot National Forest, just two days later on Sunday, the 9th of June. The site is known to be surrounded by dense foliage and tall trees, and hence, it's a tent-friendly only area. It's the perfect place for remote escape, far away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life, especially considering it's darn near impossible to even have an RV in this area or anything of the sort. Many people who have visited the campsite describe the surrounding areas as hard to traverse, since there's a steep slope leading up to the campground into the dense national forest beyond, which encompasses an area of over 1.32 million acres. This forest is incredibly large. When the group arrived at the campsite, the weather was mild at a pleasant 70 degrees. There was no threat of rain, and it all seemed very idyllic for an afternoon of camping. There's no indication whether the group of friends had anything to eat or drink while they were out there that afternoon, but one would assume that they made a fire at some point, since it would begin to cool down soon. There's been a lot of speculation about whether the group took part in any alcohol or anything else while out in the woods. Many people claim that this may have been what led to the terrible series of events that's to follow. But the reality is that this information simply isn't available. No one from the group has spoken up about this, so I can't really say anything with certainty. Regardless of this, everything seemed to go exactly as planned that afternoon, until around 5 o'clock when Anu suddenly announced to the group that it was time for her to set out on the spiritual quest that she'd been planning for so long. As she proclaimed that the time had come, she caught everyone off guard when, without warning, she stripped off all of her clothes, including her shoes. She acted like this was no big deal, but her friends were all shocked, to say the least. Immediately after doing so, she grabbed a fanny pack that contained a compass, a small knife, and a pack of matches. She then turned away and wandered off into the woods telling her friends that she planned to be back by midnight. Many people have questioned why Anu's friends didn't stop her from going into the woods by herself, especially since she was incredibly underdressed and unprepared. But according to Sheriff David Cox, her friends felt that this was something that she needed to do, since she'd been talking about it for a very long time. I wish we knew more about her mental state at this time, as well as the specifics of her spirituality, because it could help to shed a lot of light on this case. But unfortunately, that information just isn't there. One thing is clear, though. For Anu, this trip wasn't something that she had suddenly decided she wanted to do. In her mind, this was something she needed to do. As Anu stepped away from her group of friends, she showed them one final glimpse of her smile before walking off into the woods, never to be seen alive again. The term missing 411 refers to individuals who have gone missing under bizarre circumstances inside of a national park. Unfortunately, Anu's case is the very definition of bizarre. Anu's friends waited patiently for her to return as promised, but when temperatures started to drop into the 40s, accompanied by light rain, they became concerned since she wasn't wearing any clothing and would be left at the mercy of the elements if she didn't make it back to the campsite soon. She did have matches with her, so she would have been able to start a fire, but if the rain got any worse, that fire would have been useless. When midnight came and there was no sign of Anu, her friends felt that something had to be done, and they contacted the Skamania County Sheriff's Office to report Anu as a missing person. A search party was quickly organized, and as soon as it started, detectives felt that there was a good chance that she would be found since they very quickly discovered bare footprints not far from the campsite that were estimated to be about the same size as Anu's feet. The footprints led them to Canyon Creek, which isn't too far from the campground, and it was determined that she had crossed the creek, seemingly without any problems. Most people have, though, expressed their astonishment at the fact that she made it this far, 
since the going from the campsite to the creek is very steep, and it would not have been easy to traverse the terrain, especially while not wearing any shoes. Just as astounding was the fact that she seemingly climbed up the other side of the canyon, which was also very steep, and she seemed to have made it to Forest Road 54. But unfortunately, this is where searchers were unable to find any more footprints, so they had no idea which direction Anu may have walked. It was as if she had approached the road, then vanished. There were no signs of a struggle, no clues or evidence, nothing. It was genuinely like she had just blipped out of existence. The decision was made to bring in search dogs from a nonprofit company called Pacific Crest Search Dogs to aid in the search, but they were unable to pick up on Anu's scent past this road. At one point, searchers considered calling in helicopters to help the search from the air, but it was the following day at this point, and a thick cloud cover had formed which made this mission impossible. Unwilling to give up, searchers continued scouring the area for the rest of the day, but were unable to find any trace of Anu and they had no choice but to suspend the search when it started getting dark, as their efforts would have now put even more lives in danger. They resumed the search the following morning, but again they were unable to find a single clue as to which direction Anu had traveled, and her family and friends started to fear the worst. She'd now been nude in the wilderness for multiple days. Temperatures had dropped multiple times, rain and mud now covered the terrain, and the conditions were dire to put it mildly. But what's incredibly odd is that the search efforts were called off after just two days, which is a very short time in a missing person investigation. Oftentimes, rescue personnel will search for clues for weeks, even months, but in Anu's case, this simply didn't happen. It's unclear why this was done since the forest is massive and Anu could have walked in any direction that had not been searched yet. This decision admittedly seems incredibly irresponsible. But I feel like we have to assume that the sheriff's office likely had their reasons. Anu's family and friends then launched an urgent appeal in which they spoke to the media, begging for searchers to continue their efforts. This had the desired effect, and the search was indeed resumed that same week. But many people who followed the case still wonder why the decision was made to suspend the search in the first place, since no explanation was ever given. This wasted large amounts of crucial time. Considering Anu had no food, no water, no hope of shelter, it just boggles my mind how they could have tried to give up after less than 48 hours. One thing that's interesting about the search is that some of the searchers stated that the brush was so thick that they could probably walk right up to someone who was lying on the ground and never even notice them. They feared that the chances of finding Anu after she'd been out in the elements for nearly a week were now slim to none. This is a very, very old growth forest, so it makes sense that the undergrowth would be quite substantial. Anu and her friends waited day after day, hoping, praying, and begging that they would receive some sort of news. As fate would have it, they received news just six days later. But it wasn't the news that they had hoped for. At 6 p.m. on the 15th of June, just six days after her disappearance, Anu's friends and family were informed that the search was officially called off. Not a single trace of her was found, and since the likelihood that she would have succumbed to hypothermia due to the low nighttime temperatures was very, very high, authorities stuck to their decision this time around. It was announced that Anu was presumed deceased, and that was that. Not one trace of Anu has ever been found, even all these years later. It's been almost 11 years since Anu ventured out into the wild on her own, and to this day, no one knows where she went, what happened to her, or if she was trying to make her way back to the campsite when she went missing. As with most unsolved missing person investigations, those that kept close tabs on the case had their own theories as to what happened to Anu, and some of them make a lot more sense than you would expect. This isn't one of those typical missing 411 cases where everyone suspects some kind of alien abduction. No, this case hits very close to home for a lot of people and some of these theories may just be correct. The most common and most likely scenario is that Anu lost her way while in the forest, and having no clothing or other supplies like food to keep her warm, she had to bunker down for the night, planning to finish her journey in the morning. While this would have been a good idea under normal circumstances, Anu would have been far more affected by the low temperatures and soft rain that was falling, leading many people to believe that she succumbed to hypothermia in her sleep. The reason why she was never found 
Well, it's entirely possible she was taken off by an animal, as disturbing as that may sound. One would think that if this were the case, Anu's remains would have eventually been found, in part or in whole. But since there are any number of wild animals in this area, it's also very likely that there simply wouldn't have been anything left for rescue workers to find, especially when taken into account the thick underbrush. The next, much debated theory has to do with Forest Road 54. It's here that all traces of Anu stopped after her footprints led searchers here. And since it's a well-maintained asphalt road, it's led to some interesting speculation. Most people believe that Anu never crossed the road, since her footprints would have been found on the other side, which they weren't. Hence, it's been suggested that she either followed the road before heading onto a different part of the woods, or she was picked up by someone when she reached that point. And this is the theory that I find most plausible as well. After all, we know the area Anu came from was incredibly crime-ridden and dangerous. Could you imagine what would happen if one of these criminals happened to be passing by and saw a nude 19-year-old by the side of the road? Another theory that's also been suggested is that she planned to be picked up ahead of time, unbeknownst to her friends and family. It's possible that the entire situation was planned and Anu simply left to start a new life. Though, admittedly, this theory is wildly unlikely, as no one in her circle believes she had any reason to want to disappear, especially not in such an unorthodox way. The prevailing theory for most people is that Anu simply reached the road at just the wrong time, resulting in her being taken against her will. But this theory has drawn a lot of criticism since it seems somewhat sensationalized in most media reports, and since investigators have stated that they don't suspect any type of foul play in her disappearance. But the theory that she was picked up by someone may just hold some water, since search dogs were unable to find her scent again after they reached this part of the road, and since she was barefoot, one would imagine that her scent would still be present for some time if she left that area on foot. If she ever set foot on that road that day, I just feel certain that the dogs would have found something, anything. The fact that her scent stopped so suddenly right there, well, it just seems suspicious. But not everyone is convinced that Anu has lost her life. One of her friends, a woman named Yasmin, stated that there's always the possibility that she simply wandered into the forest with no intention of ever returning. She's been quoted by multiple sources as saying, quote, she may not want to be found. This theory may, in all actuality, be correct. One final idea is that given Anu's outlook on life and her spiritual nature, she may have taken illegal substances before she headed out on her quest, but Sheriff Cox stated in an interview that there was no indication that she had taken any such substance or any alcohol, and it's far more likely she was just eager to head out into nature on her own, then got lost or didn't make it to shelter in time. It's entirely possible that Anu is still alive somewhere, but given her loving character, it seems far more likely that if this were the case, she would have reached out to one of her loved ones at some point to reassure them that she's all right, and that they no longer need to worry about her. Whatever the case may be, Anu's disappearance has never been solved, and at this point, it seems very unlikely that her friends and family will ever receive the answers they are so desperately searching for. If you have any leads on Anu's case, you're asked to get in contact with the Skamania County Sheriff's Office at 509-427-9490. Legal battles over who receives custody of children are always sad and tense experiences, even under the best of circumstances. But when religious zealotry and the willingness to commit a crime become part of the equation, it's a recipe for disaster. And in the case of two women, Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, who suddenly disappeared in March of 2024, it was a disaster from which they would never return. Twenty-seven-year-old Veronica and thirty-nine-year-old Jillian were both known to be religious people. Jillian's husband served as a pastor at the Willow Christian Church, which is based in Nebraska, though he previously served under the same title at the Hugoton First Christian Church, which is just a short distance from the church that Veronica used to attend. While they were both very similar people, some aspects of their lives couldn't be more different. 
At the time, Veronica was in a fierce custody battle with her ex-husband's mother, Tiffany Adams. Tiffany had been granted custody of Veronica and her former husband's children due to the fact that he was spending some time in a rehab facility. Veronica had just recently filed a petition with the court in which she asked to be granted more regular visits with her kids. Why Veronica didn't already have custody of her children, though, has never been explained. As it stood, Veronica could only see her children on Saturdays under the supervision of a court-approved person, who up until this point was chosen by Tiffany Adams. But on the 30th of March, Tiffany unexpectedly told that supervisor to take a couple of days off. Tiffany then contacted Veronica, who she knew would be traveling to her house to see her children that day, and told her that she needed to find a different supervisor for the day, since her preferred one would be unavailable. Veronica was blissfully unaware that this supervisor was actually unavailable because Tiffany had called and canceled. Pretty petty move, if you ask me. Veronica then contacted Jillian Kelly to ask if she was available for the visit, and Jillian agreed to accompany her, since the kids were excited to attend one of their friend's sixth birthday parties, and she didn't want them to miss it. We don't know for sure how close Veronica and Jillian were, but based on the information I've been able to gather, the two likely only knew each other in passing. There were more acquaintances than friends, but I haven't been able to confirm this 100%. The thing is, there's been a gag order placed on this case by a judge, so some of the finer details are being withheld from the public for a few months, maybe even a couple of years or so. But we know that Jillian likely sympathized with Veronica since Jillian had four children of her own. She was known to do volunteer work in her community and clearly had a soft heart for other people, and certainly would have wanted Veronica to spend some time with her children. She also managed the children's program at the Hugoton First Christian Church, and so would have known that Veronica's children would have been very disappointed if they couldn't see their mother that day due to a scheduling conflict. Unbeknownst to the two women, though, Tiffany, along with several other people who were associated with a religious anti-government group known as God's Misfits, had been brewing a nefarious plan to keep Veronica out of the picture for good. Jillian was nothing more than an innocent volunteer who was trying to help out a fellow mom, but the plan Tiffany and her gang of so-called misfits had been concocting would change the lives of their families forever. Tiffany Adams started getting her plans ready as early as the 13th of February when she traveled to a Walmart store in Oklahoma, where she purchased three prepaid cell phones that would later be used as burner phones. In the meantime, Veronica had filed a petition for more visitations with her children, and by all accounts, Tiffany did not take too kindly to this. But nevertheless, a hearing was scheduled to be held on the 17th of April. Just three days later, Tiffany Adams was known to have gone to a big R store, also located in Oklahoma, where she bought three stun guns, and I think you can probably guess where this is going. Both of these purchases would later serve as evidence in court. Exactly a week later, on the 30th of March, Veronica and Jillian set out from Hugoton to meet up with Tiffany and the children as planned, and they were known to have made it as far as Highway 95 and Road L, which is about five miles from the designated meeting place that was arranged beforehand. But then, things started to get a little bit strange. While there hasn't been any public mention of how things unfolded exactly, police say that both women's cell phones suddenly dropped off the radar at 9.40 a.m as if they'd been switched off simultaneously or had both run out of battery, which was extremely unlikely. Investigators would later learn that just two minutes after Veronica and Jillian's cell phones went dark, the three cell phones that were bought by Tiffany were in the location of Veronica's car, and just over 10 minutes later, two of those phones were present at 43-year-old Tad Cullum's house. Cullum was also a member of God's Misfits. The two women never made it to the meeting point, didn't attend the child's birthday party, and never returned home that evening. But they wouldn't be reported as missing until the car that they were traveling in was found empty and abandoned, close to the designated meeting spot by Veronica's family. There have been several rumors spread online about how this plan unfolded, but there's never been any official mention of what exactly happened here. As far as the evidence takes us, it would seem as though the two women, Veronica and Jillian, were likely carjacked just a few miles before arriving at the meetup spot, with their car simply being left on the side of the road. The Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation sent officers to the scene, but it seemed from very early on that this wouldn't be your typical missing person investigation, since some very alarming pieces of evidence were found around the car. 
investigators noticed trails of blood on the road and by the side of the road next to the car. Veronica's glasses were located a short distance away from the car where they were found lying on the ground. And worryingly, they were found next to a broken hammer. There were rumors that locals spotted a truck and or trailer near Veronica's car that day, but these rumors have never been confirmed by detectives. All we know for sure is that whatever happened to the two women on the side of the road that day, it didn't end well. As detectives continued to scour the scene of the crime for any additional evidence, Jillian's purse was finally tracked down, and inside, officers discovered a pistol magazine, but the firearm was nowhere to be found, and it immediately became apparent that some type of foul play had occurred at the scene. A search of the immediate area was carried out, but neither Veronica nor Jillian could be located, and an investigation was launched. By this time, all three of the prepaid cell phones bought by Adams had stopped transmitting likely because they'd served their purpose and had been turned off or destroyed. Having learned about the bitter custody battle that had been raging between Veronica and Tiffany, investigators decided to do a little bit of digging into Tiffany's life, and they obtained a search warrant for her cell phone, and what they discovered immediately sent alarm bells ringing. When her browser history was checked on the 1st of April, they found that she'd searched for phrases that included taser pain level, how to get someone out of their house, gun shops, and prepaid cell phones. This was not looking good. It would seem at this point that Tiffany may have planned on getting Veronica out of the picture for good, strictly so she could maintain custody of Veronica's children. Investigators then decided to interview people that they knew had associations with Tiffany. One teenager, the daughter of Cora Twombly, also a member of God's Misfits, had a lot of information to share none of which filled investigators with any hope that these two missing women would be found unharmed. She stated that Tiffany Adams, Tad Burt Cullum, and her parents, Cora and Cole Twombly, were definitely involved in the disappearance and that they likely ended the two women's lives. She also implicated one other person, but they've never been named and have never been charged. It was then that the police found out about the prepaid cell phones that Adams had purchased. Twombly's daughter revealed that the phones had been used by the group to stay in touch with each other during the events, as you probably expected. She also then admitted that they were all a part of the God's Misfits group. When asked about what had transpired that day, she stated that her parents told her on the 29th of March that they would not be home the following morning, since they were due to go on a so-called mission. They never elaborated about what this mission was, and Cora's daughter didn't press the situation any further. The following day, the couple returned home at about 12 noon. They were each seen driving a pickup truck, and when they entered the house, they stated that their plan hadn't gone quite as they had anticipated, but no one would have to worry about Veronica being a problem any longer. While it was never explained what they meant by this, their intentions seemed pretty clear. Cora's daughter took things one step further and admitted that the group had made an attempt on Veronica's life in the past, but couldn't carry out their plan since she didn't leave her house when they expected her to, essentially foiling their plans. On that occasion, they'd hatched a diabolical plan of throwing an anvil through Veronica's windshield while she was driving in hopes that it would look like an accident, in which an anvil had fallen off the back of a truck and ended her life. Thankfully, this plan never came to fruition. But what had happened to her this time around? assuming these so-called misfits were responsible. Well, what investigators uncovered next wasn't what anyone had expected or was hoping for. It had now become obvious that this was a premeditated kidnapping and that more sordid details would emerge, and so the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation contacted the FBI to ask for their assistance with the investigation. Having learned of the burner phones purchased by Adams, Investigators used location services to ascertain the whereabouts and where they were last used. They learned that all three phones had been activated on the day of the disappearance, though this was done at different times throughout the day, as we mentioned. Two of those phones were at the Twombly house that day, and after the kidnappings were carried out, they transmitted from a pasture in the area. Officers then made contact with the owner of the pasture, a man named Jamie Beasley, who explained that Cullum rented the land from him and that he used it as a grazing area for his cattle. He added that Cullum and Adams contacted him either on the 28th or 29th of March, just days before Victoria and Jillian went missing, to ask if he could cut a specific tree down, remove a stump, and bury some concrete that he needed to dispose of. 
He also stated that he would be carrying out some dirt work using his skid steer, which is a type of earth moving machine. Beasley agreed to the work and added that he saw Cullum working on the skid steer on the 30th of March, the day of the incident. But when he returned to the area at around noon, the skid steer was no longer there. Investigators decided to take a closer look at the area where Cullum had been working, and there they made a worrying discovery. They noticed that a hole had been dug and then filled back in and covered up with hay, which struck them as strange. Covering up a hole is one thing, but in this scenario, there would have been no point in trying to conceal the hole. After all, Beasley had given them permission to dig in the first place. There was no reason to hide it. Beasley added that Cullum confided in him that investigators had suspicions that he may be involved in the two women's disappearances, and that he worried about the fact that his skid steer's tracks could be seen when the machine clearly wasn't there anymore. Beasley admitted that he told Cullum he would tell anyone who asked about the skid steer that he asked Cullum to do some tree and dirt work for it. But this was likely before he learned that Cullum might be involved in a convoluted crime plot. A further search of the area resulted in the burner phones that were bought by Tiffany being found. And the next daunting task was to find out what was buried in the 10-foot hole that Cullum had dug. And this wasn't a job that any of the detectives were looking forward to. The site was soon excavated, and to the dismay of investigators, a box freezer was extracted from the ground, and inside they found Veronica and Jillian's remains. They speculated that Cullum had covered the site with hay in hopes that it would attract his cattle, and this would cover the tracks left behind by the skid steer. But obviously his plan didn't work. Other personal items that have not been made public were also found inside the hole, though investigators have revealed that those items did not belong to either Veronica or Jillian. It's unclear if these items may allude to other crimes or if they're completely unrelated. They also found one of the stun guns, pieces of clothing, a saw handle, duct tape, and a knife at the scene. While it's never been revealed exactly how the women lost their lives, there's been a lot of chatter online about the girls potentially being held against their will for hours leading up to them finally losing their lives. And considering the various weapons police found near the burial site, these women were probably set up for an afternoon of terror unlike anything you or I could imagine. I came across a source or two online that claimed that both women likely lost their lives by being on the wrong end of a firearm. But I do again want to reiterate that this has not been confirmed by investigators just yet. I cannot stress this fact enough. I certainly don't want anyone thinking I'm spreading false information here. It's just the details of this crime and how it unfolded are severely limited at the moment. What we do know is that crime scene experts concluded that Cullum had dug the hole lowered the freezer down, and then covered everything in concrete and dirt in hopes that the women would never be found. But the truth had now been revealed, and five people were taken into custody. Tiffany Adams, Tad Cullum, Cole Twombly, Cora Twombly, and Paul Grice were all charged with the crime. A witness would later contact the police to report that Grice had arrived at his home on the 17th of April and started asking strange questions, including how long DNA would be present in the ground how DNA evidence is processed, and how someone could go about moving their family to Mexico. When he was interviewed, investigators noticed that he had a cut on one of his fingers, and when asked about it, he stated that he'd hurt himself while working on his pickup truck a few days earlier. When Cullum was arrested, officers noticed that he had crescent-shaped marks on his face that were consistent with those that would be made by fingernails. This indicated that either Veronica or Jillian may have fought against him while they were being kidnapped. Those who knew Cullum claimed that he usually kept his beard well trimmed, but recently started growing it out, likely in an attempt to hide the scratches left on his face by one of his victims. But this is purely speculation. Tiffany and Cullum's community members revealed that the couple had gained quite a reputation in the area, and that most people who lived there tried to steer clear of them, since they were known to have a history of violence and were considered to be dangerous. No one ever explained specifically why they believed the couple were dangerous, but it seems pretty clear to see they were right. All of the suspects entered not guilty pleas, despite Adams admitting that she was responsible for ending the two women's lives, though she didn't go on record with these statements, so it's unclear if they'll be used against her in court, but I'd be willing to bet they probably will be. Investigators also noted that when Cullum was taken into custody, he was in possession of a rifle, 
ammunition, a bulletproof vest, and had prepared a go bag, also known as a bug out bag, that he would likely have used if he was forced to go on the run from the law. The pickup truck belonging to the Twombleys was seized after their daughter revealed that she was ordered by her parents to clean the vehicle after her parents returned home that morning. She and a friend did as they were told, but noticed a stain in the vehicle that they thought resembled blood. This discovery sent shivers down their spine, but it seems as though they didn't press the issue and left well enough alone, simply doing as the parents told them to do. Another member of the Twombly family then alerted the authorities to a gooseneck trailer that was being used by Cole Twombly, which was seen in the area where Veronica's car was found. This trailer was also confiscated and held as evidence in the case. As it stands, none of these suspects have received any sort of prison sentence, as the investigation is still ongoing. It needs to be said that all these people are innocent until proven guilty, but the evidence that continues to stack up against them, it doesn't paint a pretty picture of what unfolded that day and all over a custody disagreement. This crime not only robbed Veronica's children of their mother, but also caused the passing of a mother and wife who had nothing to do with the custody agreement whatsoever. Jillian was just doing her part to try to help out a friend who wanted to see her children. She was the very definition of an innocent bystander who just got caught up in a bad situation without even knowing it. It would later be revealed when asked on one occasion why Jillian had lost her life, Tiffany stated that it was necessary because she supported Veronica and hence could not be considered innocent. So while Tiffany did enter a not guilty plea, this statement alone seems to indicate the obvious. In the meantime, the leader of the God's Misfit group, a man who calls himself Squirrel, has come forward to state that the group has completely distanced itself from the incident and believes that Adams serves a different God to his own since the God he serves would never condone such actions, and I certainly agree. Since evidence was found that Adams and Cullum were preparing to flee, the entire group was held without bail. This decision was certainly the correct one, since it was then revealed that the couple had, during a previous custody hearing, made comments in which they stated that they knew the path the judge walked to work every morning, suggesting that they may have been thinking about harming him as well. Since capital punishment is still a very real possibility in Oklahoma, the group may face the ultimate penalty when their cases go to trial. I certainly don't feel like giving these criminals the easy way out should ever be a possibility, but according to Oklahoma law, there's a very big chance that's exactly what the prosecution will try to do. While the investigators in this case should be commended for the amazing work they did to find Veronica and Jillian's attackers, we can't lose sight of the fact that two families are now left in mourning thanks to the actions of a clearly unhinged group of people that has absolutely no regard for human life. Veronica's children have been confirmed as safe, but they'll spend the rest of their lives with the knowledge that their grandmother, a woman who was supposed to care for them while their father was dealing with his addiction issues, chose to end their mother's life over some ridiculous custody battle. And that's something that no child should ever have to contend with. I don't think there's anyone on this planet who's capable of fully processing such a wicked amount of grief and confusion, let alone a few young children. This whole situation was not only damaging to Veronica and Jillian, but more than anything else, it has profoundly affected the lives of their kids and their kids' future children, and maybe even the ones after that. This type of trauma doesn't just go away with the people who witnessed it firsthand. Trauma trickles through generations making this a crime that won't soon be forgotten. Most of us fall in love for the first time while we're still in school or attending college. And for Alex Skeel, a 28-year-old man from Stewartby in Bedfordshire, England, this was no different. But his case is one that's left many people in disbelief when it came to light that he'd been suffering horrific abuse at the hands of Jordan Worth, the woman who claimed to love him. And it would take a near-death incident to finally bring her heinous misdeeds into the public eye for all to see.
Alex Skeel didn't have an easy start to his life. He and his twin brother Luke were both born prematurely on the 17th of August 1995. And weighing just two pounds, he had to spend some time in intensive care and underwent several surgical procedures while he was still an infant. He went on to make a full recovery, and later on he and his brother became models for the well-known supermarket franchise Asda. A pretty happy ending to an otherwise tumultuous situation. While growing up, Alex developed a deep love for football, or soccer as we call it in the States, and Alex spent most of his weekends playing the game with his friends. By June of 2012, Alex was 16 years old and attending Bedford College in Bedford, England. It's here that he would meet Jordan Worth, a fellow student who was studying fine arts. On the 3rd of June of that year, one of Alex's friends was performing in a play at the college, and Alex decided to attend to show his support. Jordan was also in attendance, since one of her friends was also in the play, and soon she and Alex started chatting. Now, Alex had never shown much interest in women, but something felt different when he was with Jordan, and before long, he was falling head over heels for her. He found it surprising and exhilarating that Jordan showed interest in him, and at the time, he described her as a confident, caring, and loving person. He introduced her to his friends, and they all got along though Jordan seemed reserved and introverted compared to the rest of the group. Regardless, they accepted Jordan for who she was, and soon she was just as much a part of the group as anyone else. Alex later introduced Jordan to his family, and this is when he started to notice strange things about her behavior. Jordan would comment on the clothes that he was wearing, and on some occasions would mention that she didn't like the color, and that it didn't suit him, and that she thought he should wear something else. She would also make comments about other things like his hairstyle, suggesting that he'd rather wear it in a style that she preferred, and at first he didn't think much of it, but changed some things that she had mentioned since he wanted to impress her. After all, every relationship is full of compromise, though admittedly these were some pretty strange things to compromise on, and a lot of the time it wasn't a compromise at all. It almost felt as though Jordan was demanding these things while offering nothing in return. Alex's parents also started noticing that Jordan was playing mind games, and they tried to warn him, but he felt that when he and Jordan were alone, things were different. And although he had also noticed some strange behavior on her part, he was sure that it was nothing to worry about. That brings us to the 17th of August, 2013. Alex and Luke were celebrating their 18th birthdays, and their mother decided to make the day special by hiring a caterer and inviting all of their friends to celebrate with them. But when Jordan got wind that a certain family friend's daughter would be attending, she proclaimed that she wouldn't be going to the party. End of story. But Alex eventually convinced her to change her mind. During the night, though, an altercation broke out between Jordan and the girl, who was just 15 at the time, with Jordan hurling some rather nasty language towards her. Jordan was generally unhappy that Alex was spending all this time with people other than her. She wanted him all for herself and nothing else would do. Although Alex's friends tried to warn him that Jordan was nothing but trouble, he just couldn't see it. Considering how much he loved her, he allowed her antics to continue, believing it was all for the best. After this argument at the party, the couple started fighting much more frequently, and on one occasion, Jordan lost her temper and snapped Alex's phone's SIM card in half, preventing him from contacting anyone on his phone. He suddenly realized that his family and friends were right and he decided to end the relationship, much to the relief of everyone around him. From this point forward, things seemed like they'd begun to cool down for Alex. His life gradually got back to normal and all was well. But Jordan, she had other things in mind. Unfortunately, as is true in many abusive relationships, the separation between Alex and Jordan didn't last long. Just a few days after the breakup, Jordan arrived at the family's house with the shocking news that she was pregnant with Alex's child. He agreed to support Jordan and their child financially, but told her that they couldn't be in a relationship since he couldn't handle the mind games and her controlling behavior. For the next 12 months, they had virtually no contact, and for Alex, things couldn't have been better. Jordan gave birth to a healthy baby boy on the 19th of May, 2014. And without prior warning, Jordan showed up to the family's home with the boy so that everyone could meet him. Though Alex was unhappy with Jordan being invited into the house, his family felt that she'd changed after becoming a mother, since she showed none of the strange behavior that they'd witnessed in the past. For Alex, though, the wounds still felt too fresh, and he wanted no part in this. 
Instead, he decided to meet his son for the first time without Jordan present, opting instead to do so with his grandfather, who he was very close with by his side. But before long, as you probably expected, Alex and Jordan started spending time together again while caring for their son, and the following year, they decided to officially and formally get back together. This time, everything seemed different. Jordan truly seemed to have turned over a new leaf, and by Alex's own admittance, their relationship was better than it had ever been. But just a short while later, Alex's family started noticing more alarming behavior, and when Alex confronted Jordan about it, she lost her temper yet again. She told Alex that he had to choose between her and his family. Alex didn't want to be separated from his son, and so he decided to move in with Jordan. His family wouldn't see him again for the next two years. The couple had moved into Jordan's parents' house, but here, Jordan's controlling behavior only escalated. She forced Alex to change his phone number, and on several occasions accused him of cheating on her with other women even though Alex wasn't that kind of person and never showed any interest in anyone else. She also falsely told him that her mother had been informed by his family that his grandfather had passed away. But upon seeing how upset he was, she later admitted that she had lied. Why she did this, nobody knows. Despite all of this, the couple decided to find their own place in 2016, and they moved to Stewart Bay. For a while, everything seemed perfect. Alex and Jordan were getting along, their son was healthy, and they loved their new house. Since the relationship seemed to be better than ever before, they decided to have another baby, and soon Jordan was pregnant once again. While everything was going great during these days, their house of cards would soon come crashing down, and Alex could have never expected the terror and turmoil that his life was about to crash into. Jordan was still in college at this time. She had classes nearly every day. But as time passed by, she began to grow concerned that Alex may have been sneaking around behind her back while she was gone for the day. As it would turn out, she was right. But Alex wasn't sneaking around with other women. He was sneaking around to visit his family. When Jordan found out about this, she was beyond livid. From this point on, she forced Alex to attend all of her classes with her so that she would always be able to keep an eye on him. Alex hesitantly agreed, because he couldn't stand the thought of shaking the foundations of his already fragile family. It wasn't long after this that Jordan had set up a fake Facebook profile in Alex's name, and in the months that followed, she contacted his friends via private messages, stating that he wanted nothing to do with them, and that he'd never really considered them as his friends in the first place. Luckily, they quickly caught on and replied that they knew Jordan was the one messaging them, resulting in them being blocked from the fake profile. She also messaged his family pretending to be Alex, telling them that he didn't want any contact with them and that they should just leave him alone. Again, it seems the family knew that these messages weren't from Alex, but from Jordan. By this time, Alex's family had had enough, and they made up their minds to intervene. They knew that the couple had relocated to Stuart Bay, but when they finally tracked Alex down at his new address, their knocks were ignored, despite the couple clearly being home. They were under the impression that Alex didn't want to see them, and so they had no choice but to leave. In the meantime, Jordan's behavior had gotten worse than ever before, and on one occasion, she forced Alex to swallow an entire packet of sleeping tablets, which left him with memory loss for the rest of the evening. When he finally woke up, he had no clue what had taken place, and to this day, that evening is still a bit of a blur. A few days later, the two were driving in their car when, without provocation, Jordan picked up her hairbrush and started assaulting Alex with it, resulting in one of his teeth breaking off. She would later admit to the assault, but maintained that she had never been abusive towards him before, nor had she ever kept him from contacting his family. The investigation into this incident more or less ended right there. But things would only get far, far worse from here. During the nights when Alex had fallen asleep before Jordan, he would repeatedly be awoken by blows to his head, which would leave him with scars afterward. During one of these attacks, Alex was unsure what had even happened, and to his shock, he realized that Jordan had assaulted him with a hammer. When questioned by the police later on, Jordan would admit that she had, in fact, used a hammer to assault him, but inexplicably stated that she never meant to hurt him. But then, investigators found out that she had taken things a step further on a couple occasions, pulling out a knife. Her response to this accusation was even more baffling. She stated that, yes, she had used a knife to assault him, but she only ever cut him, 
and never jabbed him with it, as if that would make things better. It would seem that, in her mind, the two actions were vastly different. But in reality, regardless of how things specifically played out, Alex's life was in constant danger. By this time, Alex had started to lose weight in a dramatic way, since Jordan would sometimes not allow him to eat. This would usually be when she wasn't hungry, and so she didn't see the point in preparing dinner. And it would seem that she prevented Alex from preparing dinner either. She also started prohibiting him from sleeping in their bed, instead forcing Alex to sleep on the floor. She would later make the excuse that there wasn't space for Alex, since she was sharing their bed with their baby, but this was an obvious lie. Alex knew that he was in trouble by this point. There was no doubt in his mind that he was going downhill physically, but his judgment had become so clouded that he didn't know what to do. He saw no other option than to contact his family for help, and in February of 2017, he contacted his father out of desperation. But when his father arrived at the couple's house, all of the lights were suddenly switched off, and Alex asked him to leave, but he refused to do so. Instead, his father phoned the police since he suspected that Jordan was keeping him from coming outside. He didn't know how right he was. It would seem that for weeks or months leading up to this, Jordan had prevented Alex from leaving the house at any point without her accompaniment or approval. He was to remain in her line of sight at all hours of the day, no exception. When officers arrived later on, they spoke with the couple and then told Alex's father that the couple had merely had an argument and that the issue had been resolved. They did, however, mention that Alex was seen walking with a limp, but stated that there wasn't much that they could do other than to ensure that the fight was well and truly over. Disappointed by the outcome, Alex's father had no choice but to leave empty-handed. It would seem, at this point, Alex was desperate to get out of the relationship, but Jordan's controlling behavior had gotten so out of control that he had no idea how to deal with it or how to escape the nightmare that he was living. He was now a prisoner within his own home. He couldn't leave. He couldn't sleep. It almost felt as though he couldn't breathe without Jordan's permission. But quite unbelievably, the worst was yet to come. Alex would later recall that he and Jordan went to see a band perform in Leeds one night, and he thoroughly enjoyed himself. Not only because it was his favorite band, but because he and Jordan were having a good time, and he felt as though he didn't need to worry about being abused for once, even if only for one night. But his relief was short-lived. The following morning, he woke up in their hotel room to the horrific realization that Jordan was pouring boiling water down his back for reasons unknown. He would later state that he'd started screaming in pain and couldn't understand why she had done this. When Jordan was confronted about this by investigators later on, she merely stated that it was untrue since she had never poured boiling water on Alex while they were in Leeds, with her exact words being, quote, never in Leeds, never. On another occasion, Jordan purchased a cheap lie detecting device, which she told Alex to strap to his hand. She quizzed him on things about all kinds of stuff, all the while standing ready with the kettle of boiling water, which she intended to use if he was found by the machine to have been untruthful. To make matters worse, Jordan would reveal a short while later that she'd fallen pregnant yet again. But while most of us would recoil in horror at the thought of this, Alex believed that having another baby together might bring about a change in Jordan's behavior. But as is to be expected, this simply wasn't the case. Their second child, a girl, was born in May of 2017. And for the first few days, Alex did see a change in her behavior, but this wouldn't last long. The couple had started arguing yet again, and one night their neighbor had had enough and decided to call the police. The caller would tell the 999 dispatcher that he was certain someone was being assaulted since he heard a man asking someone to stop hurting him and to get off of him. When officers arrived at the scene, they had to knock and call out several times before the door was opened by Jordan. The first officer to see her stated that she didn't seem in any way distressed, and she calmly stated that there had been an incident in which Alex had hurt himself. She added that he had a history of self-harm, which was of course untrue. But when the officer asked Alex whether this was the case, he stated that it was, likely out of fear that he would be assaulted if he contradicted her. It would later come to light that Jordan had been assaulting Alex with a bread knife. In an effort to defend himself, he had to put his hand in front of his face to avoid being cut, and in the process, sustained a serious injury to his hand. After the police left, Alex went to a local hospital where he received stitches, 
and since the police officers couldn't see any evidence that a crime had been committed, they took the couple's word that the injury was self-inflicted, and hence could do nothing further. The injury to Alex's hand was so severe that he needed surgery, but before this could happen, Jordan arrived and decided that he needed to go home instead. Hospital staff were quick to realize what was going on, and they tried to convince him to stay, if only to undergo the necessary procedure. Alex was then seen by a consultant who asked him if he was sure that he wanted to leave, since he felt that it would be unsafe. But Alex assured him that everything would be all right, so he left the hospital and went home with Jordan. He would later admit that in that moment, he knew he had a chance to reveal everything that had been done to him, but he was frightened at what the repercussions would be the next time that he was alone with Jordan. A few days later, the same officer who'd been called to the house before returned to the property for yet another domestic incident report. And this time, he sat Alex down to ask him whether he was being abused while he ordered Jordan to stay downstairs. But Alex stated that he and Jordan had merely been arguing since they were under a lot of stress. In body cam footage of the incident, it becomes clear that the officer doesn't believe him and decides to take Alex out of the house. He escorted Alex to his patrol car and asked him to finally tell the truth since they were in a safe environment where they couldn't be overheard. Alex stuck to his story for a short while, but eventually relented and admitted that he had been suffering abuse at Jordan's hand for years. But he pleaded with investigators to only rely on neighbors' reports since he didn't want Jordan to find out that he'd been the one to accuse her of a crime. Officers returned to the house and informed Jordan that she was being placed under arrest for assault and that she would be taken to the police station for questioning, where she would be allowed to tell her side of the story. The officer would later report that Jordan mistakenly thought that she would only be out of the house for an hour or so, and that she'd be allowed to leave as soon as she had, quote, cleared everything up. Alex was then taken back to the hospital, where the true horrific nature of his injuries was revealed. Due to the head trauma that he had sustained, fluid had built up on his brain, and doctors informed him that if he hadn't received treatment when he did, he likely would have lost his life in about 10 days. When interviewed later by investigators, Alex stated that he never lashed out at Jordan in self-defense, since he didn't want to hurt her. He added that he never reported the abuse since he believed it would stop one day and that the relationship would turn out to be okay. After being questioned by police and admitting to the abuse that she'd inflicted on Alex, Jordan was charged with 17 counts of grievous bodily harm and controlling or coercive behavior. She pleaded guilty to three of the charges, and in April of 2018, she was found guilty and handed two seven-year sentences to be served at the same time. She also received six months for the controlling or coercive behavior, becoming the first woman in UK history to be convicted of that charge. After being released from the hospital, Alex moved back in with his family, who were all too happy to see him home and safe. Jordan would eventually be released in 2023 after serving just five years of her sentence, when it was found that she'd no longer posed a risk to her surrounding community. She'll never be allowed to contact Alex again, and Alex has since gone on to become a football or soccer coach, and is now an ambassador for a charity against domestic violence called the Mankind Initiative, who also sponsors his football team. Alex has vowed to do everything within his power to spread the word of Jordan's abuse, but in a positive way, hoping to inspire other victims to take any opportunity they can to get out of an awful situation, such as the one that he had to live through. He's also started hosting talks in which he informs others of the signs of domestic abuse, and he's since stated that he's learning how to cope with the trauma and the memories of the abuse against him. He's now concentrating on the life ahead of him and creating a promising future for his children. There's been no word on what happened with Jordan after her release, but considering she's now prohibited from ever speaking to Alex again, I think I can speak for everyone when I say, who even cares what happened to her? Good riddance. It's not often that cases like this have a happy ending. So let this be a lesson to all of us. You're worth a lot more than you probably give yourself credit for. We're all above being abused, talked down to, or physically assaulted. I've said it in past videos, it can never be too early to get out of a bad situation, but it can always be too late. It was October 13th, 2011, when a pair of black bags were found behind an Oklahoma City grocery store, and police were called to the scene to investigate. The bags were discovered by a team that was trying to trap some feral cats, and the smell that was emanating from the bags was indescribable, but detectives pressed on. As they opened each of the containers, investigators quickly realized they'd uncovered a morbid crime scene 
something unlike anything they had seen before. Detectives are still working to piece together what exactly happened here, and they've since arrested two men in connection to the crime. But what exactly was inside these bags, and who could have done such a thing? Stick around and find out. Karina Saunders was born on July 17, 1992. Her parents say that they decided to name her Karina as the name directly translates to Dear Little One, and dear to her family, Karina certainly was. Karina was one of nine siblings, but she always found a way to stand out and become noticed. Her father described her as being very outgoing, and she'd always find a way to fit in no matter where she went. Karina went to school in Mustang, Oklahoma, attending Mustang High School, a relatively small school in a relatively small area, but the Saunders family made the best of it and Karina seemed more than happy during her teenage years, a stark contrast from many of the other young victims that we cover from time to time. While attending school, Karina became well known for her singing. According to one report, Karina was always seen wandering around campus singing, and eventually she was given a spot on the high school honor choir team. But Karina wasn't just a great singer, she was also quite smart. She'd been a top competitor in the school's math tournaments year after year, and she won the school's spelling bee three years in a row. She'd also won a statewide tournament in accounting. And I'll be honest, I've never heard of any team being interested in accounting before, and certainly not to the extent of entering an accounting tournament, but this just shows the type of person that Karina was. She wasn't just good at accounting either, she truly enjoyed it. Her main goal in life was to become an opera singer, but if that career path didn't pan out, she decided to take up a career in accounting. Her future was looking incredibly bright, and Karina was so far ahead of other teens her age that she was able to graduate high school a year early. But unfortunately, this is where her winning streak would run out. According to Karina's mother, no sooner than Karina left school, her life began to spiral. Her mother says that Karina began to struggle with substance abuse, and she was known to have taken part in various illegal narcotics. As shocking as it may be, her issues grew so severe that she decided to spend her summer vacation going to rehab. So this certainly seems to have been a problem that was brewing for quite some time. Her stay at the rehab facility seems to have worked out great, and her mother recalls that Karina left the program as a new woman. She was excited to get her life back on track, and by all means, seems to have been doing much better. But we have to keep in mind that, for most people, addiction is a lifelong struggle. It's not something that can just be solved by spending a few weeks in a program. Addiction is a habit that you can certainly kick, but months, years, even decades after getting clean, the lust for another fix can pop up when you least expect it. But for Karina, as far as her family could tell, she was having no issues coming to terms with her new life as a recovering addict. Karina and her family had begun attending church services again, and Karina would even post about her religion and beliefs on social media from time to time. Social media was the main way that her friends and family would keep in touch with her, as she didn't have a cell phone or a car of her own just yet. But she would always be sure to post updates or send messages to her loved ones on social media. The last time Karina saw her mother was the day that they attended church together, September 18th, 2011. Several days later, on September 28th, Karina would post to social media and ask her friends and followers what they planned for the night, seemingly looking for someone to tag along with. But oddly enough, Karina would never post to social media again after this. Even stranger, her mother was never able to get in touch with her again either, and her family were left in the dark about where she may have gone. It wouldn't take long before Karina's family would realize that she had gone missing. On September 28th, the day of her final social media post, Karina was known to have visited a local Taco Bell with her cousin, though her family says that the two girls were more like sisters than anything else. Her cousin Catherine left Taco Bell a short while later, but Karina didn't go with her. Instead, Karina stayed at the restaurant to meet up with a friend known as Kenny. According to several reports, Kenny was a bit of an interesting character. He wasn't friends with Karina in the traditional sense, rather, he was helping Karina establish her career as an adult actress. Sources vary regarding what type of work Karina was specifically getting involved with. Some say that she was beginning to start working on the streets, while others report that she was gearing up to begin starring in adult films. We just don't know for sure. 
but whatever the case was, Kinney was more or less set up to be Karina's manager. And detectives found several pieces of evidence in Kinney's possession, proving that these allegations were most likely true. Kinney says that he and Karina hung out for several hours that afternoon, and he later dropped her off outside of an apartment complex close to Oklahoma City. About a week later, an old friend from high school saw Karina hanging out near this apartment complex. The two chatted for a while, and Karina claimed that she'd moved in with the apartment complex's handyman, and that she'd been helping him around the apartments in her spare time. The friend named Keegan said that he saw Karina again later that day, and he stopped to chat with her for a while longer. He quickly learned that Karina hadn't eaten in several days, but he didn't press her to find out why. He offered to take her to get some food, and while they were out, he learned that Karina was essentially homeless and had been living out of a small duffel bag. This took place on October 8th, 2011. After the two said their goodbyes that afternoon, Keegan says that he never saw or heard from Karina again. Well, at least not until he saw her face plastered all across the local news. He quickly learned that Karina had gone missing, and police feared the worst after discovering CCTV security footage of Karina getting into a red pickup truck outside of a local casino. Several other women were spotted in a nearby vehicle, each of them pleading for Karina to not get inside, but Karina entered the truck anyway. And after this, she was never seen again. The CCTV security footage from this case doesn't appear to have been made public, but various descriptions of the footage can be found online. According to these reports, there were two cars parked outside the casino that evening. One was a red Ford pickup truck with a brush guard and lights mounted on the top. The other was parked nearby and was simply described as being a dark colored vehicle. This is the vehicle that multiple women were believed to have been inside of. A large man with sleeve tattoos exited the red pickup truck, and it seems that he instructed Karina to get inside, and she followed his orders. All the while, the women in the nearby car were screaming for Karina to run away, but she didn't. Neither this man nor the women have ever been located for questioning. The following day, Catherine, Karina's cousin, was texting one of Karina's friends named Kyle Savage. Karina and Kyle were known to have been on good terms, but at some point during this conversation with Catherine, things turned sour and he sent a haunting text message that remains unexplained all these years later. He texted Catherine and said, I'm going to bury you next to Karina. When police questioned him about this text later on, he said that the text was sent by mistake. He thought he was talking to one of his male friends, but sent the text to Catherine purely by accident. But this begs the question, why would he have been sending such a threatening text to one of his male friends either? To make things worse, when this text had been sent, no one had seen or heard from Karina for about 24 hours, and his text certainly suggests that something bad had happened to Karina and he knew about it. In the end, police weren't able to find any evidence to place any charges against Kyle, but for Karina's mother, enough was enough. She thought that it had been very odd that Karina had been out of touch for such a long period of time. After these text messages were brought to her attention, she decided it was time to file a missing person report, and the hunt for Karina was officially underway. This report was filed on October 10th, 2011. Karina's mother immediately sprang into action and began hanging up missing person flyers all around town. She reached out to all of Karina's closest friends and family members and asked for help, only to learn that no one had heard from Karina in at least a month. Nevertheless, they all worked together to raise awareness for her disappearance on social media, and through hanging up hundreds of missing person flyers in the local area. In missing person cases like this, it often takes detectives and families weeks, months, or even years to get answers, but for the Saunders family, they would only need to wait a matter of days before there was a major breakthrough in the case. But unfortunately, it wasn't the breakthrough that anyone would have hoped for. It was October 13th, 2011. A team of animal rescue volunteers had been attempting to trap some feral cats behind a local grocery store, known as Homeland Grocery. As they were setting up the traps for the animals, they encountered a pungent odor that filled the air. As they traced the source of the smell, they came across two black duffel bags, one small and one large. The closer they got to the bags, the stronger the smell became. It was at this point that they decided to abandon their initial mission, and they called in the help of the local police. When police arrived at the scene, they immediately knew that something was wrong. 
One officer recalled smelling the distinct odor of decomposition, and she knew that they'd encountered a terrible crime scene. As officers opened up the bags, they found that each duffel bag had been stuffed with smaller plastic bags, each of which contained a portion of a young woman. I'm not going to go into any further detail about the state of this discovery, but it was more than obvious that a serious crime had taken place here. Officers said that a lack of any other evidence at the scene suggested that this wasn't the scene of the actual crime, but rather a dump site. Police say that the bags had likely been here for three or four days, but at the time of the discovery, they had no idea who the remains could have belonged to. They wouldn't find answers to this question until four days later, on Monday, October 17th. Early that morning, Karina's parents received a phone call from the police, asking them to call out of work and come to the police station immediately. When they arrived, it became painfully obvious that they weren't called down for good news regarding their search for Karina. Instead, it was far worse than any parent could ever prepare themselves for. Karina's parents would soon learn the pain of loss that none of us could ever imagine. Losing a child or a loved one is beyond comprehension, but losing a child like this? These are wounds that will never heal. As mentioned a moment ago, the last known sighting of Karina was at the aforementioned Newcastle Casino which meant that Karina was last seen alive on the evening of October 8th, five days before the duffel bags were discovered. After confirming this info, police turned their attention towards a nearby home located at 3500 South Harvey Street. This home was known by locals as being a home for less than desirable people. While innocent homeless people would use the home for shelter from time to time, the real reason why locals were bothered by the home is because it was also used by individuals who would seek shelter in the home to sell illegal goods or to use them. Police had been called dozens of times over the years, and there were various reports of women selling themselves for money near the home, and even reports of a man claiming his life inside of the home, and another man trying to set the home on fire. This place was seriously sketchy, and it was one of the first places police searched for clues, given the somewhat close proximity to the scene of the crime. While investigators didn't find any additional evidence here, it did help prompt the police to issue an order for the building to be condemned and torn down, certainly easing the minds of all the neighbors who lived nearby. It was around this time that the autopsy report came back from the coroner's office. Now, like I mentioned a moment ago, I'm not going to go into all the details about the state of Karina's remains. It's far too graphic for even seasoned true crime viewers to hear, but that information is out there if you want to read it for yourself. All I'll tell you is that there were various pieces of evidence and remains that were tested, and each revelation was worse than the last. Karina had been subjected to a night unlike anything else. She had been restrained, she'd been dosed with prescription painkillers, and the criminals went to great lengths to try to conceal her identity before dumping the evidence. The coroner says that it's impossible to determine whether or not Karina had been alive when the criminals began, well, taking steps to fit Karina into the duffel bags. But one witness claimed to have seen video footage of the ordeal, and this witness confirmed that Karina was, in fact, alive at the time that this occurred. This witness was known as Tia and she claims she uncovered the video while looking through a friend's cell phone. Her friend, Louis Ruiz, had left his phone out while he went to the bathroom one day while he was visiting with Tia. She began innocently scrolling through his photos and videos when she came across the footage of Karina by mistake. Another woman later came forward and claims to have witnessed the crimes against Karina firsthand, becoming so terrified that she jumped out of a window and ran for her life, and thankfully did so successfully. Now, all this may sound like it's coming completely out of left field, but there's much more to Lewis than meets the eye. According to Tia and several investigators who dug deeper into Lewis's past, Lewis reportedly had been involved in various crimes, including dealing, human trafficking, and he may have even had links to certain homicide cases. But get this, here's the craziest detail of all, Lewis also used to be an elementary school teacher. It's rumored that he became involved with illegal trafficking and quit his job as a teacher soon after, as he didn't need the money anymore. It was July of 2012 when police finally began to bring together enough evidence to implicate Louis Ruiz. But he wasn't the only man believed to have been involved in the crime. As they would soon learn, two prison inmates had come forward and revealed that they had shared a cell with another man named Jimmy Massey. 
Jimmy had allegedly confessed to the crime while behind bars. Not only this, but Jimmy had direct ties to Lewis, and they both allegedly ran a trafficking ring together. Hopefully now, all this is starting to make sense as the facts and allegations are all adding up, but this still begs one bigger question. What was the motive? After all, Karina had no known ties to either of these men. Well, it may be as simple as Karina being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So, as you can imagine, being a victim of human trafficking isn't a great lifestyle. These young men and women are forced against their will every day of their lives, and most of these victims will attempt to escape at some point or another. But for Lewis and Jimmy, they were tired of having to deal with all of their victims trying to flee. To help put an end to this, it's been suggested that Karina was captured and her life was taken in the most awful way in order to show all of the trafficking victims what would happen to them if they ever tried to escape again. According to these rumors, Karina had no involvement with either of these men or any of these girls. She just happened to be outside the wrong casino at the wrong time. But here's where things really take a dramatic turn. In 2013, all charges against both Lewis and Jimmy were dropped due to a lack of evidence. While police had multiple compelling witness testimonies regarding both Lewis and Jimmy, they weren't able to find any evidence that tied either of them to the scene of the crime nor did they have any evidence to confirm the witness testimony. Witness statements can only take an investigation so far, and in this case, they just couldn't take things far enough to secure a conviction. To make matters worse, the video that Tia allegedly found on Lewis's phone has never been located, and it's entirely possible that she made the whole thing up or that Lewis deleted the video before police could find it. In the end, both men were cleared, and Lewis was even granted $50,000 in compensation after his attorney learned of at least 10 civil rights violations that were carried out against him while he was in custody. Ever since then, the case has more or less reached a standstill. The FBI has been called in to help with the investigation, and various investigative agencies in Oklahoma are still helping out, but the evidence in this case is minimal at best. Whoever carried out this crime did an excellent job of covering their tracks, and so far, police have virtually no leads. While many people still believe that Lewis and Jimmy were involved, this doesn't matter if police aren't able to prove it. In the end, it's entirely possible and highly probable that Karina did nothing wrong in the lead up to her disappearance. Her friends and family say that she had no known ties to any of the suspects, and investigators have been forced to agree. The hunt for the criminals responsible for Karina's demise is still ongoing, but things are not looking great for the investigation. Police are currently offering a $10,000 reward for information, and another $50,000 was offered by an anonymous donor in 2018. If you have any info regarding this case, anything at all, you're asked to contact the OSBI at 1-800-522-8017. You can also email tips to tips at osbi.ok.gov. Brianna Kinnear wasn't someone that you would expect to become a victim of a violent crime. In fact, according to investigators and the evidence provided by her mother, Brianna is the last person you would expect to be caught up in such a horrendous cold case. See, Brianna grew up as one of the popular girls in her school, but immediately after graduating, well, things took a downward turn. Before she knew it, Brianna had become caught up in the dark underworld of organized crime. It started off as a simple, easy way to make money, but by the time Brianna turned around, she was far deeper than she could have ever imagined. Detectives are still debating why Brianna lost her life that day, but the truth of this crime may be a bit more obvious than police are willing to admit. Brianna Kinnear wasn't your average teenager. According to Brianna's mother, she was always one of the more popular kids in school, far from average. We don't know too much about her younger years, but we know that by the time Brianna made it to high school, she was doing incredibly well for herself. This was in the early 2000s, between 2003 and 2005. Brianna never really got into any trouble during school. She always kept her nose clean and made sure to get all of her schoolwork done to the best of her ability. Brianna was known for her remarkable soccer skills all throughout high school, and she was one of the star players on her team. 
It seemed that if she were able to maintain this momentum and skill, she would be well on her way to getting a great scholarship towards a college education. There's been no word on whether or not her time playing soccer paid off, but as her high school years were coming to an end, Brianna announced that she wanted to get a further education by studying to become an esthetician or a makeup artist. These two jobs go hand in hand to a certain extent. Her mother recalled Brianna around this time as being incredibly warm-hearted and loved by nearly everyone, so pursuing a job as a personal makeup artist would certainly have been a great path for her. But no sooner than Brianna started making arrangements for her future, things started to change. See, for her final year in high school, Brianna attended Coquitlam's Terry Fox Secondary School in British Columbia, Canada. It was here that she met her first long-term boyfriend, Jesse Margeson. The two met through mutual friends, but Jesse had a reputation for being a, well, less than desirable person. Brianna's mother, Carol, knew Jesse's history all too well. As soon as Brianna announced that the two were friends, her mother began to warn her to stay away from him. The thing about Jesse is that he was always involved with all sorts of nefarious people, carrying out pretty much any kind of illegal activity you could think of. Crazy enough, when he and Brianna first met, Jesse was actually hiding out from the police, avoiding arrest. Brianna encouraged Jesse to turn himself in so that he could do his time, clear his name, and move on with his life. But as we all know, this was never going to happen. Once you become involved with people like this, there's only one way out, and it certainly doesn't involve the police. At first, Brianna and Jesse were nothing more than friends. But for those closest to them, it became quite clear that Brianna was looking for much more, and so was Jesse. It didn't take the two very long at all before their relationship started to heat up, and before long, they had announced that they were officially dating. For Carol, Brianna's mother, this was pretty much the worst news she'd ever heard. She knew how dangerous Jesse was, and she knew how impressionable Brianna was. To hear that the two were now so close was devastating, but I'm sure we all know that a parent's words mean virtually nothing to a teenager who's in love. Carol was willing to do anything within her power to keep Brianna away from Jesse, and her first attempt at this was to go to the police and request a restraining order against him. But unfortunately, there was nothing the police could do. Rather obviously, Jesse had committed no crimes that targeted Carol or Brianna. This meant that they had no legal ground to stand on when it came to requesting a restraining order. In the words of the police, if Brianna willingly invited Jesse into Carol's home, there was nothing that they could do. Unfortunately, while Carol sought this restraining order as a way to help protect her daughter, the effects of this may have only made things worse. Brianna knew that her mother didn't like Jesse. She made this much as obvious as she possibly could, hoping her daughter would see the light and break up with him. But as you probably came to expect, her mother's efforts had the opposite effect. Her actions only drove Brianna closer to Jesse, and would eventually lead to her moving out when she was just 19 years old, with the sole purpose of continuing her relationship far away from her mother's eyes. It was right around 2005. Brianna was just 19 years old when she moved out of her mother's home, presumably moving in with her boyfriend Jesse, but this is just a guess. I haven't been able to confirm this. As it would turn out, the media coverage of Brianna's case was shockingly minimal, but there is a reason for this that we'll get to in just a moment. But no sooner than Brianna moved out, her mother noticed that she started having larger amounts of money around. It started off with Brianna having money to eat out at restaurants. Prior to this, Brianna and her mother did well enough, but they certainly weren't eating out multiple times a week. Carol says that it was at this point that she began to suspect that both Brianna and Brianna's best friend Tiffany Bryan had been convinced by Jesse and his crew to become part of the illegal trafficking trade that was running rampant through the area at the time. Having grown up in Coquitlam, Brianna had been exposed to organized crime for most of her life. Now, this isn't to say that either she or her family were involved in it, but rather it was an issue in the area that was only getting worse as time grew on. Coquitlam is only about a 35-minute drive from Vancouver. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know too much about the state of Vancouver around this time, but it's become common knowledge in more recent years that Vancouver, and really most of British Columbia, was in a pretty bad place in the mid to late 2000s. This is because organized crime was running rampant through the streets, and people were losing their lives each and every day. That's because beginning around 2007, building up to 2009, 
Vancouver was caught up in the middle of one of the most high-profile gang wars in modern times. Due to restrictions that had been put in place by the Mexican government around this time, illegal goods were becoming harder and harder to come by on the streets of Vancouver. Now, this was true pretty much everywhere across Canada and the United States, but it was particularly bad in Vancouver. This caused tensions to become incredibly high between the various gangs that had set up shop in the area. Between late 2007 and early 2009, dozens and dozens of gang members lost their lives due to increased tension and violence between these various groups. Unfortunately for Brianna Kennier, her boyfriend Jesse was a member of one of these gangs. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that Brianna's case didn't get much media attention. And the reason for that is because she was so closely related with all of this gang activity. In fact, when her case did make the news, most people just wrote her off as yet another junkie who had it coming. But this simply wasn't true. Though this did mean that her media coverage was incredibly minimal, and most people forgot about her case as quickly as they had learned of it. The thing we don't know is whether or not Jesse had malicious intentions when he recruited both Brianna and her friend Tiffany into his dealings. I'd like to think that he didn't. I'd like to think that he was simply a guy that was caught up with all the wrong people and didn't realize just how dangerous the situation really was. But I think we both know that this is just wishful thinking. Carol first noticed how bad things had gotten when Brianna suddenly had money coming from everywhere. In fact, she and her new group of friends even made a trip to Mexico during this time. Even though they knew all of the obvious dangers related to all of these gangs, they took a vacation straight into the eye of the storm. When Carol would ask Brianna where she was getting this money for all these trips and items, she would make up stories about low-paying jobs, but her mother would see through these lies each and every time. But there was virtually nothing she could do to keep her daughter safe. All she could do was hope for the best. Carol says that despite all of this new money, Brianna continued to pursue her goal of becoming an esthetician or a makeup artist. She continued paying for classes and was even offered a position as an instructor. But as her gang relations started to grow, her ability to study for her classes began to dwindle, and she just couldn't keep up with them anymore. She started missing classes, giving up on great opportunities, and instead continued to dive head first into the world of organized crime. When speaking about Jesse Margeson, Carol says that she remembers Jesse as always being a bit of a loner. She remembers that he had a terrible upbringing, but didn't dive into anything specifically other than he was more or less abandoned by his parents and forced to raise himself. She mentioned that Jesse was always getting into trouble and believes that Brianna was drawn to Jesse because she believed she could fix him or help him in some way. But she also admitted that it could have been the bad boy lifestyle that seemed appealing to Brianna after living as a good girl for such a long time, but the truth is we just don't know. Carol says that Brianna always kept her eyes open looking for a way out, but the problem is that the lure of the money was just too much to turn away from. When she would speak with Brianna about getting out of the business, she says that Brianna would always have an excuse, such as, once I make X amount of money, then I'll get out. But this amount of money would always increase, and it was simply never enough. Regardless of this, Brianna's mother continued to invite Jesse to family dinners and get-togethers. She didn't do this for Jesse's sake, but rather so that her daughter knew that she would be there for her when things fell apart, and she knew they eventually would. She just couldn't have ever anticipated how quickly things would go wrong. It started with Jesse being unfaithful to Brianna. Carol says that she knew that Jesse was sneaking around, but she also knew that this was simply part of the lifestyle. Jesse felt that he was above everything and everyone, including the law and his own girlfriend. Carol knew that Brianna was being mistreated, but Brianna simply wasn't willing to listen to reason. So what else could she do? But that's when things started getting far, far worse. Brianna's demeanor began to change. She was always known for being a pretty happy and outgoing girl, but all of a sudden, there was a shift. She used to be confident, unafraid, powerful, but now she seemed to jump at every shadow. She was always watching her back. Carol says that she really noticed how bad things had gotten when Brianna started keeping the curtains closed 24-7, even on a beautiful sunny day. When Carol questioned her daughter about why she was being so secretive and acting as if she was hiding away in her own home, Brianna revealed something terrifying. She said, Mom, they can't know where we live. By 2007, Brianna Kenyer had reached an all-time low. 
There was a raid at her apartment, and she was arrested and charged with possession for the purpose of trafficking. Along with these charges against her, charges were also placed against Tiffany, as well as Jesse. To say that Brianna was distraught about this would be a serious understatement. Brianna insisted that Jesse was willing to take all the blame for the situation. After all, he was the one to blame. Supposedly, Brianna played no part in the collection or dispersal of these illegal goods. But unfortunately, her name was attached to the lease of the apartment where all of it was found. So she was determined to have been an accomplice. It would also later come to light that detectives believed Brianna was, in fact, involved in the dispersal of these goods. She was just as guilty as Jesse in their eyes. Carol says that for Brianna, this was the beginning of the end. Her life as she knew it was over. She always had dreams of leaving the country and seeing the various sites in America and across the globe, but now she was a felon, so she couldn't even leave the country. It wasn't too long after this when Jesse became caught up in a string of violence and was hit by several rounds during an altercation, nearly losing his life. Thankfully, it doesn't appear that Brianna was present for all of this. The doctors say that it was a miracle that Jesse even survived to make it to the hospital, and in the end, he would make a full recovery. For Brianna, this situation was a bit of a wake-up call. The only problem was, regardless of how woke Brianna got, there was no exit. There was no way out. By this point, she knew too much and had too many rivals who knew who she was. There was no escape. Thankfully, around the same time, Brianna did eventually leave Jesse. But as is true with many people who are in abusive relationships, she went right back to him within a matter of weeks. Worse yet, around the same time, Brianna started using the same substances she was selling. So adding an addiction into the mix certainly didn't make her situation any better. And it's likely that she went back to him not only because she missed him, but also because she needed her next fix, and he was the main person who could provide that for her. After many more months passed by, Brianna finally made the decision to leave Jesse once and for all. She even packed up all of her things and moved to a new address that only her close family knew about. But Jesse wasn't willing to give it up. He was actually in prison at this point for one of the countless crimes he had committed. He and Brianna would write letters back and forth all the time, but in late 2008 or early 2009, Brianna wrote him one final letter in which she broke up with him for good. But from behind prison walls, Jesse had Brianna stalked by one of the members of his gang, and he found out about her new address almost immediately, bringing Brianna right back into the thick of it. And that brings us to February of 2009. Brianna had been driving around the Coquitlam area in a residential neighborhood. She'd been driving a truck that she had borrowed from her friend Tiffany, who had also been deeply involved in the illegal trafficking trade. And that's when everything went wrong. How exactly the situation played out has never been determined. Best I can tell, there were no witnesses, or at least none that were willing to come forward. But Brianna was found around 7 p.m. on February 5th, 2009, after she'd pulled over and parked the truck on Oxford Street, just south of Mason. When she was spotted by police who were conducting routine rounds, she was already slumped over in the driver's seat, and the window on that side of the truck had been shattered. She'd been struck by a single round and lost her life within moments, and no one had witnessed a thing. Just days prior to this, Brianna found out that she was expected to make a court appearance regarding her charges for trafficking illegal goods. But as is true with so many people in situations like this, Brianna wouldn't live to see her court date. She lost her life all alone in a borrowed vehicle on the dark streets of Coquitlam. The worst part is we don't even know if she was the intended victim. A suspect has never been named in this case, and considering it was gang-related, it's pretty much guaranteed that none ever will be named. In fact, it's likely that there wasn't even just one person involved, it's likely there was a collective of people who needed to make sure that Brianna didn't reveal any secrets to the police when her court date rolled around. But the craziest thing about Brianna's case is that investigators believe it's entirely possible that Brianna lost her life due to a simple case of mistaken identity. Considering she was driving Tiffany's truck, many detectives believe that Tiffany may have actually been the target. It's never been revealed why Brianna was parked in that area on the night that she lost her life, but it has been confirmed that in Jesse's absence, Brianna was still actively dealing. It could be safely assumed that she was there to carry out a deal, but this has never been confirmed. As mentioned, Brianna was just one of three people who lost their lives on that very same day, all of whom were tied to various gangs in the area. According to my count, at least 
41 people lost their lives between January of 2009 and July of 2009, all of whom were directly related to the business that Brianna had been involved in. Brianna was just one of the first victims of these gangs, but she was far from the last. In reality, we don't even know if she had any gang secrets worth sharing. It's highly possible that she lost her life that day for no reason at all, especially if she wasn't even the intended target. It's just tragic all the way around because Brianna knew how dangerous this lifestyle was. She was a very smart girl. She did really well in school and always stayed out of trouble. But for whatever reason, this Jesse guy had an almost supernatural hold on her. And she was so blinded by her desire to be with Jesse that everything else just fell by the wayside. If there's any silver lining to this story, it's that Brianna's friend Tiffany appears to have made it out alive. After Brianna lost her life in Tiffany's vehicle, it served as somewhat of a wake-up call, and Tiffany was able to get out of the business, at least as far as I can tell. After Brianna lost her life, I was able to confirm that Tiffany had found herself a more typical job and had held on to it for at least six to eight months, but after this, the trail of Tiffany basically runs cold. As for Jesse Margison, well, he's a bit more difficult to track down. As of 2012, he was in jail awaiting trial when he was savagely beaten by a group of fellow inmates, who, you guessed it, were likely members of a rival gang. They messed him up pretty badly, but get this, he was awarded $3 million in the aftermath, given to him by the British Columbia government. Jesse and one other inmate had been the victims of this assault, and it was determined that the guards and prison officers didn't do their job to keep the two men safe, so the two were awarded a very hefty settlement. But after about 2016, Jesse basically falls off the map. I'm not sure if he's still in jail, prison, or if he's a free man now living the high life with $3 million in the bank. After this settlement, no one ever mentioned him again. Unfortunately, it seems like the real victim in this entire situation, in my opinion, was Carol, Brianna's mother. Brianna, rather obviously, is no longer around to have to suffer the aftermath of everything that went down. Jesse's no longer in the picture, nor is Tiffany. Carol has basically been left behind to sift through the wreckage all on her own. But she's doing everything within her power, and I mean everything, to ensure that her daughter isn't forgotten. She's even taken it upon herself to reach out to other mothers who've been placed in similar situations to offer them help, support, and a shoulder to lean on. While Brianna may be gone, Carol is stopping at nothing to make sure that her memory will live on forever and be a light to those who feel hopelessly lost in the dark. Thankfully for Carol, she has no regrets about the way she handled things. She knows that she did everything within her power to keep her daughter safe, but her daughter still chose to make decisions that led her down one of the darkest paths you could imagine. One of the most heartbreaking statements that I've heard from Carol is that in the days leading up to her passing, Brianna asked her mother to provide her with a letter for the judge who was ruling over her case. This letter was basically a character statement meant to prove to the judge that Brianna wasn't a bad person. Carol refused to write the letter. When asked if she felt bad about this, Carol admitted that she did feel pretty bad. She also admitted that she wasn't ever going to lie to a judge and it was time for Brianna to face the music, so to speak. Carol says that she could not, with a clean conscience, write a letter to a judge and tell him or her that her daughter was a good, honest person, when she knew wholeheartedly that it wasn't true. She admitted that her daughter had the opportunity to make the right move time and time again but she made the wrong decision each and every time. She couldn't cover for her anymore, and she was forced to admit that, based on the decisions her daughter had made, she couldn't vouch for her anymore. Rather obviously, knowing all of this doesn't change the pain and the devastation that Carol has been through. If there's any comfort to be found here, it's that Carol has made peace with things, at least as much as she can. There's a strange type of solace that comes from situations like this when you know that you've exhausted every avenue that you could have. While it doesn't bring anyone back, at the very least, it may offer some level of closure. Jasmine Fiore was a budding model and actress who got her start modeling body paint and swimsuits. At just 28 years old, she made quite a name for herself, appearing in shows all around the Las Vegas area. And she even had a brief stint on a VH1 reality TV show. But in 2009, Jasmine's career met a sudden and tragic end when she disappeared on the evening of August 14th. 
Within hours of her disappearance, investigators found her remains stuffed inside of a suitcase and abandoned inside of a dumpster. The state of her body was humiliating to say the least. In fact, the perpetrator had been so brutal that Jasmine could only be identified by the serial numbers on her breast implants. But who could have done something like this? Well, detectives have a very clear idea of who the perpetrator was, and they even pressed charges against him. But for a shocking and rather unexpected reason, the man was never arrested, even though the case would go on to change the face of reality TV forever. It was a little over 20 years ago when modern reality TV first burst onto the scene, and many credit the genre's success to shows like CBS's Survivor, which first aired in 2000. After Survivor, which saw a successful launch, series like American Idol, The Bachelor, and The Osbournes weren't too far behind. By 2005, VH1 had really begun to cash in on the new craze of reality television, and soon enough, they launched the series Megan Wants a Millionaire. Despite the show's incredible success, though, it only managed to air for a single season before it was canceled, and it's all because of the tragic loss of Jasmine Fiore. Jasmine had a somewhat difficult time growing up because her parents separated when she was just eight years old. This meant that her mother was forced to raise young Jasmine all on her own, living in Bonnie Doon, California. We all know how expensive it can be to live in California, so it goes without saying that the two likely struggled quite a bit. As Jasmine grew a bit older, she found that she had a love for playing football. Regardless of how inclusive the sport is these days, this was a bit unusual for a girl of Jasmine's size and stature to play such a demanding sport at that time in history. But Jasmine wasn't one to shy away from pushing boundaries. As she entered her teenage years, Jasmine found a job at a local grocery store. But all the while, she wanted to pursue her dreams of becoming a model. As Jasmine became of legal age, she began applying for modeling jobs and managed to land a few work opportunities pretty quickly. She first became a swimsuit model, and soon after this, she found work as a body paint model, working for various people at parties and entertainment gatherings. Jasmine was such a big hit with her clients that she even landed several shows at some of Las Vegas' biggest casinos. For Jasmine, everything was going perfectly according to her plan, and she was truly living her dream. She appeared on various commercials for adult services, such as adult phone lines and the like, and things were really looking up for her in terms of her career. But Jasmine knew that her lifestyle wouldn't last forever. Being a pretty smart worker, she began making arrangements for where life would take her when her job as a beauty worker eventually came to an end. So she went to school and got a real estate license, and had made arrangements to open her own gym and personal training center. Jasmine had encountered various love interests over the years, and she eventually caught the attention of Robert Hasman, a man that she truly loved and admitted that she wanted to settle down with. Unfortunately, their relationship didn't really last, and they eventually went their separate ways. And before long, she found herself in the arms of a man named Travis, and the two got engaged in 2006 but they too broke off their relationship. This brings us to 2009, when Jasmine met a fellow real estate expert by the name of Ryan Jenkins. Ryan was a real estate investor who owned properties all around the Las Vegas area, but he wasn't a big shot just yet. He was more of a small time investor who was still looking to find his place in the business and hadn't quite made it yet. With this in mind, Ryan did his best to keep his options open, and one of his options was to appear in reality TV shows on VH1. Ryan had applied for a new series known as Megan Wants a Millionaire back in late 2008 or early 2009. Ryan was over the moon when he'd been accepted onto this show, but his stint with the series didn't last very long, and he was eliminated in one of the earlier episodes. But for Ryan, this didn't matter too terribly much. That's because just days after he was eliminated from the series, he met the woman of his dreams, Jasmine Fiore. Two days after this, the two were married. This may sound completely crazy to marry someone that you've only known for two days, and don't get me wrong, it kind of is, but the two claim that they have genuinely been in love with one another. According to Jasmine's friends and family, at this point Jasmine was truly, genuinely happy when she was with Ryan. Jasmine was known for being a very vibrant and energetic woman, and her relationship with Ryan only further amplified these qualities. 
regardless of them meeting at a casino and having a spur of the moment wedding, their love was very much real. But as you might expect, things weren't always perfect. Within months of their wedding, Jasmine was forced to call the police after her husband revealed a side of himself that she never knew existed. In June of 2009, just three months after Jasmine and Ryan were married, it's rumored that Jasmine had been stepping out of her marriage behind her husband's back. Jasmine had been speaking with her former fiance, Travis, and the two had met up at what appears to have been some sort of party. At this event, Jasmine and Travis kissed, and this caused Ryan to flip out, and understandably so. But what isn't quite so understandable is Ryan's reaction to learning about this. Now, I don't know if Ryan walked in on the two or if someone told him what had happened, but Ryan sprung into action right away, and he and Jasmine got into a very heated argument. Travis admitted to what had taken place, and soon after, Ryan punched Jasmine and caused her to fall into a nearby pool. The police were called and charges were immediately filed against him. Ryan was then set to appear at trial in December of 2009. But the two reconciled soon after all this unfolded, and before long they were back on the same page again, but their marriage would never be the same after this. Lisa, Jasmine's mother, claims that Jasmine and Ryan fought constantly. The main reason for their argument was that Ryan claims that Jasmine was never willing to let go of her former boyfriends, and for all intents and purposes, this seems to have been true. Ryan felt that if they'd broken up, that should be the end of it, but Jasmine didn't feel that way. Needless to say, Ryan was a very jealous man. But strangely, some of Ryan's jealousy and some of his fears seem to have been somewhat justified. According to Ryan's father, Jasmine had been sneaking around behind his back for months. His father claims that Ryan had told him about multiple occasions in which Jasmine would leave for multiple days at a time and never tell Ryan that she was leaving nor tell him where she had been for all this time. Now, what we don't know is whether or not this all came about after the two had the altercation at the party, or if this was taking place when the two were supposedly on good terms. If this all happened right after they separated after the party, then I totally get it. Jasmine needed space, and the last person she wanted to be with was Ryan. But if this was all going on while the two were on good terms and happily married, then you have to admit Ryan wasn't being too unreasonable by wanting to know why his wife had been missing for days at a time. Worse yet, according to Ryan, when she would return, she would repeatedly lie about where she had been, but Ryan had never explained how he knew she was lying. To make things even more confusing, Jasmine reportedly told her mother that the two had annulled their marriage in May of 2009, just two months after getting married. But after multiple searches of public records, there's no proof that this statement was true. By all means, the two appear to have been married when all of this was going down. This all brings us to August 14th of 2009, the night that the lives of Jasmine and Ryan would change forever, and the same night that Jasmine's final hours were captured on CCTV, and the night that would alter the course of reality television for the rest of history. It was August 14th, 2009, when Jasmine and Ryan made plans to stay at the Loberge Hotel in San Diego. The two were scheduled to attend a poker tournament, which was some type of charity fundraiser to raise money for the Karma Foundation. CCTV footage from this evening was viewed by investigators who said that the two were seen having a great time together. Both Ryan and Jasmine were seen in the footage laughing and smiling throughout the evening. The couple left the hotel at around 2.30 a.m. on the morning of the 14th, being spotted again at the Ivy Hotel, which was a nightclub in downtown San Diego. This nightclub was the final time the two were seen together, and by 4.30 a.m., Ryan had returned to their hotel room alone, and he would check out of the hotel by himself at 9 a.m. that morning. Jasmine was never seen again. It hasn't been reported whether or not she was spotted on CCTV at the nightclub, but whatever took place at that nightclub, things don't appear to have ended well for the couple. The following day, August 15th, police announced that they located a body in an alleyway in Buena Park, California. The person had met a very, very terrible end, and detectives say that all of their teeth had been removed, as had all of their fingers, making identification incredibly difficult. 
whoever had placed this body here, they didn't want this person to ever be identified. The only thing police were able to determine was that the remains were female, and they'd been crushed inside of a suitcase that was far too small. Later that day, Ryan reported his wife missing. He told police that he had last seen Jasmine around 8.30 p.m. on August 14th at their home in Los Angeles. He said that the two had attended the aforementioned charity poker tournament, visited some bars, then they'd returned home, where Jasmine dropped him off and headed out to run some errands. After this, he never saw her again. What's never been explained is why Ryan thought this disappearance out of all the other times Jasmine had up and vanished was suspicious. If you remember, Jasmine was known for disappearing for days at a time. But in this particular instance, he reported his wife missing less than 24 hours after she had vanished. This has never been fully explained, but investigators had reason to believe that there was much more to Ryan than meets the eye. By the following day, Ryan had spent some time at the couple's home packing up some clothing and travel items. He was seen leaving their penthouse on August 16th at around 9 a.m. He then headed straight to Nevada to pick up his boat, but this wasn't the story that he shared with police when they reached out to him later that same day. He told them that he'd been in Utah and was heading to Canada to resolve some immigration issues. Around this same time, investigators had made some progress on the body that had been discovered in the dumpster. Despite the fact the perpetrator had gone to such great lengths to conceal the identity of this person, the remains were identified just days later on August 18th. As the coroner was examining the body, he noticed that the woman's breasts appeared to have been altered, and he believed she may have purchased implants at some point, and this assumption was correct. During an analysis, the coroner removed the implants and was able to read the serial number that had been printed on them. The serial number tied them directly to Jasmine Fiore. The coroner was able to determine that Jasmine had lost her life within just a few hours of her body being found. But things got much worse from here. Police were soon alerted that a white Mercedes had been found abandoned in a parking lot in West Hollywood. This discovery was made less than a mile from the home that Jasmine and Ryan shared in Los Angeles. When the car was searched, it was found that it too belonged to Jasmine. But what made this discovery so disturbing is that the inside of the car was covered in a significant amount of evidence. Red stains were found everywhere in the car, and there were even signs that Jasmine's hair had been pulled out. Police then reclassified the case, officially labeling it as a homicide investigation. At this point, police wanted to speak with Ryan about his whereabouts around the time that Jasmine had vanished, but he was nowhere to be found. The following day, on the 19th of August, Ryan called his father from Vancouver, proving that he did eventually make it to Canada as he had told investigators he would. It was during this phone call that Ryan's father informed him that police were looking to speak with him, and that they'd found Jasmine's body, and that they had reason to believe she'd been the victim of a homicide. At this point, police were actively searching for Ryan. For one reason or another, they firmly believed he was behind the crime, and a manhunt soon followed. Before long, investigators received a tip that Ryan's black BMW SUV had been spotted heading towards the U.S.-Canada border while towing a boat. Police later found the vehicle at a marina in Washington. The vehicle was empty, and the trailer that it was towing was also empty, proving the boat was out somewhere on the water. The vehicle's engine was still warm, though, so Ryan couldn't have gone too far. It needs to be mentioned that, at this point, Ryan wasn't considered guilty he was merely considered a person of interest that police desperately wanted to speak to. Police were so interested in getting in touch with him that the U.S. Coast Guard and the Customs and Border Protection Agency announced that they were sending out multiple boats to search for him. It wouldn't be until August 19th that a credible sighting of Ryan finally came in. A witness had spotted someone who resembled Ryan piloting a boat near Point Roberts in Washington, where Ryan's stepmother was known to have lived. No sooner than this report came in, police announced that they had reason to believe he had crossed the border back into Canada sometime between the 19th and the 20th. This was the final straw for investigators. They knew that Ryan had been informed that police were looking for him, so to them, this was proof that he was evading capture. This prompted them to escalate their search for him, labeling him as their prime suspect and officially charging him with homicide.
It was August 20th when Ryan arrived at the Thunderbird Motel in British Columbia, Canada. He arrived with a young woman who the motel worker described as attractive, young, and very calm. The two paid for three nights at the hotel, and the manager didn't find them even the least bit suspicious. When police investigated the identity of the woman that Ryan was seen with, they quickly realized that it was his half-sister, Elena. The motel manager noted that he'd spotted Ryan walking out front of his room on August 21st, looking extremely exhausted. He said that he looked so disheveled that even though he was aware of the manhunt for Ryan Jenkins, he didn't recognize this as being the same person. By 11.30 a.m. on August 23rd, the manager noticed that Ryan had never checked out of his room, which had been booked under Elena's name. The manager then asked his nephew to go check in on him and make sure that he had left. But that's when he walked in on yet another crime scene. When the nephew opened the door to the room, he found Ryan's body hanging from a clothes rack by a belt. He had taken his own life. A note was never found at the scene of the crime but investigators would later find one on Ryan's computer dated to August 20th. The contents of this letter have never been made public, and unfortunately, this means that Jasmine's case to this day has never been solved, but this is far from the end of the story. Police very firmly believe that Ryan was the one who took Jasmine's life. In fact, they're pretty much certain that this is true. They have no other people of interest, and it's pretty clear to see that Ryan was struggling with some pretty serious guilt in the final days and hours of his life. After Ryan lost his life, police began to look more closely into his past, and VH1 did the same thing. VH1 being the company that invited him to appear on Megan Wants a Millionaire. According to VH1, they always conduct a background check on every star that appears on one of their reality TV shows. They claimed that Ryan's background check came back perfectly clear. But a subsequent check revealed some interesting information. As it would turn out, back in 2007, Ryan had been investigated for assaulting a woman in Calgary. The production company behind Megan Wants to Be a Millionaire reiterated that he would never have been allowed onto the show if they'd been aware of this. VH1 explained that they employ a third-party private investigative firm to conduct all of their background checks. But these checks are limited to crimes that occurred within U.S. borders, and Calgary is obviously located in Canada. So the information of this crime never made it to VH1. But what makes things even more interesting is that this third-party company, Collective Intelligence, announced that they hadn't actually been the ones to conduct the background check. Since Ryan was originally from Canada, they had outsourced the background check to another company known as Straight Line International. In the wake of the allegations against Ryan, Collective Intelligence sued Straight Line International for breach of contract, claiming that the company was fully aware of Ryan's violent history, but never reported the history to Collective Intelligence or VH1. Collective Intelligence would eventually lose trust with its primary clients, Viacom, NBC, and ABC, and Straight Line was forced to pay Collective Intelligence over $800,000 in damages. But things are still about to get even crazier, if you could even imagine. VH1 had not only hired Jenkins to be a part of the first season of Megan Wants a Millionaire. In fact, after he'd been eliminated from the show, they hired him to appear in season three of I Love Money, yet another reality TV series. Now, I've never seen this show, but the Wikipedia article about the series says that the show involved contestants competing in various physical and mental challenges, with the hope of winning a $250,000 grand prize. As it would turn out, Ryan Jenkins actually won the third season of the show. Ryan reportedly called Jasmine every day while he was filming the show, promising her he was going to do everything he could to win the money, so that the two could live the life they had always dreamed of. But it was also reported that throughout the duration of him filming the show, his calls to Jasmine grew progressively more and more aggressive with each passing day, and it became clear that he was growing suspicious of Jasmine while he was gone, and feared that she may have been cheating on him. And upon his return from filming, if the rumors about her involvement with her ex-boyfriend are true, he may have been right, and this may have been his motive for ending Jasmine's life. In the aftermath of this revelation, VH1 made the decision to pull the plug on the third season of I Love Money. Not one episode of this season has ever aired, and the production company, 51 Minds, was forced to settle with VH1 for over $12 million in losses from their inability to air the show. 
This was a pretty serious blow for the company, and it was a massive blow for reality television as a whole, and could have easily ruined the entire genre. See, when you watch a typical fictional television show, you likely don't think too terribly much about the actors, because they're not portraying themselves on screen. They're portraying a character that was created and written for them. But when it comes to reality TV, part of what makes it so captivating is that you're watching the actual person say and do things that they would likely actually say and do in real life. It may be amped up, but it's not fictional. But the thing with reality TV is that even when watching these stars on the big screen, you still have no idea who they are as a person. And that's a scary thought. It's the same feeling that comes along with watching famous YouTubers or social media stars. You only see what they or their publicity team wants you to see. For Ryan Jenkins, VH1 only wanted you to see the entertaining side of him. For the most part, these companies couldn't care less who these people are behind the scenes, and Ryan was no exception. If I'm being honest, I have a pretty good feeling that the only reason VH1 was even upset about all this was because it nearly lost them $12 million on that third season of I Love Money, and a scandal like this could have easily ruined their entire reality TV catalog. When speaking with Mark Cronin, the co-founder of 51 Minds, the main production company behind many of VH1's most popular reality TV shows, he explains that the loss of Jasmine Fior has cast a shadow on the reality TV genre as a whole. He said that the crimes of Ryan Jenkins have given him new perspective when he's selecting contestants for future reality TV shows, saying that he trusts his gut a lot more these days, suggesting that he had a gut feeling that something wasn't right about Ryan, but chose to bring him on the show anyway. Further proving my point that, for the most part, these companies don't care about these people or who they really are as a person. Another producer spoke up and said that he would rather have a gut feeling about someone, exclude them from a show and be wrong about them, than end up with another situation like Ryan Jenkins. The producer for another reality TV series, Big Brother, has even stated that these days, many studios who conduct background checks no longer even take into account their budget. They want the best, most thorough background check they can find, with no regards to cost. And I just hope that this is true. In the end, Ryan Jenkins was never able to be held accountable for his alleged crimes. But if there's anything good that's come out of this case, it's that the entirety of reality TV seems to be a much safer place now, even if only to protect the bottom lines of these faceless corporations. But it should never have taken the loss of someone's life for these studios to provide their actors with a safe work environment. And that much should never be forgotten. Ashling Murphy was a 23-year-old woman from Ireland who just landed her dream job at a local primary school in Tullamore, when she became caught up in a chilling true crime story. As she was out jogging one afternoon, Ashling was ambushed from behind. The suspect claimed her life within a matter of seconds, and did so in broad daylight in front of multiple witnesses and CCTV cameras. The crime shook the entire country, but what could this criminal have wanted so badly that he was willing to take the life of such a young, promising school teacher? And what could have led him to commit such a heartbreaking crime in broad daylight, no less? Investigators think they know the answer, but it isn't pretty. Ashling Murphy was born in 1998 in Blue Ball, which is fairly close to Tullamore, where Ashling would spend the majority of her life. She grew up alongside her siblings, a brother and a sister, and had a deep love for music. And she was specifically fond of traditional Irish music, as was the rest of her family. She would often play music with her father, with Ashlyn playing the tin whistle or the fiddle, while her father preferred the banjo. Ashlyn believed that everyone should learn how to play an instrument, and she did her best to pass on her love of music down to her students and her peers. She would often take younger musicians under her wing, teaching them all she knew about her instruments. Ashling would then meet the love of her life when she was about 13 or 14 years old. Now, I get that may sound a bit strange to some, but when you know, you know. I mean, my own wife was just 14 when we started dating. But when Ashling met her boyfriend, Ryan Casey, the two hit it off instantly. He was just 15 at the time, but regardless of their age, they started dating just weeks later. And from the very beginning, they knew it was meant to be. 
By 2014, though, they had called things off, admitting that they were probably too young to truly know what they wanted in life. But it didn't take them long to realize what they were missing out on. Because after a short while, Ryan asked Ashling to make things official, gifting her a watch that she virtually never took off since the day that it was given to her. It wasn't the world's prettiest watch by any means, but it was the most special thing that Ashling owned, and by a steep margin. Unfortunately, Ashling wouldn't be around long enough for the two to get married, even though they both obviously wanted to. But they stuck together throughout the remainder of high school, college, and after graduation. They would actually remain together for the rest of Ashling's life. Once she graduated from high school, Ashling went on to attend the Mary Immaculate College in Limerick, getting her Bachelor's of Education in 2021, when she was just 22 years old. When Ashling left school and began placing applications at nearby primary schools, she was contacted by Duro National School, who was more than happy to offer her a position teaching first grade. For Ashling, this was the job of a lifetime. She was able to make a living doing what she always dreamed of doing, so it's easy to assume that, for her, life couldn't have been better. But as we all know, good times don't always last forever. Ashling wasn't one to let her health go by the wayside after she finished up school, so she always made time to ensure that she ate properly and got regular exercise. So on January 12, 2022, Ashling headed out for a jog, as she did quite often. She was jogging along the Grand Canal located in Tullamore. She had just finished up work at school and was hoping to get some fresh air before returning home for the evening. She left school just after 3 p.m. that day and made her way towards a walkway known as Fiona's Way, which was, oddly enough, named after a missing woman, Fiona Pender. As Ashling made her way down the path, tragedy struck. What should have been an ordinary January afternoon quickly turned into a nightmare. As Ashling made her way along Fiona's way, she was ambushed from behind. A male suspect, who was not immediately identified, had pulled out a weapon and charged at Ashling from behind. She would sustain a total of 11 wounds, all of which were to her neck. What's crazy is that this was an otherwise beautiful day. It was broad daylight, no rain in the forecast, the perfect day to go out for a nice jog, and Ashling clearly agreed. So why had this suspect chosen this day of all days to commit such a heartbreaking crime? Naturally, many other people were out and about walking along the canal near to Ashling. It goes without saying that there were multiple witnesses to the crime. Two women who were jogging along the opposite side of the canal were the first to realize what was taking place. And mere seconds after Ashling fell down, the two women bolted and headed towards the nearest home to ask the residents to call the police. When investigators finally arrived at the scene of the crime, it was incredibly clear what had taken place here. Ashling had lost her life within a matter of seconds, but the aftermath left an image in the minds of locals that is likely to persist for many years to come. As police collected evidence from the scene of the crime, they initially believed that Ashling had lost her life after being asphyxiated. After all, the women who'd witnessed the crime were so shaken that they couldn't quite tell what specifically had unfolded. They just knew that a man had grabbed Ashling from behind. But as police began to investigate the situation a bit more closely, they realized the sheer brutality of the crime. Police had also initially believed that Ashling had used the keys that she was carrying to fight back against her attacker, but they would later learn that this too wasn't entirely accurate. As the crime was unfolding, Ashling immediately began defending herself by kicking at the man, as well as clawing him with her fingernails. And it was incredibly helpful that she did this, because by doing so, she collected a perfect DNA sample of the suspect under her nails. But keep in mind, a DNA sample is only useful if the criminal is logged into a police database. In this scenario, he wasn't. Police honed in on one specific man based on the statements witnesses gave at the scene of the crime as well as their belief that the criminal wasn't someone who Ashling knew personally. Descriptions of this individual eventually helped police track down a 40-year-old man who they believed was responsible. Some sources seem to suggest that this man was captured on CCTV in the area as well. But unfortunately, though, the man was cleared of any involvement in less than 24 hours. When the man spoke with the Irish Independent a short while later, he described his time being detained by police and relayed his experience of being interrogated for a crime he didn't commit. To put it nicely, this man did not have a good time while he was in custody, 
Even after his release, he was bombarded by online threats from people who still believed he was behind the crime even though it was proven that he wasn't. The man's life was in such danger that police were forced to provide him with a safe accommodation while the investigation continued, because they feared he may have his life taken, simply because he was a suspect. It seemed that no amount of evidence could convince these armchair detectives otherwise. It was the very definition of a modern-day witch hunt. Interestingly, as police were still searching the scene of the crime for any clues, they came across a Falcon Storm mountain bike that they believed was tied to the case. They went back and started combing through hours upon hours of CCTV footage. After learning that another woman claimed to have been followed by a man who rode an identical bike to the one that was found near the crime scene. Footage of a man riding this specific bike was eventually recovered, but it wasn't initially clear if police believed the man riding this bike was the perpetrator or merely a witness who fled the scene when the crime had unfolded. But considering the bike had been left behind at the scene of the crime and no one had bothered to come back for it, I'd say it's pretty safe to assume that detectives believe the bike likely belonged to the suspect. But around the same time, detectives were informed of another interesting clue, and it came from somewhere no one would have anticipated. On January 14th, two days after the crime, a man stumbled into a local hospital, seeking treatment for an injury that he'd sustained to his stomach. He refused to tell the nurses and doctors how he had been injured, which only made them more curious and suspicious. Some of the healthcare workers believed that the man may have been involved in something rather nefarious, so they called the police to inform them. Investigators then carried out a background check against the man. Now, we don't know specifically what this background check showed, but it clearly raised a few eyebrows, because after receiving the results of the report, police decided to carry out searches of multiple nearby properties that the man was associated with, including one in County Offaly and one in Dublin. Two vehicles were seized as well, and one of these vehicles is believed to have been the taxi that was used to transport the suspect to the hospital. Around the same time, it was reported by the local police commissioner that all of the police force's available resources were to be allocated to getting this case solved. Police announced around the same time that they were making significant progress in the case, but that they were unable to share many of the specifics of their investigation, as they feared it may tip off the suspect and cause him to flee, or at the very least, do a better job of covering his tracks. But then, a breakthrough came, and an arrest was finally made. Turns out, it was the man who had admitted himself to the hospital on the 14th. He was released from the hospital after four days of observation, being sent back into society on January 18th, the same day as a public vigil that was being held for Ashley. Less than 24 hours later, the man was arrested under suspicion of claiming Ashling's life. Less than 24 hours after this, the man was officially charged and identified as Joseph Puska, a Slovakian national. Police quickly learned that the man didn't even know Ashling, but he had been stalking her on the date of the crime. He was later taken before a special sitting of the Tullamore District Court, at which point they agreed that there was enough evidence against the man, and he was sent to Cloverhill Prison to await a second court appearance, scheduled for the 26th of January, about a week later. At this same time, police arrested a second suspect, who they also believed was involved in the crime, but he was released without charges a little while later. It wouldn't be until April 25th that the man was officially given a court date. It seemed to nearly every member of the public, the police had finally found their man. But then, a shocking turn of events. Joseph's trial began on October 2nd, 2023, following several more lengthy delays. During the trial, several key pieces of evidence were revealed that caused the public to seriously question the integrity of the local police. The most condemning piece of evidence that was put forward was that Joseph had actually confessed to the crime on January 14th, the same day he entered the hospital. And he did this in the presence of police officers, yet he wasn't arrested until the 19th, five full days after his confession. No explanation for this has ever been given. So why in the world did it take police nearly a week to arrest a man who had openly confessed to a crime? When police were digging deeper into the man's whereabouts at the time that the crime took place, they realized that he was, in fact, the man who they had spotted on CCTV footage, riding the mountain bike that was mentioned a moment ago. 
Better yet, police were able to conclusively prove that he was the criminal because of the DNA that Ashling had collected underneath her fingernails. In essence, she'd helped to solve her own crime even after she lost her life. If this wasn't condemning enough, police were actually able to use data that was pulled from Ashling's Fitbit smartwatch to determine the exact second that the crime occurred. And Joseph's whereabouts fit perfectly in line with the timeline that they had now established, proving beyond any doubt that he was with Ashling when she lost her life. Around the same time that Joseph was spotted traveling through the Fiona's Way area, Ashling's Fitbit history showed a sudden and dramatic change in her heart rate, pinning down the exact moment that the crime occurred. But even with all of this information stacked against it, police still had one major problem. They had found no motive for the crime. In fact, Joseph had begun to blame the crime on a masked man who had jabbed him in the stomach around the same time that the crime against Ashling was carried out. In essence, he explained this Fitbit information away, claiming he was in the area at the time, and he did witness the crime, but he wasn't the one who carried it out. This would have obviously been the reason he admitted himself to the hospital just two days after the crime. But what I can figure out is that Joseph had already confessed to the crime. He confessed in detail to police officers who visited him in the hospital months before the trial took place. So why the sudden change in his story? I guess he suddenly didn't want to go to prison? I mean, who even knows? To top this off, he shared various conflicting stories with other members of the investigative team, so who even knows what the truth is at this point? Police were eventually able to determine that the wound that Joseph had sustained to his stomach was self-inflicted and it had come about during the crime against Ashley. Needless to say, with the DNA, the confession, the Fitbit data, the dozens of scratch wounds all over his body, and the stomach wounds stacked against him, Joseph was sent to prison for life. But this brings us right back to the bigger question here. What was the motive? The most obvious motive in many cases like this is that the suspect wanted to take advantage of the victim, but that didn't happen here. Ashling was never taken advantage of, nor was she even robbed. Joseph ran up behind her, jabbed her 11 times in the neck, then just ran away. There literally was no motive other than he wanted to do it. After the trial had concluded, police were willing to divulge some of the more heavily guarded secrets of the case, and they were finally willing to admit that Joseph had, indeed, confessed to the crime on January 14th with the help of a Slovakian interpreter who they had on the phone while Joseph was stuck in a hospital bed. They never opened up about why it took them an additional five days to arrest him, but I suppose that's largely irrelevant at this point. What's done is done. When Joseph spoke to the interpreter, he made it clear that he wanted his confession to be repeated word for word to investigators. In his statement, he admitted to claiming Ashling's life, repeating this twice. But interestingly, he says that he didn't do it intentionally, adding that he feels guilty and he's sorry. He admitted that he had never seen Ashling before and explained the situation away as some sort of accident. He said he'd been carrying a knife with him that he used to work on the chain of his bike. He said when Ashling passed by, he accidentally cut her. He said that she began to panic, then he began to panic. He said he never saw her there and that the crime was an accident. But how? How in the world do you accidentally jab someone in the neck 11 times, then accidentally get yourself in the stomach as well? Well, you don't. With this logic, he must have accidentally been stalking the other woman as well, and accidentally left his bike at the scene of the crime after he accidentally ran away and hid from the police for 48 hours, hiding the wound that he had accidentally sustained to his own stomach. I feel like Ashling's boyfriend said it best in this case, when he told this man, quote, you smirked, smiled, and even showed zero remorse during your trial, which sums you up as the person you really are, the epitome of pure evil. In the aftermath of this crime, a park bench located near to where the crime unfolded has been dedicated to Ashling, with a simple inscription reading, In Memory of Ashling Murphy. At least three music charities have been set up in her memory as well, providing scholarships to students based on their musical achievements. Ryan, Ashling's boyfriend, says that Ashling meant everything to him, and when her life was taken away, he lost his purpose. It's hard to imagine what you would do without someone who's literally been in your life since you were a child, someone you grew up alongside and dedicated the rest of your life to. If you remember, Ryan gave Ashling a special watch to commemorate their love for one another. 
but rather than having Ashling buried with the watch that she cherished more than anything, he opted to pass it on to Ashling's mother, who has vowed to wear it every day of her natural life until she's able to meet with Ashling again in the next one. Ellen Greenberg was a first grade school teacher and loved her job and her life. She'd met the man of her dreams and the two were engaged to be married. But in January of 2011, all of that would change. A winter storm forced Ellen to leave work early, returning home to her apartment. At around 5 p.m. that evening, a terrible tragedy occurred. When Ellen's fiance returned home from the gym, he found his soon-to-be wife on the floor in their kitchen, completely unresponsive. When responders and investigators arrived just seven minutes later, rescue personnel announced that there was nothing they could do. The crazy thing is, according to detectives, Ellen had been wounded more than 20 times, and many of these injuries were on her back, very clearly suggesting that Ellen had been ambushed while her fiancé was away. But after a relatively brief investigation, police determined that Ellen had done this to herself. Ellen Greenberg was just 21 years old in 2011. She'd been living in Philadelphia for much of her adult life, but had originally come from Harrisburg. Ellen taught first grade students at the Juniata Academy located in Philadelphia. Even though the school is labeled as an academy, which in my area means it's a pretty high-end, decent place to be, well, the school seems average at best. With math and reading proficiency scores coming in at 20 and 39% respectively, well, it's not really the best school in the world. Overall, it ranks in the mid to low ratings compared to other schools in the area, but Ellen never let that deter her. If anything, this just meant that her students needed her more now than ever. Ellen seems to have been incredibly happy with her job at the school, and she seems to have loved all of her students dearly. At least, that's how it appeared on the outside. In reality, underneath it all, Ellen, known by her family as Ellie, had been struggling pretty severely. We don't specifically know what led to all of this, but her parents had known that she'd been dealing with some pretty serious anxiety for quite a while. Considering Ellie lived in a less than desirable area, there's a chance that the crime and unpredictability of the city just placed her on edge. There's a chance she'd been struggling with her students at school. There's just so much that's uncertain and so much that we don't know about her private life. But what we do know is that Ellie called her parents just a couple weeks before the crime unfolded and announced that she wanted to quit her job and, in her words, come home. Her parents were very sympathetic to Ellie's struggles. They openly welcomed her back into their home, but they requested that she get some professional help with her anxiety if she decided to do so. When they pressed her about what was bothering her, all that Ellie revealed was that the stress of planning a wedding was getting the best of her. Her wedding was set to take place in August, about seven months away. She also revealed that her job as a teacher had been super busy lately, and it was really starting to stress her out. She'd been planning for her wedding for a number of weeks, and she sent out her Save the Date cards just four days before tragedy struck. While all of these complaints are certainly understandable, None of them should have been enough of a reason for Ellie to have done what the police claimed she did, which was take her own life. According to Ellie's father, when he spoke with her on the phone in January of 2011, he felt like something was a little bit off about Ellie. He claims that her personality had changed and she didn't sound like her typical happy-go-lucky self. He says that Ellie had been continually complaining about how the stress of her job was affecting her, and she felt like she may have been falling behind. But when the teacher who eventually took Ellie's class over looked through her books and general housekeeping, she said that everything looked perfect. It appeared as though Ellie was on top of everything and was doing remarkably well with her class. After learning this, many people began to wonder if Ellie had been sharing the whole truth with her parents. Was her job really the problem here, or was there something else going on that she didn't want her family to know about? Eventually, Ellie gave in to her parents' wishes and agreed to go to a professional for help with her anxiety. This professional appears to have been chatting with Ellie extensively for several weeks, with the two meeting on at least three separate occasions as far as I was able to confirm, but it's possible that they've been meeting for a, a lot longer than this. 
Her doctor says that at no point during any of their discussions did Ellie give any indication that she would want to claim her own life. She was a perfectly healthy young woman who was simply overwhelmed by various stressors that had appeared all at once in her life. In the end, the doctor offered Ellie a couple medications to help her sleep and help her take the edge off so that she could have a clear head to try to work through whatever it was that was bothering her. While seeking help should have been the start of a new beginning for Ellie, unfortunately, it just wasn't. In fact, it was quite the opposite. If anything, it merely marked the beginning of the end. It was January 26th, 2011. A terrible winter storm had begun to blow into the area, and the local schools quickly became concerned that the buses may not be able to finish their rounds before the roads were covered in snow and ice. As a result, school was called off early that day, and all the children were sent home in the early afternoon hours. The teachers would follow soon after. After leaving the school, Ellie headed to a nearby gas station and filled up her car with gas before returning home to her apartment that she shared with her fiance, Sam Goldberg. Sam was a local television producer, and he and Ellie had met about three years prior. By all outward appearances, the relationship between Ellie and Sam was going great. Shortly after Ellie had returned home from school that day, Sam announced that he was going to head to the nearby gym, which was still open despite the storm. He left their apartment at about 4.45 p.m. that day, saying goodbye to Ellie and not thinking anything else of it. He was at the gym for around 30 minutes before he returned home. When he got back, he tried to open the door to their apartment, but it was wedged shut. Sam quickly realized that someone had engaged the swing lock from inside of the apartment. He tried and tried to open the door, but he just couldn't. Clearly frustrated, he began to text Ellie, asking her to open the door. Ellie didn't respond. He texted her again and again, with this taking place over the course of around an hour. His texts grew increasingly frantic, and he got so frustrated with Ellie's lack of response that he went and found one of the apartment building's security personnel and asked them to unlock the door, but they refused, claiming that it was unethical and against their building's policy. Sam, undeterred, returned to the apartment and broke through the latch that was keeping the door closed. As soon as the door flung open, Sam's anger turned to sheer terror. As he peered into the apartment, he saw Ellie slumped down on the kitchen floor. She was covered in pools of evidence, as was the ground around her. Sam immediately called the police and explained what was going on. He was instructed to begin CPR, hoping to keep Ellie alive until rescuers could arrive, but that's when he noticed the knife. The emergency responder then instructed Sam not to conduct CPR and to wait until first responders could get there. Paramedics showed up within a couple of minutes, but it was quickly determined that Ellie was gone. She was pronounced deceased at 6.40 p.m., not even two hours after Sam had last spoken to her. The big question here is, who could have done this to Ellie? After all, the door was not only locked, but it was also latched from the inside. So who could have been responsible? Well, if investigators are to be believed, Ellie. Once detectives entered the apartment, they immediately noticed there were no signs of forced entry, aside from the broken latch that Sam had burst through in order to gain access to the apartment. As police canvassed the apartment, there was no sign of anything being disturbed outside of the kitchen. Very clearly, the crime had begun and ended within the boundary of the kitchen. In fact, it doesn't even seem as though Elliot even walked around in the kitchen. Best I can tell, all of the evidence was collected in one small corner of the kitchen, where Ellie had collapsed in the corner of a set of cabinets. A fresh bowl of blueberries was found on the counter, as was a freshly peeled orange. It seemed as though Ellie may have either prepared herself a snack or was getting ready to have dinner, but she was ambushed from behind. But detectives refute this belief. When a medical examiner arrived, it was determined that Ellie had passed away from a total of 20 individual wounds. Each wound was infected with a single weapon, the knife that was still found in the kitchen. Ten of the wounds were found on the back of her head, her back, and her neck. She also had a pretty serious cut on the top of her head, sort of on her backside, but the fatal blow was to her chest. What's crazy is that no matter how much police investigated the scene of the crime, they couldn't find a single shred of evidence that suggested anyone else had been inside the apartment that day. 
There were no shoe prints, obviously no forced entry, no open windows, nothing. So how had someone broken in, taken Ellie's life, and then fled without leaving a shred of evidence behind? Well, investigators first looked at the weapon for any signs of evidence. They found no fingerprints nor any DNA outside of Ellie's. They also began to look at all the exterior walls of the home. They noticed that the home had a large balcony, but none of the snow that had fallen on the balcony had been disturbed. There was also no evidence that anyone had entered the home after being in the snow. No wet marks on the floor or anything else of the sort. There was nothing. This led police to one seriously dangerous but honestly understandable conclusion that Ellie had taken her own life. Police quickly contacted the apartment security team, hoping they captured CCTV footage of someone that day. The apartments did have cameras set up in the main lobby, but they didn't have any surveillance in the hallways of the building, likely for privacy reasons. After combing through the footage, police found no evidence of anyone who couldn't be accounted for. When speaking with neighbors, investigators recalled that none of the nearby residents heard anything unusual that day outside of Sam repeatedly banging and shouting at the door trying to get inside. Sergeant Tim Cooney remembered the investigation and said that the entire crime unfolded in the exact spot where they found Ellie, in the corner of the kitchen cabinets. He said the rest of the apartment was unremarkable. No further evidence was found outside of what was collected from the kitchen. When speaking about the case, Detective Cooney explained that the case was not ruled as a homicide for a number of reasons. The most obvious was the lack of any further evidence suggesting such. But he also recalled the state of Sam the fact that he never left the scene of the incident for that entire night, as well as the fact that Sam was extremely cooperative throughout the investigation. I say this because, naturally, police always suspect the spouse or partner, especially considering Sam was the only other person with the key to the apartment as far as we know, outside of security staff. But Sam's alibi checked out, and there was zero reason to believe he was involved in the crime. I remember reading one report that claimed that there was evidence found on Ellie's laptop, claiming that she'd been looking up details regarding taking one's own life. But the best I can tell, this report was false. Every other report I've found claims that nothing was found on her laptop or in her search history, but it does clarify that police did check into her laptop just to be sure. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, okay, cool story. Ellie was more depressed than she let on, and she eventually took her own life. Case closed, right? Well, no, not exactly, and in fact, not at all, because the results of Ellie's autopsy soon came in, and what they revealed would cast the case in a completely different light. Just a day after Ellie lost her life, the local medical examiner began the autopsy. He began searching her body for wounds. When he would find one, he would label them with a letter, obviously beginning with the letter A. By the time he was finished, he made it all the way to letter T. He noted that Ellie had a total of eight wounds on her chest alone. Each of these injuries ranged from a couple centimeters to more than four inches. Now, I could certainly understand how someone may have done something like this to themselves in an attempt to claim their own life. I'll admit there are easier ways of going about this, but we don't know Ellie's mental state at the time so this may have been a reasonable option for her. But what about the 10 wounds that were found on her back? How in the world would a petite person like Ellie have been able to get herself in the back with such tremendous force? Worse yet, how could she have done this and still been able to inflict the final 10 blows on the front of her body? After all, one expert took a look at the results of this investigation and explained that the wounds on her back appeared to have taken place first but she would have been in such excruciating pain that she would have either been rendered unconscious or maybe even paralyzed. This is because the wounds on her neck completely severed much of her nervous system. To put it plainly, there's no logical way that Ellie did this to herself. The examiner also found 11 bruises on her body, with them being in various stages of healing. This seems to suggest that Ellie may have been in some sort of a scuffle in the days leading up to her demise, though admittedly she was also an elementary school teacher. First graders are nuts, so many of these bruises may have just come from her day-to-day -day life as a teacher. We just don't know for sure. I've seen several people suggest that these bruises prove that Sam may have been abusive, and this could have led to Ellie's sudden change in personality as well as her sudden onset of anxiety. But police found no evidence to support this theory and I didn't find any reason to believe this either. 
The bruises are certainly suspicious, that much is obvious, but that doesn't mean that Sam was involved in any way. At the end of it all, the medical examiner weighed the options and listed Ellie's case as a homicide. But that's not the end of it, because no sooner than Ellie's case was handed off to the homicide unit, it was updated once again. This time, the homicide unit rejected the idea of her case being listed as such, and they once again claimed that Ellie had done this to herself. They claimed that they believed this to be true after Ellie had obviously been struggling with her mental health, as well as the fact that there was literally nothing found at the crime scene. When investigators eventually spoke with Ellie's closest friend, Debbie, she revealed some information that didn't really help this ruling. Debbie explained that in the weeks leading up to Ellie's demise, she had become incredibly reserved and didn't want to talk about much of anything. When Debbie pressed her about this, Ellie would shut down and refuse to reveal what had been bothering her. Debbie says that if she asked her anything, there would be a long pause followed by Ellie saying, I don't want to talk about it. Debbie worked alongside Ellie at school, and she says that while working, Ellie didn't seem any more stressed than any of the other teachers. She believes that whatever's going on, it wasn't work-related. Ellie's father says that despite Ellie's obvious signs of anxiety, she never complained about anything or anyone in particular outside of her wedding plans. When investigators spoke with Ellie's psychiatrist, she revealed that Ellie never complained about anyone either. She specifically explained that Ellie never complained about her relationship with Sam, which in essence completely rules Sam out as having any involvement in this. Her psychiatrist even recalled that when speaking about Sam, Ellie would begin to smile. Ellie's family, rather obviously, does not buy into the belief that Ellie claimed her own life. They firmly believe that she had her life stolen from her. They've hired various detectives on their own, and one of these detectives described the scene of the crime as a so-called blitz attack, which is essentially an attack that's carried out incredibly quickly and would certainly explain the number of Ellie's wounds, as well as the varying severity of them. But still, investigators were undeterred. In the end, Ellie's family took the case to court and demanded that it be re-examined as a homicide. This all took place as recently as September of 2023, just a few weeks ago at the time of making this video. But in a two to one vote, the case was rejected. Ellie's demise is still listed as having been carried out by herself. Now, I tend to be fairly quick to be critical of investigators during cases like this, but if we take a step back for a moment, we have to ask ourselves, what other choice do officers have? Rather obviously, they should continue pursuing the case and looking for leads. But as the case stands, there's simply no evidence pointing to anyone else being in that apartment that day. The only two entrances were the front door and the balcony, which was on the sixth floor of the building, mind you. The front door was latched shut from the inside, and the balcony was covered in countless inches of snow, all which had been undisturbed. Now, to be clear, I'm not defending the belief that Ellie did this to herself, not for one second. But in terms of a simple black and white investigation, what other option do investigators have? I hate this so much for Ellie and her family. Sam has since moved on and continued with his life, and he's now a married man and a father of two young children. But for Ellie's family, the pain never stops. They've announced that they plan to continue pushing for justice, and I'm so thankful that they have the strength to do so. In the end, something happened to Ellie that day, and I, for one, do not believe she was alone in that apartment. All we can do is hope that, at some point, more information will become available, and investigators will finally be able to get this case solved properly. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you want to see more true crime documentaries like this, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, the best way you can do that is simply by leaving a comment below any comment at all. It helps out the channel a lot more than you may realize. If you want to help out financially, you can do that by clicking the blue join button below, or by picking up a True Crime Stories mug like the one you see on the desk behind me from tynots.com. But with that, my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.